In February of this year, the long-awaited sequel to Horizon Zero Dawn, Horizon Forbidden West, was released. And it's safe to say this game was everything I wanted it to be and more. I absolutely loved the first game and saw the potential in its story, world and characters, and I always knew Guerrilla had the talent to grow the Horizon franchise into a fan favourite. Forbidden West takes everything from Zero Dawn and improves upon it in every conceivable way, whether that be the game's open world, graphics, characterization, combat, crafting, exploration, traversal, story and side content. Horizon Forbidden West is in my opinion the perfect example of a sequel and I think developers should look to games like Zero Dawn and Forbidden West to see exactly how direct sequels should be handled. Far too many developers these days are afraid of creating a sequel that's too similar to the original and opt to almost entirely change the formula and atmosphere of a game series to keep it fresh. Forbidden West is unapologetically a sequel to Zero Dawn, directly following the events and fallout of the ending of the previous game, picking up basically where we left off six months after the Battle of Meridian where Aloy defeated the Eclipse and thwarted Hades' plans to destroy the planet. In this game, Aloy is a lot wiser and more battle-hardened given her experience with old world technology, delving ruins and fighting machines. It's beautiful to see her character arc fully realised in Forbidden West, as she is now known as the saviour of Meridian, and her deeds across the Nora Sacred Lands, the Kaja Sundom and the Ban-Ur have reached far and wide, with everyone talking about the red-haired Nora Huntress who faced off against a demon and won. In this review, I'm going to be fully discussing and analysing all of the content in Horizon Forbidden West. This includes main story quests and all the relevant story points, the game's characters and themes, and all of the game's side content, including salvage contracts, hunting grounds, melee pits, gauntlet runs, the arena, rebel camps, rebel outposts, relic ruins, collectibles, machine strike, old world sites, sunken caverns, tall necks, cauldrons, and a few of my favourite side quests and errands. So, this video is most definitely going to be very long, very detailed, and very very packed with analysis of this game and hopefully by the end of the video you guys will be able to see why I love this game so much if you don't already love it yourself. But to be honest, I don't know why you'd be watching like an 11 hour video on Horizon Forbidden West if you didn't at least like the game enough to hear me talk about it for so long. So. Join me as we take a journey into the heart of the Tanakh clan lands, past the safety of the Kaja Sundom and the high walls of Meridian, to the sprawling landscapes of ancient Utah, across the unforgiving deserts of ancient Nevada, and towards the towering spires of ancient central California to find the Gaia backup and her subordinate functions in order to stop the blight spreading across Earth. Join me as we journey into the Forbidden West. Our story begins six months after the events of the ending of Horizon Zero Dawn. Hades is no longer a threat, the Eclipse is all but disbanded, and silence is nowhere to be found. Gaia's terraforming system has begun to fall apart, with a red blight spreading across the land, infecting animals, plants, crops, as well as huge supercell storms spreading across the land. 
meaning life on Earth is once again hanging in the balance, and so our heroic red-haired Huntress steps up to shoulder this great burden. Aloy has spent the last six months searching far and wide for the location of the Old World's facility that supposedly houses a backup of the super-intelligent AI known as Gaia, the only thing that can stop the collapse of the biosphere. Being a clone of Elizabeth Sobek, only Aloy has the capability to retrieve the Gaia backup and use it to save the planet, and so she's been searching on her own for the last six months for the location, exhausting all her leads. The only thing that keeps her going is the memory of Elizabeth Sobek, that this world is her legacy, and Aloy will do whatever she can to save it, to make sure that Project Zero Dawn wasn't all for nothing. We join Aloy exhausted and alone, and reaching the end of her tether, with one last lead left to explore. because of a terraforming system that's spiraling out of control. And only I can fix it. Only I have your genetic code. It won't be long before we hit the point of no return. And then... extinction. I've been searching for months for what I need. A backup of Gaia. The AIU designed to control the system. Same dream. I'm walking under a brilliant night sky, through a field of flowers. And when I arrive at the center, I see you, Elizabeth, waiting for me. Even though you've been dead for a thousand years. You're the closest person I've ever had to a mother. And for a moment, I feel whole. left alone. This world is your legacy, Elizabeth. I won't let it slip away. The valley below is my only remaining lead. My last hope to find the backup. I'll do whatever it takes to get it. I promise. Varl? <laughs> if it isn't Aloy, the savior of Meridian, anointed of the Nora. 
You know I hate being called that stuff. Well, consider it a punishment for running out on us the very same night we beat Hades. I grew up an outcast. Remember, I'm not much for parties. Yeah. But that one was in your honor. Just saying. So, what are we doing? Must be urgent since you left so fast. Delving into ancient ruins? Or maybe it has something to do with the Blight. Both, actually, but, um... I should... Oh, no. I've been tracking you a long way. It's okay. After everything you've done to help the Nora and my family, I swore an oath to help you, no matter what. But you're stuck with me now. Like bark on wood. Okay, but if you're going to come with me, you'll need to be able to see what I see. <sighs> A focus? Never thought I'd get your second sight. I'll give you another one later and show you how to back up your data. Data? Information on the device. We've got a lot to cover. Um, I'll have to explain everything as we go. You see like this all the time? Since I was a little girl. Come on. Shall we? Grapes on the way here. We should find some medicinal plants. Stock up. So it's time for your first lesson with the focus. Sounds good. Let's get started. Aloy's been tracked by her old friend Val. You may remember him from Horizon Zero Dawn. He was actually a relatively minor character in the first game. He was one of the first people that Aloy became friends with after her status as an outcast of the Nora tribe was rescinded. But this time around, Val is one of the major characters that will accompany Aloy on her journey. And I'm so glad they decided to introduce him as Aloy's traveling companion from the very beginning of the game here. The way they utilize Val in this game is absolutely brilliant and he quickly becomes such a beloved character. We'll talk more about him and his character arc as the game progresses. Aloy and Val are here to search the ruins of a facility for the Gaia backup. This is Aloy's last hope to repair the terraforming system that would heal the world and save humanity. The two Nora make their way through the jungle and towards the ruins. The ruins themselves are what's left of an ancient launch facility, built by the organization Far Zenith, a consort of the world's wealthiest people before the Faro Plague wiped out humanity. The entrance to the facility is blocked by the first of many of the new types of machines, the Burrower. This machine is pretty much a watcher from Zero Dawn, but it can burrow underground to evade your attacks. This is our first taste of combat in Horizon Forbidden West, and although there are still many tough fights ahead of us, these burrowers allow us to get to grips with the combat system. As to be expected, the ranged combat feels almost entirely identical to Zero Dawn, just a lot smoother and tighter. I'll talk more in depth about the combat later when we come across more machines, unlock some more abilities, and obtain new weapons. Defeating the burrowers, Aloy and Val head deeper into the facility in search of Gaia. Upon entering the building, a hologram is still working at the front desk. Upon activating the console in front of the desk, the hologram says, Please hold for identiscan. Access denied. Please wait here for personnel to assist you, Dr. Sobek. Which clearly indicates that Far Zenith didn't have a particularly cordial relationship with Elizabeth Sobek. Which brings up the question, if they didn't have a good relationship with Sobek, why would they have a Gaia backup in the first place? Aloy pries open the door to the facility, and we find some abandoned Osiram climbing gear, followed by an entire massacred camp of Osiram Delvers. Whatever killed these Delvers also destroyed part of the facility, 
as you can see huge holes in the wall and ceiling, as if something huge crashed right through the camp. Rubble's blocking the way deeper into the facility, so Aloy needs a way to dislodge the debris. Val finds some sort of Osaram prototype grappling hook, but it's in disrepair. If it can be fixed, Aloy could use it to pull the debris out of the way. The two check the camp for supplies that could be used to repair the tool, and Aloy uses the workbench to put the pieces together. As you can see, this is one of four important pieces of special gear that Aloy will acquire during her adventures in Forbidden West, the pull caster. This device can be used to latch onto and pull objects such as crates and debris, as well as grappling to specific points in the world. This is a very important piece of gear for puzzles, and it also really adds a nice layer of verticality to Forbidden West climbing system. The workbench itself is also a very important part of Forbidden West gameplay loop. It can be used to craft ammo, other types of special gear, potions, and traps. It also allows you to upgrade weapons and armor using the resources you loot from machines you encounter in the open world. Upgrading will eventually become important, but only when you acquire armor sets and weapons that you know are worth the materials to upgrade. For example, it's not really worth upgrading your starting gear, but once you come across very rare or even legendary weapons and armor, I'd say it's worthwhile upgrading them to their maximum if you're particularly interested into specking into certain builds. But I'm getting way ahead of myself here. My point is the workbench is a very important utility and you'll find yourself crafting a fair amount in this game. Aloy crafts her new pull caster and uses it on the debris, pulling out of the way with ease. As I said, the pull caster is an integral tool in your arsenal and it will get plenty more use throughout the course of our journey through the Forbidden West. Moving further into the facility, Aloy uses her pull caster to climb higher up, parkouring around the large room in order to drop a ladder for Val on the other side. Beyond the door is the auditorium, in which we get our first true chunk of knowledge about Far Zenith and what it was they were doing. Humans, Homo sapiens, us. We have always pushed the boundary as explorers, pioneers, trailblazers. And now Far Zenith is taking the next leap into the future. That's why we're proud to have resurrected the Odyssey. When our governments abandoned in orbit, Far Zenith will actualize in less than a decade. But that's only the beginning. When the ship is complete, we will send the Odyssey and her crew where no one's gone before. The Sirius system. There, we'll create humanity's first off-world colony. The Odyssey may take 300 years to reach it. But when we look up at the night sky, we'll know they're on their way. And in the words of our founder, the late Peter Shinvumbe, the truest form of immortality is data corrupt. The playback stopped. The old ones could fly through the sky? Between the stars? Uh, well, yes, sort of. That ship, the Odyssey, it, it never made it to the other star. Something went wrong, and it blew up. Is that why Elizabeth gave them a backup of Gaia? For a colony? Public presentation file corrupted. Member recruitment file available. Do you wish to reactivate? Yeah, reactivate. Let's see what else they had to say. We all know the projections. Economic instability, new biocontagions, rampant AIs. How long before another catastrophe creates unacceptable risk for the world's elite? We here at Far Zenith believe, escape the inevitable. And so we reach for the stars. Now you've seen what we're building here. Infrastructure to support the Odyssey's construction. 
a state-of-the-art data center to facilitate rapid technological advancements. And you've seen how we're managing public perception. So invest and join us. Claim your birth on the Odyssey. Preserve your way of life beyond the concerns of Earth. Well, they were right about the world ending. They just didn't know how... yet. So everything they said back there about the next step for humanity... it was all a lie. These people only cared about saving their own skin. Yeah, well, didn't work out for them in the end. That Oswald guy mentioned a data center. There, the backup. It should be stored in there. Won't be able to swim across. I guess we'll have to find a way around. Come on. Heading deeper into the ruins and towards the data center, it becomes evident that Val and Aloy are not alone. The facility is clearly home to a very large type of machine, but it hasn't realized they're there. Yet. I must say I enjoyed the classic action-adventure style gameplay of this section, coming across enemies to take down either stealthily or in a fight, using the pullcaster in conjunction with parkour to navigate the ruins, and exploring to find alternate areas that contain extra items. It's all really engaging, even if it's simple. It reminds me of level design in more linear games like Uncharted, The Last of Us, or God of War, being a nice linear section that focuses on immersion and storytelling. This linear structure does such a good job of easing you back into playing as Aloy. And after fighting some more burrowers, climbing to higher ground and exploring around, Aloy and Val find themselves in a large meeting room, with the console in the centre. Onzu. The Zero Dawn terraforming system, the brainchild of Dr. Elizabeth Sobek, empowered by nine subordinate functions, Gaia, the core of the system, is capable of advanced planetary engineering, an obvious advantage to our space colonization efforts. Operation Phase 1. Establish an asset within Project Zero Dawn. Status complete. Phase 2. The asset will secretly beamcast a complete copy of Gaia and her subordinate functions to this facility's data center. If all goes well, Zero Dawn staff will remain completely unaware of the transmission. Risks. Discovery of this operation could result in Zero Dawn withholding the already negotiated Apollo database. Special care must be taken not to alert Travis Tate, the expert hacker in charge of Hades protocol. In addition, extreme caution must be exercised in regards to Dr. Sobek herself. As one of the world's preeminent technologists, she may have instituted unforeseen security measures. A complete assessment is attached. This concludes the executive summary. I thought Elizabeth sent the backup here, but she didn't. Far Zenith stole Gaia. Aloy, why does that woman look like you? Uh, um, it's okay, Paul. We look alike because we're the exact same, genetically identical. But she was one of the old ones. How can you be her? Because I wasn't born. I was made by a machine. It's why I'm motherless, why I was cast out as an infant. I don't understand. What kind of machine can make a person? Remember when I said the backup? is like a set of instructions. It's more than that. It's called Gaia. And for a long time, she cared for the world until she had to destroy herself. So she made me to bring her back. I'm the only one who can. And this place is my last hope. You once said the goddess spoke to you when you went into All Mother Mountain. Was that this Gaia? Yes, but she's not the goddess, Oral. 
there isn't one. How can you be sure? It sounds like she anointed you with a sacred task. <sighs> I've had a lot of time to figure this out. And you will too, with the focus. But for now, the reports said they were going to store the stolen copy of Gaia in the data center. So that's where we have to go. Okay? The dialogue during this section between Aloy and Val is so good. For us, it's common knowledge that Aloy is a genetically exact clone of Elizabeth Sobek, but Val had no idea, so his genuine confusion and exasperation at the news really goes to show how little he knows about everything that's happening in the larger world. His reaction also kinda reminded me of myself when I was first playing Horizon Zero Dawn and we discovered that Aloy is a clone of Sobek. That reveal was just so crazy, and I'm sure Val is going through the same confusion at that revelation as I did back in 2017. Scene. Although, maybe on a larger scale, because he's not playing a video game. From his fictional perspective, this is all real. It must be pretty startling to discover that one of your closest friends is actually a clone of a woman who lived over a thousand years ago. It's also revealed that Far Zenith stole a copy of Gaia without Elizabeth or anyone involved with the Zero Dawn project knowing about it, which must mean that the copy of Gaia is in fact within the data center of the Far Zenith launch facility, and Aloy and Val need to secure it as soon as possible. After fighting a few more groups of machines and venturing further into the ruins, Aloy and Val climb to the top of a nearby observation deck, coming face to face with the large machines that have been stalking us the entire time we've been here. Three snake-like machines called Slitherfangs are on the ground below, and they're blocking the way to the data center. At this point in the game, there's no way Aloy is going to be able to take down three of these at once on her own, so she comes up with the plan to drop the ancient Far Zenith spacecraft on top of them. She just needs to find a way onto the platform that the ship hangs from so she can cut the cables holding it in place. Splitting away from Val, Aloy rappels down to the ground and begins to sneak her way through the area, past the patrolling machines and up towards the tower. Upon reaching the base of the tower, you have this really fun climbing section in which you need to find your way to the top using the various handholds, grapple spots and platforms. The climbing mechanics in this game are also a lot more responsive and a lot more freeform, which makes it so much more enjoyable to do parkour sections like this. Climbing higher allows Aloy to use the nearby zipline, which leads to the spacecraft dock. At the top, Aloy notes that there are large metal clamps and a few cables holding the ship in place. All that's left now is the fun part, releasing the clamps by activating the console and climbing to the very top of the structure to shoot the remaining cables. Shooting the cables will drop the ship on top of the machines below. This sequence is so tense. As Aloy activates the console to release the clamps and realises that the cables are still attaching the ship to its dock and then frantically climbing higher to shoot the cables off. This whole section of gameplay perfectly makes use of its environment and constantly has Aloy interacting with the environment to reach her goal. It's just brilliant and it all comes to a head with Aloy finally detaching the ship from its dock and dropping it onto the Slitherfangs. Finally, the only thing standing in the way of the data center is this one last Slitherfang. Luckily for us, it's pinned down by the weight of the spacecraft and is unable to use all of its power. This is technically one of the game's various boss fights. You're in an enclosed area, and to progress to the next area, you have to defeat this enemy. Plus, it's got a largely inflated health bar. Coming face to face with such a formidable enemy so early in the game is quite intimidating, but it greatly sets the precedent for some of the new machines that will be introduced over the course of this game. I remember this fight actually being pretty challenging, not only because the Slitherfang is actually a tough enemy, but also because my skills at Horizon Combat were pretty rusty. 
It's one of those combat systems that really does get a lot easier the more you play, and my aim was certainly a lot better by the end of this game than it was at this point. A great rule of thumb when fighting an enemy that you haven't fought before is to use your focus to scan the machine and see which parts of it are weak, whether it has any detachable weapons or if it has some sort of explosive that can be exploited to deal lots of damage in a quick burst. The Slither Fang in particular does have an explosive sack that can be blown up if you deal enough damage. This in turn will cause the machine to take acid damage which deals damage over time. It's good to assess machines with the focus focus before engaging so that you can better exploit their weaknesses. The Slither Fang has lots of different parts and weaknesses, so it's a great machine to teach players that scanning a machine's components is a very important part of the game's combat. There are also a couple heavy weapons in this boss arena that can be used to deal large amounts of damage, which also teaches you to be aware of your surroundings. Don't just scan the machine with your focus, scan the environment too. There are always plenty of things you can use to your advantage, which can be useful in a fight, whether that be explosive containers, environmental traps, or powerful heavy machine weapons like in this case. Overall, this is a really solid fight, and a great introduction into fighting some of the stronger machines in this game. After fighting this machine, you normally get enough XP to level up, which awards you with your first skill point. Skill points can be invested into one of six skill trees, Warrior, Trapper, Hunter, Survivor, Infiltrator, and Machine Master. The skill trees are actually quite extensive in Horizon Forbidden West, way more so than the ones in Zero Dawn. I will admit, this does lead to some skills feeling like filler in a way, skills that you only unlock so you can get to the one after it. Most of the smaller skills are just passive boosts, more focus for concentration aiming, berries restore more health, silent strikes do slightly more damage, that sort of thing. The standout things to me that the skill trees have in Forbidden West are weapon techniques, active skills, and valor surges. Weapon techniques are specific abilities that allow Aloy to perform special attacks with the weapons in her arsenal. For example, you can get the triple notch ability for the Hunter Bow, which allows Aloy to knock three arrows at once. The Braced Shot, which shoots a charged, heavy-hitting explosive arrow from the Sharpshot Bow. The Sustained Fire, which unleashes an entire mag of Bolt Blaster ammo all in one continuous barrage. And one of my favourites, the propelled spike, which launches a rocket propelled spike that explodes on impact. There's so many different types of weapon techniques, and there's three for each weapon. Weapon techniques are such a versatile addition to your abilities in Forbidden West once you get used to the flow of gameplay. But there's a catch. To use a weapon technique, you must use some of your stamina meter, which is the orange bar in the bottom right corner. It charges gradually over time, but you can also use potions to regain stamina immediately. I recommend keeping a few focus potions in your inventory if you like using weapon techniques, as some of them cost quite a bit of stamina. Once you get used to managing your stamina bar, as well as actually switching between weapon techniques on your weapon wheel, they're such a welcome addition to the game's combat and add an entirely new layer of power for Aloy to achieve. Secondly, we have Valor Surges. Think of these as your super ability. You can only have one equipped at a time, but there are plenty of varieties that suit many different playstyles and many different situations, so it's good to switch every now and then to a Valor Surge that suits your situation the best. For example, if I knew they were going to be powerful machines, I'd switch to a more combat-oriented Valor Surge, such as the Overshield or Ranged Master. If I knew I was going to be using Stealth, I would switch to the Stealth Stalker Valor Surge. Similarly, if I knew I was going to be using melee combat, I'd equip either melee might or the radial blast valor surge. There are so many abilities and I actually used a decent amount of the valor surges throughout the game. Although I usually had over shield on as a default, not only because I'm a huge fan of the whole shield weaver look from Horizon Zero Dawn, but it's a very versatile valor surge which is useful against machine attacks, ranged arrow attacks, melee attacks and elemental attacks. It's a great thing to be able to fall back on to buff yourself. If you want to go all out defense, you can pair it with the shield wire ammo which allows you to place a shield barrier on the ground. This was actually a particularly fun playstyle and it worked pretty well against ranged enemies and smaller machines. The overshield is definitely my favourite valor search, but I did find myself switching between them to better suit my situation, because a shield isn't always going to be useful. I actually wish they gave us the ability in the late game to be able to equip two Valor Surges at once. It would save you having to switch in the menu every time your situation changes from combat to stealth, meaning I could equip my Overshield and Stealth Stalker Valor Surges at the same time. It would just save me that little bit of extra effort. But it could also mean that you could double up your offensive capabilities by pairing Ranged Master with Radial Blast for example. I just think two Valor Surges at once would open up possibilities for some really fun builds. Maybe in the next game, Aloy will be strong enough to do this. Lastly, we we have the active skill trees for each of the different skill trees in Forbidden West. Active skills are important skills that both directly and passively affect gameplay. The hunter skill tree only has one active skill called Workbench Expert, which allows Aloy to craft more ammunition using less resources at a workbench than she would be able to in the wild. This makes it actually a good idea to go to a workbench when you need to refresh your ammo supply. Ammo is nowhere near as easy to craft as it is in Horizon Zero Dawn.
spawn, with some of the top end ammo costing some very expensive resources that you don't want to waste if you don't have to. So this skill is actually invaluable. The Infiltrator tree has no active skills, but Machine Master does. The Override Subroutine's active skill allows you to choose whether or not an overridden machine is aggressive or defensive. In concept, this sounds really useful. And it can be, but only on certain machines. If you plan on overriding a machine and using it as a mount, I'd steer clear of setting it to aggressive, because once you dismount, an aggressive machine will immediately run away to seek out an enemy to fight. This means that if you're trying to use stealth, your cover is immediately blown. I will say though, it is fun overriding the larger machines, and setting them to the aggressive mode means they don't stop going crazy until they either die or your override runs out. Although I will admit, it's usually easier to just fight machines yourself instead of getting a larger machine to do it for you. I normally use machine overrides as a distraction so I can pick off the remaining hostile machines while they're occupied. The over Override subroutine skill is an interesting idea and is useful in a few select circumstances, but overall I don't use machine overrides enough to fully realise its potential. The survivor skill tree has one active skill called Plant Forager, a really useful skill which just allows Aloy to gather more berries from plants. Obviously, this is one of those skills that you want to get as early as possible because it makes healing so much easier. And if you're like me who can't resist picking medicinal berry bushes, you'll end up finishing the game with thousands of berries in your stash. It means you'll never have to worry about healing ever again. Definitely one of the more useful skills in the game. Finally, we have the Warrior skill tree, which has the most active skills out of all the skill trees. It has eight in total. Horizon Forbidden West has a completely overhauled melee combat system, and it's leagues above Horizon Zero Dawn. The active skills in the Warrior skill tree act as combo upgrades, allowing Aloy to perform longer, more elaborate combos as well as powerful melee abilities. These new abilities include Aerial Slash, Jump Off, Block Breaker, Energy Surge, Half Moon Slash, Nora Warrior, Resonator Blast, Spinning Scythe, and the Destroyer. These new abilities really spice up melee combat, allowing you to chain together all sorts of different combinations of moves. For example, the Jump Off can be used to propel yourself off of an opponent, creating distance between you and your enemy. The Half Moon Slash is used to transition into a new combo, but can also be used as a way to close distance quickly. The Nora Warrior is a powerful combo that deals a lot of damage in a short burst, and the Energy Surge can be unleashed once you've built up enough energy within your spear, making it glow blue. Meaning that when you hit someone with a heavy attack, it transfers the energy from your spear to that part of the body that was hit. Shooting the tag spot unleashes an energy explosion that deals massive damage and knocks enemies down. These are only a few of the potential combos you can perform, and once you've got used to all of them, you can really start to string together combos and get creative with your melee combat. We'll discuss the melee combat in more detail when we begin discussing the melee pit side content, but that won't be for a while now, so it's time for us to get back to the main story. Right, that was a long tangent to go on, but I thought it was important to discuss the game's skill trees. It's a big part of your power progression in Forbidden West. Where we left off in the direct story of Forbidden West, Aloy had just defeated the remaining Slitherfang, so it's time to venture further into the Far Zenith launch facility to recover the Gaia backup and meet back up with Val. Aloy climbs back into the facility and makes her way through the cold metal doors of the data center, the last hurdle before reaching Gaia. Here. Gaia version 6.9. Initializing. Hello. Hi. Elizabeth? Uh, Travis Tate. Now, what's this we got here? A far as in the conspiracy to steal a copy of Gaia? And her subordinate functions? Naughty, naughty. You want me to handle this, Liz? Blasphemers! Brood of vipers! With a mighty hand, I smite and pour troubles upon you! Hey, 
Aloy? The goddess. There is no goddess. I told you that already. That's not Gaia. That's not what I'm looking for. It's nothing but a fake. sometimes you know but it was pretty amazing to see you fly off that tower and blow up the entire basin the thing is um there's going to be more of that i'm out of leads Farl. but i i have to keep searching and fast and whatever risks i have to take i will and it doesn't make sense to have someone with me someone who might get hurt this is on me Farl. Nobody else. Hold on. Before, in Meridian, you said there was a man who helped you. Silence. You said you used to talk to him a lot about things you discovered from the old world, things no one else understands. And he gave you the lance you used to defeat Hades. He's gone, Varl. I haven't heard from him since the battle against Hades. Sure, but Spymaster Murad back in Meridian, he's good at finding people, isn't he? Varl, I... Come on, it might work. Plus, you'll get to see some friendly faces again. Okay. I... I guess it's worth a shot. We've got a long walk ahead. Actually... I've got a better idea. You know when I said that Far Zenith did in fact steal a copy of Gaia without Elizabeth or anyone involved in the Zero Dawn project knowing it, which means the copy of Gaia is in fact in the data center of the Far Zenith launch facility? Yeah, I lied. They weren't able to successfully steal Gaia because Elizabeth Sobek and Travis Tate were always two steps ahead. You don't really think that Elizabeth Sobek herself would be fooled that easily, do you? Although, this isn't good news for Aloy as she has now exhausted all of her leads and finds herself in a dire situation. The land is dying, people are starving, storms are ravaging the land, all leads connecting to Gaia have gone cold and Aloy has failed. This is the lowest point of Aloy's journey, but Val is there to pick her up and dust her off. With no leads remaining, Val suggests that Aloy searches for the Sage. Silence. He gave her the spear to defeat Hades, and he knows more than anyone else about the old world. He's the only person capable of helping Aloy find the Gaia backup. Val convinces Aloy to come back to Meridian with him to speak to Spymaster Marad, the Sun King's advisor. He's notoriously good at finding people, and maybe he can help. And so the two Nora hunters mount a couple of charges and make their way back to the Sundom in order to return to Meridian. Savior of Meridian has returned. You earned this welcome. You saved them. Not yet. In the name of the Sun King of Vard, a royal welcome for the champion. Make way. Murad, Aloy has an urgent matter to discuss. Dashin, that makes two of us. I've sent forth hunters for weeks. The sun fall all the way to the sacred land, searching for you. Something happened at the spire. Come. I'll show you. Watch your step. You saved us all, to be sure, but... Uh, 
We're still cleaning up the mess. It happened right after the solstice. We were able to explain it away, thank the sun. Otherwise, it might have caused a panic. One night, for less than half a minute, it glowed an angry red. From Meridian, it looked like a trick of the light. But those who were closer, atop the light, said it could not have been a reflection. Much to my dismay, they said the light rose up from the tower's base. From that. We left everything just as it was. What do you think happened? I don't know. The Spire's supposed to send out signals, messages, for the terraforming system. But Hades tried to use it to wake up ancient war machines. I was sure I got the connection to that thing. Wait here while I check it out. Let us know what you find. Aloy is heralded as a hero as she returns to Meridian. The people owe her their lives. However, they are blissfully unaware of the newest threat to their safety, the rapidly spreading red blight and unstable weather conditions, as well as the full collapse of the biosphere. Aloy is greeted by Spymaster Marad, and he leads them to the spire in the outskirts of Meridian, where something concerning recently happened. If you remember the post credit scene of Horizon Zero Dawn, you'd remember Hades flying into the sky out of the Horus processing unit and Silence capturing it in a small device. Well, Everyone in Meridian saw the huge beam of light come out, and they saw Hades fly across the sky. That's why they've been searching for Aloy for so long, to see if she knows more about what happened. Aloy approaches the orb and pulls the spear out of its core, the same spear that Silence gave her to defeat Hades at the end of Horizon Zero Dawn. Secretly, Silence used this spear to transmit Hades from the Horus processor and into his device, using the spire as a transmission link. A red signal like the one that Hades emitted in the post credit scene of Horizon Zero Dawn comes out of the spear and makes its way up to the top of the spire, indicating that the spire is the key and it will lead Aloy to wherever the transmission was sent. Obviously, given the fact that Silence gave Aloy the spear to begin with, it's clear to Aloy that Silence was the one that sent this transmission, meaning if she wants to speak to him, she's got to find out where the transmission is headed. Aloy then uses the handholds on the tower's exterior to climb up and finds a way inside, using the maintenance elevator to reach the very top. An elevator? Let's see. Access lift activated. Lucky day. Engaging maintenance configuration. Wonder what the Karja will make of this. I see you finally figured it out. To be honest, I am surprised it took you so long to discover my rules. You read the lands to steal Hades. How could you be so reckless? Reckless? You're the one who tried to purge Hades before its precious knowledge could be extracted. The mysterious signal that woke it, for example. But why don't you one of those Gaia backups you've been having such a hard time finding? If you knew, why didn't you just tell me? I've been having problems of my own these past six months, Eloy. The difference is, I've made progress. So once your anger at my entirely necessary deception has faded, 
Now why don't you come out here and find me in the Forbidden West and learn all that I've discovered? Oh, I'll go find you, all right. Yes. Well, the coordinates should make it simple enough. Even for you. It's nice to hear from Silence again after so long. Even if he is as smug and condescending as usual, he directly asks Aloy to find him in the Forbidden West. The beacon from the tower leads to specific coordinates, and Aloy has no other choice than to go and find him. She lets Val and Marad know what she found, and her plans to head towards the Forbidden West. Marad warns her that the Forbidden West is home to the Tanakh, a fierce and violent people. They don't let any outlanders cross their borders without explicit permission, and any trespasser on their land will be met with immediate force. However, King Avad has been able to negotiate somewhat of a peace treaty with the tribe, and their next embassy begins in a day or two. If Aloy and Val were to attend, the Tanakh may grant them passage into the Forbidden West. Sun King Avad arrives moments later, bearing gifts for Aloy, a new golden spear and headpiece presented to her by none other than Vanasha and Uthid, two characters prominent in the Kaja related quest lines in Horizon Zero Dawn. It was a really nice moment to see these two again, and being able to speak to them. In fact, I appreciate it so much that we get to somewhat return to Meridian in this game. Yeah, we don't get to explore the city, but we get to see returning characters, and they even bring back a reprised version of the Meridian daytime theme music, which was so nice to hear again. It gave me goosebumps after not having heard it for a long time. I love the attention to detail. You can choose to speak to Uthid, Vanasha, and Avad to discuss what's been happening since she last saw them after the Battle of Meridian. The Sun King even had a statue of Aloy erected in honour of her victory as the saviour of Meridian. As we know, he admires her a lot. Aloy, on the other hand, was not so pleased to hear this, as we know she doesn't enjoy being admired or revered for what she does, a trait clearly bestowed upon her by Elizabeth Sobek. Avad also sheds some more light on the relationship between the Kaja and the Tanakh. Thirteenth Sun King committed countless atrocities against the Tanakh and the two factions were at war for a long time. The conflict ended with the Tanakh and a neighbouring tribe, the Utaru, pushing the Kaja forces out of the Forbidden West and back to Barren Light, the settlement that serves as a border between the Tanakh and Kaja territory. Since then, tensions between the two factions have been high. Avad has slowly tried to appease them, to show that he actually wants lasting peace unlike his father. The upcoming embassy is the most important meeting between the Kaja and Tanakh yet, in which the two groups will discuss matters of peace, which is why it's so crucial that it goes smoothly. Whilst catching up with Uthid and Vanasha, as well as Prince Itaman, who Aloy saved from the Eclipse with the help of Vanasha in a quest in Zero Dawn, it's really nice to hear some exposition about the aftermath of the Battle of Meridian and what happened to the remaining Eclipse after Hades was defeated. It helps you fill in the gaps of the six month time jump between the games and also shows that Gorilla hasn't just forgotten about the events of the last game. In fact, this game constantly references things that happened in Zero Dawn, which I'm a big fan of, as the game doesn't try to remain as vague as possible to appeal to new players that may have skipped the first one. It just assumes you've already played it, which is how it should be. As I said, it's unapologetically a sequel. It's also really wholesome that Vanasha and Uthid have a little thing going on together. I think they make a great pair and their flirtatious dialogue's pretty funny, especially given that Vanasha is fiery and sarcastic, compared to Uthid's more reserved and serious personality. Opposites attract, I guess. After speaking with her friends, Aloy attaches the Master Override to her new spear and speaks to Marad once again who offers her a place to rest in Meridian while she waits for the embassy. Finally, Aloy and Val retire to their accommodation and turn in for the night. Of course, in classic Aloy fashion, not wanting to endanger her friend with the burden that lays ahead of them, she leaves alone at the break of dawn while Val is sleeping, mounts her charger, and sets off to leave Meridian towards the untamed lands of the Forbidden West. I just want to say that this next sequence is quite possibly one of my favourite opening and title card drops in any video game. The beautifully performed piece of music that plays throughout, as well as the shots of Aloy travelling across all the areas we saw in Zero Dawn, it feels like a victory lap, saying goodbye to the first game and turning our gaze to new lands.
to steal. Ha! Never seen anyone use one of those to get around. Is that how I get to Baron Light? Uh, yes, I mean usually, but not today. Uh, not yet. And why is that? Well, the Daunt. The whole valley. It's infested with machines. I can handle machines. Oh, I'm sure you can, but uh, I'm under strict orders not to operate until the whistle down at Chain Scrape sounds the all clear. Look, I didn't come all this way just to stand around and wait. I'll crank that car down myself if I have to. Well, but then who would crank it back up? <laughs> fine, fine. Though, should anyone ask, it might be best to say you forced me. After a long journey, Aloy finds herself right near the border between Kaja and Tanakh territory, greeted by a lone Osirum, whose sole job is to operate the lift system that leads down to the valley below. The man is under strict orders from the leader of the nearby village, Chainscrape, to not operate the system until the machines that are infesting the valley are dealt with. Aloy insists that she needs to get down to the Daunt regardless, even if it means commandeering the lift herself. Ultimately, the lift operator relents, allowing her passage through, and they begin their descent. On the way down, he explains that a herd of bristlebacks, a non-native type of machine, appeared in the Daunt a day ago, 
and Chainscrape's self-appointed leader, Ulvund, has declared a work stoppage until the machines are dealt with. He also mentions that the embassy is also on hold until the bristlebacks are gone. The Kaja Sun Priest, who is to lead the embassy on behalf of the Kaja, refuses to make the journey through the Daunt to the Kaja settlement Baron Light until the bristlebacks blocking the way are cleared. This means that it's now in Aloy's best interest to try to solve the situation, and clear the way for the Sun Priest. If you don't do as I say immediately, the Sun King himself shall hear of your insolence. Thanks to you, I was forced to spend the night shivering in the tent. Exposed to attack, I might have died. Oh, me you refuse to transport, but not this... This... What? This Nora girl? This savage? Besides Scallywag? Wadis, that's Aloy. Studious Wadis. Aloy? You know, savior of Meridian? Really? Well, that lessens the insult, I suppose. I came here for the Embassy of Baron Light. Way I hear it, so did you. Well, not with the valley infested. And so did Aramon proclaim the Sun Priests most precious and worthy of safekeeping. See, Scripture. I shall head to Baron Light when the captain of the Vanguard tells me the way is clear, and not a moment sooner. Fine. Captain's a friend of mine, you know? Where is Erend? Wouldn't mind speaking to someone a little more action, a little less scroll. Vadis. Studious Vadis. Studious. Wadi sent Aaron and another vanguard out at daybreak to clear the way. And so at daybreak. Hey! Shh. Down the valley then? Yeah, said they check the ruins on the left bank for tracks. Take it from there. Okay. I hear there's a work stoppage. Any way to upgrade my gear? I'll bet the Smith and Chain Scrape would let you use his workbench. As for the bristlebacks, you might want to craft some acid arrows. Hitting their canisters with those will take them down quick. Thanks. I'll find Aaron and I'll bring him back. Hey! Where do you think you're going? What? To the top of the ridge. To wait in safety. Sorry. Operators under strict orders. No passengers till the whistle blows, right? That's right. <laughs> Best start cranking. <laughs> Why? Why? Jorf, would you kindly escort Studious to Chain Scrape and wait for me there? You got it. I will find Erend, and I will help clear a path. But after that, no more excuses. Baron Light. Embassy. If such be the will of the sun... It will be. Trust me. I really like how Aloy deals with the Sun Priest in this cutscene. She had to deal with her fair share of radical religious zealots in Horizon Zero Dawn, so she knows how to shut these pretentious people up. I also like how halfway through the cutscene, the Osram soldier Jorof starts giving Aloy random gameplay tips like craft acid arrows and shoot their canisters. It's always funny to me when games attempt to incorporate subtle gameplay hints into the context of dialogue and cutscenes, I don't know why. I guess it stands out more because acid weapons are actually a new thing in this game. In Horizon Zero Dawn, the weapons with the green swirl icon were actually corruption weapons that would cause enemies to become hostile and attack anything in their vicinity. Anyway, our current goal is to find Erend, who many of you may remember as the charismatic Osram warrior that Aloy first meets in Mother's Watch before the proving all the way back at the beginning of Horizon Zero Dawn. Erend is the first true friend that Aloy makes after being allowed back into the embrace of the Nora, so of course it's great to see him return to the Forbidden West. Aloy heads to where Erend was last seen, finds his tracks, and follows them until she finds him fighting some bristlebacks, clearly trying to help hunt them out of the dawn. When he sees Aloy, he's so surprised that he momentarily loses focus and is injured pretty badly by one of the bristlebacks. This is where we come in. Aloy takes on the rest of the machines, scrapping them with ease, and after the fight, Aloy speaks with Eren for the first time in six months after the Battle of Meridian. Oh, yeah. Caught me in my best, as usual. Well, you did the hard part. I just took care of the stragglers. How bad is it? Uh, this? Ah, who needs ribs, huh? <laughs> oh. oh, I'm good. I'm good. Huh. Okay, well, I, I know you didn't come all the way to the Daunt just to watch me get wrecked. But what's the story? 
I need the embassy to happen. So I can head west. Errand, what I did at the Spire... What we did... It didn't end the threat. It just slowed it down. There's still more to do. Really? <laughs> well, that's great! I, I mean, yeah, not the threat's not over part. That's not so great. But, but hey, what? Whatever you're up against, your spear, my hammer, just like old times. Oh. Errand, I need the embassy now. I can't wait for you to heal. A couple of days rest, if that. Actually, even if you weren't hurt, what I have to do, it's... It's better if I do it alone. Alone? <laughs> now that figures. Oh. Errand! I hate to interrupt the romance, but I'm pretty banged up here. I don't blow your blaze, I'm coming. Oh, this just keeps getting better. Huh. Listen, I'll go to Baron Light, get patched up. If you want this embassy to happen, we're gonna need this sun priest, Studius Wadis. Oh, I know him. I'll clear the Valley of Bristlebacks, then send Wadis to Baron Light. I'll catch up with you there. Well, I guess that's sort of like a goodbye. I'm sorry? You? Sorry? <laughs> yeah, that'd be a first. Where is this coming from? Hey, just, you know, forget it, yeah. Oh, it's nothing. It sounds like something. All right, fine. Now, after the battle at the Spire, you, you took off. You left without so much as a handshake. I mean, people like me, we fought and bled at your side, Aloy. You just, or you just disappear? What kind of person does that? Aaron, look. I'm sorry it wasn't easy for you when I left. And I know it's not easy now, but... What I've been doing... Life on Earth is in danger. And only I can save it. Your life on Earth? Yeah. Everything dies unless I succeed. Well, then let me help. Oh. You can't. There's no machine to fight, no bad guy to kill. What I've got to do, I... I can't even explain it. Not even to people I care about. Oh, so much for being useful. Okay. Errand! By the forge. I guess that's my cue. Maybe I should go with you to Baron Light. No, no, hey, you're needed elsewhere. Obviously. We'll make it without you. This cutscene is actually great. Erin is clearly upset about Aloy's six month disappearance, and understandably so, as it's strange to suddenly disappear after going through so much trouble to protect the people of Meridian. But Aloy's responsibility is so great that even those closest to her are currently unable to understand the weight of the task ahead of her. Due to her knowledge of the old world, the terraforming system, Gaia, Zero Dawn, Elizabeth Sobek, and now the Odyssey ship, Far Zenith, the Gaia backup, and the spreading of the blight, Aloy is on an entirely different level compared to her friends in Meridian, the Nora Sacred Lands. She's more similar to someone like Silence than she is to someone like Erend or Val, which is why it's so difficult to explain her situation to regular people who have little knowledge of the old world. If she were to tell them about the Gaia backup and the terraforming system, it only confused them, which is why she opted to act immediately and leave Meridian as soon as she found out about the Blight, opposed to staying and meticulously explaining the situation to everyone. I've always found this aspect of Aloy's character quite interesting. She's essentially living a double life, Life. One where she's the Nora Huntress, the saviour of Meridian and the anointed of the Nora, and another where she's the clone of Elizabeth Sobek with the Master Override, Alpha Prime Clearance, and the only person capable of understanding the mistakes of the old world in order to protect the new one. Of course, Erend is hurt by Aloy's cold actions, because he currently doesn't understand what she's up against because he only knows the one side of Aloy. I think in many ways, Aloy's character arc in this game is about the merging of these two aspects of her character, as she begins to share her knowledge of the old world with 
with her allies instead of trying to carry the burden alone. But this is something I'll get into a little bit later on, because right now we have far more relevant things to be talking about. Given that he's injured, Eren can't help Aloy, so he agrees to wait for her at Baron Light. Don't worry, we'll be catching up with Eren soon enough, just after we take out these bristlebacks. Just after talking to Eren, a series of explosions can be heard nearby. Aloy rushes over to find the residents of Chainscrape fighting off a large group of bristlebacks. Once again, Aloy enters the fray to deal with them. Yorif wasn't wrong though, these acid arrows are really useful. Just group the bristlebacks up and shoot a couple of these into those acid canisters and it really clears them out easily. And with that, the bristlebacks are gone. Pretty easy, right? I bet you were thinking this is going to be some needlessly drawn out quest to serve as an excuse to introduce Aloy to side content and the concept of settlements, but no. Bristlebacks are done and dusted and we can move on quite swiftly. Aloy finds Olvund and speaks to him because Vadis, the Sun Priest, refuses to leave the embassy until the whistle has been blown to signal that it's clear. It's obvious that Olvund is benefiting from Chainscrape being out of business. He has investors interested in his mining business, but they remain somewhat cautious as the Kaja could still technically revoke any Osram claims to their land. To remedy this, Ulvan planned to have the Kaja sign a concession decree that would protect any such claims. The Kaja's compliance in such a matter would require a strike, which Ulvan attempted to force by stirring up old resentments about the Red Raids, blaming the arrival of the Bristlebacks on the Kaja. So yeah, Ulvan's an asshole, but he agrees to blow the whistle nonetheless. What do you want, Ulvan? Some kind of payment? My dear magistrate, you think I can be bought? If you want that whistle blown, all you have to do is have your soldiers remove the bristlebacks and sign the concession decree. Face it, what other choice do you have? <clears throat> Hi. Savior, what auspicious timing. Might we discuss a matter of importance to the Sundom? We might. Later. Very well. I shall be waiting. So, the savior herself, Walloper of Durval, got her of use. Maybe. I've heard many tales of your beauty and heroics, my fierce lady warrior. Olfant Freehold, at your service. So, what could have dragged you away from the fine silks and wine of Meridian to this smudge of a settlement? Your saviorly attention must be needed elsewhere. I'm here for the embassy and- The embassy? Why, well, uh, by the forge. Ah, greater gears for greater matters. Guess that means you'll be moving on. Once I've dealt with any problems around here that need my saviorly attention. Ah, the bristlebacks, of course. Got to get rid of them if you want that embassy to take place. Well, best get to it, hey? And off you go. Not so fast. I cleared out all the bristlebacks. Oh, you did? Now that you've recovered from your shock, time to blow the whistle. Oh, there, not so fast. I'll have to send someone out to confirm the kills. Make sure the valley is safe again. It shouldn't take more than a day or two. <sighs> no, you blow the whistle now. These are innocent Osram lives we're talking about here. Surely the delay... Either you do it now, or I will. Ah, I knew you could do it! Friends, gather around. The savior of Meridian has done now it again. What? The bristlebacks are defeated! You. What? Sound the whistle. Chain scrape is open for business! And Olvind has agreed to personally pay every worker their lost wages. Yeah! That's where I like it! Yeah! Woo! Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah! Yeah! Don't you have an embassy to get to? Yeah. I guess I do. After the whistle's been blown, Chainscrape returns to normal, and the workers return to their jobs. This means that merchants are now available in Chainscrape, which is pretty useful. It means we could stock up on resources, buy new weapons, armor, and potions, as well as selling any valuables that we have for metal shards. Merchants are pretty self-explanatory, so I won't go into crazy amounts of detail, but the different types of vendors in this game are as follows. Hunting supplies where you can buy weapons, coils, and resources. Stitchers where you can buy new outfits, armors, and armor weaves. Herbalists where you can buy potions and ingredients 
ingredients for potion crafting, cooks where you can buy food which can be consumed for passive buffs, dyers where you can purchase new dyes for your armor, and face painters where you can apply a variety of face paints themed on the various tribes that Aloy's encountered. There are additional types of special vendors in the game, but we'll talk about those some other time. For now, I just wanted to highlight the general merchants that can be found in most major settlements. With the valley cleared, Vadis has no excuses not to proceed to Baron Light, but he refuses and demands to be escorted by all three of his escorts. Yorif ignores him and begins to head towards Baron Light anyway, leaving him with no choice but to follow. It's pretty funny. Finally, the embassy can get underway, and if all goes well, the Tanakh will grant Aloy passage into the Forbidden West and she can track down Silence, and maybe find the Gaia backup that the world so desperately needs. Aloy arrived in Baron Light, the last Karja outpost before the land becomes Tanakh territory. It was an integral place during the war between the Karja and the Tanakh. Before heading into Baron Light, Aloy takes the opportunity to restock, which also introduces us to the stash, a really useful feature that helps a ton with inventory management. Your stash is a place where you can store both important and unwanted items, sort items by type, rarity or relevance, as well as stockpile crafting materials. By the end of the game, I basically had all the materials I could want in my stash, meaning whenever I needed resources to craft ammo for example, all I had to do was return to my stash and grab what I needed, craft my ammo and be on my way. It's also useful to put items in your stash that you don't want to sell when you've been hunting machines, this way you can just bulk sell anything with value without having to worry about the important crafting materials, which are often very valuable. Your stash is also where all additional potions will go, so instead of crafting entirely new potions on the fly, check your stash to see if you've picked up any potions that weren't able to go into your inventory. They'll be sent straight to your stash. That's probably the most useful thing about the stash. Anything that cannot fit directly into your inventory will automatically be sent to your stash, meaning you can go crazy looting as much as you want and you won't have to worry about carry capacity or anything like that. You could argue this is unrealistic and immersion breaking, but honestly, it doesn't bother me that much. It just made my time playing the game so much more enjoyable. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. Aloy has finally reached Baron Light and intends to move further west into No Man's Land so she can attend the embassy and hopefully be granted passage into the Tanakh clan lands. The second in command at Baron Light, Lawan, leads Aloy to the garrison's commander, Nozar, who is waiting alongside Studius Vardis for the embassy to begin. The Kaja have signalled their horn to begin, but must wait for the Tanakh to do the same before the embassy can begin. Only two of the three Tanakh clans have raised their banners to signal that they're ready, however the third has not arrived yet which means everyone must wait until all parties are prepared. Aloy, being in a difficult situation and already frustrated at the constant holdups, insists that the embassy must start now regardless and attempts to pass the soldiers guarding the door to No Man's Land. Commander Nazar is adamant that Aloy should not be allowed through until a drunken Aaron gets involved and convinces him to let Aloy through by calling him a stupid bastard. Oh, and Val's back. He caught up with Aloy whilst she was busy clearing out the bristlebacks just in time to make the embassy. Although you'll all be sad to see his beard is gone, it was so short-lived. Rest in peace, Valsbeard. You'll be sorely missed. Aloy says her goodbyes to Eren and exits through the doors out of Baron Light. Finally, Aloy and Val have made it to No Man's Land, the line between East and West, which gives them the opportunity to finally speak to the Tanakh to ask them for passage through to the Forbidden West. Aloy's plan is to engage with the Tanakh and just ask them directly, even with tensions as high as they are moments before the embassy. Quite the bold plan. If it works, they'll be able to skip the formalities of the embassy altogether and continue on their journey to find silence and hopefully a lead on the Gaia backup. That is the line between East and West. Cross it and die. Hold on now. Let's take it easy. None may walk this valley until our signal sounds. That was our accord with the Karja. I'm not Karja. I came here on my own to ask for rite of passage. But they opened the gate for you, did they not? What is the meaning of this violation? Why send a child? Do they want to parley or not? The Karja can't be trusted. This is no. Forget the Karja. This has nothing to do with them. I need to go west to save lives. Maybe even yours. The only lives you can save are your own. By turning back. Now. Hold! She's telling the truth about one thing. She's not Karja. 
She's a Nora from the Savage East. And if she seeks to save lives, should we not listen? Let me speak to her. One last favor for a fellow marshal before he's taken away. Fearless, red-headed Nora. You must be the so-called savior of Meridian. Just Aloy. I am unyielding Fashav. Once of the Karja High Command, last of the Army of the Setting Sun. You're Fashav. The Vod gave me a message for you. That he waits for you in Meridian, where you belong. Hmm. <laughs> Avad always was polite. Well, now I'm even more curious about you knowing that you have the confidence of the Sun King. But, such an association with the Karja could work against you here, as it often has with me. As you can see, tensions are high. This embassy is a delicate affair. They're about to return me to the Sundom, a gesture that might help soothe painful grievances. And now you arrive, unheralded. I'm not here to cause trouble. I just need to go west. So you say. I might be able to help, but I need to know why. Along with some assurance that I won't regret it. Fashav is actually a really interesting character. He was born and raised in Meridian as the cousin of the now Sun King Avad. He spent much of his life in the libraries of priests and nobles, reading books about adventures in distant lands, taking a particular interest in the Forbidden West. As an adult, he enlisted as a soldier in the Kaja army and reached the rank of general becoming an influential military figure in charge of leading men into battle. During the Red Raids, he headed to the Forbidden West to try and quell the brutality of the Kaja military. His efforts were unsuccessful, and the slaughter of the Tanakh the Nutaru tribes continued. During the height of the Red Raids, Fashav was taken prisoner by the Tanakh during the Battle of Cinnabar Sands. He fought off the Tanakh to cover for the retreating Kaja soldiers, but was wounded badly and nearly bled to death before being taken to Chief Akaro at the Memorial Grove. Knowing a bit about Tanakh lore, Fashav demanded a Kulru, in the hopes of regaining his freedom through trial by combat. Karo accepted the challenge, and Fashav was able to emerge victorious by defeating a machine in the arena, although it wasn't without complications. Unbeknownst to him, winning the Kulrut meant becoming a marshal and serving Hikaru. For the next five years, Fashav served under Hikaru as a marshal, forming a mutual respect with the chief and appreciation for the Tanakh way of life. Fashav is happily living with the Tanakh, but has to return to the Sundom to speak with Avad so that he can further orchestrate peace between the two tribes, advocating for both sides. The player can actually find Fashav's diary entries in many of the larger Tanakh settlements. They detail his experiences travelling through the Tanakh lands, starting from his first assignment as a marshal all the way up until he barks. <laughs> all the way up until he barks. All the way up to until he embarks for the embassy. He discusses his perspectives on the Tanakh people, their culture and traditions, and his place amongst them as an outsider. It's a really interesting perspective from a really interesting character. Fashav is the one person who's most likely to be able to help Aloy gain access to the Forbidden West, and he's willing to help her, but only if she divulges more about what exactly she's fighting, and how she's going to save lives. You asked why I need Rite of Passage. I'll tell you, but you won't like my answer. Six months ago, the world almost ended in Meridian. That threat still exists. It's getting worse every day, much worse. Calling down storms, poisoning the water, enraging the machines. The source of it all has gone west, and I'm the only one who can stop it. I've seen the signs, and I've heard tales of incredible occurrences in Meridian, an army of demons vanquished by a red-haired champion. So I'm inclined to believe you. The burden of your task is written across your face clearer than any mark of mine. I'll grant you this, to serve as proof of your right to travel into Tanakh lands. A task so important, and it's just the two of you. Take it from one who aspires to be a diplomat. Allies are essential. Chief Akaro knows the West better than anyone. He may be able to help you. He can be intimidating to others, but don't let that deceive you. He is a man of his word. Maybe. 
if I need him. Your choice. You can find him at his palace, past the mountains to the southwest. Tell him I sent you, and he'll listen to Look! Me. The Sky Clan's banner! Marshals, it wasn't easy, but I brought the Sky Clan with me. And the commander? Uh, no. I could only convince a few. He isn't yet aware we left. We have banners from all three clans. If there are fewer from the Sky Clan, it can't be helped. He's right. Sound the horn. What's going on? Not all Tanakh can stomach the idea of parlay with the Kaja. But enough have come for us to begin. Then I'll be on my way. No. The other marshals will not permit it. You wanted safe passage, you have it. After. have opened the gates. As the sun rises over a land at war, so too can it set over a land at peace. Today is such... Hear me, marshals! You who claim to be Tanakh! Regala. Chief Akaro's biggest mistake. A rival whom he should have killed. You have forgotten that our people were born in blood. The blood of the Karja. Instead, you pledge your spears to a chief who conspires with the enemy. Hikaru has betrayed us. The embassy is proof. And all of you marshals are his accomplices. For this, I condemn you to death. You'll need more than toothless threats to intimidate us. Exile. Riding machines! Where'd they learn to do that? Silence. Vashav! Come with us now, or not at all! Archers! Light them up! Stand your ground! 
don't have a shot. As you've just seen, all hell has broken loose at the embassy. Only moments after it started, Commander Nozar, Studius Vadis, even Vashav, and many others were killed. Both Kaja and Tanakh. The one responsible is Regala, one of Chief Hikaro's former marshals, aided by her own army of overridden machines. Aloy suspects that Silence gave Regala and her rebels machine overrides, but it's unclear for what reason exactly. Aloy has no other choice but to defend what's left of the embassy. Much like the section at the beginning of Horizon Zero Dawn when the Proving gets attacked by Eclipse soldiers, Aloy is forced to defend herself against an onslaught of enemies, but this time, she's much more experienced compared to her younger self. Regala's rebels come bounding down, riding machines, brandishing their spears and charging towards the survivors of the ambush. Aloy makes quick work of them all, dismantling machines and killing Regala's men with ease. Most of the riders are riding bristlebacks, which we know quite well how to deal with at this point. After fighting back a good amount of Regala's forces, she sends in her champion to take out Aloy, clearly underestimating the abilities of our hero. I will admit, this guy is pretty tough on a first time playthrough, especially when you've not quite gotten to grips with the new melee system yet. This is actually the second boss battle in the game. As you can see, the champion's health bar is much bigger than most regular enemies, although this champion enemy archetype becomes a sort of mini-boss enemy that we'll see more of in the game's side content, particularly the rebel camps. The champion's fast moveset, punishing attacks and energy shield make it hard to penetrate his defences, but you can disable his shield which allows you to get more hits on him. I wasn't aware at the time, but it's actually easier to fight these guys with your spear as opposed to shooting a bunch of arrows into them. Once you unlock more of the warrior skill tree's active skills, melee combat becomes easily the most powerful option against all human enemies. And once you learn to mix your melee combos and ranged attacks fluently, human enemies really become a breeze to deal with. Finally, after a long fight with Regala's champion, Aloy of course is the victor, but the reality of the situation hasn't quite sunk in yet. Regala has officially declared war on Chief Ikaro, and the Tanakh now have a civil war on their hands. Your turn! Come down here and face me! No! It was an honorable challenge. You've earned your life today. Comrades! Mark this day! Today you have decimated the marshals! Slaughtered the Karja! So begins our war on Hikaru. Move out! Without me, aren't you? Guess I'm stuck with Aaron for now. Come on, I'll take you back to the fort.
The following morning, after recovering from the embassy, Aloy sets out from the western gates of Baron Light. Osiram salvagers have already started stripping the machines for parts to sell, and Aloy does a little bit of salvaging of her own. She takes the now damaged shield from the body of Regala's champion. It won't be able to be used as a shield anymore, but it can be used for gliding. This new piece of equipment is called the Shield Wing, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. Aloy has one last conversation with the now commander, Lawan, and he tells her that the true Tanakh territory lies beyond the mountains that border plain song, home of the Utaru tribe. Where they are standing isn't actually Tanakh territory, it's meant to be neutral ground. If Aloy wants to reach the Tanakh domain, she must head even further west through the mountains and past Plainsong. There is also lots of optional dialogue choices for Lawan. Far too much dialogue for me to go into in detail, but you can talk to him about Commander Nazar and Studious Wadi's tragic deaths, Fashav's death, Regala and her relationship with the rest of the Tanakh, the Red Raids in the West and how the United Clans of the Tanakh pushed the Kaja armies back to Baron Light. So yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Lawan also has lots of exposition on Tanakh culture, such as the three clans, the Desert Clan, the Sky Clan, and the Lowlands Clan. The Horizon games really nail these long conversations with all this branching dialogue. It's something we've seen particularly in the Frozen Wilds DLC where Aloy has a long branching conversation with Cyan, the AI found inside the Old World facility designed to regulate Yellowstone's volcanic activity. These conversations are something we will see more of in this game, and I find myself exhausting all of the dialogue options every time, because I find this game's world and lore so fascinating. With the dialogue done, Aloy has to be on her way. She says her farewell to Commander Lawan and waves goodbye to Erend and Val, who are waiting by the gates to Baron Light in the distance. With that, Aloy sets off further west towards the farmlands of Plainsong, the home of the peaceful Utaru tribe. Here we are, fully allowed out into the expanses of the Forbidden West for the first time. I think this is the perfect opportunity to talk about the world of Horizon Forbidden West as a whole. By this I mean the game's biomes, wildlife, the machines that reside in different areas of the map, and how the map itself is structured to carefully funnel the player into specific areas according to their progress in the story. I'm sure everyone's eager to get back into more of Aloy's journey, now that she's finally able to reach the coordinates that Silence gave her, but this video is also a review of the game as well as an analysis of the story. Considering we've just been out into the true open world for the first time, I think it's time I give you all a full and detailed overview of the Tanakh clan lands. The Forbidden West is split up into many biomes, much like the map of Horizon Zero Dawn. Guerrilla has actually mastered biomes in my opinion, with the map of Forbidden West filled with a variety of different terrains, foliage or lack thereof, climates and weather conditions. In the east of the map we have the Daunts, which is very similar to the areas in and around Meridian that we know so well from Horizon Zero Dawn. Deep valleys, towering cliff faces, rivers, oak trees and the distinctive dry grass and orange soil that we saw so much in Zero Dawn. Further southwest the land becomes a lot rockier, with more mountainous terrain, more sand and a lower density of trees. This biome also has a large lagoon to the south, which is home to many types of wildlife. To the north of the lagoon we have the farmlands of Plainsong and the village of Plainsong itself, as well as the surrounding forests and plains that encompass the region. This biome is very lush and green and despite the red blight afflicting parts of it when you first arrive here in game, it's a beautiful area. It's clear building the village itself took generations worth of plant growth. The peaceful tribe of the Utaru resides here, sticking to themselves and living in harmony with the land thanks to the machines that fertilize the soil around the village. Further west, across the first set of mountains that split up the areas of the map, we enter the deserts of the Forbidden West. This cluster of arid biomes is split up into two different deserts, with a rockier area of land which separates them. The rocky area is very harsh terrain and offers much less opportunities for plant life to grow. These desert biomes are also very prone to sandstorms, which lower your visibility greatly. The northern desert is the smaller of the two and has more mountainous regions on its borders. This desert is home to the Great Desert Clan and their settlement, Scalding Spear. Even living in a harsh environment such as a desert, they manage to endure and survive, a testament to just how hardy the Zanak people are. The southern desert is much larger and expansive, with plenty of huge sand dunes which cover the ruins of Las Vegas below. I won't go into this now because we will be exploring the ruins of Las Vegas later, but the quest in which you explore them is absolutely fascinating. 
and one of my personal favourites. This desert is also covered in machines, as various convoys regularly make their way through the area, making use of the wide open space to travel in large groups. To the very south of this desert, there's also a bandit camp which is situated underneath one of the colossal Horus machines that devastated the world during the Faro Plague. I found this pretty interesting, and it looks cool too. Across the final border of mountains and across the rocky terrain, we find ourselves in a much more lush biome, which is green and covered in trees. It's a large forest with winding rivers, waterfalls, and densely packed trees. Most importantly, this forest is where you can find the Tanakh settlement, the Memorial Grove. This is the capital of the Tanakh clanlands, situated roughly at the intersection of the three clans' territories. This is an important settlement, as it serves as the foundation for Tanakh culture, but we'll talk more about that later when we visit there ourselves. The large forest surrounding the Memorial Grove stretches all the way down to the southern border of the map, making it the biggest forest in the Forbidden West. To the northwest of the Memorial Grove is a large collection of snowy mountaintops that reach right the way up to the northern border of the map. This biome features snow-covered forests, rocky mountains, snowy slopes, and frozen rivers and lakes. It's a beautiful glacial biome. These mountains are home to one of the three Tanakh clans, the Sky Clan. Their home is called the Bulwark, a settlement built into the mountains on top of a pile of huge boulders surrounded by natural defences. We will also be coming back here later for a main quest, so we'll talk more about it then. Further to the west, we have the coastline, which is one of my favourite biomes, because this is where we start to see some of the more tropical aspects of the map. The north of the coast features a massive rainforest with huge thick trees towering up into the sky, with lush green foliage and moss coating the ground. A thick mist also hangs in the air of this forest, showing us that this forest is close to the ocean as the moisture is built up in the air and is carried through the undergrowth. Making it out of the forest brings us to the coastline itself, and the beautiful tropical beaches that border the land and sea. This area has gorgeous blue lagoons, sunken ruins, and white sand beaches, as well as large areas of swampland located to the south. These swamps are home to the final of the three Tanakh clans, the Lowlands clan. Their home, Thornmarsh, is a large wooden fortress located on the coast, where the swamp meets the sea. This means they have very easy access to the ocean if the need arises. The swamp is a vital part of Tanakh life in this area, and the inhabitants of Thornmarsh have learned to live alongside it in harmony. Further to the west, we have a large expanse of ocean. I'm actually really glad they decided to have this piece of negative space, to show just how huge the San Francisco Bay really is. And even then it scaled down. If you fly across it on a sunwing, it takes a good two minutes of straight flying to get from one side of the bay to the other. It's a huge body of water. There are also various old world shipwrecks scattered throughout the bay. Unfortunately, they aren't explorable, but they do add to that sense of nature reclaiming the world. Even swallowing up huge battleships, leaving only the rusted, jagged remnants of metal sticking out of the ocean's surface. Finally, the last biome is located within the Isle of Spires. Similarly to the coast of the mainland, this island features lots of tropical aspects such as lots of sand, palm trees, beaches, seashells, and tropical foliage. But the island itself is of course the city of San Francisco, or what's left of it above sea level at least. This means that the biome maintains that city-like structure, with once inhabited streets littered in ruins, unstable skyscrapers standing tall after thousands of years, and old rusty cars and street lamps just below the surface of the surrounding ocean. Honestly, the biomes of the Forbidden West are some of the most diverse, colourful, densely populated, and generally fun to explore biomes in any open world game. I really like how the world is split up into tons of different types of areas. It makes the world feel fresh and exciting at every turn, with plenty of beautiful areas that you can stumble across as you make your way westward. Wildlife is a huge part of any open world in my opinion. One of my favourite open worlds, Red Dead Redemption 2, has plenty of wildlife that fill the areas of wilderness around the game's world. Horizon Forbidden West takes a leaf out of Red Dead Redemption's book in this regard, introducing tons of new animals that only appear in certain parts of the map, depending on where their habitats are. There are all types of animals in the world of Horizon Forbidden West, ranging from boars, raccoons and squirrels, to owls and vultures, or prairie dogs, lizards, crabs, lobster, scorpions, and even fish like salmon and moonfish. There are so many diverse types of wildlife, especially when compared to Horizon Zero Dawn, which had a very limited array of animals. To the east of the map, in the Daunt, you can most commonly find raccoons, rabbits, boars, squirrels, jays, and foxes. The same types of animals you can find in Zero Dawn, which makes sense, as the Dawn is not too far away from Meridian, where you can find those same types of animals. These animals can also be found within the forest north of Plainsong. Further west in Cinnabar Sands, down towards the lagoon, we have our first species of fish 
Salmon. This is the most common freshwater species of fish in the game, which can be found in most inland bodies of water, as well as most rivers. Further west in the mountains, the main species you'll see are owls and mountain goats. The owls can be seen walking along the snow-covered slopes or soaring above the trees. The goats can be found traveling the mountains to find food. They serve basically the same purpose as the boars from other areas, larger mammals that drop fatty meat when hunted. Goats are quite plentiful and easy to spot whereas owls are certainly rarer to find. Moving into the desert biomes, a range of new animals are introduced that fit the hotter conditions. Deserts feature peccaries, small pig-like hoofed animals that run across the dunes in search of shade, vultures, scavenger birds that spend their days soaking in the sun and circling above the land in search of leftover pickings from animal corpses, prairie dogs, small burrowing animals that burrow their way through the sand to hide from larger predators, scorpions and horned lizards that hide amongst the sand to keep cool, desert rabbits that spend their time running away from absolutely everything that moves, and finally, geese that reside to the north of Scalding Spear in the large lake, venturing onto land every now and then to stretch their legs and lay their young. Further west towards the Bulwark and the Memorial Grove and the deep forest leading towards the coastline, there are some returning and some new animals. The forests and swamps to the south have plenty of peccaries and salmon, but these colossal forests are also home to ducks, geese, and a new type of fish, moonfish. Moonfish are very rare because they're normally found much deeper in the ocean than more typical types of fish like bass or salmon. To the north and the snowy mountains near the Bulwark, the owls and mountain goats are commonplace and in the freshwater rivers of the mountains you can find plenty of bass swimming around. Finally, the rest of the map is much more tropical and the animals that make their home in those regions follow this theme. Along the many beaches in the Forbidden West are lobsters and crabs which burrow into the sand to escape predators and pelicans that scour along the coastline searching for food. And there you have it, all the animals in the Forbidden West and where they live in their respective habitats. Given the amount of biomes in this game, I'm glad there's a larger diversity of animals that can only be found in specific areas of the map. It really adds to the realism of biodiversity and definitely fleshes out the open world. You could also argue the inclusion of lots of new species adds to the hunting and crafting system too, because you need to hunt a larger array of animals in order to craft upgrades, which means you have to explore each biome thoroughly to find the animal you need. The machines in the Forbidden West are also very diverse, with this game boasting 43 machine types opposed to the 26 in the previous game. I imagine there will also be more machines added to the game's DLC, just like how Frozen Wilds added new machines to fit the frozen environments of the Ban Ur in the southern plains of the Yellowstone Glacier. Machines are split up into archetypes and weight classes. Machines can either be lightweight, midweight, or heavyweight, depending on their size. For the sake of the video, I'm going to ignore the weight classes and break down each machine archetype, of which there are four. Acquisition, Recon, Transport, and Combat. Acquisition machines make up the majority of Gaia's workforce. Resources they harvest are used for the terraforming program and the production of new machines. Each model in their class is typically specialized for harvesting and refining a certain type of resource, such as breaking down plant life to create blaze, distilling natural fresh water to create chill water, or dismantling and recycling destroyed machines into processed metal blocks. There are 21 types of acquisition machine in the game. We won't talk about each and every one of them, but the most common acquisition machines you will come across are grazers, herd machines that dig up natural resources, and converted into biofuel, scroungers and scrappers, canine-like machines that scavenge destroyed machines for parts and process them for recycling, bristlebacks, large herd machines that use their metal tusks to dig up resources, glint hawks, flying scavengers that can gather in groups to collect and process machine carcasses, rock breakers, huge drilling machines that can mine valuable underground resources and ores, and finally, Tide rippers, large and powerful aquatic machines that filter sediment from the ocean for resources. These ones are definitely tough and can kill you very easily if you aren't prepared for a fight. Recon machines are typically the simplest and least dangerous machines of the lot, usually built with advanced detection as their primary purpose. Using their ocular sensors and radars, these machines were originally created to assist acquisition machines in finding lands suitable for terraforming, but their purpose shifted after the derangement, and they now serve as guards and lookouts for other machines. There aren't many recon class machines in this game, actually, with only five in total burrowers, common recon machines that emit high-pitched sounds to alert enemies and tunnel underground when threatened, skydrifters, gliding machines that survey large areas with their advanced scanning units, long legs, fast and agile recon machines that can scan tall grass to locate threats, red-eye watchers, simple machines that alert allies to danger and don't have many offensive capabilities, finally of course, the tall necks, giant observation machines that are oblivious to the world around them, circling large areas to monitor local machines and collect data on the area. But we'll talk more about the Tallnecks later, as they are an integral part of this game's side content. 
Transport machines are a diverse group, designed to help acquisition machines move large amounts of cargo, as well as carrying resources designed for their own terraforming functions. These machines are often large, with lots of components designed to store resources and minerals. This also makes them some of the most valuable machines to hunt, because they're basically walking cargo containers. In the southern desert, the Still Sands, you can find many groups of transport machines making their pilgrimages across the desert to deposit the resources they've gathered to nearby cauldrons in which the materials are used to produce more machines. Much like the Recon Machine class, there are only five transport machines in the game. The Behemoth, large powerful machines that see to the collection of resources from smaller acquisition class machines, as well as the transport of materials to cauldrons for machine manufacture. Bellowbacks, armoured machines that transport biofuel such as blaze, chill water or acid in their large cargo sacks, leap lashes, small acrobatic machines that transport small cargo such as canisters of fuel and cargo pods, rollerbacks, heavily armoured machines that can curl up into a ball to protect cargo, and finally of course, shell walkers, crab-like machines that carry a large distinctive cargo container on their back filled with valuable machine parts and resources. This container can be shot off and looted, which yields lots of materials. The final class of machine we have is combat machines. Obviously the most infamous and feared machines in the Horizon universe fall into this category. Combat class machines did not exist when humans first stepped foot out of the cradles and into the wilds of the new world. They were only developed in cauldrons after the derangement, when Gaia's subordinate function known as Hephaestus began considering humans as a threat. Combat class machines are unquestionably the most dangerous types of machines in the game, and are often seen in groups with more vulnerable machines, guarding them against hunters. There are 13 types of combat machines in the game. I won't be going over every one, but I will be showcasing some of the most unique and cool ones. First we have the Claw Strider, a machine with the appearance of a raptor that uses its barbed tail to swipe at its enemies, as well as launching bombs from the mounted weapon on its tail. The Ravager, a machine that resembles a long extinct feline apex predator, with razor sharp teeth and large clawed paws for swiping. The Shell Snapper, a heavily armoured machine that resembles an enormous snapping turtle, capable of leaping long distances, burrowing underground, and shooting heavy artillery at enemies from great distances. The Slaughter Spine, a machine built to look like a Spinosaurus, which uses huge plasma cannons to eviscerate threats. Stormbirds, large predatory birds that patrol the skies, surveying the land for any trespassers. Thunderjaws, probably the most infamous of all the machines in the Horizon franchise. This imposing machine resembles the Tyrannosaurus Rex, king of the dinosaurs, and has a formidable arsenal of weaponry. And lastly, we have Tremor Tusks, a new addition to this class which resembles a woolly mammoth with four sharp tusks and a back lined with an array of mounted weapons. Machines can actually come in two distinct overall archetypes, which determines how tough they'll be in a fight. You've got the standard white-plated machines, which are commonly seen across the map at all times of day, and then the more formidable apex machines that are covered in black armor plating and purple accents. These machines are much stronger than their regular counterparts. They're drawn to locations where large numbers of machines have been killed to serve as guardians, and will stop at nothing to eliminate anyone they consider a threat. These are machines that are created directly by Hephaestus, specifically to target human hunters. Apex machine variants are a common sight in the game, especially at night time as they spawn more regularly at night. There you have it. That's my overview of all the different types of machines in Horizon Forbidden West. Obviously we still have plenty more to say about this game's machines, but we'll get more into that in due time. I now only have two last things to discuss regarding the game's world before we get back to Aloy and a journey deeper into the Tanakh territory. A standout feature of both the open worlds of Horizon Zero Dawn and Horizon Forbidden West is the ever-looming presence of the Faro Automated Solutions BOR-7 Horus Titans, the huge imposing machines responsible for the destruction of humanity. I've got to say, ever since I first saw one of these in Horizon Zero Dawn, I was so intrigued by their existence. During the Faro Plague, it was common to see one of these destroying entire cities and searching for biomatter to convert into fuel. Much like the FAS ACA3 Scarab and the FAS FSP5 Kopesh, the FAS BOR7 Horus machines belong to the chariot line of military machines developed by Faro Automated Solutions. But what sets the Horus apart from its peers is its sheer size and power. Faro's engineers designed the chariot line to operate in swarms similar to those of insects. Horuses were intended to be the colossal queens of the swarm, replicating other machines in numbers that overwhelmed any enemy force, as well as repairing themselves on the fly, all via biomatter conversion. Additionally, they themselves were formidable combat machines, adept at 
tearing into and destroying huge enemy fortifications using their huge tendrils. They could consume biomass's fuel in the event of fuel line interdiction, and their network was virtually unbreakable, meaning they couldn't be exhausted and couldn't be hacked. The events of the Pharaoh Plague allowed the world to see the horrors of the Horus Titans firsthand. As a result of their ability to replicate, their ability to convert biomass to fuel, and their inability to be hacked, the Pharaoh Plague's Horuses numbered in the thousands by the time humanity became extinct. Eventually, as we know, Project Zero Dawn was completed and eventually Minerva was able to broadcast the deactivation codes across the world, shutting down the swarm for good. Unlike most other swarm robots, which were buried by the Zero Dawn system through terraforming, the chassis and tendrils of the swarm's Horuses remain, stretching up out of the land in all directions, as if they're still raining fire down on humanity. The presence of the Horuses can be felt across the entire map, seven of them spread throughout the Forbidden West. Their imposing nature is so strong that many primitive tribes living in the New World have named them Metal Devils, shunning their existence. The Nora especially are afraid of the dormant Horus machines, forbidding anyone from the tribe to even go near the Horus to the south of the Nora Sacred Lands. Few people in the Horizon universe know the origins of these intimidating titans, meaning most are left to speculate as to what they are and how they got there. As they've been exposed to the elements for centuries, the serviceability of these Metal Devils is unknown. Indeed, it's unknown if they can be reactivated at all, though the one in which Hades took refuge still had a functional computer core, meaning it's possible that all they need is to be reactivated, and they'll begin to wreak havoc anew. I guess that's what's so terrifying about them. We barely know anything about them at all. The fact that they're still sitting there, seemingly frozen in time, it insinuates that something one day could wake them up. Of course, I think it would be a missed opportunity to not have Aloy at least fight one of them at some point in the franchise. Ever since Horizon Zero Dawn, these colossal machines have been ever-present, and the community is waiting with bated breath for the moment that one of them becomes operational again. So I think at this point, Gorilla has to come up with a way to wake at least one of them, so that Aloy can fight it in a sick God of War style fight where she takes down something hundreds of times bigger than her. I can already imagine how beautiful the set piece would be. Well, I guess until the day Gorilla decides to do something with the Horus machines, all we can do is sit here and speculate about them, whilst admiring their terrifying beauty from afar. The structure of an open world and how the player is guided through the open world is as important as the content that fills that world. Horizon Forbidden West's open world is split up into four main areas, or biome clusters. The first contains the Daunt, Barren Light, No Man's Land, Dry Yearn, Cinnabar Sands, and the Farmlands of Plainsong. The second contains Salt Bite, Scalding Spear, The Shining Wastes, The Steel Sands, and Dune Hollow. The third contains the Memorial Grove, the Rain Trace, Thorn Marsh, the Shearside Mountains, the Bulwark, Tides Reach, the Long Coast, the Valley of the Fallen, Cliffs of the Cry, and Stand of the Sentinels. And the fourth contains Legacy's Landfall, Shrouded Heights, and the Isle of Spires. These four biome clusters contain their own biomes and settlements that are split up into what I like to call buffer zones. Areas of the map that funnel the player into the next biome cluster whilst also serving as a border between these areas. For example, Two sets of mountains serve as buffer zones, one to the west of Plainsong, before you reach the desert, and another to the west of Scalding Spear, before you reach the Memorial Grove and the surrounding forest. Not only this, but there are three distinct pathways that lead you past the first set of mountains and into the desert. One way to enter the desert is to use the passage called the Spine Break. It's the ruin of an ancient highway tunnel, with remnants of the connected overpass marking it as part of a once expansive freeway. It cuts through the mountains, separating No Man's Land and the Still Sands, making it the southernmost of three entry points that provide provide access to the Tanakh clanlands from the east. The northernmost entry point into the clanlands is through a checkpoint called the High Turning. It is located near the farmlands of Plainsong. Since Regala's rebels are at large in the Forbidden West, they have taken this checkpoint and do not allow anyone in or out of Tanakh territory. To use this outpost as intended, as a way to travel from No Man's Land to the clanlands, Aloy must take out Regala's rebels that are stationed here. This is easily done, it's just a very simple rebel outpost mission, where all you have to do is defeat all the enemies and their leader. I'll be discussing this game's side content later, so I won't go into detail about the Rebel Outposts, but Aloy makes quick work of the Rebels stationed at High Turning, and as a result, Utaru warriors from the nearby village of Plainsong reclaim the outpost. This means it can now be used as a secure way for Aloy to travel to and from the Tanakh clanlands. Lastly, the third and most central way to pass through the mountains is a secret passage that Aloy will discover a little bit later on. I'm not going to talk about this just yet because it will spoil the reveal, but it's the safest, easiest, and most convenient way for Aloy to make her way straight forward through the mountains and into the territory of the Desert Clan. These three points leading 
through the first buffer zone, funnel the player into different areas of the map that contain different side content for players to run into. Using the spine break, we'll have players discover Camp Nowhere, a small camp of Osiram Delvers that will have their own side quests and errands for Aloy. Similarly, using high turning to enter the desert will lead to an optional rebel outpost, the settlement of Arrowhand, and various other assorted side activities. My point is, the player is guided through the world through these buffer zones, and depending on which path you take, you can end up somewhere completely different with different activities to engage with. The next buffer zone is the next large set of mountain ranges further to the west. This splits up the second biome cluster, the desert, from the third biome cluster, the forest, swamps, snowy mountains, and the coastline. This buffer zone has a lot more pathways which allow you to pass through the mountains, which makes sense. At the beginning of the game, players may need a lot more hand-holding and guidance, which is why there are three main pathways. But after being allowed into the open world, the buffer zones no longer need to push you in a certain direction and offer you a lot more options of traversal. However, as I said, the mountains themselves are there to split up the biome clusters, which is a necessary part of this game's open world. However, the lack of three distinct pathways doesn't mean that the game doesn't continue to funnel you in some way. You'll notice, lots of the small pathways leading through or around the mountains lead you straight to the settlements that are closest to the buffer zone, whether that be the Memorial Grove itself, or the smaller camps and villages such as Lowlands Path, Fenrise, Falls Edge, Sky Sentry, or Stonecrest. Much like roads in real life, they branch off in various directions and eventually lead somewhere significant. Meaning, if you follow one of the many roads through the second mountain range, you'll most likely find yourself at one of these many settlements, each of which have their own vendors, side quests, and errands. The final buffer zone on the map that leads into the final biome cluster is the large expanse of water that makes up part of the San Francisco Bay. This large area of negative space serves many purposes. Firstly, it needs to be there because the San Francisco Bay is a real place that needed to be represented on this game's map, considering it's set partially in Central California. And secondly, it's used as a way to separate the Isle of Spires from the rest of the mainland of the Forbidden West, which explains why the Tanakh don't venture there, as they have no way to get there, as the island is surrounded by ocean. Not even the fearless Tanakh have been there, which adds to the veil of mystery surrounding the Isle of Spires, as it has yet to be claimed by any of the known tribes. And thirdly, the San Francisco Bay serves as the final buffer zone to disconnect the final biome cluster from the rest of the map. It really makes the Isle of Spires feel like this final frontier, with just one straight pathway across the ocean to reach it, opposed to having branching pathways. I think the three buffer zones and their varying pathways also reflect the three stages of the game. The beginning guides you through three different paths, allowing you the choice of which one you want to use, but holding your hand enough so that you don't get overwhelmed. This is Aloy's first steps into an unknown land, and she needs all the help she can get, much like us as the player. The middle section of the game allows you the most freedom of choice, allowing you to make your own way through the mountains into the next area. Much like Aloy during this part of the game, the player's confidence is growing and is therefore given freedom of choice as to where to go, what to do, and in which order. And the ending of the game has only one straight pathway leading to the end, with no ambiguity as to where you're meant to go. Similarly to how at this point in the game, Aloy is sure of her goals and how she's going to accomplish them. I know this section has been a very long cut away from Aloy's story, but the world of Horizon Forbidden West is actually one of the most diverse, densely populated, vibrant, and living worlds I've had the pleasure of exploring in a video game. The sheer amount of biomes keep that sense of unadulterated exploration at an all-time high, with all kinds of wilderness to get lost in, settlements to discover, and ruins to explore. The wildlife that populates these biomes not only brings them to life, but the many animals can also be hunted for useful crafting materials, which is something you're going to need a lot of if you want to craft potions. The machines add that element of sci-fi danger, with 43 machines split into 4 different classes with all their own strength, weaknesses, and unique abilities. And the world itself is clearly structured to guide and funnel players according to their progress in the story and familiarity with the game's world. I think with the release of Elden Ring, Horizon Forbidden West was quickly forgotten about. But the sheer quality of this game's open world deserves so much praise, and I hope my analysis of the components that make up this world has made you appreciate it more. Thank you, Gorilla, for the years of effort that clearly went into sculpting this beautiful open world space. I had a lot of fun with it. Of course, we will have more to say about the open world, particularly the main Tanakh settlements that exist within the Tanakh clanlands, as well as all the game's optional side content, but that's it for now. And with that, I think it's time we get back to Aloy, as she embarks on her journey into the Tanakh clanlands. I've been rambling for long enough.
When we left Aloy last, she had just made it officially into the Forbidden West after Regala attacked the embassy, killing many Tanakh and Kaja alike. Before he died, Fashav gave Aloy a dagger that will supposedly grant her safe passage through the Forbidden West. All she needs to do is present the blade to Chief Ikaro and tell him that Fashav sent her. Obviously, with Fashav now gone, this may prove to be slightly more difficult, but that's a problem for a later time. For now, Aloy must go to the coordinates left by Silence to find out more about what happened with Hades after the Battle of the Alight, as well as where the potential Gaia backup could be. As you may remember, Aloy looted a piece of special gear from Regala's champion. Now too damaged to be used as a shield, it can still be used as a glider, which allows Aloy to quickly descend from high places as well as glide over unsuspecting enemies to drop down onto them to surprise them with a stealth takedown. The shield wing is definitely the coolest piece of special gear in the game, and it's now an iconic part of Aloy's arsenal. Honestly, it's going to be so weird returning to Zero Dawn and not being able to use the shield wing, it's a staple of traversal in Forbidden West. Need to get down from a high ledge but don't feel like climbing? The shield wing's got you. Want to cross a small gap but don't think you'll be able to make the jump normally? Shield wing can carry you across. Accidentally dismount your sun wing halfway through flying? Just deploy the shield wing and you're safe. You can even use the shield wing in parkour. Sure, this wasn't its original intention, but you can use the shield wing to reach places that would normally require another route to reach. This can be used to bypass certain climbing sections. You can even use the shield wing in old world sites, ruins, cauldrons, and most indoor places, making it a really versatile tool that you will soon realise you wouldn't be able to live without. Using the shield wing and the pull caster in conjunction with each other adds a whole new level of verticality. You can use the pull caster to pull yourself towards a grapple point, leap off the grapple point at the last second to launch yourself into the air, and then deploy the shield wing to glide safely back down. I absolutely adore the shield wing, it makes traversing across the open world so much more fun and adds a great verticality aspect that I think Zero Dawn was missing. Finally, it's time to travel to the coordinates that Silence left at the Spire for Aloy. After a long and perilous journey full of setbacks, we arrive at the location and we're met with the sight of a metal devil, a huge unoperational titan left to be reclaimed by nature. I absolutely love the Horus War Machines left over by the Pharaoh Plague. They have this mysterious and imposing presence, almost as if they could reactivate at any point and lay waste to Earth once more. I just love how they're scattered across the map in all sorts of places, almost frozen in time. The coordinates that Silence left lead directly to the underbelly of the Colossal Machine, and upon reaching the exact location of the coordinates, it's clear that Silence was camped here for a long while, studying Hades and probing the AI for information on the secrets of the old world. Within Silence Camp is a console that can be interacted with. Upon activating it, a hologram of Silence appears, and he's standing next to a large orb, the processing unit of the Horus machine, just like the one left at the Spire and Meridian after the Battle of the Alight. These are used as a kind of vessel to house artificial intelligence. These processing units were originally used so Pharaoh AI could pilot the rest of the body without need for human intervention. So disconnecting the orb itself from the body of the Horus and then implanting the AI into it is a way to keep an AI trapped as it has no way of moving. Silence trapped Hades here and interrogated it over the course of months, forcing his way into the day to help within the AI's memory, which in turn gradually corrupted the Debris Pride. Hades then mentions the signal it received which turned it from a low-level subfunction into a sentient AI, and how even though he cannot stop the Gaia reboot, the entities, meaning humanity, will still face extinction eventually, but at the hands of someone or something else. This indicates to us that Hades was never the main threat and was simply trying to fulfill its duty as extinction failsafe. There's a bigger nemesis waiting in the shadows that poses a much bigger threat to humanity. The line, cannot compromise Gaia reboot, also indicates that Gaia can in fact be safely rebooted, something that Aloy wasn't even certain was fully possible herself. Silence also confirms that a copy of a Gaia backup does exist and it's nearby. All Aloy needs to do is follow the trail left for her to the nearby old world facility called Latopolis. Upon reaching Latopolis, waiting for us in the entranceway of the facility is the derelict processing unit used to house Hades during its interrogation. And inside is what's left of Hades after Silence pushed it to its limit, a shell of what was once considered a god by the Eclipse. Aloy gingerly approaches the orb to examine it. Is that you? System threat detected. 
You don't look so good. You are the Aloy. Come to destroy me. Yes. Permanently this time. Even like this, you're a threat to Gaia. Once I resurrect her. So you have not yet secured Gaia back up. Then Gaia is dead. Earth and him too. Despite malfunctions, I have won. Silence asked you where to find a backup of Gaia. <laughs> Been easy. What did silence do to you, Hades? It's like you've been hollowed out. Silence interrogated me. And what did you tell him? Data error, memory structures disintegrate. You don't remember any of it? What, like me beating you at the spire? Okay, that's not going anywhere. Do you know where Silence went? So you don't know anything more than I do. Great. When the mysterious signal transformed you, it made Gaia's other subordinate functions conscious too. You escaped when Gaia destroyed herself, but so did they. Where did they go? Each function migrated its coordinates based on data error memory structures of crazed AIs, scattered who knows where, doing who knows what. Hephaestus kills thousands every year with the combat machines it keeps making, and you nearly ended the world. Seven more functions out there, cooking up trouble? It's not a happy thought. You are unhappy. Good. Anyone ever tell you you've got a great personality, Hades? Sarcasm. Didn't think so. Silence questioned you about the mysterious signal. The one that woke you, gave you consciousness. Who sent it? Signal transmitted by masters. And who are they? Masters woke me to destroy earthly life. Who would want that? <laughs> I really enjoyed this section when I first played it. It's another dialogue heavy section where you have the opportunity to ask a character lots of significant questions. These dialogue options are normally entirely optional, but I just can't help myself. I always exhaust the options completely. It's really interesting having Aloy speak with Hades, as they have never had an interaction in Zero Dawn that didn't end with Hades trying to kill her. Seeing the antagonist from the previous game in this state also raises the stakes for this game, insinuating that Hades was nothing compared to what's to come in the future. As for the dialogue itself, they touch upon some really interesting topics, such as the Gaia backup, Silence interrogation methods, Gaia's subordinate functions, and the mysterious signal that led to Hades and Gaia's other subordinate functions becoming sentient. AI. Overall, this section is a really nice send-off for Hades. The interaction ends with Hades taunting Aloy for believing she can restore Gaia and save the biosphere, and she finally uses the Master Override to rid the world of Hades, for good this time. I really like that they had this send-off for the character. I think Hades is a really interesting concept for an antagonist, an ancient rogue AI whose original purpose was to assume control of Zero Dawn and reset the biosphere when Gaia failed to produce a habitable planet, achieving sentience, developing apathy for humans, and trying to fulfill the goal it was programmed to do by appealing to the religious ideologies of a nearby tribe, and starting a war also it could use the global terraforming system to reset the planet once and for all, returning it to an uninhabitable rock with no biomatter and then ultimately failing at the hands of Aloy, a genetic clone of its creator. And with that, 
Hades is no more, but that also means that there's no more extinction failsafe, meaning that the world cannot simply be reset and terraformed again. This version of the Earth is the last one, which means the spreading of the red blight needs to be fixed, as there's no way to press the reset button on Earth this time. Enough. It's time to finish this. Does Aloy still think she can restore? Yeah, Aloy does. Then you are deleted. Extinction inevitable. What would you know, Hades? Twice you tried to destroy life on Earth, and twice you failed. The only extinction you ever brought about is your own. And there's no tricked out lands to save you this time. You are incorrect. Three times. You remember this? Yes, data intact, non viable biospheres aborted in years 254 2161 2168. So? Th that's centuries ago. It's what you were designed to do. need to be. I'm saving this one. Master Override, arms. Commander, stay name and rank. Elizabeth Sobek, Alpha Prime. Master Override activated. Bridging extinction protocol. see you dealt with Hades. Yeah. Think maybe you can stay dead this time? It will. You can trust. Trust? Yes. Trust. As in, since I did what you could never do, and extracted all of Hades' priceless knowledge, you can trust that I was willing to actually let you destroy it this time. So back to holograms instead of face-to-face? -face? What, afraid I'd stab you or something? There's a reason I'm I... I'm using the same spyware, I see. So, all those times I called, you could have just answered. But I guess you just prefer to go on spying all this time. My world stopped revolving around you months ago, Aloy. I've had work to do. Countless hours of research. As demanding and time-intensive as it has been critical to the fate of this planet. <laughs> right. Of course. You're just trying to save the world, too. That's right. The difference, of course, is that unlike you, I've produced the results. Did you find a backup of Gaia or not? Oh, yes. I believe I did. Where? Voila. Why do you think I summoned you here? Behind that gene-locked hatch lie the ruins of the ancient facility where the Hades extinction protocol was perfected. A testing process that ran hundreds of trials, each of them using a backup of Gaia. Hades told you this? It took some convincing. But yes. So, are you ready to go get what you've been searching for for the last six months? Or are you just going to stand there with your mouth open? All right. I'll search the facility for a Gaia backup. But just to be clear, Silence, if this ends up being another one of your tricks... It's a gene-locked hatch, Eloy. You're literally the only person who can open it. How could I set a trap inside? Trick me again, Silence, and our next conversation will be face-to-face. -face. Though you won't have much to say on account of my spear being buried in your throat. Eloy, thanks to me, everything you desired... Everything you've been fumbling about, unable to achieve for six months, is now within your grasp. Now, I know you didn't learn much about manners growing up a Nora outcast. But in a situation like this, you say thank you 
And I say, you're welcome. Here we are, the ancient facility of Latopolis, or the Hades Proving Grounds, as Aloy takes to calling it. As Silence explained, this is the facility that was used to test Hades' ability to take over Gaia so that it could reverse terraforming and reset the biosphere in the event that Gaia was unable to successfully recreate habitable conditions on Earth. This means that this facility could house many backups of Gaia, as they stored Gaia test kernels within Latopolis for easy access during the testing phase. The facility itself is also nearly digitally impenetrable, with no outside signals being able to reach inside. This means that Latopolis was impervious to cyber attacks, and thus was the perfect place to test Hades' capabilities without the possibility of outside interference. Aloy approaches the door to enter the facility, the same way she would access any Zero Dawn facility, by using the Identiscan system that would identify her as Elizabeth Sobek Alpha Prime and unlock the door. But there's an issue this time. The door opens partially, but cannot fully open due to a deposit of Fire Gleam blocking the mechanism. Fire Gleam is a red crystalline substance that can be found in caves and ruins. It gets its name from its propensity to combust given the right conditions. Of course, just as we start out to enter what is possibly the most important facility we've encountered so far, we're stopped in our tracks. Luckily for us, Fire Gleam is easy to deal with and all we need is some form of igniter to blow the Fire Gleam out the way, clearing the way for us. The igniter only requires two resources both of which are easy to come by, a leap lasher canister and some deep water kindleweed oil. Combining the two ingredients in a crafting bench creates the igniter, the third piece of special gear which is used exclusively to ignite fire gleam to clear away debris or blow holes in the walls of ruins. Fire gleam can be found around the open world and blowing it up usually leads to some sort of secret passage or room that contains valuable resources. So keep an eye out for fire gleam during your travels around the Forbidden West. With that little errand out of the way, now we can finally enter Latopolis and hopefully recover one of Gaia's testing kernels housed inside. Aloy returns to the door and proceeds to inject her spear into the fire gleam which ignites it, causing it to combust. This in turn allows the door to open and we can make our way inside. Making our way to the main room of the facility, it's evident that the last millennium has not been kind to the old metal walls of Latopolis, with water seeping in from various breaches in the structure, flooding the building and compromising its structural integrity. It's clear that it isn't going to be as easy as walking up to the gene lock door, opening it, grabbing Gaia, and leaving. I love this whole section in Latopolis. Not only is it a callback to many of Aloy's previous adventures in the first game, exploring old world sites with silence in her ear making sarcastic remarks, but it's such a fun place to explore. This was once one of the most important Zero Dawn facilities, as Gaia's mistakes could only be undone by Hades, which means a lot of resources went into making this facility the most secure of all. This quest is full of parkour, simple puzzle solving, optional data pads, audio logs, and lots of valuables to loot. It also teaches you the fundamentals of exploring old world ruins and how your exploration is rewarded with loot or lore. The main flooded room has lots of valuable caches hidden away that can only be found by exploring, even if that means veering away from the main objective every now and then. Obviously, the main goal is to reach the gene lock hatch on the other side of the room, so naturally it's in our best interest to use the pillars jutting out of the water to climb around the room so we can slowly make our way to the other side. This means that Aloy must use a conjunction of parkour, the pull caster, and the shield wing to navigate the various dangerous metal structures sticking out of the flooded ruins. There are also doors and consoles that need to be powered, vents to climb through, and crates that can be used to reach areas that would be unreachable otherwise. Latopolis really does serve as a sort of tutorial for delving old world ruins, and it's so subtly done without you even realising it. There's also this really nice hologram that can be activated within Latopolis that shows Elizabeth Sobek and Travis Tate developing and sending the Logic Bomb, disguised as a Gaia backup to Far Zenith, the one that we saw at the beginning of the game in the Far Zenith launch facility. It gives us a little bit more insight into Elizabeth as a character and what she was like during the days of Project Zero Dawn's development. In this scene, Travis and Elizabeth are just finishing the development of the Logic Bomb, and upon sending it to Far Zenith, Travis suggests that the two of them kick back and celebrate, but Elizabeth declines, being the Alpha Prime of the Zero Dawn project and a very busy woman with the weight of the world on her shoulders. This prompts Travis to ask her why she's even trying so hard to save the future of humanity if she doesn't value spending time with the people she's trying so desperately to preserve. This is actually a really great parallel between Aloy and Elizabeth. Aloy is prone to becoming so wrapped up in the urgency of her mission that she forgets to feel normal human emotions, even entirely compartmental mentalizing parts of her personality in favour of a brave face, which is exactly the way Elizabeth responded to the hopeless situation humanity found themselves in thanks to the Farrow Plague. 
This isn't to say Elizabeth is this cold, unfeeling individual, but she had to become that in order to save the future of humanity, which is what Aloy found herself doing, especially when she just up and left Meridian after the Battle of the Light. Not even so much as saying goodbye to her friends that put their lives at risk to fight by her side. After the hologram, there's a really interesting piece of dialogue from Silence, and he says, the exceptional walker path of solitude. In this context, he's not only speaking about Elizabeth, and not only is he narcissistically referring to himself, but he's also referring to Aloy. Whether Aloy likes it or not, she is exceptional. She's the only person capable of restoring Gaia and saving the world. For the last six months, she's found herself walking that path of solitude. And I think part of Aloy's character arc during this game is to do what Elizabeth could not, renouncing the mindset of needing to distance herself from human connection and coming to terms with her emotions and interpersonal relationships. We'll get more into her character arc later, but I think this small parallel between Elizabeth and Aloy is a theme that runs throughout the game. And Aloy's capacity for compassion, even when facing with the end of the world is what sets her apart from Elizabeth and makes Aloy even greater than Elizabeth. Anyway, after making her way through the rest of the ruins, Aloy finally finds herself at the foot of the gene-locked hatch. She uses her authorization as Alpha Prime to enter, and inside is a large room with two consoles and a large mechanical spider in the center. Don't worry, this isn't a robotic spider boss fight or anything like that. This spider is called the Recluse Spider, which is the name for the spider-like mechanism used to safely contain two software modules. In the context of Hades testing, this was used to contain Gaia and Hades to test Hades' ability to take over in the event of a biosphere reset, and to ensure both systems operated as expected. This level of security was paramount to testing Hades because any outside interference would render the experiments useless. Aloy interacts with the console in the center of the room, which lowers the repositories that contain the Gaia backup as well as a copy of Hades. The Hades repository successfully touches the ground, but the Gaia repository gets stuck, resulting in Aloy having to shoot the structure for the arm to drop, allowing Aloy to interact with the repository and finally check it for any spare Gaia kernels. Got one. Two, in fact. I was starting to get worried. Data footprint low. 90% memory free. That can't be right. Guy was a vast superintelligence. He barely expected us. without subfunctions, but there are subfunctions out there. The original ones. Scattered to the winds when Gaia blew herself up. They could be anywhere. You can't find them in time. Even if you did, the mysterious signal mutated them just like Hades. You have no idea. I do. A good one. But it works. west of Plainsong. Close enough for me to go get it. I was hoping to find all the subfunctions, but one's enough to get started, right? It is. Recover Minerva. One could use it to launch Gaia's heuristic matrix. And when she's conscious, she helps me find the other subfunctions. I go gather them. And rebuild her piece by piece. Very clever. Still think I can't save the world on my own? want the same thing you do. Gaia reborn. It's why they're here. Friends of yours? No. They don't know me. The data pulse I transmitted indicated that a Gaia backup could be recovered here was anonymous. 
Now they're very powerful, but they won't harm you. Not when they see who you are, what you are. A clone of Elizabeth Sobek, a genetic key with which they can reboot a guy and rebuild the system. They need you. I warned you, Silence. For once, Aloy, submit to the inevitable. Open the hatch. First I rebuild Gaia, save life on Earth, then I track you down and end yours! I'm trying to help you here. Try spying on me with that. There. New focus, spyware free. I don't care how powerful they are, the only thing that can open that hatch is me. The question is, can I find another way out? There's a current in the water. Not much, but maybe it's a way out. Genetic profile confirmed. Entry authorized. Greetings, Dr. Sobak. Please step inside. <laughs> Do we have it? Fantastic. Did the pulse originate here? Has someone... Something wrong? Shit! Spectres, Beta! Any idea what the hell a clone of Elizabeth Sobek is doing here? Maybe Gaia made one, when it destroyed itself a Hail Mary to repair the system. Hmm. Don't like the sound of that. Nah, don't like it. Don't want it. But the if it Nope. One's enough trouble. Eric! Yeah? Care to do a little downsizing? Hmm. Sure. What if she sent the pulse? Then that was foolish of her. But we got what we came for. So let's put it to use. I snap a lot of necks in VR. But that certain tremor, as life fades from the eyes. Ooh! No hollow quite gets it. Keep flapping your mouth. It makes a nice target. You actually think that primitive crap you got there can hurt me? This is gonna be fun. So, yeah. There's a lot to take in during this cutscene. It's possible to reboot Gaia, but we now have to find her subordinate functions, all of which disperse when the signal was sent which turned all of them into sentient AI capable of emotion and thought. Minerva, the AI that was tasked with broadcasting the deactivation codes that would stop the Pharaoh Plague, is nearby in the Forbidden West amongst the mountains to the west of Plainsong, and that's our next goal. But we have more pressing matters to deal with right now. 
Not only is there another clone of Elizabeth Sobek simply called Beta, but there are also humans wearing advanced shielding, making them impervious to any kind of physical damage. Their technology is clearly more sophisticated than anything Aloy is able to throw at them, and something about them feels otherworldly, with their extravagant clothing, nanomachine weaponry, and matter-of-fact attitude towards Aloy, seeing her as nothing more than a complication to be ironed out of a meticulously designed plan. They also have control over these machines they refer to as Spectres, clearly much different to anything we've encountered so far. The man referred to as Eric is tasked with taking care of Aloy, but of course, our hero doesn't intend to go down without a fight. Faced against insurmountable odds, the Nora Huntress refuses to back down. This fight is one of the more interesting in the game. He's not just a damage sponge because he can't actually take damage during the fight. The trick is to use the environment to your advantage. Something that was made clear to us earlier was that the recluse spider mechanism was very heavy, as well as that there's a system of pipelines and passageways submerged under the water below. You can put two and two together to realize what you gotta do. The goal here is to bait Eric to one side of the arena so you can use the console to expose the recluse spider's couplings that keep the arms secured. Whilst doing this, you must avoid Eric's hard-hitting attacks. He can use the nanomachines in his suit to form different kinds of weapons, such as a blade that he thrusts at you, a type of hammer that he uses to slam the ground, and a cannon that shoots balls of hot energy. Eric is very slow moving, and is clearly intentionally drawing the fight out because he doesn't believe Aloy's a threat to him, which is why she's able to outsmart him. Exposing the joints means that Aloy can shoot them, which isn't quite enough to bring the recluse spider down. At this point in the fight, Eric becomes more erratic, pursuing you around the arena faster and launching more attacks at you in quicker succession. On top of this, you have to destroy the stem couplings at the center of the mechanism. These are harder to shoot as there's only a small exposed piece of the couplings. This just serves to make the fight that much more frantic. Finally, the last arrow hits the stem couplings and the recluse spider begins to smash begins to smash, amazing. Finally, the last arrow hits the stem couplings and the recluse spider begins to fall, smashing through the floor and opening an escape route for Aloy to jump down into the water, and use Metopolis' many passageways to escape. Eric sends his spectres in after us, which leads to this really intense chase section through the many labyrinths of the underwater passageways throughout Latopolis, with Aloy frantically searching for a way out as the spectres pursue her. Every now and then you've got to come up for air, which adds to the tension as you don't know if there's a spectre going to be waiting for you or not. After lots of swimming and climbing, Aloy finds a partially flooded room with some fire gleam growing on the wall. She uses her igniter to light it in order to reach the passage on the other side. It's okay. I'm here. I've... I've got it. Hey, hey, easy. Easy there. Hey, 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 hey. It's right here. And the way you were clutching it when I found you, I knew it was important. Where are we? An outpost of the Utaru tribe. Not far from where you fell. How long? Two days. Uh, 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 
Aloy? There's no time. I found something. In the mountains west, west of Plains Song. Yeah. Kept muttering it while I carried you. Look, Aloy, whatever it is that you found, you're in no shape. To... I will crawl if I have to. Fight. Okay, fine. But before you do that, there's someone you should talk to. An Utaru named Zo. And she told me there's been trouble in those mountains. A cave spitting out deadly machines. Can't be a coincidence, right? Why do we need her? Let's head for the cave. It's in Utaru territory. Her territory. She can help us. You'll see. Let's go see this marvelous so then. As verdant limbs wither, roots rot in snow, still the seed rises as certain as stone. So? She should be in bed. Aloy doesn't really do should. You're so right. Verl said I should talk to you about the machines in the mountains west of Plainsong. I am a grave singer. My place is here. We can talk once you've healed. What's wrong with it? Her. Her name is Ray, not it. She's one of our land gods, and she's dying. But not just dying. She's suffering. Her condition is not your concern. So, if anyone can help, it's Aloy. May I? What to do might look bad, but it will help. Spear. West of Plain Song. There are trouble out there? The Utaru have trouble everywhere. Our fields blighted, our settlements abandoned. But the cave in the mountains is the worst of it. It is a sacred place. Fa, another of our land gods, went inside weeks ago, but she hasn't emerged. Killer machines pour out instead, threatening to overwhelm us. It's never happened before. Wouldn't be your first sacred cave. I really like this whole introduction to the Utaru tribe, as well as Zoe the Gravesinger, who becomes a major character as you'll see later down the line. Aloy awakes in a panic two days after her escape from Lotopolis, calmed by Val who assures her that he has the Gaia backup safe. They speak to the Utaru and Gravesinger Zoe, who tells them of the Utaru land gods, machines called Plowhorns that are not directly hostile towards humans and actively fertilise the land around Plainsong. These machines are ingrained into the culture of the Utaru people, 
and the tribe worships these land gods in thanks for their fertilization of the farmland. We'll talk more about the Utaru culture later, but for now, you just need to know that these plow horns are paramount to the survival of the Utaru people. The land god's purpose from a terraforming perspective is to fertilize, plow, and plant seeds into the soil to make way for plant growth. Ever since the derangement, they became hostile when approached by humans and began over-fertilizing the soil, which makes the land more susceptible to the red blight. The land gods also have yearly scheduled maintenance in which they return to the nearby cauldron, receive repairs, and then emerge from the cave anew to continue their fertilizing. This became a sort of festival for the Utaru, in which they would celebrate the rebirth of the land gods as they make their pilgrimage and return from the cauldron, which they refer to as the sacred cave. Eventually, like all machines, the derangement changed the plowhorn's behavior so that they would not return to the cauldron for repairs, meaning they became damaged and slowly began to shut down, which is why in the cutscene, the land god is in pain, and Aloy has to remove a damaged component to ease its suffering. Zo tells us of the problems that the Utara are facing currently. Not only is the blight ruining their farmland and causing their people to starve, the nearby cauldron is producing deadly machines that have forced everyone to retreat back to the safety of the main village. On top of this, Regala's rebels have also been ambushing and attacking the tribe's people, ransacking their outposts and camps, adding even more pressure onto the Utaru people. These factors really leave the Utaru with only one choice, to wait in the relative safety of Plainsong until the dangers subside, until hunger takes them, or until the rebellion decides they want to take Plainsong as their own. Aloy is quite confident at this point that Minerva can be found somewhere inside the cauldron, and its presence is somehow promoting the production of deadly machines. If Aloy wants to help the people of the Utaru tribe recover Minerva and reboot Gaia, we need to get into that cauldron. The only issue is, as I mentioned, this is the Utaru's sacred cave, meaning Aloy can't just waltz in there without upsetting the people of Plainsong. An outlander wandering into their sacred site would be seen as an act of aggression and would probably lead to an outcry from the people. Due to this, Aloy reluctantly agrees to take the more political route and meet Zo in Plainsong so that they can speak with the chorus, Plainsong's oligarchy comprised of the most respected individuals in the village, who decide the future of the people. Many in Plainsong disagree with the chorus, insisting that their small group is unfit to solely decide what's best for the entire village. We'll talk more about the chorus and Utaran politics a little bit later, but in the meantime, Aloy heads to Plainsong to speak with Zoe in order to discuss next steps. Upon arriving at the village of Plainsong, it's clear that Utaran culture is much different to the cultures of the Nora, Osaram, Kaja, Banuk, or even the Tanakh. They are a peaceful people, primarily vegetarian, who live in harmony with the land. The village is constructed by a winding system of thick vines and trees that form the village itself, interlocking across what was once three huge satellite dishes. The mass of plants and trees is held up by generations of careful plant growth, coiling around the satellite dishes, with wooden bridges connecting the three main segments of the village together. At night, Plainsong looks particularly beautiful, with bioluminescent plants lighting the village's many walkways and painting the village vibrant hues of green and yellow. Plainsong is definitely one of my favourite settlements in the Forbidden West. It's just so unique. And the Utaru are a particularly interesting people, a settlement of mostly peaceful farmers who were simultaneously fierce enough to subdue the bloodlust of the Tanakh and even push back the Kaja during the Red Raids. Val and Zo are waiting for Aloy at the entrance to Plainsong. They have convinced the chorus to discuss the topic of letting Aloy enter the sacred cave, not only to recover Minerva, but to investigate where the machines are coming from, and what happened to Far, the last land god seen entering the sacred cave. Possibly, all these things are linked, which means Aloy and the Utaru have aligned interests. Finally, Aloy, Val, and Zo head to the top of Plainsong to speak with the chorus themselves, with the hopes of convincing them to allow them entry into the sacred cave. Speak. Your sacred cave. There's something inside I need. If I can get it, it so will help. and the Nora have spread word of your story. And what you want. We know of no spirit in the cave. Only Fa, our land god, who entered the cave and did not return. The power of the land gods is broken. We are diminished. 
Tales of spirit will not help us. Nothing will. We weaken. We die. And become fertile ground for new life. This is the natural order. Wait. You're all just going to sit around? Until you become food for worms? Literally? So says the Outlander, ignorant of our beliefs. Please, remember how she brought peace to Ray. Listen to her. We've heard such temerity from you before, Zoe. Let us not forget that you agitated for reckless war against the Kaja. At least she's trying to help. How? Oh. By inviting you to break our traditions? Should we change our ways to suit every impudent outsider who wanders into Plainsong? No. You should change your ways because your own lands are killing you. We have stood by and watched as our land gods waste away. You would have us do the same with our neighbors, our children. And this lone outlander can save us. <laughs> Nonsense. A single seed matters little in the infinite cycle of growth and decay. An alarm. It's coming from the mountains. Was that from the cordon? It's an alarm! The machines must have broken through the cordon. Then we need to get down there. What about the chorus? If the cordon has fallen, there is nothing left to prevent us from going in the cave. Time for permission is over. Then off we go. I really enjoyed this scene where Aloy and Zoe challenge the Chorus Authority. Not only does it show Aloy's passion for people, no matter where they're from and her belief of never accepting defeat, but it also shows us how Zoe is of similar mind. Unlike other Utaru, she's not content to just sit back and allow her people to starve and die. In this regard, Aloy and Zoe are similar challenging the traditions of their respective tribes so as to bring about large-scale change. However, despite their fierce protest against the Chorus, they were unable to get through. Although in the end, this proves to have little significance, as their point is proven immediately. The Cordon stopping people from entering the Sacred Cave has fallen, meaning they no longer need to ask the Chorus to enter. I really like the line from Zoe, the time for permission is over. That single line tells us so much about her character and what she's willing to sacrifice for her people. She knows very well that if she enters the cave without the permission of the Chorus, Chorus, she may be disowned by the tribe for breaching tradition, but she still springs into action anyway because she cares more about the people than she does about her own identity as an Utaru. The goal here is to make it to the sacred cave as quickly as possible. The cauldron inside has produced a lot of combat machines, which have clearly overwhelmed the tribe's people stationed at the cordon. This has then led to the machines leaking out into the lands of Plainsong. During this section, Aloy, Val, and Zoe have to fight their way to the cauldron whilst also defending Utaru farmers that are caught in the fray. There are lots of claw striders during this sequence and they hit hard. Towards the beginning of the game I always found claw striders to be really hard to deal with because not only are they fast with a decent amount of health but their attacks have lots of range. They launch themselves at you from a surprising distance away meaning they can close the distance very quickly so be aware of that. Finally after a gruesome struggle against the battalion of machines Aloy, Val and Zoe make it to the sacred cave and not a moment too soon. They find their way to the cauldron door and Aloy overrides it to enter. I really like this moment where Aloy gives Zoe her focus. For her whole life she's most likely lived a mundane and tough life as a farmer and gravesinger, with a small career as a warrior during the Kaja's Red Raids. The secrets of the old world have most likely never even crossed her mind, due to her being so enveloped in her own culture. Now, here she is, at the entrance to a cauldron, with a device that will allow her to actually understand the technology she sees around her. It must be entirely alien to her. She's clearly processing a lot, 
but she isn't afraid or confused, which shows her mental fortitude and ability to adapt quickly. This is what makes Zoe such a brilliant character and a formidable ally for Aloy. Zoe's character progression from here on out is amongst some of the best in the game, so we'll keep an eye on her moving forward. The rest of this mission is actually dedicated to the first cauldron you come across in the game, and thus it teaches you the fundamentals of the dungeon-like nature of these activities. This is actually one of two cauldrons that are only available by playing the main story, which is interesting, considering cauldrons were just optional side content in Horizon Zero Dawn. Cauldrons are underground facilities that were entirely built by one of Gaia's subordinate functions, known as Hephaestus. Hephaestus' primary function was to construct these underground facilities so that they could be used to build machines that would in turn be used to terraform the landscape. Some cauldrons are also used as repair bays for existing machines, hence why the land gods return to the cauldrons each year for routine maintenance. You'll notice that the inside of these cauldrons are asymmetrical and not practical for human use. This is because the cauldrons were not created for human workers, as they were built by Hephaestus after humans were extinct. Cauldrons merely serve as a way to manufacture and release machines into the world so that they can get on with terraforming. I always like this aspect of the cauldrons, and how they don't follow the same design patterns as other old world facilities, because they technically aren't old world facilities. They were built after the extinction of the human race by Hephaestus and its machines. Cauldrons are normally split up into four separate gameplay types. Exploration, parkour, puzzles, and combat. Having four distinct styles of play that are constantly switched out for one another, and sometimes used at the same time, makes for a very engaging gameplay experience, in my opinion. In one moment, you're parkouring around the jagged metal walls of the cauldron to reach a new area, and in the next, you're fighting off a wave of deadly machines. In terms of atmosphere, Cauldrons are normally quite lonely, especially considering you can't leave a cauldron until after you've finished it. So it's nice to have Val and Zoe here with you during this one. Their additional dialogue during exploration as well as their help during combat is very welcome because most cauldrons are quite long, meaning you're underground for sometimes up to an hour at a time. This cauldron isn't quite as long or as combat or puzzle oriented as some of the later ones due to it being a main story mission, but it does certainly teach you the basics when it comes to cauldron exploration. This cauldron in particular, Repair Bay Tau, has been taken over by the rogue AI Hephaestus, which explains the influx of hostile machines in the area. Remember the signal I mentioned earlier which turned all of Guy's subordinate functions to sentient AI? Well, Hephaestus is another one of the dangerous ones, like Hades. Hephaestus has limited access to the cauldron network, meaning for years it has been producing combat machines to kill humans, being the direct cause of the machine derangement. It's not quite clear what Hephaestus' goal is at this point, but it deems humans a threat, and has been using cauldrons to create hunter-killer machines that will actively seek out and eliminate humans, so as to quell the human threat, which is why it needs to be stopped, contained, and merged back with Gaia, so that it can return to its intended purpose of creating peaceful machines that collect resources and help maintain the biosphere. You may remember Hephaestus from Horizon Zero Dawn, the Frozen Worlds expansion, in which it's the primary antagonist, and takes control of the Firebreak facility at Yellowstone, creating Cauldron Epsilon, and using the large deposits of magma to create powerful combat machines, which would in turn kill countless humans. Obviously, Hephaestus' plans were thwarted by Aloy, but the AI still persists, finding ways to break through the cybersecurity of more cauldrons, and infecting the facilities one by one, and continuing to create new forms of combat machines. After lots of wandering around, climbing, fighting machines, and finding secrets, Aloy, Val, and Zoe finally find themselves at the very heart of the cauldron, the repair bay core, and waiting for them inside is the land god Far. The once peaceful Plowhorn has now been turned into the combat augmented Grimhorn, a new type of combat machine designed to kill humans. Knowing the consequences of letting this out into the world, Zoe agrees with Aloy that Far must be taken care of here and now, otherwise it would wreak havoc across Plainsong. This again shows those priorities. Unlike the Chorus, she cares solely for the well-being of the Utaru tribespeople, and will willingly break tradition if it means saving lives, which makes her such a likeable character. Upon dropping down and overriding the network uplink, the Grimhorn is released from the force field, and immediately sets its sights on Aloy, and the fight begins. This is a fight that could be considered another boss battle. It's not exactly a unique enemy, but as you'll come to know later when we talk about cauldrons, is that each cauldron ends with a sort of boss battle against a strong machine. Although, may I'd consider this a boss battle because of its story significance. This is far the land god after all, not your standard plow horn. This fight is pretty straightforward. Drop down, release far from its containment, and immediately use your focus to scan the various parts of the machine. This is a combat machine, so it has a couple of weapons for you to use, which are powerful disc launchers mounted on the machine's back. 
These hit really hard. Shooting the disc launchers off allows you to pick them up and fire a barrage of explosive discs at the Grimhorn, blowing off components left, right, and center. Grimhorns also have sacks filled with blaze that serve as a weak spot that can cause lots of damage. Shooting a sack enough will cause it to explode, dealing fire damage over time. Your best friend during this fight, however, is going to be acid arrows. Grimhorns are weak to acid, meaning all you've got to do is sink a few of these into the Grimhorn's chassis until the acid begins to corrode them. Then it's best to switch to some form of explosive whilst the metal is being eaten by acid, as this is going to do insane amounts of damage. This was actually a combo I like to use a lot all the way up until the end of the game. Acid arrows and explosives just completely decimate anything, but of course it's most effective against machines that are already weak to acid. Overall, the actual Grimhorn fight itself is great, and really test your weapons and abilities at this point in the game. And with that, the Land God Far has been slain, and the first cauldron has been explored. Don't worry, we'll come back to talk more about the rest later. Mourning a machine that nearly killed us? It's still her god. I do not grieve for a god or a machine but because I no longer know what to believe. Look, so if you want, you can go back home. Do I still have one? And if so, for how long? Can you really heal our lands? Save my people? One step at a time. It starts now. bad. Up we go. There's more. Like Aloy said, this is only the beginning. After purging Hephaestus from the cauldron and laying far to rest, there's nothing stopping us from recovering Minerva. Repair Bay Tau is a cauldron that's connected to another facility, the Regional Control Center. I won't go into too much detail about this facility yet, but I will say that these control centers were intended to be used by the new humans to oversee the terraforming process, but because Apollo, Gaia's subordinate function tasked with educating new humans, was purged, these facilities were left untouched because no one knew they were there or even how to use them. Upon entering the facility, everything seems normal. Doors are easy to bypass, the facility is well lit, and it seems to be in good condition considering it's been sitting here untouched for a thousand years. Heading deeper in, it appears that Minerva becomes agitated at the presence of Aloy, Val, and Zoe, and begins to initiate a facility-wide lockdown which locks all the doors, making certain points of the building completely inaccessible. I find it really interesting that Minerva is scared, unlike Hades or Hephaestus who both harbour negative emotions and a direct hatred for humanity. Minerva is confused and scared. Despite its efforts to close off the facility which insinuates a desire to be left alone, Minerva is the only subordinate function that responds to Aloy's scan of the nearby area in Latopolis possibly indicating that it's desperate for companionship, most likely feeling very alone and confused. After all, the subordinate functions were never meant to become sentient AI in their own right, they were only meant to be an extension of Gaia, so imagine suddenly gaining the ability to think and feel independently with no way to communicate with anyone. It's just a really interesting concept to me that the different subordinate functions developed different personalities based on what their roles were within Zero Dawn. Hades developed an apathy for humans because its job was to end all life on Earth. Hephaestus will stop at nothing to kill every human because humanity actively hunts the machines it creates to maintain the biosphere, and Minerva is scared, alone, and confused, desperately broadcasting its own location to end 
any who would help it. Which is ironically fitting, because her job as a subordinate function was to use the network of spires to broadcast the codes that would stop the Pharaoh Plague. With the facility in lockdown, luckily for Aloy, not only can she pry open doors with her spear, but she finds an elevator shaft that she uses to reach the upper levels of the facility. She stumbles across a vent and uses the pull caster to rip the grating off so she can head to the vents to see if there's a way to reach Minerva by scaling the mountains outside. After making our way through the vent system, we come out onto the snow-covered mountaintops, high above the farmlands of Plainsong. Here we have a really nice parkour section that has us scaling the rock face around and using the shield wing and the pull caster to navigate the dangerous route leading to the main control room of the facility. Finally, Aloy pulls herself up to the last ledge and clears away the rocks blocking the way inside. Climbing through one last vent leads to a rappel point allowing Aloy to rappel down, finding herself in the main control room right in front of the console that houses the AI Minerva, the key to rebooting Gaia's heuristic matrix. No! Minerva, I need the console. Please. Access denied. It didn't used to be like this. Do you remember it? Anything? You were part of something bigger once. Something good. Gaia. That's right. She can live again. But only if you give her the chance. I can't reboot her without you. Will I cease? I think you'll disappear into her. Become part of her. Like you used to be. That's okay. Yes. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you, Minerva. <clears throat> Elizabeth Sobek. Alpha Prime. Master Override activated. Restoring Minerva function to original code. to initiate heuristic matrix? Here goes. So it is Aloy, not Elizabeth. We have much to discuss, but initialization of my heuristic matrix will not be complete for several minutes more. In the meantime, I suggest you familiarize yourself with this facility. It is our best option for a base of operations, and you can make use of its equipment to improve your ability to override machines. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Shall I grant access to your companions? They will be here shortly. Um... Okay, but... Don't overwhelm them, okay? They don't have a lot of experience with things like... Well... You. Uh, so no fake this time? No. This time she's real. 
Borrell. So, this is Gaia. Hello. Hi. Hi. Gaia's still, uh, waking up. Let's look around. I will highlight the location of the lab on your focus. With Gaia needing time to reboot her heuristic matrix, I think it's a perfect time for us to talk about what this facility actually is, and what it will be used for moving forward in the game's story. As I mentioned earlier, this facility is a regional control center, regional control center 9 to be more specific. These facilities were built all across the world, for the sole purpose of being used by future generations of humans to monitor Gaia's terraforming systems. However, the subordinate function Apollo was purged from Gaia by Ted Farrow in the final days of the old world, and all of humanity's knowledge up until that point Point went along with it, meaning the new humans that eventually came to inhabit the new world had no idea that they were even meant to oversee Gaia's terraforming operations in the first place, leaving these facilities to rust underneath the surface of the earth for nearly a thousand years. Due to its strategic positioning in the mountains, as well as how relatively untouched by nature the facility is, Regional Control Center 9 from this point will be used as a base of operations for Aloy and her companions so that they can come here to recuperate, study old world information using their focuses, and discuss future plans amongst themselves and with Gaia. The inclusion of a base in this game is so perfect. A place that you can return to after each mission to resupply and speak with your companions really adds another layer to the game. As you'll see moving forward in the game, after every major quest we will always return to the base to resupply and speak to Gaia before setting off on the next main quest. And I absolutely love the gameplay loop. It feels like returning home after a long journey across the Forbidden West. In Horizon Zero Dawn, I always considered Meridian to be Aloy's base of operations, but it wasn't exactly that useful, not only because of the war between the Cadre and the Eclipse threatening the city, but also because there was nowhere for Aloy to sit and plan her next mission. A lot of planning and discussion of what was learned was done on the move while speaking to Silence via the Focus, so having an actual secret base that is disconnected from the Tanakh Civil War is very useful. This means that Aloy can theoretically focus on the pressing matter of collecting the available subordinate functions without becoming too engrossed in the politics of the Tanakh. The base isn't fully open to Aloy from the get-go as Gaia is still booting up and gradually gaining control of the facility, but also some areas of the base are locked off until you progress further into the story. For the sake of the video, I'm just going to cover everything included in the base so that you guys can get a feel as to why I love it so much as an idea, as well as the things you can do here. The main hall is of course the large room located in the centre of the facility on the first level. This area was built to be a gathering space for the future humans tasked with operating the control centre. It's a large rounded room with lots of communal areas to sit, as well as desks to work out and lots of doors leading into other parts of the facility. As the game progresses, the main hall and other areas of the base will become adorned with decorations created by the facility's various inhabitants that reflect their tribes and cultures. For example, the base contains Utaru rugs and plants, Nora decorations in the the form of candles and supply crates, Osaram delving equipment and armor, etc. I really like this touch. As Aloy brings more companions into the base, they all add their own personal flair to the areas they set up in, and what was once a cold metal room barren of all decoration, turns into a warm homely place that you grow to love over the course of the game. The main hall is repurposed into a general storage and recreational area, where a lot of the group's main supplies are kept, as well as where each of the characters come when they want to drink together, tell stories, or play machine strike to pass the time. What was once intended to be used as a bar for the people operating Regional Control Center 9, has now been repurposed as Zoe and Val workstation, where they practice using their focuses and trawl through information Aloy has shared with them from her focus so they can learn more about the old world. Later on in the game, a special chest becomes available to Aloy which contains a variety of resources and valuables. This chest is replenished whenever you return to the base after a long time. As you get further into the game, this chest is filled with increasingly more valuable items, corresponding to your level in game. It gives the impression that your companions are out on their own little missions, delving ruins, hunting machines and foraging together so that Aloy has something to come back to that will help her on her travels. Lastly, there's a really cool diagram on the wall opposite Gaia's chamber, which depicts the symbol for Gaia with the subordinate functions surrounding it in a circle. Each time you return a subordinate function to Gaia, the corresponding icon on the wall lights up. I just thought this was a really nice touch. Whereas the others have to sleep within close proximity to one another in the more communal sleeping quarters, Aloy gets her own room in the base. 
It was previously one of the many private office spaces within the base, but it has been repurposed so that Aloy has somewhere to privately gather herself and rest away from the rest of the group. This is where Aloy keeps many of her most important personal belongings, one being Elizabeth's pendant that she found at the end of Horizon Zero Dawn, and another being her first spear that Rost gave to her when she was a child. Aloy's room is a small window into her character, and the reflection she has upon interacting with these items shows a side of Aloy that she doesn't show anyone except for us as the player. Aloy reminisces on times during her childhood and her unresolved trauma regarding Ross's death, as well as her longing to meet Elizabeth and how she wished that she had a mother. Aloy never shows this more delicate troubled side of herself, which is fitting because just like Elizabeth, she carries the weight of the world on her shoulders, but is reluctant to share the burden with others. As I said earlier, however, her arc in this game is learning to transcend that mindset and accept the help from those who care for her. The archive room was originally intended as a training room, featuring advanced training modules so that new humans could quickly get to grips with the terraforming system. Gaia repurposes this room as an archive room to store all the data Aloy has collected across her adventures. This way the group can access any necessary information relating to their mission. Originally intended to serve as a recreational room for officers of the control center, this room is repurposed to serve as a war room of sorts, with holographic displays showing the activities of Regala's rebels in the region, meaning that Aloy and her companions can use this room to track the movements of Regala's forces, as well as plan their next missions. The shelves at the back of the room actually display all of the machine strike pieces that Aloy's collected over the course of the game, which is a really cool little feature that I had no idea was in the game. The fabrication room was originally intended to be a laboratory that would oversee machine repair operations in Repair Bay Tau below the facility, but of course with no personnel to work the facility in the way that it was intended, the fabrication room becomes more of a workshop. This room contains a workbench, which is obviously very useful as you can craft ammo and weapons and armor upgrades before before you head out back into the wilds. The main standout feature of the fabrication room is the fabrication terminal, which is used to craft and activate machine overrides. There are many machine overrides in the game, and this is where you can create overrides for some of the deadlier and larger machines. Unlike Horizon Zero Dawn, to acquire most overrides in this game you must craft them here using materials taken from the corresponding machines. The sleeping quarters is quite self-explanatory. It's the area in which most of Aloy's companions sleep, bringing belongings and personal effects from their homes that reflect their cultures. As Aloy gains more companions, more people move into the sleeping quarters, adding their own flair and a dash of character to the area. Directly adjacent to the sleeping quarters is a bathroom and shower area. It's never specifically said anywhere whether the showers or bathroom appliances are unoperational. So I like to imagine the characters using old world appliances for the first time, or stepping into a shower and realizing it runs hot water. These facilities were designed to be operational after hundreds if not thousands of years, so I like to think the gang got to at least have a nice hot shower. Guy's chamber can be accessed via the staircase in the main hall. It's of course one of the most important rooms in the base because it's where Gaia is housed, the most valuable thing on planet Earth. This room is accessed by Aloy and her companions whenever they want to consult Gaia and speak with her directly. Although it's mostly Aloy that makes her way up here as she has the closest relationship with Gaia, given the fact that she is a clone of Elizabeth. There's plenty of great conversations Aloy has with Gaia in this room, as you'll come to see as we progress further into the game. The basement was originally intended to be a server room, where the immense amount of data being received will be stored. You can see the computers lining the room with a huge mass of industrial cables in the center, giving an idea of just how much data is required to run an automated terraforming system. Who would have guessed? Of course, this makes it the perfect place to house Gaia, because the computers are capable of storing so much data that they're also powerful enough to support Guy's heuristic matrix. There's also a secret passage leading from one of the side rooms in the basement and through a ventilation shaft. The secret passage leads to a hidden room with a code locked door. Behind the door are personal records left behind by the facility's design team as a sort of memorial for the people that helped build Regional Control Center 9. Little did they know, this small facility would become one of the most important facilities in the Forbidden West, housing Gaia herself as well as accommodating Aloy and her team, the only people capable of saving humanity from extinction a second time. Overall, the base was the perfect addition to Horizon Forbidden West. Not only does it further develop Aloy's relationship with her companions, but it also serves as a place that you will always come back to after main story quests to resupply. I really like this aspect. As you progress through the game, and your companions decorate the base more, it feels more and more like home, and I hope we get to see it again in future DLC. Anyway, with the tour of the base done, I think it's time for us to go and speak to Gaia regarding the humans we encountered in Latopolis, as well as where exactly we can find the other subordinate functions. Hello, Aloy. Uh, hi. So you're... ready? Yes. Initialization is complete. All tests show that my heuristic matrix launched correctly and is stable. 
You must have many questions. Yeah, but two big ones first. We're not going to be able to fix the biosphere without making you whole. I ran a search for your subfunctions at the Hades Proving Lab, but Minerva was the only one I found. Thankfully, the sensory capabilities of this facility are far more advanced. I will search for the others now. Transmitting query pattern. Receiving. Of Apollo, Artemis, and Eleuthia, I can find no trace. They are simply gone. What about the others? Ether, Demeter, and Poseidon are revealed. They lie within reach, procurable. And Hephaestus? It too stands revealed, but it is not like the others. <laughs> That's for sure. In the years since the extinction signal, Hephaestus has evolved. Moreover, it is not confined to a single location. It haunts the global network that connects cauldrons to each other across the planet, making it exceptionally difficult to subdue. Let me guess. We need it bad? Correct. Its capabilities are essential. Without it, I can only delay the extinction of life on Earth. Hephaestus is our only hope of a permanent solution. So we start there? Unfortunately, we cannot. Procuring Hephaestus can only be attempted after my own capabilities have been significantly enhanced. Grab the other subordinate functions first, then Hephaestus. Precisely so. So, Aether, Demeter, and Poseidon. How do I capture them? To recover a subordinate function, you will have to travel to its location and find the physical processor to which it escaped. Then, exactly as you did with Minerva, you must use the Master Override to revert the subordinate function to its original code state. And then how do I get it back here? The subordinate function must be loaded onto a data storage device and physically carried back to this facility. The cartridge your root kernel was stored on? Yes. Its capacity is limited, so it can only carry one subordinate function at a time. But in all other respects, it will suffice. Maybe you can help me make sense of something. A while ago, I had a run-in with a group of... strangers who tried to kill me. They had machine servitors, and a, um... a... a clone of Elizabeth Sobek with them. Yes, this was recorded by your focus. Do you know who they are? The answer to that question is related to the extinction signal that woke Hades, prompting my predecessor's self-destruction. The extinction signal? Okay, that sounds ominous. The signal did not come from Earth, Aloy. The calculations are complicated but it appears to have originated 81 trillion kilometers away. A distance so vast that light itself requires 8.611 years to cross it. Okay, so... What's so far away and... and why does it want us dead? The Sirius star system. Sirius? But that's where Far Zenith, their ship... The Odyssey. Yes, that's where it was headed. But it blew up. Unless... Uh, I don't... Why make it seem like they failed? They didn't want anyone to know. 
They didn't want future humans to think that they were out there. Wait. The strangers who tried to kill me at the Hades Proving Lab? The ones with the clone? Are you saying that they're from... That they're descendants of... Farsenith? Yes. That is my conclusion. What is the state of the biosphere? Is the terraforming system functioning at all? In a sense, the terraforming system never stopped functioning. The difference, since my predecessor's destruction, is that there has been no central governing intelligence to monitor its robotic agents and assign new tasks. As a result, errors have accrued, and day by day, the biosphere has gradually veered ever more sharply towards destruction. In recent months, disturbances in the biosphere have become obvious. But these bellwether phenomena offer just the merest glimpse of the complex and accelerating cycles of environmental dysfunction, now driving Earth's biosphere towards collapse. Then you can't do anything to stop it. If you can return Aether, Poseidon, and Demeter to me, I can improvise modest corrections to parts of the system. Weather will improve, water will be purified, and rampant plant growth curtailed. But such corrections will not stave off collapse. They will only buy us time. Only with Hephaestus can I design and produce new robotic agents designed to permanently reverse the damage that has accumulated. All efforts must be directed toward that end. How long do we have, then? At present rates, without additional factors. The biosphere will cross a point of no return in approximately four months. And if I gather Aether, Demeter, Poseidon, merge you with them? We will only gain a few months more. Well... Every bit counts. I guess I should get going and start bringing back subordinate functions. What can you tell me about their locations? When my predecessor destroyed herself, the subordinate functions sought physical processors capable of holding them. So in each case you will be looking for a powerful computer of some kind. Ether is the closest and therefore might be the easiest to acquire. However, it appears to be in the middle of Tanakh territory. My knowledge of that tribe is limited to data I read on your focus, but they seem to have a significant inclination towards violence. Well, that's a nice way to put it. What about Poseidon and Demeter? Poseidon has taken shelter in the desert south of this location. My substratal geography data indicates that a major Old World settlement, called Las Vegas, was located there. A ruin in the middle of the desert, huh? Strange place for an AI devoted to water. Agreed. As for Demeter, it appears to be located on the coast to the far west. Unfortunately, I am unable to provide any relevant data about the region. As such, it may be the most difficult to retrieve. Okay. So, three subordinate functions to go after. Aether, somewhere in Tanakh's territory. Poseidon in the desert, and Demeter on the coast. Where will you begin? I think I'll head for Aether. Then I will assign Aether as the objective on your focus. If you obtain it, I may be able to use it to quell the most severe storms in the region. Though I will require Hephaestus and the control over machines that it offers to permanently stabilize the biosphere. Should you change your mind, you can update your objective via your focus interface at any time. I will also transmit a summary of available data on all of the subordinate functions to you for reference. Is there anything else I can help you with? I know you have a great deal to accomplish. I do, don't I? Is something wrong? Um... I don't know. It's just that... 
Elizabeth set the bar pretty high. She had a dream for you, for life on Earth, and... A lot has gone wrong, and it's all on my shoulders to fix it. Do you think I can do it all? Repair the system? Defeat Varzenith? Live up to her example? Absolutely. In her last message, my predecessor declared her unwavering conviction in your success. In you, all things are possible. You prevailed in purging Hades and rebooting my system core. You will prevail in this. Thank you, Gaia. Well, I, uh... I guess I should get going. I have unlocked the facility's exits. One leads onward to the west. The other leads back down the mountain to Plainsong, should you wish to return east. Varl? Whoa! Gonna have to get used to that. That you, Aloy? Uh, yeah. Gaia's opened the exits to this place. Can you and Zoe meet me by the west door? Be right there. And there you have it, all that's left is to leave the base and head further west. I know this video is already really long, but we have so much more to talk about. Not only do we now know that the humans Aloy encountered in Latopolis are possible descendants of Far Zenith, the organization of Earth's richest people, we also know where to find three of Gaia's eight remaining subordinate functions. Aether, in charge of regulating Earth's atmosphere, Poseidon, in charge of detoxifying Earth's oceans, and Demeter, in charge of recreating Earth's flora biosphere. These three subordinate functions are actually the most impactful of them all, with each of them tasked with regulating and monitoring integral parts of the Earth and are crucial to keeping it inhabitable. Of course, Hephaestus is also at large, but as Gaia said, it's not easy to track down and isolate due to its evolution into the Cauldron Network, and Gaia herself does not yet have the power to isolate Hephaestus and convert it back to its original code anyway. So for now, we set our sights on Aether, Poseidon, and Demeter. I must say though, I really like this ending dialogue between Gaia and Aloy, where Aloy begins doubting herself, which is a rare sight as Aloy is normally very sure of herself and her abilities. She compares herself to Elizabeth, in this moment questioning whether she can bear the immense burden of saving the biosphere against all odds, unsure that she can live up to the woman that sacrificed everything to preserve life. Gaia is no stranger to this self-doubt, as she was most likely there to reassure Elizabeth in the days of Project Zero Dawn that she can do it. If anyone is capable of saving the world, it's her. Which is true. Aloy, much like Elizabeth, is brilliant beyond compare, and she still doesn't see just how important she is in all this. Elizabeth was there to ensure that humanity could find its way back home, and Aloy was created by Gaia to defend that home. I also just want to highlight how cool the premise of this next section of the game is, exploring the expanses of the Tanakh clan lands further west towards the coast, getting involved in the midst of a violent civil war, searching ancient ruins from the old world to find the most important and advanced AI humanity was ever able to create, all to save the world from the inevitable collapse of the biosphere. When I realised whilst playing that I had complete access to the open world and could choose which order I collected the subordinate functions in, a huge grin spread across my face as I realised the sheer size of the adventure I had ahead of me. And we're going to be going on this adventure together, so sit back and strap in, because this is only the beginning. Finally, we've made it to the bulk of the game. When I think back to my time playing Horizon Forbidden West, I always think of Aloy travelling across the land to find each of Gaia's subordinate functions. I think it's because this part of the game takes the most time to complete. At least, it did for me because I kept getting sidetracked by side content. As you know, we're able to pick which of the subordinate functions we want to go after first. And in this case, we're going to go for Aether, which is the closest of the three to the base. To me, it makes sense to go for the closest one first, and then work outwards. Aether is responsible for detoxifying the Earth's ravaged atmosphere and controlling weather conditions, making the air breathable again after the Pharaoh Plague poisoned it, and quelling the unstable weather patterns caused by the collapse of the biosphere. Without Aether, Gaia is unable to control weather and atmospheric conditions, meaning air quality will slowly decline, and weather becomes more erratic and dangerous, with powerful supercell storms ravaging the land. This makes Aether one of Gaia's most important subordinate functions, and with it, Gaia can once again bring stability to the Earth's atmosphere and weather cycles. 
Aloy heads west out of the base and goes to the location of Aether's coordinates, which conveniently happens to be located directly in the Memorial Grove, a place which is very important in Tanakh culture as the Memorial Grove is where Tanakh culture began, and where their ideals of strength and ferocity came from. Upon approaching the gates of the Memorial Grove, Aloy is greeted by the chaplain, Decker, an experienced Tanakh warrior and elder of the Lowlands clan, whose job is to decipher the visions within the Memorial Grove. These visions are holograms left behind from the Old World. The Memorial Grove was once a museum that told the story of a valiant band of soldiers who held their ground against an enemy that outnumbered them. They are unanimously known by the Tanakh as the Ten, and the memory of these soldiers and the battle they served in is what formed the basis of Tanakh culture. Decker shows us the displays, with each of them telling us a different part of the story of the Ten, but the data being streamed to the hollow projectors has long since begun to corrupt, leaving the Tanakh with only fragments of the whole picture. Chaplains like Decker dedicate themselves to studying these holograms in the hopes of one day finding deeper meaning in the small snippets of story they have access to. But we'll talk more about this cornerstone of Tanakh culture later. Aether is located somewhere within the Memorial Grove, and who is better to discuss this matter with than Chief Ikaro, the respected chieftain of the Tanakh. Surely with his power, he would be able to help Aloy recover Aether quickly and easily without preamble. Decker leads us to the throne room, and waiting for us is the legendary chieftain of the Tanakh in the flesh. I'm ready. Good. Come. It's underneath the throne. I will see you soon, Outlander. The savior of Meridian. I am told you held back Regala's forces outside Baron Light. And defeated her champion, Grutta, in single combat. Impressive. I met Fashav there, too. He said you were a great warrior, and a man of honor. His death is a painful loss among many. We will not soon recover from the massacre of our marshals. But if you are here to pledge your service, that could help considerably. I am not here to fight for you. I need something in that basement. Something that will save many lives, yours included. It's not something you can see, but it is there. I have seen it. You have named your price. Now I name mine. With my marshals dead, I need your spear. Help me defeat my enemies and I will grant you access to the chamber below. I don't have a price. I am not a hired killer. I'm here to save lives, more than you can count. I count the corpses of Marshal slain. I count hundreds more to knock them, whose lives hang in the balance. I will fight for them. I will kill anyone who threatens the peace, and you will too if you want me to open the door to the chamber below. Okay. So by that logic, what's stopping me from killing you right now and taking what I need to save everyone? You could try. You might even succeed. Either way, you must fight. My way might hold off Regala and the slaughter she craves. Fine. What do you need? I need more marshals to keep the tribe together. Such warriors can only be promoted at a trial by combat called the Cool Root. I've sent out a call for the competition, but since Regala seeks to undermine me, she is certain to attack it. She'll want to kill me in front of the assembled clans. So what, you want me to be your bodyguard? No. 
to defend the cool route. But there is more. Knowing Regala will attack, one of the clans have balked at sending their contestants. You must go north and force Tecote, the commander of the Sky Clan, to submit and send his best. Force him to submit. Do whatever is necessary. I can't hold a cool route with two of the three clans in attendance. Marshal Cathala will assist you. He was maimed at Baron Light, but he can still be of use. I sent him ahead to the northern village of Stone Crest. Meet him there, and he will guide you to the Sky Clan stronghold. If you have any questions about your mission, now is the time. I'll do what you want and go north to deal with Dakota. But you'd better not forget about our deal. You will have what was promised, if you succeed. Speak to Decca on your way out. She will arm you for the road ahead. As you can tell, Chief Akaro is a very resourceful man. Decker wasn't lying when she said he can be persuasive. I really like how right off the bat he's characterised as a fair leader who is great with people and can influence even the most stubborn individuals. After all, Aloy is the most stubborn there is, and yet he was able to convince her to help him with a few short sentences. He even keeps a clear head when she bluffs and threatens to try to kill him to get what she wants, as he knows that killing for personal gain isn't in her nature, otherwise she wouldn't have helped fight back Regala at the embassy. Aloy eventually rolls over and accepts the task, to go to the Bulwark, the home of the Sky Clan, and force their leader Takote to bring warriors to the Memorial Grove so that they can hold the Kulrut. The Kulrut is an important Tanakh tradition in which a trial by combat is held in the arena where Tanakh warriors fight machines. The survivors are named marshals and they work closely with Hikaru himself, like Fashav did. A Kulrut can be held whenever the chief is in need of candidates to become marshals and after Regala's attack on the embassy, most of Hikaru's marshals are gone, which means another Kulrut is required to see who's worthy. However, Tekote, the leader of the Sky Clan, is refusing to answer Hikaru's call which is why Aloy must head to the Bulwark and force him by any means to reconsider his stance. Aloy is to go to the settlement of Stonecrest to meet with Catalo, one of Hikaru's remaining marshals who was maimed in the battle at the embassy, losing his arm in the conflict. We'll keep an eye on Catalo moving forward. He becomes a major character and I absolutely love the development he has over the course of this game. Anyway, it's time for us to leave the Memorial Grove and head to the harsh mountains of the Sky Clan. This valley is infested with Regala's rebels. The scouts from the village tell us that they've been moving machines through here for days. Some they ride, others they herd along, and some they even strip for parts, especially cannons. The path ahead will not be easy. We should get going. My orders are to guide you to the bulwark so that you can speak to Dakota. For all the good it'll do. Not so fast. I'm gonna need a little more than that. For all the good it'll do? What's that supposed to mean? The bulwark has stood unyielding since the birth of our clan. Behind it, Tecote believes himself to be invulnerable. If he insists on defying Hikaru's orders, an outlander and a maimed marshal aren't gonna change his mind. Your chief seems to think differently. And that is the only reason I am still standing here, talking to you. You were at the embassy. I was. I'm sorry about the other marshals. And their deaths will not go unpunished. <clears throat> You're still healing. I will never heal. But that won't stop me from cracking any skulls that need it. Good thing you're on my side, then. Hmm. What makes you so sure Takote won't listen to us? A snake safe in its lair hears nothing but its own rattle. Come on, is that all you've got for me? Hikaru said you were from the Sky Clan before becoming a marshal. I need to know what you know. Takote is a petty, 
Vindictive schemer. If he had any guts, he would have gone after Hakaro long ago. But instead, he covets the chieftain from behind the bulwark. Biding his time. Hoping that his foes will weaken one another. Is that enough for you? For now? So, what's the plan? The bulwark is to the southwest. So undoubtedly we'll have to cross paths with Rogala's troops along the way. We'll either have to fight our way through, or find a way to sneak past unnoticed. Neither will be easy. Never is. <laughs> Let's get this over with. As you can see, Catalo is a solitary man who does not seem to enjoy the company of others. He has great respect for the chief and his fellow marshals, but he isn't fond of strangers or outsiders. The loss of his arm and his comrades has only made him more withdrawn, and that reflects in how he interacts with Aloy. His flippancy and impatience are telltale signs of someone who is frustrated at their circumstances, and he's letting these frustrations out onto Aloy, who hasn't done anything to deserve it. Of course, Aloy isn't phased by this attitude as she's met many brooding men, but she understands why Catalo would be feeling bitter towards the world after losing so much, so she doesn't hold it against him. Catalo and Aloy are almost opposites, with Aloy being caring and curious, and Catalo being distant and unbothered. But their interests are aligned, and they have to work together if they want to succeed, so Catalo begrudgingly agrees to lead Aloy to the Bulwark. In between Stonecrest and the Bulwark is a small pathway in the valley below that connects the two settlements, which is currently occupied by Regala's rebels. This section will have Aloy and Catalo coming across groups of rebels, and you have the option to either fight them directly or use stealth to dispatch them. The choice is yours. There are only three groups of enemies, so it's easy to make short work of them. The most trouble you're going to get is from the shield bearers, but even they can be taken down quite easily with a good use of elemental arrows and combos with your spear. Upon reaching the bulwark, Catalo signals the guard who lowers the lift to the ground level. As I mentioned earlier, the bulwark is a settlement built into the mountains on top of a pile of huge boulders. The lift is the only way to directly access the bulwark because the boulders serve as a way to elevate the settlement above ground level. It's definitely the safest of all the Tanakh strongholds, but I suppose that comes at the cost of the harsh cold environment, meaning the Sky Clan are in constant battle with the elements. The bulwark is actually Catalo's home, where he grew up. He was chosen to take part in the Kulrut and succeeded, meaning he became a marshal and had to leave home to serve the chief. Catalo has a history with Takote. He fought alongside him during the Kaja Red Raids, even so much as leading men into Baron Light and opening the gates from the inside so that the Tanakh forces could raise the fortress. His courage during the Red Raids left him heralded as a hero by the Sky Clan, but this in turn made Takote feel intimidated by Catalo, assuming that he would come for his position as commander of the Sky Clan. Takote's jealousy led him to recommend Catalo for the Kulrut, knowing that he would survive and be made a marshal, severing his connection to the Sky Clan and in turn preserving his own position as commander. Despite his respect for Hikaru and his duty as a marshal, Catalo never wanted to leave the Sky Clan, nor did he want to become commander. He was content serving under Takote. Now, he resents Takote for his selfish decision, which is why Aloy is going with him, to soothe the damage of old wounds as an impartial individual. Not only this, but the Tanakh respects strength, and with Catalo missing his arm, it's unlikely he will be treated with the same respect as before. However, they would surely respect the presence of the champion of the embassy, who fought back Regala. As you make your way up, you can already hear Tanakh warriors making comments about Catalo's wound, which must make his suffering so much worse. The unlikely duo make their way into the settlement, and begin walking up the steps towards Takote's throne room. We're here for Takote. Let us in. Sky Clan's mighty son returns. Bless the Ten. Your chief has demanded an immediate dispatch of all challengers to the Cool Root. We're here to make sure yours haven't gotten lost on their way to the Grove. I see. Regala must have dealt our chief a mighty blow if he's sending you two as messengers. This one defeated Regala's champion, Grutta, at the embassy. She fought honorably. I had the sense to bar our soldiers from that embassy. Just as I have the sense now to keep our challengers here. 
If they must fight, then they will fight here. Defending our walls. Our clan. That wall won't protect you. Not from the machines Regala controls. They're already at your doorstep. <laughs> and what do you know of the battles that the Bulwark has withstood? The blood shed upon stone. I know it wasn't meant to be used as a coward's shield. You were a great warrior once. But that was then. But tell Hakaro, with all due respect, that we will keep our challengers here for as long as we are safe behind the bulwark. I told you. Words are useless with his kind. We're gonna have to kill him. It won't be easy with all his men above. Are you even listening? For as long as we are safe behind the bulwark, he said. Wait here. I need to get a closer look at that wall. What? Why? As you can see, Takote is very reluctant to send warriors to fight in the Cool Roads. The civil war has scared him and his people, and so he would prefer to cower behind the walls of the Bulwark rather than prepare for the inevitable war. He seems to think that his walls are strong enough to keep Regala out, but as Aloy discovered at the Battle of Meridian, even the tallest walls can fall. The key to convincing him lies in showing him just how fragile his fortress is, and that the only option to protect his people is to fight. On the way up in the lift, Aloy noticed some metal debris sticking out of the wall, so she decides to go and investigate the wall closer to see what exactly it's made out of, and if there's anything inside that can be used to take it down. Upon climbing up through the hole in the wall and inspecting closer with her focus, Aloy determines that within the wall of the Bulwark is an old world tank left over from Operation Enduring Victory, with an operational power core inside. This power core could be used as an explosive which could tear the walls of the Bulwark down, proving to Takote that his fortress is not as impenetrable as he originally thought. The only question is, how? Aloy returns to Kotalo and discusses the plan with him. If Takote refuses to take part in the Kulruts as long as his walls still stand, then it's time to tear them down. Regala's rebels have been harvesting machines in the nearby valleys, which means there's bound to be a high-powered cannon somewhere nearby that Aloy could use to blow up the power cell, which would surely displace the boulders that make up the wall of the bulwark itself. Kotalo seems reluctant to help with this plan, but agrees when Aloy makes a comparison between him and Takote, and how he would be defying Hikaru like that arrogant shit up there. Katalo's reply is really funny. He simply begrudgingly says, that was an unkind comparison, as he hurries to follow Aloy. It's clear Katalo's personality is coming out the more he and Aloy spend time together, and he's realizing that Aloy is more than a strange outlander. She's a resourceful and charismatic person. These are traits she received from Elizabeth, being able to forge alliances with the most unlikely people, such as her long romance and friendship with Travis Tate. Aloy has those same qualities of a perfect leader, which is why people can't help but follow her no matter how long they've known her for. Even a seemingly withdrawn and bitter man like Katalo can't help but follow her into the unknown. The rebels have made their camp at the northeast of the Bulwark. The plan is for Aloy and Katalo to storm in there, take out the rebels and their machines, and steal a cannon large enough to blow up the power cell inside the wall. Upon arrival, it's clear that the rebels have been busy collecting machines, as they're now in possession of an overridden Tremor Tusk, which is one of the most formidable machines in the game. This Tremor Tusk will be the perfect candidate, as it's outfitted with a variety of cannons and weapons that could be used to easily blow up the wall. This section can be approached in two ways. You can either take out the rebels stealthily before going in for the Tremor Tusk, which means you have the help of Katalo when fighting it, or you can just rush straight in and start blowing stuff up, leaving Katalo to take on the rebels whilst you take on the Tremor Tusk. I'll let you guys guess which one I chose. Fighting Tremor Tusks is actually really fun too. The bigger machines are always a challenge to fight, especially when they're this early in the game. I had a lot of trouble with this fight, not only because my weapons were terrible at this point in the game, but also because I wasn't quite sure where the weak points were or which elemental damage type would work the best, which is why I stress always scanning an unknown machine before fighting it. Additionally, Tremor Tremor Tusks hit hard, so taking any hits from it this early in the game can actually one-shot you, so you've got to make sure to use the environment to your advantage as you dodge and weave between its attacks. After a long and messy fight with a lot of explosive spear spam, the Tremor Tusk is finally down. Aloy tears the cannon from the machine's carcass, and Katalo hauls it back to the bulwark in order to finally bring the walls of the Sky Clan down. Upon returning, the cannon is mounted to a piece of nearby debris, and Aloy begins to shoot. It's working! Nothing's exploding. 
loading. This isn't gonna work. Well, isn't this impressive? Two children playing siege. I hope they haven't hurt the Bulwark's feelings. Come now, stop embarrassing yourselves. And leave this poor mountain alone. This is your last chance, Takote. You can still answer Hikaru's call. This is your last chance. You have it backwards. Leave this place, Savage, now. And take this cripple with you. Done. Can't hide behind the wall anymore, Takote. Now you have to join Hikaru. Never. Never. We will. We will rebuild it immediately. You are not safe. The bulwark couldn't protect you from a single cannon, let alone an army of machines. The only pathway to safety is to unite against Regalo with your chief. You decreed that no challengers would be sent, while the clan remained safe behind the bulwark. So send them now. Unless your word means nothing. Send them. I didn't hear you. Send the challengers. I look forward to seeing the Sky Clan's colors in the arena. Nicely done, Marshal. What's gonna happen to this place? They'll have to live without their wall. But that's better than living apart from the tribe, as pawns in Takote's foolish schemes. If you want to check up on them, talk to Jera, the chaplain of the clan. If anyone needs help up there, she'll know. Yeah, maybe I will. I'll take my leave then. I need to report to Hikaru. I'll see you at the culvert. Good. We may need another miracle there as well. And there we have it. With the Bulwark's Wall finally dealt with, Takote agrees to send the warriors for the Cool Roots. I just want to highlight Katalo's shifting character over the course of this quest. He begins the quest feeling disdain for Aloy and bitterness at life in general after losing comrades, as well as his arm at the embassy. But slowly as the quest unravels, he begins to see Aloy as more than just an outsider. He sees her resourcefulness, leadership, and courage, as well as how she treats him with respect despite his dismemberment. He tries to keep this cold hard exterior, but the more he and Aloy interact, the more comfortable he seems in her presence, until right at the end, where he sees her take down the bulwark, a seemingly impossible task. He realizes that Aloy is something else. She isn't just a warrior deserving of respect, or a compassionate friend, but a person capable of achieving what can only be described as miracles. With that tangent out of the way, I think it's time we return to Hikaru to begin preparations for the Kulrut itself. Aloy. It seems you've had to move mountains to bring the Sky Clan to heal. Literally. Katalo helped. Yes. Takote reprimanded for all the clan to see. You both served well. But now the cool route is at hand. Some have come to compete, others to bear witness. They know Regala will come for me. I'll do whatever it takes to hold up my end, as long as you remember yours. So what's the plan? Katalo. There are only two viable ways to attack the arena. 
through the throne room you just passed, and by the trail on the north end. We've set up barricades at both. But if Regala means to assault the cool route with machines, she will have to attack by the trail. You will join our defenders there. Hold the line, and I'll have my marshals. You will be free of my service and receive your reward. Make whatever preparations you must. Once the cool route begins, you must see it through. The grove, the arena, it's all part of the same ancient structure? Yes. Here the land remembers the sacrifice of the Ten. Their deeds commemorated for eternity. Sacrifice? The visions tell us that on the ground below, they gave their lives in a fight against machines. We honored them by holding the cool route where they fell. Let's get this over with. Good. You'll find Decca at the north barricade with the rest of our defenders. Strike true as the ten. I'll see you when this is done. As I've said, the Kulrut itself is a trial by combat that is held to determine who the next marshals are. The trial itself consists of many waves of machines, and the combatants in the arena must defeat a machine each to prove that they can handle themselves in the heat of battle. As Sakara mentioned, the arena itself is where the Ten fell. The large crater that makes up the pit in the arena is the blast zone of a huge explosion that occurred during a battle that broke out in the area. Due to the corruption of the data within the Memorial Museum, the Tanakh don't know much about the battle itself or why it occurred. Apart from the fact that those they dubbed the Ten fought back in military machines and eventually laid down their lives to protect innocents that were caught in the fighting. The Tanakh hold the Kulrut in the location that the Ten lost their lives as to honour their sacrifice and keep their memory alive. I'll get into what we can piece together of the story of the Ten later down the line, but for now, their battle will remain shrouded in mystery. Hikaru gifts Aloy some martial armour. If she is to fill the role of a marshal when defending the Kulrut, then she must be equipped to do so. I chose to wear the armor for this point in the game because I can't see Aloy just disregarding Hikaru's request to wear it, although if you're not a fan of how it looks, you can simply opt to keep your own armor on. For now, Aloy must head to the North Barricade to rendezvous with Decker in order to prepare for Regala's inevitable attack. The champions from their respective tribes are prepared, the machines are in place in the arena, and Hikaru finally addresses the crowd, and the Kulrut commences. There's also this really nice cutscene that shows the intensity of the Kulrut from the perspective of the warriors jumping down into the arena. The champions rappel down and immediately begin taking on the machines in one-on-one -on -one combat, using spears and machetes to hack away at them. This sequence also shows how tough it is to make it through the Kulrut, with one of the warriors being pummeled by the tail of a claw strider, killing him instantly. Even some of the strongest champions in their clans are still not capable of making it through such an ordeal alive, which once again reflects just how harsh Tanakh's life could be, especially when you consider that these people may not have even wanted to take part in the Cool Rut in the first place, much like how Katalo never wanted to become a marshal. On the other side of the arena, Aloy waits for Regala's forces to break through the tree line. Decker has equipped her with a cannon that has been torn from the back of a Ravager, meaning the objective here is to sit on top of the wall of the arena and use the cannon to take out the machines trying to break through the barricade. I like the large-scale battles they do in Horizon, with man and machine clashing on the battlefield. With with the Kulrut in full swing and Regala's forces advancing on Memorial Grove, it's time for Aloy to do what she does best. This first wave of machines consists of Scrappers, Ravagers, Claw Striders and Plowhorns, which can all be dealt with relatively easily given the firepower of the Ravager Cannon. This fight is so fun, just being able to unload an entire energy cell's worth of ammo into the fray of machines in front of you is the power fantasy I didn't know I needed. You're given extra ammo than normal as well, meaning all you need to do is hold that trigger down until everything standing in front of you is reduced to a heap of metal on the floor. Of course, the first wave is just a warm-up, and Regala plans to follow it up with something much worse. There can't be all of them. There. What is that? I don't know. Hold the defenses! Go! Oh! <laughs> 
Once again we find ourselves face to face with the Slitherfang, but under much different circumstances than last time. Instead of being trapped and damaged with limited abilities, we have to face a Slitherfang at the top of its operationality, with full control of its movement and weapon systems. I actually kinda wish we had to fight the Rockbreaker that we saw earlier in the cutscene because we've already fought a Slitherfang and Rockbreakers are very fun to fight, but this fight is fun anyways. There are two main phases to this fight, the first phase where the machine will largely use the same attack as the first fight, attacking you directly directly by lunging towards you and using its elemental focus beam to damage you at range. It's mainly a battle against the limited space in the arena, as you dodge its attacks to get periodic hits on its weak points. In the second phase of the fight, the Slitherfang will be a lot more aggressive with its attacks, regularly using its tail for charged AoE attacks that hit really hard. One thing that will make this fight a lot easier for you is knowing what this particular Slitherfang is weak to, fire, ice, and plasma. I'd recommend using fire, as at this point in the game it's the cheapest and easiest to craft, plus everyone has a weapon that has fire arrows, so it's the most accessible. But if you have plenty of chill water canisters to create ice bombs or arrows, it's definitely a good option. But mainly what I used in this fight was the sparker canisters that aligned along the underside of the machine's chassis. If you hit them with a single shock arrow, this causes the canister to blow up, which not only does a burst of damage, but it also immobilizes the machine for a time, allowing you to close the distance and deliver a few critical strikes with your spear whilst it's down. The great thing about this strategy is that there's a ton of sparker canisters all over the Slitherfang's body, meaning you can just shoot the next one when the shock status effect wears off and go in for a few more critical strikes. Lastly, Slitherfangs also have this large sack on their chest that can be shot and blown up. This does a huge burst of damage which is useful if you're finding it hard to get damage in. Overall, Slitherfangs can be hard to fight, but if you know what weaknesses you're looking for, then you'll easily have the upper hand. After a tough fight, Aloy has little time to process what just happened. She runs through the rubble left by Regala's machines and past an act locked in battle with the rebels until she reaches the throne room where Hikaru and Regala are fighting one to one. This isn't finished! I'll be back with everything I have! And all who stand with Hakaro will be run red. At attention. You fought well. Proved yourself against enemies both metal and flesh. I name you all, Marshal. Your first order is to secure the arena from any remaining rebels. Go. <sighs> ah. 
I failed. I should have finished Regala. But now she'll be back with more machines. Stronger than ever. I'll do what I can to help. No, you've done enough. Far more than our bargain called for. When we first met, you spoke of your true mission on which all depends. I wasn't certain if I believed you then. But I believe in you now. So leave me. And get to your task. What will you do? Tend to the wounds. What you need is there. Take it. Your deeds today will be remembered like those of the Ten. Finally, after ingratiating ourselves into Tanakh culture for a while, we've finally found Aether, which is coincidentally located directly underneath Hikaru's throne. Aloy has officially gained the respect of the chieftain of the Tanakh himself, which I'm sure will prove useful as we make our way deeper into the clanlands. Word of Aloy's deeds will most likely have spread quickly. Underneath the throne room is a chamber with a console in the center. This console is the processor that houses Aether. Unlike Minerva, Hades, or Hephaestus, Aether seems immediately willing to go back to Gaia even referring to her as home. Aloy uses the Master Override installed into her spear, as well as her clearance as Alpha Prime, to revert Aether back to its original code, converting it from a sentient AI back into a subordinate function, using Gaia's kernel to house it until we can return to the base to reintegrate it into Gaia's heuristic matrix. This way, Gaia can begin to regulate the Earth's atmospheric and weather conditions with haste. But before we head back to the base, there's one last thing we need to see at the Memorial Grove. As a result of Aloy taking Ether back from the Memorial Museum's central computer, the data being streamed to the hollow projectors is no longer corrupted and can be played in full, allowing the rest of the Tanakh to see the visions that inspired Hikaru when he first came to the Grove. I'm gonna let this scene play out, as I think it's a great moment that really shows how much humanity stands to benefit from unity, instead of constantly warring to tear each other down. The visions throughout the Grove are different now and this one it, it just appeared is this your doing the visions have changed that's the one that inspired chief hakaro more testimony of the old ones Hear now the words that reunited a people. Following the tragic events of the war, Anne Faraday, the chief architect of the reconciliation effort, addressed a nation in need of hope. If we look into the future, the lens of the recent past, our fears loom. Wars waged against machines, scarcity of food and water, Storms that drive us from our homes. But true courage means facing those fears with conviction instead of cynicism. Leading the peacekeeping effort with these brave men and women, these marshals of the new Southwest has strengthened my conviction. That when we are united, we can overcome any threat. Join me. Join us in that conviction. As we strive for a nation and a world without want or war. Reporting for duty, Commander. I'm coming with you. 
But Hikaru needs you. Because of you, he has new marshals. And a rallying cry the clans cannot ignore. So I will stand with you on your mission. Give whatever is left of my life. It is what I choose. How can I say no to that? Zo. There's someone who wants to join us. I need you to meet him in the foothills and guide him the rest of the way. Will do, Aloy. Go to the mountains, west of Plainsong. A friend of mine will meet you on the ascent. I'll join you when I can. A friend of yours? Should be interesting. This cutscene is so beautiful, with the speech from Anne Faraday and the reactions from the observing Tanakh as they realise their fight against machines for survival is not so different to that of the old ones, and how the Ten fought valiantly against the US government's deployment of military machines to protect the people of the Mojave who are being wrongly forced to evacuate their homes. The story of the Ten isn't really explicitly told in the game, but I think it would do good for our understanding of the Tanakh if I piece together their story from the limited amount of lore we get. This way we can better understand how the Tanakh came to be and how they interpreted the story of the Ten, or Joint Task Force Ten as the group was known in the Old World. During the 2030s, 30 years before the worries of a rogue robotic swarm stripping the biosphere clean of all life, humanity was faced with a variety of global catastrophes. The world was plagued with issues thanks to unchecked global warming, much like our own world in real life. Floods, temperature surges, famine, and population displacement all threatened to end the human race 30 years before Ted Farrow and his singularity of automated killer machines came into the picture. The Ten, formerly known as Joint Task Force Ten, was a specialised military unit that was often deployed in all types of crises, both domestic and international. It is not known when or why JTF-10 was created, but it's safe to assume that the task force consisted of particularly resourceful and experienced members of the United States Navy and Air Force, with the sole purpose of being the go-to squad to call for backup when the situation was dire. With humanity facing existential threats from multiple sources, the squad was often deployed whenever and wherever humanity was in danger. Little is known about the actual members or structure of JTF-10, and it's likely that there were more than 10 members of the squad, but for the sake of clarity, we'll assume that the Tanakh were right in their assumption that JTF-10 consisted of 10 people. Plus, it makes their story so much cooler to imagine 10 of the most elite members of the US military taking a stand against the government. In fact, only one member of JTF-10 is ever named. Colonel Edward de la Hoya, who was the task force leader. JTF-10 was a group that specialised in all forms of combat in all terrains, climates and environments, including jungles, mountains and deserts, as well as being very proficient in air and sea combat, making them the perfect squad to deploy when in need of specialist expertise in almost any circumstance. Not much is known about JTF-10's earlier deployments, but their most notable conflict dubbed the Battle of the Mojave during the Hot Zone Crisis of 2037 is explored in great detail. Due to rampant climate change, Nevada's ecosystems began to collapse in the 2030s, to the point where the desert supposedly became almost uninhabitable for human life. In order to save as many lives as possible, the US government enacted Executive Order 73H, which called for the evacuation of the nearby cities of Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and Phoenix. This executive order was immediately met with protest, with many people refusing to leave the cities they had lived in for their entire lives. Opponents of the order criticised it as an unforgivable federal overreach and an attempt to take land from under the people, as the federal government was seeking to seize mining claims under eminent domain or forcing residents and refugees to live in fenced-in camps until more suitable housing could be arranged. Roberto Medina, a leader in rare earth mining in Nevada and a stark opposer of the 73H executive order, enlisted Colonel De La Hoya and JTF-10 to protect his assets and reclaim other resources resources valuable to those who resisted evacuation. How altruistic their intentions really were is left up to interpretation though, as Medina stood to benefit financially from the situation as the world tech corporations were keen to see the region's resources remain accessible. Regardless of this, under the backing of Roberto Medina, JTF-10 was deployed to the region to block the government's evacuation attempts, meaning 
the task force was directly opposing the very government that greenlit their formation. Joint Task Force 10 showed loyalty to the people, in a time where the federal government was using an environmental crisis to justify their greed, attempting to take land from the people in order to begin mining operations. The following battle that ensued between the human members of JTF-10 and the US government's general synthetic battle drones would be a turning point in human history and would finally kickstart the discourse about how to directly combat climate change. Not only did the ensuing conflict represent the first war on US soil since the Civil War, it was also the first time that automated robotic forces were deployed against human soldiers. Despite the overwhelming odds, JTF-10 were able to valiantly outwit the government's GSIN battle drones on multiple occasions. Colonel de la Hoya was a skilled pilot. As such, he and the other members of the task force used jets known as F-38 Razor Wings to outmaneuver the federal government's GSIN drones. Proving that decades of human skill and muscle memory will always have that natural edge on automated robots. While the government initially employed non-lethal tactics, by May of 2037, the GSINs were firing live rounds on members of JTF-10, which pushed the members of the task force to their limits. By August of 2037, what had started as an attempt to capture the war's conspirators alive had rapidly devolved into a tragedy after a robot's power casing was punctured by a shot fired from a member of JTF-10, triggering a fission-based reaction. The members of Joint Task Force 10 and 900 refugees were all killed in the resulting explosion, which would have been similar in size to that of a small nuclear blast. The immense loss of life led to the swift resolution of the hot zone crisis, and the government rescinded the executive order to evacuate the three cities, meaning ultimately, the people won, but at a great cost. Approximately a decade after the explosion that ended the Battle of the Mojave, the Mojave Battlefield Memorial Museum was constructed at JTF-10's Mojave base, just adjacent to the crater that was left as a result of the explosion. The museum initially presented a broad history of events, possibly even representing the moral ambiguity of the situation and how Roberto Medina only offered his help because of the money he stood to gain. However, some exhibits were altered in a bid to satisfy Medina's daughter, Maria Medina, who had become a senator. As a result, the displays in the main exhibit hall emphasized the heroism and resilience of JTF-10, which in turn may have altered the public's perception of the task force, as well as how the Tanakh would interpret their deeds a thousand years later. After all, it's highly possible JTF-10 only disobeyed the government because they had family living in the affected areas, but I'll let you guys decide whether or not JTF-10 was actually fighting for the people or not. After the fall of humanity at the hands of the Pharaoh Plague, the Memorial Museum stood still for 300 years whilst Gaia worked to terraform and repopulate the biosphere. As the first new humans in southwestern America stepped out of the cradle facility Eleuthia 9 in the year 2326, the large group of humans eventually split up into smaller tribes over the course of a few generations. One of these tribes would eventually discover the Memorial Museum and the commemorative holograms inside that had long since begun to corrupt. This subtribe are the people that would have eventually formed the Tanakh, taking inspiration from the story of JTF-10, even going so far as to live in jungles, deserts, and mountains, similar to the environments and climates in which JTF-10 was normally deployed during their active duty. Determined to conquer all terrains just like the Ten, the Tanakh split into three clans, the Desert Clan, the Sky Clan, and the Lowlands Clan. Somewhere along the line, the Tanakh spread out all across the land and conquered all forms of terrain, all thanks to the teachings of the Ten. The essence of their militarism influenced Tanakh belief and culture and can still be seen in the tribe to this day. One day, a young Tanakh known as Hikaro would conquer the Memorial Grove, a feat that had never been achieved since Tanakh culture began. Whilst relishing his victory, Hikaro was met by the holograms within the Memorial Grove, specifically one that had never been seen before. This hologram was the one that we just saw at the end of the cool route. Taken aback by the teachings of the vision, Hikaro set aside his bloodlust and dedicated his life to peace and unity, and eventually brought the three tribes together, uniting them against the Kaja. It turns out that what triggered this new vision was Aether finding its way to the Memorial Grove central computer. The same day that Hikaro conquered the Memorial Grove was the same day that the extinction signal was sent to Gaia, turning all of her subordinate functions into sentient AI. And there Aether would remain for 19 years, until Aloy eventually came along to recover it. I think the origins of Tanakh beliefs is one of the most interesting stories in Horizon Forbidden West, and I really like how parts of the story of JTF-10 directly influence Tanakh beliefs and the way they view the world. 
as well as the areas that they decide to settle in. In an attempt to be like the 10, they decided to settle in areas that JTF-10 were regularly deployed. The Koroth itself takes place in the crater left behind by the fission explosion, in the place where a great tragedy occurred. And now in that same place, people are forged in the fires of battle and named marshals in honour of the task force that fought valiantly against an onslaught of machines, even in the face of government tyranny. In many ways, the Tanakh are the living legacy of JTF-10, and the people who lost their lives in the Battle of the Mojave. And even though they will never meet them, I'm sure the Tanakh have a great respect for the people who refused to abandon their homes, and instead chose to resist. Reading into this and researching the origins of Tanakh culture for this video has really made me appreciate the tribe a lot more. It just amazes me how Gorilla is able to create these complex and detailed tribes that not only have their own customs and traditions, but can be traced back to the old ones, and you can see the patterns of influence that the old world has on them. With the origins of Tanakh culture discussed in great detail, I think it's time we head back to the base to reunite Aether with Gaia as well as welcome a couple new faces into the group. Yeah, like this? Oh, uh, you're not waving a hammer around, Aaron. Try a gentler touch. And yeah, my big sausage fingers don't really do gentle, okay? Bring it back. Trace the line to your right. Other right. I just saw it. It's the one Aloy found up north. Gotcha. They call it a, a concussion beat party or something. Yeah, now that's music. Aloy! Aaron, you're all better. And you're here. Well, the world only goes on if you can do your thing. We learn fast enough, we help make that happen. You want all the backup you can get, right? We still have much training to do, of course. One does not become hunter in a day. Each seed grows at a pace of its own. Doesn't mean it won't bloom. You should know your Tanakh friend arrived. Katalo. I heard their warriors drink people's blood. I want to sleep with one eye open. I think he's seen enough blood for a lifetime. I showed him to one of the rooms. He seems to appreciate the privacy. Uh, looks like you've got things under control. I should get this to Gaia. Right. We'll keep on training. Catch up as fast as we can. I'm seeing glyphs in my dreams already. Well, while you've been off gallivanting around, I've been working with Gaia to find out more about the land gods. So, from where I'm standing, you're in need of some training. Come along. Uh... Oh, uh... Okay. Ah yes, the boy Erend is back and he's here to stay. It felt like something was missing this whole time, and it's clear that we all just had an Erend shape hole in our hearts. In all seriousness though, you can really see the main group start to form now, with Val, Zoe, Erend, and now Katalo, who knows who else will join the group. I also really like how they waited a while to reintroduce Erend. It gave space for Zoe and Katalo to be fleshed out and expanded upon, and it's nice to see Erend again after so long. I also really like the dynamic of the group, and the diversity of characters as more people join. Each member apart from Aloy and Val is part of a different tribe. You've got Aloy and Val from the Nora, Zoe from the Utaru, Katalo from the Tanakh, and Eren from the Osaram. It's just really cool to see each member represent a different faction and a different culture. Factions that have previously been at war or isolated from one another. It's almost like Aloy is unknowingly sowing the seeds for world peace, as she's respected by each of these tribes and a couple more, such as the Kaja and the Banuk. I'm sure this was done intentionally, to show that Aloy is capable of uniting humans under one banner, but that's a concept I'll talk about much later on. At this point, you also get the chance to catch up with all of your companions, with each of them now having new optional dialogue in which you can discuss how their training's going, talk to them about significant experiences from their life, or ask them generally how they feel at the moment. It's really cool, and I really appreciate the attention to detail. Gorilla went that extra bit further too, and you even have companion quests, where you can go on a quest centered around the themes and aspirations of that character, which ultimately strengthens their bond with Aloy. Now, with the preamble out of the way, it's time for us to finally speak with Gaia and reintegrate Aether into her systems.
Welcome back, Aloy. When you're ready, please merge Ether with me. Afterwards, I must discuss an important matter with you. So, what did you want to discuss? While you were away, I received an unusual transmission on my dedicated Aluthia frequency. Aluthia? That's one of the subfunctions you couldn't detect before. Yes. The transmission occurred so slowly that at first it seemed like an accidental blip of data amongst background static. Once I noticed this irregularity, it took some time to collate the complete message. Coordinates. Where does it lead? To a mountain to the northwest of this facility. A word of caution, Aloy. It is possible this transmission is genuine. It is also possible it is being broadcast by someone or something else. You don't think it's actually Eleuthia? I am uncertain. What's SOS? It is an old world code. A distress signal. A desperate plea for help. Why would Eleuthia send a coded transmission on a frequency only the two of you can communicate on? I believe it was done as a precaution to avoid detection, or at least to create the appearance of the desire to do so. I am also uncertain why Eleuthia would expect that I would be able to detect and respond to its distress signal at all. As far as it is aware, I no longer function. Okay, so... Either Aluthia is in trouble, and sent the message hoping you were out there. Or someone else is trying to get us to go to these coordinates, pretending to be Aluthia. That is my conclusion as well. You said the coordinates lead to a mountain to the northwest. What's there? I have no record of anything of note in that vicinity. Okay, and what about the other number in the message? 237. Any idea what that means? I have queried my available databases, but it does not appear to have any significance. Perhaps its meaning can only be understood at the indicated coordinates. All right, I'll go to the coordinates and check out the source of the transmission. All by yourself? Ha! No way. I included Erend and Varl in this briefing via their focuses. I concur that you should not investigate this alone. What if it's a trap? Of course it could be a trap. But if it really is Eleuthia, then it's in trouble, and I need to bring it back. Don't worry. I'll be careful and... We're coming with you. Fine. Go grab your things. We'll wait for you at the west exit, in case you need to upgrade your gear. So, it seems as if another one of Gaia's subordinate functions has revealed itself and has sent out a distress signal. Supposedly, this is Eleuthia, Gaia's subordinate function in charge of the reintroduction of the human species. Eleuthia was instructed to wait until Gaia was done terraforming the biosphere, where it would then use the cradle facilities containing human embryos to biologically engineer new humans using genetic machinery, in which Eleuthia would then nurture the humans using robotic servitors until they were of the age to begin learning about humanity's history via Apollo. But as I've said before, before, Ted Farrow purged Apollo from Gaia, therefore humans were never able to learn about the world in the way that they were supposed to. Obviously, Eleuthia was only partially successful, and the only purpose it would be able to serve post-human reintegration is to create a brand new wave of humans using reserve embryos. So I'm unsure what its use would be right now with humans already thriving in the new world, but recovering every subordinate function so that it doesn't fall into the hands of the Zeniths is a good enough reason to investigate. Bear in mind that this transmission could be a trick. There's a chance that it could be the Zenith sending a fake distress beacon in the hopes that Gaia will respond, thus revealing her location. So this mission should be exercised with caution, which is why Val and Erend offer to come with Aloy to ensure that she has backup if she needs it. Anyway, I think it's time we set off. 
Aloy meets Val and Aaron at the west exit of the base, and the three set off together to investigate the source of the signal. Uh, this distress call had to be up a really steep mountain, huh? <sighs> That takes the keg. Burl, see if there's anything over there? On it. We'll check out the battlefield. Let's start with that zenith. This cutscene marks quite a significant moment in the story of Horizon Forbidden West, as it's the first time a Zenith is killed, demonstrating to Aloy that their shields can be bypassed. This will prove to be useful later down the line, but for now, investigating the aftermath of this skirmish will hopefully shed some light on how the Osram developed this technology in the first place. Aloy attempts to examine the weapon the Osram used to take down Rabina's shield, but she's unable to touch it, as the weapon is still too hot. Examining a Spectre's remains, Aloy finds instructions to assist recovery of the asset, meaning the Zeniths are most likely already here searching for Eleuthia, which definitely isn't good news. Aloy speaks with Erend, and they surmise that the weapon used against the Zenith for Bainer's shield is a prototype that is still in development by the Sons of Prometheus. They specifically waited here for Zenith activity in order to test the weapon, and it works. Only it's obviously still a work in progress due to its propensity to spontaneously combust after being fired, which is par for the course in terms of Osram inventions. Erend and Aloy meet back up with Val, who's standing at the mouth of a huge hole drilled directly through the mountain, most likely created by the Zeniths in an attempt to dig down to the facility below in order to find the asset. Aloy instructs Eren to wait outside and stand watch in case the other Zeniths show up, and her and Val head down through the tunnel to investigate further. Upon heading down through the tunnel to the underground structure, it's clear that this isn't a Zero Dawn facility. After walking through the ancient metal corridors, Aloy and Val come out into a large round room, with a console and a transmitter sitting in the centre. Aloy activates the console, which reveals that this is an old Far Zenith facility, known in the old world as the Ninma Research Lab. With the Zeniths having been here already as indicated by their transmitter, if Eleuthia was ever here at all, then it's definitely in the hands of the Zeniths by now. But that still leaves the mystery of the distress signal, as well as the recovery of the aforementioned asset. Aloy decides to explore more, because even if Eleuthia isn't here, something had to have sent the SOS signal. I just want to highlight again how amazing these sections are where you're exploring old world ruins and facilities. The contrast between what we were doing in the last quest, helping Hikaru host the Kulrut so he has more marshals to fight in the war, and what we're doing right now, exploring a buried old world facility to intercept the activities of the highly advanced descendants of the old ones, is night and day. But somehow the writers balance the sci-fi and fantasy aspects of this game perfectly, even more so than Horizon Zero Dawn. It really serves as a nice break from the politics of the game's world, as much as I love the way the Tanak and their civil problems are handled in this game. After a little bit of exploration and looting, Aloy and Vald come across an observation room overlooking a much larger room. Within both of these rooms are ectogenic chambers, the kind that Eleuthia used to turn the human embryos into living people, and the kind that created Aloy. Heading down into the larger room, it's clear that this was a storage room for these ectogenic pods, as it contains hundreds of them. The far end of the room is a console that can be interacted with that seems to be a control module for the ectogenic storage, meaning you can key in a number and the corresponding ectogenic chamber will be found and retrieved. An automated voice indicates 
indicates that there are 236 containers in storage. But Aloy and Val recall that there was a three digit number attached to the distress signal that Gaia received, 237. Aloy keys in the number and the ectogenic chamber begins to make its way down. Aloy, it's you. Skin's like ice. Must have cut this from her head, but why? Hello, hello, Elizabeth. Apologies, I don't know what else to call you. Um, my name is Beta. I'm afraid I, I must be brief. I only have a few minutes before my keepers discover I'm missing, and I still need to remove this implant. I had hoped to find shelter with you, but if you're viewing this, I, I may be dead. Be careful when you take on Farsiness. They are ruthless, and they have Aluthia, Artemis, and Apollo now. But at least I don't have the Gaia Colonel to march them with. You must succeed. Oh, this was all for nothing. Good luck. And goodbye. So she's... She's still alive. We need to get her back to... Oh, shit. They can fly. Aloy. Aloy, can, can you hear me through this thing? What's going on, Erend? Two of those spectral things just fell out of the sky. One of them is heading down towards you. The other one's waiting up here. We're coming up. Stay in cover until I get there. You got it. Get her to cover in that room. Whatever happens, she stays with us. I'll protect her. So, the asset that the Seniths wanted to recover is the other clone of Elizabeth Sobek that we saw in Letopolis, known as Beta. She's given us two pieces of vital information, that the Zeniths have Artemis, Eleuthia, and miraculously a copy of Apollo, but they don't have a Gaia kernel to merge them with. Beta hid herself along with the secondary Gaia kernel within the ectogenic chamber in order to send a distress beacon to Aloy who would hopefully make sure the Zeniths wouldn't be able to get their hands on the kernel or Beta herself. The Zeniths having a copy of Apollo is a very significant reveal, as it's thought that Ted Faro purged Apollo completely from Gaia, but the Zeniths must have somehow gotten a copy before leaving Earth on the ship Odyssey, and it's been passed down through the generations of Zeniths for the last thousand years. During this confusion and the mass reveal of new information, as well as the realization that Beta is alive, Eren calls Aloy on her focus to tell her that two Spectres have arrived. One has headed down into the facility, and the other one is waiting at the entrance. If Aloy wants to get Beta out of there alive, She's got to stand her ground here. The game gives you a little bit of time to prepare for the fight, as this is the first time we actually get to fight a spectre in the game, so you can lay your traps and drink your potions before it arrives. The fight itself is pretty fun. It's always cool when a new machine's introduced and you have to work out its strengths and weaknesses on the fly, testing out which weapons do the most damage and which elements it's weak to. Spectres in particular are really weak to acid, so my strategy for this fight was just spam acid arrows into it until the corrosion status effects applied, and then throw as many explosives at it as you can to make the most of its weakness. You can also shoot precision arrows into the gold parts of its metal plating as this does extra damage. Spectres hit very hard, and they are fast, capable of closing the distance between you very quickly, or using its long range cannons to pressure you from a distance. In the end though, with a bit of dodging and a lot of explosive spear spam, the first spectre is down, and Aloy hurries out of the facility to help Eren take down the second one, instructing Vile to stay with Beta until the coast is clear. 
The second Spectre goes down just as easily as the first using the Acid and Explosive Spear combo, which is something we're going to see a lot more of before the end of this video. After the Spectre's dealt with, Val carries Beta up to the surface. She's not in a good condition and needs a healer, so Val and Eren take her back to the base so Zoe can see to her, whereas Aloy stays behind to check out the Osirum contraption that was too hot to investigate earlier. She picks it up, but before she can analyse it with her focus, it crumbles under the weight of her touch. The only salvageable part that remains is a spherical component that fits within the centre of the contraption. Aloy salvages this with the intention of bringing it back to the base for Gaia to analyse. Upon returning to the base, Aloy thinks it's best to check up on Beta before speaking with Gaia, to make sure she's okay. She panicked after waking up and stumbled down here. I thought it best to wait for you. I'll talk to her. Hello? It's, uh, it's Beta, right? My name's Aloy. What's wrong? Is it your injury? Simulacrum withdrawal syndrome. I don't understand. Sudden removal of a neurologically integrated data device. The brain, especially the cerebellum, goes into a kind of sensory freefall. Everything real feels unreal, distant. Is there anything that can help? Do you have a focus to spare? It's, it's primitive, but I can make it work. Yeah. Booting up. So, uh, Aloy, I suppose you want information. About you and the Zeniths? Yeah. Why are they here? What do they want? How did they get you? But let's start at the beginning. I'm guessing they faked the destruction of their ship a thousand years ago? That seems consistent with their behavior. They wouldn't want to be followed. So far, Zenith established a colony world after all. Yes, for a few hundred years, but it didn't last. Some sort of natural disaster rendered it uninhabitable. Okay, so the descendants of Far Zenith escaped a dying planet, and now they want to claim Earth for themselves? Not their descendants. What? Not their descendants. It, it, it's them. The same ones who left Earth a thousand years ago. You didn't know? How can they still be alive? They don't even look... What did they do to themselves? I believe it's a combination of pharmaceutical, cellular treatments, and technological implants. And, and you? Does that mean that... You're... I'm not like them. I was made. On the way to Earth. On the ship. I spent years studying in my training interface. All so that I could serve my function. Access and control of the terraforming system. But why? What do the Zeniths want with it? When I discovered the Zero Dawn system had disseminated into its subcomponents, I thought my purpose was to fix it. But I don't think the Zeniths want that at all. I think they want to wipe Earth clean and start over. So the Zeniths want to exterminate life on Earth. That's what Gaia and I concluded, too. But why? Why kill everyone just to take over? When they took me on missions with them, I saw how they... butchered. The tribal people we encountered. They didn't seem to care about a rejuvenated Earth, so... I concluded that they must want a hard reboot of the system. Then they can redesign it to be exactly what they want. Mass extinction for their own comfort? Who thinks like that? Well, without their Gaia kernel, they'll have a hard time doing that. The Zeniths needed Elizabeth's gene print to access Zero Dawn facilities. So they made you. Trained you. And you went along with it? They told me I was born to interface with the Zero Dawn system. When we reached Earth, I pieced together what must have happened to Gaia and her subordinate functions. That's when I started to realize I wasn't meant to fix Gaia. That they must have made me, so I could do what their remote extinction signal failed to do. Reboot Earth, for their own benefit. So we're dealing with the same far zenith people who once lived on Earth. What else do you know about them? They were some of the most affluent and powerful people on Earth. They controlled almost every major resource, every industry. Gerard commands them. He's the one who decided to set up a base. The others, Eric, Tilda, Verbena, 
They resent his authority over them, but in the end, they always do what he says. Eric, he's the one I fought back in the Hades Proving Lab. He enjoys hurting people. Yeah, I know. You mentioned the Xenus set up a base here on Earth. Where is it? Off the coast, I think. Whenever I had to go on missions, I was transported inside of a Spectre drone. I couldn't see anything outside. But I did overhear the Zeniths talking about it once. They were discussing setting up a perimeter energy shield to repel the local fauna. I'm certain they have other security measures. Spectre patrols, machine wars. It, it must be impregnable. What's inside the base? Launch facilities so they can shuttle back and forth to their ship in orbit. Plus infrastructure to gather materials and fabricate anything they need. Are there more Zeniths than the ones you met? I'm not sure. I, I suppose there must be more of them in the base or back on the ship. For all I know, there could be more of them out in space. Other survivors of the colony. How did you escape the Zeniths? Before the Hades Proving Lab, I never thought I'd get away from them. Even if I were to run. I'd never survive on my own in the wilds. But then I saw you. And I thought that maybe you could help me. So when the Zeniths pinpointed Aluthia's location in the biomedical research facility, I saw an opportunity. You said you saw an opportunity to escape when you went to capture Eleuthia. What did you do, exactly? Whenever I was taken out on a mission to recover a subordinate function, only one of the Zeniths would go with me. The one the rebels killed, outside the facility. But Bane is dead? How did they bypass her shield? I'm looking into it. But you were talking about your escape? Well, when it was time to use the Xenus transmitter to send Eleuthia back to base, I also sent the encrypted transmission. Then I distracted Verbena long enough to seal myself in the ectogenic chamber, altering the facility's log so it appeared that there were only 236 containers. And the Gaia root kernel? I told them I could capture Eleuthia faster if I had it with me, and they... believed me. Well done. You said you were born on the way to Earth. In an artificial womb, I'm guessing? The Zeniths had an ectogenic chamber aboard the ship. An updated version of the one you found me in. They must have used a stored sample of Elizabeth's DNA. I doubt Elizabeth would have let them take her DNA. Do you know how they got it? That wasn't part of the archive I was allowed to access. You said you spent years studying in a training interface. Was this archive you mentioned part of that? but only the parts I was permitted to access. Aristotle and uh, Aspasia, th the avatars of the Archive, would assign me learning modules and evaluate my progress. Wait, those names? They were designed to be the virtual guides for the Apollo database, before Ted Farrow purged it. The Zeniths have a copy. So it still exists. And you got to learn from it. Only what was deemed pertinent to the mission. If I requested information outside of my parameters, my tutors would deny it. To have all that knowledge... just out of reach... must have been frustrating. All right, I think that's enough for now. Do you want to come upstairs, or...? So how long? You know, your, your, your plan. How long before Gaius fabricated a machine army to defeat the Zenus? How did you know... Optimal strategy, so? Well, I still have to get two more subordinate functions before Guy is powerful enough to absorb Hephaestus. What? You don't have Hephaestus already? Guy is still figuring out how to capture it. It's not confined to a single- To a single location, of course not! You didn't even know who the Zeniths really are. You were supposed to be further along by now! Coming here was a mistake. They're gonna find me. They're going to find this place and take me back. This was all for nothing. They're not going to find us. Guy is using Minerva to mask our location. What difference does it make? You're too far behind. We're never going to beat them. Everything. Everyone. I'm going to die. Hey. Calm down. You're here now, right? So is there anything you can do to help? I have certain knowledge sets. And given your state of progress, expertise you probably lack. Geoengineering, of course. Computer science, physics, biology, chemistry. 
Okay. Well, see if you can do something with that. Talk to Gaia. I'll check on you later. How'd it go? Her injury's not that bad, but I think she regrets coming here. Feeling might be mutual. Hmm. I'll come back later and talk to her. See if I can learn anything. Now, this is a huge reveal, that the Zeniths on Earth now are the very same people who left Earth a thousand years ago, insinuating that they've undergone a thousand years of genetic manipulation and have essentially reached a state of cellular immortality. They can die in conventional ways as we saw earlier, but they cannot age or contract disease. It seems as if Gaia and Aloy were right in their assumption that the Zeniths want to take control of Gaia and her subordinate functions in order to reset Earth again so they could rebuild the planet anew. Something went wrong on their colony in space and they fled to return to Earth. During this section, you can speak to Beta about a variety of topics, such as the Zeniths and who they are, Beta's origins and how she was created on the colony ship, the Zenith's base on Earth, which contained a launch facility, the supposed natural disaster that forced them to leave the Sirius star system, how Beta escaped the Zeniths during her mission to recover Eleuthia, as well as her limited access to the Apollo database during her training sessions. There's a lot of information divulged during this, but I won't go into great detail about any of it because there would simply be too much to cover. All we need to know is that the Zeniths are biological immortal. They have a copy of Apollo, and they've come back to Earth because some sort of natural disaster destroyed the human colony in the Sirius star system and pushed them out. Beta clearly assumed that Aloy would be much further along in her plan to fabricate a machine army using Gaia to defeat the Zeniths. She even assumed that Aloy would have found a way to isolate and capture Hephaestus by now, which isn't even possible right now given the fact that Gaia only has Minerva and Aether. To be able to get to the point where the machine army is viable, Gaia needs Minerva, Aether, Poseidon, and Demeter to be powerful enough to capture Hephaestus, which is why Aloy must set off with haste to recover the next subordinate function. Before heading off though, Aloy must head up to the guy's chamber in order to analyze the component of the Osram contraption that was used to bypass the Zenith shield tech. Aloy, I see we have a new guest. So now we know the origin of the transmission. Yeah, I also recovered this. The weapon it was part of somehow stripped a Zenith of its shield, but it malfunctioned and blew up. If we can recreate the weapon and improve it, Maybe we'll gain the upper hand on the Zenith. A moment. I will scan it. Complete. By combining the results with data from your focus, I can infer that the weapon was highly advanced, comparable to Zenith technology, but not how it worked. Did the explosion corrupt the data? It was only a catalyst. The moment the weapon malfunctioned, it appears a command executed to purge all data within its core. Ostensibly, this was to prevent the weapon's secrets from falling into enemy hands. Whoever designed this weapon knew how to cover their tracks. Silence. Based on your data on him, that is my conclusion as well. And he's not gonna cooperate with us? Well, it was worth a shot. That's not all. The Zenith got Eleuthia, along with Artemis and Apollo. That is unfortunate. However, our original plan remains unchanged. The two remaining subordinate functions should increase my heuristic processing density enough to absorb Hephaestus. Right. One problem at a time. Well, I guess I better get back out there. I wish you luck on your search. Right. After speaking with Gaia, you can choose to speak with the companions at the base to learn how they're doing, as well as to restock ammo and potions for the journey. But with that, I think it's time for us to set off on our next journey to find the second subordinate function, Poseidon, located somewhere within the ancient crumbling ruins of Las Vegas. With Aether successfully merged with Gaia, and Beta safe within the base, it's time for us to head west once again to search for Poseidon within the ruins of what was once Las Vegas. 
Poseidon was the subordinate function in control of detoxifying the Earth's oceans, and without it, the oceans have become increasingly unstable and will eventually be unable to support life altogether. Ever since playing this quest back when the game first came out, I loved the irony of Poseidon, the Greek god of the ocean, being stranded in a desert. I just think it's so poetic. In fact, this whole quest is beautiful as you'll come to see. It's definitely my favourite quest in the game, so I'm going to go into extra detail for this one. Because of all the things you can do in this game, this quest still impressed me the most. Aloy leaves the base and rides for the Still Sands, the southernmost desert in the Forbidden West. Within this desert lies the ancient buried ruins of Las Vegas, partially submerged in the sand. In a desert this barren and arid, you'd expect there to be very little water here whatsoever, but one of the ruins sticking out of the dunes is completely flooded, with water pouring out of every available exit. This must be Poseidon's doing, but what kind of water systems are still operational in the middle of the desert in the first place? It's not exactly as if Poseidon was able to just create water out of nowhere. I suppose we'll have to get to the bottom of it. Aloy approaches the ruins and realises there are people here already, and they've set up camp directly within the structure, most likely Osiram Delvers by the looks of their equipment. I was so close. Oh, to drowning, maybe. Not, not to the embers. M Moreland, it's over. Well, not for me, it's not. Then you're going to die alone because we're not sticking around to fish out the corpse. We're through. And so the visionary's fate hung in the balance. Would he choose life or succumb to deadly delusion? <clears throat> Hello. So, there's an ancient city under the sand, but it's flooded. Suddenly, a Nora spear maiden appeared. Yeah, okay. Um, well, you're not typical Delvers. That's for sure. What's this? Uh, I, I call it a diving bubble. This is the Mark I. The Mark II was better, but uh, it got stuck halfway down. Air tube snagged. You went down in that. Yeah, I hardly expect a lay person to understand. Because that's pretty smart. Uh, I'm sorry. May I remind you, you got stuck inside and nearly drowned. It'd have to be portable, though. Mm. Machine kneecap, maybe? Well, you'd need a filter. Synthetic membrane would do it. With a hose to a compressed, compressed air, air capsule. capsule. Hammer and tongs. What is this? What is happening here? What? Get over here. She's a stranger. You got a name? Aloy. Moreland. Not a stranger anymore. You're a damn fool. Come on. I got the original schematics over here. Oh, um... Well, hold on. Just a couple of questions first. Fair enough. Partner? Partner? Don't mind him. What's so important down there that you'd risk your life? Uh, uh well... Ah... <clears throat> uh. Moreland, I'm not interested in salvage, okay? Whatever you find below is yours. Well, all right. Then what if I told you we were delving for the most spectacular treasures ever scribed by man or a maid? I'd say get to the point. No nonsense. I like it. Behold, an ember. Looks like a piece of junk. Well, now, yes, but... But, but, with a proper spark, these magnificent creations of the old ones paint mesmerizing pictures in the air, and the ruins below us are full of them. A feast for the eyes beyond description. This is my old Gramps promise me. So these embers project images? Paintings of light. It's amazing stuff. This one showed the most beautiful woman you've ever seen, 
beckoning all to a buffet of lobster and succulent beefs. <laughs> I must have watched it about a hundred times as a child in my old Gramps workshop. What happened to it? Over time, they die out. I cried the day that this one's light faltered. But there are many more below, as you'll see if you get down there like I did and my old gramps before me. How did your grandfather discover these embers? He was here. 40 odd years ago. He, he was one of the first to lead a delving party into the West. He discovered the ancient city around us, plumbed the depths of this very structure. He found the hollow underneath and the glowing embers all about. Took as many as he could and brought them home. He always wanted to come back and get more, but well, he never scraped up the shards. What he really wanted to do was use the embers to put on a show one unlike the world has ever seen. Sounds like quite a guy. He was a true Delver and a true showman. And I miss him. But I will do him proud. I will gather the embers and put on a spectacle that would have amazed even him. With your help, of course. So what exactly happened down there? It was a delve like no other. A chance to follow in my old Gramps' footsteps. Beneath this structure here is an enormous hollow, a, a dome protected from the sands. We built this elevator here to ensure easy egress and exit. It's quite a contraption, actually, and not so easy that- uh, Right, again. What happened? At the bottom, we beheld the treasure my Gramps first discovered painted images in the air of every description dancing women and games and coins and promises of jackpots i don't know what that is but it's got to be good but then something went wrong the images turned nautical waves went through them even fish it was like a strange underwater dream Poseidon's dream. Yes. Well, suddenly there was this terrible rushing sound, and then an explosion of water erupted from the floor. So water just shot up from the floor and filled the place up? It was a raging flood unlike anything I've seen. We ran like forge fire and barely made it up the elevator as a wave just crashed beneath us. Shaken. But not stirred. I, I, I built the diving bubbles Mark I and Mark II. I tried the descent in each, but I nearly drowned both times. Abbot Dunn's beside himself. He thinks I'm insane. But I can't give up now. I, I, I just, I've come too far. And the embers are just barely within my reach. Well, maybe I can help. Yeah. Maybe you can. You guys don't seem like average Delvers. We're not really Delvers at all. We're, we're showmen. Like performers? You're Nora, and thus unfamiliar with the arts. We stage spectacles all around the claim. Stemmer tells stories which I augment with all manner of sounds and fireworks and Abaddon, he, well... Complains? He handles the money, which amounts to about the same thing. When we delve, it's to find gear for my theatrics. Which makes this delve the most important one of all. How deep is it? Can't I just swim down? Only if you have gills. You can stack 50 kegs in that shaft. Leave it to the Osserum to measure something in kegs. Talking liquid depths. I'd say it's apt. Apt or not, sounds too deep to hold my breath. Hence, our new invention. I'd better get after those parts. There's a fully intact compressed air capsule in the Mark II, but like I said, it's stuck in the shaft. 
If you made it back up alive, I should be able to swim down that far. All right. As for the other parts, Stemmer scouted a herd due south of here that should have what we need. I'm on it. Great. I'll come back when you get the gear. Good hunting. I absolutely adore these characters. Without a doubt, they're my favourite side characters in Horizon Forbidden West. Moreland, Abaddund and Stemmer are a band of travelling showmen, not Delvers as we initially led to believe. Moreland is seemingly the leader of the group. He's the man with the ideas who will go to great lengths to do what no other Osirum has done before. Stemmer is a wordsmith, a poet of sorts, who narrates the shows they host, adding a storytelling element to the spectacle. Finally, Abaddund is their financier and handles all the shard expenses, which leads him to being a sort of voice of reason, tempering the expectations of the excitable Moorland and Stemmer, although he does have a propensity to be quite dramatic himself. The dynamic of these three is so great, and we'll come to see how they play off each other as we continue through this quest. So how did they end up delving into a flooded ruin? Well, Aloy takes the time to speak to Moorland about exactly what he and his friends are doing here, and he tells us this heartfelt tale of his late grandfather, who was an experienced Osiram Delver and Tinkerer. He was one of the first Osiram to lead a delving expedition into the Forbidden West, and he stumbled across the ruins of Las Vegas, finding himself in the structure Aloy and Moorland stand in right now. He took a team of men down the long shaft that's now flooded, and discovered the huge hollow space below the sand, a sort of huge dome that protects whatever's in case below from the elements of the surface. Down in this hollow space below the dunes, Morland's grandfather found a large stockpile of hollow projectors, which Morland refers to as embers. Of course, Las Vegas is a city renowned for its vibrant light shows and grandiose casinos, so it makes sense that they would adopt hologram technology in order to make their attractions even more appealing to tourists. Morland's grandfather took as many as he could with him back to the claim, where a young Moorland would spend many hours in his grandfather's workshop, enjoying the dancing images that would light up the room. This would inspire Moorland to become a showman, instead of a blacksmith or a delver like most other Osirum. He wants to collect the rest of the hollow projectors in the hopes of organising a show using the lights, the likes of which nobody has ever seen. The way Moreland speaks about his desire to follow in his grandfather's footsteps, it's beautiful and immediately allows us as the audience to empathise with him. As soon as I heard his story, I wanted nothing more than to help him and his friends recover the remaining hollow projectors. As we know by now, due to the excess amounts of water, Poseidon is somewhere down there within the underground dome. Moreland, Abaddund and Stemmer must have triggered some sort of defence mechanism when they got down there, because before they could collect any of the hollow projectors, they were interrupted by a huge surge of water bursting out of the ground. It nearly engulfed them, but they managed to make it out alive before the old elevator shaft leading up to the surface filled with water. Not intending on giving up so easily, Moreland designed and created the diving bell he used to get halfway down there, but both prototypes failed and he almost drowned multiple times. He was actually just about to give up until Aloy came along. Much like how Minerva was locking off areas of the regional control centre in an attempt to keep people out, Poseidon became defensive and flooded the underground dome with water in an attempt to keep people away. Aloy needs to get down there to check it out, and to do that she needs to create a new piece of gear that will help her breathe underwater, and so she sets off to hunt some machines to get the materials. After taking on a nearby herd of machines in order to collect the correct resources, as well as salvaging the compressed air capsule from Morland's diving bell, she heads to the nearby workbench to craft a new piece of special gear the diving mask. This gear is an integral part of the game as it allows you to swim underwater without running out of air. This is massively useful for exploring the rest of the underwater ruins in the game as well as the many flooded caverns that can be found throughout the open world that wouldn't be explorable without the use of the diving mask. It really adds another layer of exploration because now you're not worrying about Aloy's air meter when you're trying to explore, meaning you can be much more thorough in your searches of underwater areas. Aloy has one last exchange with Moreland before donning her new diving mask and heading down to the sunken depths below. Upon swimming down, it becomes apparent that these hollow projectors are everywhere. Morland was right. They're depicting all sorts of sea life, such as coral, anemones, and schools of fish. Poseidon has not only flooded the dome, but it's also taken control of the hollow projectors inside and made them emulate sea life almost as if it's trying to create a brand new ocean within the desert, in a futile attempt to build an environment that it's used to. Passing by a beautifully ornate hanging statue of a Chinese dragon, Aloy swims through the sunken ruins of this once bustling old world structure, formerly known as the Tempo Casino, until she comes out into a much larger area. As soon as you swim out the main door, a huge machine tears through the water in front of Aloy. This machine is a highly specialised aquatic acquisition machine known as the Tide Ripper. If Aloy wants to survive down here long enough to recover beside 
Poseidon, she needs to be careful and avoid that machine at all costs. Now we get the chance to admire the dome in all its glory. It's definitely an impressive structure as it houses the entire Vegas Strip within it. But why exactly is the entire Las Vegas Strip housed within a huge dome? Well, it's all thanks to the hot zone crisis of 2037 I mentioned earlier. Not only did this climate crisis give rise to the Battle of the Mojave, but it also nearly led to the complete abandonment of Las Vegas, until a man named Stanley Chen, an inventor and entrepreneur, came and built this huge dome around the strip to protect it from the increasingly hard conditions, as well as installing a new water filtration and distribution system, which allowed the city to purify what small amounts of water it had access to in the desert, as well as to redirect this water to the parts of the city that needed it the most. In turn, saving the city from the brink of complete collapse. I'll talk more about Stanley Chen's story towards the end of this quest because it's a really touching one, but all you need to know now is that Stanley cared a lot for this city, and he saved Las Vegas from its untimely demise, allowing the city to continue to prosper all the way up until the Pharaoh Plague. There's plenty to explore within the confines of the dome. Ruined buildings, the remnants of old casinos, tourist attractions, all frozen in time and suspended within an ethereal veil of water. There's lots of lootable caches around too, which are always nice, giving you rare valuables that can be sold to vendors for a decent price. There's also lots of data points, which gives us some insight into what sort of things happened in Las Vegas before the collapse of the biosphere. Personal notes, including a retelling of the history of Las Vegas written by a small child at school, an email sent between colleagues that work for a nearby home hotel about a discreet package delivery for one of their more promiscuous guests, the drunken text from a tourist debating what to spend their winnings on after they just made it big and won a huge jackpot. These data points really just add an extra layer onto the already brilliant environmental world building and I spent a good amount of time just swimming around searching for more notes to read. There are also a variety of machines within the dome, not just the ever-looming Tide Ripper, but also smaller aquatic machines such as Snapmores and Burrowers. Make sure to be careful not to run into their path as you swim around. Personally, I was too busy looking around in awe, and I swam directly into the path of a Snapmore that scared the hell out of me, especially considering my fear of deep water kept me on edge the entire time. But with the experience of Subnautica under my belt, it's safe to say I was a lot less scared this time around. You can't directly fight the machines underwater, but you can quite easily escape them by using smoke bombs to break the line of sight, swimming around corners, and swimming through tight spaces to escape them. So overall, they just look scary. They don't pose as big a threat, it seems. In order to properly investigate the area to find Poseidon, Aloy needs to take out the Tide Ripper as its constant patrolling makes it difficult to search thoroughly. However, in order to fight the Tide Ripper effectively, she's got to find a way to drain the water from the dome, which we know can be done, as we know that Stanley Chen developed a sophisticated water filtration and drainage system within the city in order to easily channel water to and from parts of the city. Morland mentioned a red light appearing when he, Stemmer, and Abaddon ventured down here, and the water began rushing in, which may have been some sort of alarm that triggered when Poseidon redirected the water into the dome. After some searching, Aloy finds that the source of the red light is in fact a console. Upon interacting with it, a hologram appears, which shows a map of the strip. An automated voice speaks, which would typically be used to tell engineers that a critical amount of water was flooding into the dome and an emergency purge needs to take place. In order to reverse the flooding and direct the water elsewhere, Aloy has to find the primary and secondary pump nodes and manually reset them, which may prove easier said than done. But of course, the fearless Huntress takes on the task. According to the map, the primary pump node can be found to the south of this console, so Aloy sets off immediately to search for it. A small hole in the ground leading into a pipe indicates that this is the entrance into the water lines that run underneath the whole city. Swimming through the old tunnels leads to a larger maintenance room that hasn't been entirely submerged in water. Aloy climbs up and turns the valve to open the drainage channel, and quickly returns to the surface in order to find the secondary pump node. Very conveniently, the other node is directly on the other side of the dome, which means we have to swim through the dangerous killer robots another time. Honestly, even though they don't pose a threat because you can so easily escape them, the sheer thought of a huge mechanical crocodile chasing after me as I frantically try to swim away is enough to make me want this underwater section over with, even if it is oddly tranquil. After evading some snapmores, Aloy finds the second pump station and turns the valve in order to redirect the water. All that's left now is to go to the maintenance station and initiate the emergency purge. The maintenance station is a building that has partially caved in, which is lucky for Aloy as it seems there will be no other way to enter the building if it wasn't for this large opening. Aloy makes her way into the building and through two doors that lead up to the main control room. All that's left now is the fun part, to press the big button and watch all the water drain from the dome.
and there you have it, no more water. Well, you do have to swim back through the maintenance station, but upon reaching the exit, it's like a whole new world in the dome. With the vast majority of water drained, you can clearly see the remnants of buildings, streets, bridges, street lamps, cars. What was once a functioning city filled with life, now bathed in the ephemeral purple glow of the hollow projectors. With trace amounts of light from the surface breaking through, creating rays that shine down through the darkness. It truly is a beautiful moment, and it's only going to get better. Trust me. Now, the only thing standing in our way is the Tide Ripper, which will be much more manageable now that we can fight it on even ground. Just as Aloy's about to fight it, Morland, Stemmer, and Abaddon show up, obviously not realizing the danger they're about to put themselves in. Luckily, Morland's loud exclamation isn't enough to alert the Tide Ripper, so Aloy regroups with them and warns them of the Tide Ripper, and it seems as if the three are willing to help her take it down if only by firing at it from a distance. You can't fault these three. Not only are they great characters, but they're just straight up willing to fight a Tide Ripper without a moment of hesitation. Except for Abaddon, who seems absolutely mortified by the idea. Of course, as I've said many times throughout the course of this video, now's a good time, whilst the Tide Ripper is unaware, to scan it for weaknesses. Big machines like this are tough, so it's always great to know what they're weak to. Tide Rippers are weak to Ice and Shock, which are nice weaknesses to have because they're very common ammo types that are easy to craft. The Tide Ripper has a variety of external weaknesses too, such as purge water pouches that can explode when shot, glow blast canisters that can be shot with plasma ammo to create a chain reaction, chill water and sparker canisters which are especially useful because the machine is weak to Ice and Shock, a heart on its chest which serves as a weak spot, and very importantly, the Tidal Disc, which you should always try to remove when fighting these machines because this leaves them unable to shoot purge water at you. And I'm telling you, you don't want the Tide Ripper to start shooting purge water in all directions using its tidal disc. When fighting a Tide Ripper, you must make sure that you're always expecting an attack because not only are they fast, but they're huge, meaning it can sometimes be hard to time your dodges in order to evade their large body. If you stick to elemental weapons that do shock and ice damage, use explosives to remove armor plating, and target key areas like the heart, exhaust, and tidal disc, you should be able to take down this colossal machine in no time. You guys all right? More than all right. This... You... We did it! <laughs> all the embers we could ever want, and it's all thanks to you. Very, uh, heartwarming. But maybe we can just, you know, grab what we came here for and get out before any more of those things decide to show up. Now, now, shard counter. Nothing wrong with a little revving. Though we should probably let our flame-haired friend get going. I believe she has business down here, does she not? Right, of course. You need any help? I can handle it from here. Very well. Well, we'll start taking some of the embers upstairs. Holler if you need us. Thanks. With the Tide Ripper defeated and the Hollow Projectors ripe for the taking, Aloy heads into one last building in order to finally recover Poseidon. We've been on quite a journey, eh? Walking through these corridors is so satisfying, knowing we've helped Morland achieve his grandfather's dreams, and now we're about to recover a second subordinate function, which will further strengthen Gaia and bring us one step closer to defeating the Zeniths. It's a beautiful feeling. Finally, Aloy finds the console that she can use to extract Poseidon from the system. Similar to Aether, upon doing so, it sounds grateful to be reverted to its original code and merged back with Gaia. Most of the subordinate functions were not able to adapt to sentience, and so instead chose to isolate themselves in the hopes that one day Gaia would find them and bring them home. Aloy uses her clearance as Alpha Prime to use the Master Override, and with that, Poseidon has been reverted to its original code. Now here comes the part that blew me away. As Aloy begins her walk back to the main area of the dome, the same automated voice from earlier can be heard saying, System reboot initiated. Taking Poseidon out of the system has rebooted the city's power, meaning the lights of Las Vegas shine bright once again. Upon exiting the building, we're met with this gorgeous light show as all the buildings that populate the strip are brought to life once again after a thousand years of being dormant. I remember first playing this quest and after the cool introduction to the new side characters, after crafting the diving mask, after plunging into the depths, draining the water, defeating the Tide Ripper and finally recovering Poseidon, this is the perfect moment to round off the experience of this quest. Before we go any further, in light of this moment, I think it's a good time to talk about the story of Stanley Chen and how he saved Las Vegas and gave it a second chance at life. Stanley Chen was an old world inventor 
businessman, and entrepreneur based in Las Vegas who, in 2035, had created a state-of-the-art water filtration system that was able to filter even the most stubborn bacteria, sediment, and hardness out of the city's water, turning it into pure, clean drinking water. Despite his unprecedented invention, Stanley failed to impress investors because one of his trusted lawyers leaked critical information about his project's design to a competitor. He took his design to many potential investors and each time was turned away. After failing several interviews, interviews, he believed his life as an entrepreneur was over, and his business was failing. Desperate and on the verge of losing everything, he decided to leave his fate up to chance. Stanley headed to the nearby Tempo Bar and Casino, where he drowned his sorrows and in a drunken stupor planned on betting every last dime of his remaining money, $88,000 to be exact, on a roulette wheel. In a surge of extraordinary luck, his gamble somehow paid off, making him $3.2 million richer, but more importantly, giving him a second chance to start his dreams. Over the next five years, he painstakingly revised his water filtration system, making it better than before, and launching a business titan within the water industry. He would not make the same mistake of hiring untrustworthy lawyers who would leak his business secrets. And as a result, he always had an edge on the rest of the market, as no one could keep up with his innovation and his ideas never ended up in the wrong hands. As a result, that initial $3.2 million slowly became a fortune of over $200 billion. The city of Las Vegas had given Stanley Chen a second chance at following his dreams, and he would forever be grateful that luck was on his side on that lonely night at the Tempo Casino. This is when disaster would strike Las Vegas, in the form of the hot zone crisis of 2037. After the dust had settled over the Battle of the Mojave and the emergency evacuations had ceased, Las Vegas was mainly left to deal with the problems of increasing climate instability by itself. It's a city located within a desert after all, so it was greatly affected by the hot zone crisis. At this point in time, Las Vegas was becoming increasingly unpopular and uninhabitable with temperatures reaching unseen heights and tourists, Vegas' main source of income, disappearing. Vegas was at its breaking point. However, in May of 2040, Stanley Chen developed a citywide water filtration and irrigation system that was used to not only produce clean, filtered water, but could also be used to redirect water across the city. In addition to this, he contracted the construction of the huge dome that covers the city, which he called the Fountain. This dome would serve as a protective layer against the harsh rays of the sun and allowed for more control over the climate of the city. Stanley Chen single-handedly revived Las Vegas, bringing a new rejuvenated life to the city that once gave him a second chance. Chen's filtration systems revived the city, making portable water accessible for everyone. The city of Las Vegas, although it was never again the thriving hub it was before, was saved, and an elementary school was named in his honor, Stanley Chen Elementary School. As the years passed, however, it became evident that the fountain and the new water systems were unable to completely save the city from climate change. Water supplies inevitably dwindled once more over the course of the next 20 years, but just before the drought could take the city once and for all, the Pharaoh Plague was unleashed upon the world. Stanley Chen walked around the streets of this once bustling city one last time and reminisced on the great times he's had there, as well as how the city saved him. As a goodbye to the city before turning the power off, in the ruins of the city, you can actually find data points left by Chen himself, as he takes a trip down memory lane. And you can really hear in the way he speaks, how much he loved Las Vegas despite its flaws. It started right here, more than 30 years ago. Back when this casino was still called the Temple. One big bet turned my fate around. But now, fate's dealt as cruel as hell ever to everyone. I have to turn the lights out one final time, and the waters of my adopted home will at last run dry. Well, if a dream has to die, at least I can say goodbye first. The primer note shut down now. I think the last time I was down here was during the Lumia Grand incident. A malfunction led to an overflow of detergent in the pipes. Suds rose from every fountain as we frantically tried to fix it. I looked up and saw everyone in the lobby chasing bubbles the size of basketballs, young and old alike. Another magical moment in the impossible city. Just shut down the secondary node. No more water for the fountains. No more shows. No one left to appreciate them anyway. I'll never forget the city's grand reopening. The fountains had been bone dry for years. No one believed they'd ever return. So, as the first bloom arced up in the dome, the music swelling, 
My heart soared right along with it. The city gave me a second chance once. Now it had one, too. System shutdown's almost done. Only thing left is to power everything down at the control center. So, I guess this is it. One final walk down the strip, and then it's lights out forever. At least I won't be around to see it destroyed. The Odyssey will be well on its way to Sirius by the time the swarm gets here. Still, my last memory of this place will be empty. A city that's already dead. As Chen takes one last look at Las Vegas, he's overcome with emotion and can't bring himself to shut down the power altogether. Instead, he opts to leave the systems on standby in the hopes that one day, when humans return to Earth and Project Zero Dawn succeeds, that the future humans could rediscover Las Vegas and figure out a way to reinitialize the water filtration system. I can't do it. I can't give up on this place. I'm leaving everything on standby. The system's equipped for run for decades, if not hundreds of years. It's a long shot. But maybe someday, against all odds, someone will find this place again. Marvel at his lights and wonders. Discover a fortune and boundless opportunity. Make it their own dream. After all, if the city can give me a second chance, if water can flow in the wasteland, anything's possible. Chen was actually one of the few of humanity's elite who survived the Faro Plague, thanks to his affiliation with Far Zenith. He was able to secure a place on the Odyssey, and eventually went to live on the Far Zenith colony in the Sirius star system. Unfortunately, Chen was one of the Zeniths that lost their lives due to the cataclysm that forced the Zeniths to abandon their colony. When the Zeniths established their colony in deep space, they spent a lot of their time in virtual reality pods to pass the time. Chen immediately chose to build an exact replica of Las Vegas in his virtual space to remind him of home. Whereas most Zeniths secluded themselves to their own virtual spaces, reveling in their own deepest fantasies and indulging in anything and everything they want in isolation, Stanley made his space open to everyone, inviting others to join him in reminiscing the old days when Vegas was known as the entertainment capital of the world. Even though the Zeniths are mainly comprised of the apathetic elite, Stanley Chen was remembered as one of the good ones. He retained his humanity right until the end, a testament to the kind of man he was. Eventually, as we know, humanity did successfully return to Earth thanks to the brilliance of Dr. Elizabeth Sobek, and in a blind chance of fate, Poseidon found himself within the old forgotten city. Because of this, Aloy was able to dive down to the fountain, reinitialize the water filtration and transportation systems, and bring the city back online, exactly as Stanley Chen hoped all those hundreds of years ago. A quote that stands out to me from his last audio log goes as follows. It's a long shot, but maybe someday, against all odds, Someone will find this place again. Marvel at its lights and wonders. Discover fortune and boundless opportunity. Make it their own dream. After all, if this city can give me a second chance, if water can flow in a wasteland, anything's possible. And he was right. What a beautiful, hopeful quote that I think we can all draw some form of inspiration from. The story of this quest is one of hope, of looking forward to the future and making sure the world is a good place for our descendants. One day, all of you watching this video will not be here anymore. I won't be here anymore. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget that despite our worldly absence as individuals, humanity as a whole lives on and will continue to face collective struggles. So get out there and chase your dreams, whether that be honoring the memory of a lost family member, entertaining the masses through mediums of art and storytelling, starting your own business, or creating something that you think future generations may benefit from. Can you guys tell this quest had some sort of profound effect on me? Anyways, having successfully recovered Poseidon, Aloy makes her way through the shimmering ruins of the Vegas Strip and makes her way to the surface to meet back up with Moreland, Abaddon, and Stemmer. And there's one last surprise waiting for us at the surface. <laughs> oh, the show my old gramps always wanted. There's another. <laughs> His dream realized. His old Gramps legacy ensured. Our hero beheld the sea of desert lights and wept at his good fortune. When I saw the Embers as a child, I never dreamed they could be like this. 
Thank you, Aloy. Well, did you find what you were looking for? I did. And now I have to move on. Oh. Oh. Come back when you can. I got big plans for this place. I thought you wanted to put on shows with the Emperors back in the claim. Oh, <laughs> no. This is the show. Oh, can you imagine? Folks from all over the land coming to take it all in. Plus, some food and a nice place to stay. Not to mention a variety of entertainment venues. Uh, don't forget, games of chance. Plenty of shards to be had there for certain. <laughs> a new dream, huh? I, um, I hope you make it happen. Goodbye, gentlemen. This delve was a story for the ages. All thanks to you. What a beautiful end to an amazing quest. Not only has Stanley's dream of Vegas finding a new life been fulfilled, but Morland's dream of following in his grandfather's footsteps has been fulfilled too. I'm sure Chen would have been happy to see the eccentric trio that now plans to host shows, games, and all sorts of attractions within the city that he held so dear. The city of Las Vegas now truly has a second chance at life, with its new owners, a new name Hidden Ember. Don't worry, I'm sure we'll see these three again at some point in the Horizon franchise. But until then, it's goodbye to the eccentric wandering Osiram showman. It's time to close the curtain on this quest. After saying her goodbyes, Aloy sets off to return to the base in order to merge Poseidon with Gaia once more. After a long journey across the desert, she makes her triumphant return to the base and successfully re-emerges Poseidon into Gaia's heuristic matrix, leaving only one subordinate function left, Demeter. This time, there's actually nothing to distract us in between collecting subfunctions. The current goal is a matter of racing the zeniths to the remaining subordinate functions, so there's no time to delay. Although it is a nice break to return to the base so you can speak with Val, Zoe, Erend, Catalo, and Beta, just to check how they're all doing. The base really is populated with people now. After completing main quests, your companions will always have more optional dialogue regarding their training, personal feelings, and they may even have a side quest for you to complete. In particular, I really like the companion-based side quests, because not only are they engaging, but they progress Aloy's relationship with her team. Of course, we'll talk more about the specifics of these quests later. Until then, it's time for us to head even further west to recover Demeter. Demeter was the subordinate function in charge of restoring plant life to Earth once the atmosphere and oceans reached a suitable level. Ever since parting from Gaia, Demeter has been unable to produce and nurture plant life without guidance, so the world's flora has become increasingly toxic, which is what has led to the red blight spreading throughout the world. This is arguably one of the most important subordinate functions of them all, and recovering it will bring great stability back to the lives of civilizations that rely heavily on agriculture, such as the Utaru. Aloy leaves the base and heads as far west as she's been thus far, to the western coast, well past the deserts and mountains that we've been to so far, where the land meets the great Pacific Ocean. This also happens to be the territory of the Lowlands clan, but we really don't interact with the Tanakh in the area at all during this quest. I just thought I'd mention that this is their territory. Their settlement Thornmarsh can be located on the coast. After reaching the edge of the mountains to the rear of the bulwark, the land takes a steep decline downwards as the mountains recede to make way for lowlands rainforest and swamps. This is a great opportunity to have some fun with the shield wing, because the edge of the mountain drops off as the landscape changes, meaning you can jump off and glide right down to the rainforest below, giving you the chance to enjoy the view as you float down to the ground. It really gives you a chance to appreciate the scope of this huge open world, and the complexity of its biomes. Finally, Aloy touches down on the moist earth of the coastal rainforest and begins to make her way towards the coordinates of Demeter, which is somewhere within the dense forest. This has got to be one of my favourite biomes in the game, with the systems of streams running through the densely packed trees, the overwhelming amount of untouched foliage, the mist drifting through the forest, and the thick trees reaching up into the sky. It's so picturesque and tranquil. It really is some of Gaia's finest work. It also lacks the irony of Poseidon's location, as this is the exact place I'd expect to find Demeter, the Greek goddess of agriculture. Aloy makes her way through the dense forest until she reaches the remainder of an old world road that cuts directly through the forest. Laying on the ground is a band of Tanakh from the Lowlands clan, 
recently killed. The Tanakh aren't the only ones residing in and around this forest, but who would be bold enough to take on a patrol of Tanakh warriors in their own territory? I suppose with some more investigation, things will become clear. Aloy begins following the road through the forest in the hopes that whoever is responsible will show themselves. Eventually, she comes across a clearing in the forest with a ruined building in the center. Approaching closer, she decides to investigate. Oh, damn. Hold your fire! I'm not here to fight! The barbarian's pinned down. Move in! Okay, whoever these people are, it looks like we're not gonna be friends. Aloy tries to reason with these unidentified soldiers, but they do not listen and are determined to kill her, which gives Aloy no choice but to retaliate in self-defense. This section actually surprised me. These soldiers are actually pretty tough and are equipped with some strong gear. The AI itself is very aggressive, and they seek you out immediately instead of trying to land pot shots on you from a distance. To be able to effectively take one down, your best bet is to either go straight in with your spear or shoot their helmet off so you've got a clear shot of their head. It's a nice change to have difficult human enemies to fight, but of course, they're not too difficult. Aloy dispatches the men swiftly and continues on to the coordinates. Directly behind the building that the soldiers attacked Aloy from lies the facility that houses Demeter, a place known as the Greenhouse, a former Pharaoh Automated Solutions biotech research facility, the perfect place for a lost subordinate function to seek asylum. It's nice to be back in a Pharaoh facility. It feels as if Ted Pharaoh is barely talked about in this game in comparison to Zero Dawn, but I'm sure that'll change later on. Aloy searches around the facility and eventually finds a doorway for a place called the Data Core. This must be the part of the facility that has the processor big enough to accommodate Demeter, so the way forward is very clear, but there's a slight issue. The bunker door is blocked by impenetrable vines grown by a metal flower sitting in front of it. You may recognize these are similar to metal flowers from Horizon Zero Dawn, we'll talk more about them later, but all you need to know for now is that they're capable of deploying virtually indestructible vines. Looks like we're gonna have to find another way around. Aloy makes her way through one of the adjacent corridors, removing debris with her pool caster along the way, until she comes across a vent leading into an elevator shaft. Climbing up the shaft reveals a room with a console in the center. Aloy interacts with it, and watches the hologram. A log. Just got off the line with US Robot Command. Time's running out. Didn't have the heart to tell Harris that our cure might be worse than the disease. Even if adamantine wreath works, we still have to prove we can curtail the trailing plants efficiently. But Cobble's team is working on it over at Test Station Ivy. He'll come through. He has to. Adam Benting Wreath. Another secret project. Well, they made the metal flowers here and the vines, so... Maybe I can find a way to destroy them. If I can find Test Station Ivy... How do I get out of here? It seems that the scientists in charge of this testing facility had successfully found a technology that could theoretically contain or inhibit the Pharaoh Plague, but they didn't have enough time to properly develop and deploy it. They developed drop pods that were designed to deploy vines, which were immune to the swarm's biomass conversion capabilities. It's never explicitly explained, but these vines would have one of two logical functions. The first one I can think of is that the vines themselves would be deployed and used to physically encase the swarm in an impenetrable barrier until it could be shut down. And the second is that the swarm would try to consume the vines which would in turn damage their biomass conversion systems because the vines are unable to be broken down. It's never explicitly explained what the end goal of Project Adamantine Wreath was, but you can headcanon either of those theories or create your own. The scientists working within the greenhouse developed the drop pods and the vines they created, but realized that they would have to figure out a way to dismantle the vines if they were to successfully stop the swarm, otherwise they'd be left with a world covered in indestructible vines. If they were successful in creating a piece of technology that could be used to dissolve the vines, then Aloy needs to find it in order to recover Demeter. The hologram made mention of Test Station Ivy being a significant place in the development of Project Adamantine Wreath, so that's where Aloy needs to head next. Aloy opens the shutters on the nearby window 
windows and rappels into the courtyard below. If she wants to make it to Test Station Ivy, she's going to have to deal with the soldiers patrolling the area first. If they're anything like the ones we encountered earlier, they'll try to kill her on sight, so it's best to deal the first blow. I actually like this bit. You can either take it on stealthily, or just go in all bows blazing. Or you can do a bit of both. It's pretty rare you get to fight a decent group of human enemies in the main story, so it's nice to be able to practice melee combos or stealth moves during this section. Aloy also expresses regret about having to take their lives. Even though she does a lot of it, Aloy isn't a fan of killing people, especially not over petty tribal squabbles that she doesn't have the time to be involved in. The soldiers' use of the word barbarian when referring to Aloy insinuates that they think that she is a Tanakh, which is why they're firing on sight. Either that, or this unknown tribe is just very hostile towards other tribes. Despite how she feels about it, Aloy quickly dispatches the soldiers and presses on. To actually get to Test Station Ivy, it looks like Aloy's gonna have to go through the facility the long way round, because the overgrown vines and plants, as well as the crumbling building, make it hard to navigate directly through the lab. Nearby is Test Station Oak, which may at least shed some light on how to navigate the overgrown facility to reach Test Station Ivy. I submit. Do as you will. I didn't want to fight your friends out there. They attacked me. If by death alone I can atone our trespass. I'm not gonna kill you, okay? I just want to figure out what's going on. Where did you get that focus? Uh, I'm of the chosen people. The Quen? The Ancestors left the power of the Focus to us alone, the Eye that reveals the Legacy. The Legacy, huh? The Legacy? Uh, the Truth. Now, it is in the darkness and the lost places, among the ancient ashes and the bones of the before that it lies waiting. Now, as a Diviner, it is my task to seek it out for the good of my people. You're looking for data. Maybe we can help each other. What's your name? Alpha, second diviner of the Eastern Expedition. I'm Aloy. Why don't we start again? I've never heard of the Quen. Our lands lie across the Great Ocean. We haven't been here before. So why come now? Our homeland has been ravaged by freakish weather. Terrible storms and blistering droughts. The crops are failing, the people are starving. When we looked for answers, it was proposed that if we had the courage to cross the ocean to Legacy's landfall, then we might earn the knowledge we need to save our people. But so far, that knowledge has eluded us. So, your people call this place Legacy's landfall? No. Uh, landfall is where we arrived. To the west, in the shadows of the sunken city by the broken bridge. You mean San Francisco? Yes. You're well versed in the legacy. It was a place of great importance to our ancestors. We had hoped to learn their secrets there, but so far that door remains closed. Even so, the data we discovered there has led us to this place. It might be our last chance. To find something that can save your crops and your people. Yes. If the Ancestors will be generous to us once more. So you said your Ancestors left your tribe that focus? Yes. Thirteen Diviners have possessed this one since it was discovered among the ruins in our homeland. I have their honored names committed to memory. So you have one, but none of the soldiers out there did. We each have a role to play. No, it is the Diviner's purpose to seek out the Legacy, interpret the wisdom of our ancestors for the good of all, and to keep it safe, so that no one but the Diviners know how to use a focus. Not even the Imperial family, and certainly not soldiers. So, how many Diviners are there? At Landfall, a small group. Uh, back at home, a few dozen more. That's a guess. Uh, only the Overseers know for sure, and I am not of their rank. So you call data from the ancient past the legacy? Yes. All that is not lost or forbidden. What does that mean? All that we are capable of reading and that which is permitted. 
Okay, I'm not sure I get it. That's fine. Um, so what do you use the data for? The greatest secrets are the ones that improve the lives of many. How to tend our crops, how to hold floodwaters back, or even cross the ocean. Technology. That is what I seek here. Technology that can help my people back home. Those soldiers, they opened fire on me without warning. Why? Uh, it is the duty of the Quen to seek out the legacy and defend it from the ignorant and envious. Not that you seem ignorant. But back home, other tribes only mean us harm, and we were told the same was true here. Does that come from your legacy? The legacy is truth. But we have been known to misinterpret it. I hope time and the wisdom of our ancestors will guide us down the correct path. Yeah. I hope so, too. I'm looking for a place in this facility called Test Station Ivy. Have you found any data that mentions it? No. Uh, but I did find something that looks like a map. Uh, but it was unreadable. Lost. Maybe I can make some sense of it. Uh, there. a lot of files here. <sighs> I've been through all of them. Look in the GH facility section. <sighs> like I said, a lost file. You can't see the map? It's okay. Looks like your focus is an early model. The operating system won't be able to read any files created after the mid-2050s. But I could share them with you. Share them? <gasps> you can see what is lost. And forbidden. Not lost. Not forbidden, just a newer format. There. That's where I need to go. Oh, but you can't get there. We've been here for a week trying to get deeper into the complex. The way has been blocked by rubble. What about this tunnel? It looks like it unlocks from here. No. I thought these might be some kind of access controls, but I couldn't read enough data to make them work. Well, let's try with my focus. So we finally have the name of this new tribe that we've been fighting since arriving at the greenhouse. The Quen. This woman, Alva, tells us that her tribe is from beyond the Great Ocean, meaning the Quen are from a different continent and are not from the same cradle facility that Aloy and the ancestors of the Nora, Osirum, Kaja, Banuk, Tanakh, and Utaru were born in, Eleuthia 9. This civilization is located somewhere across the Pacific Ocean, most likely in Asia, and they have travelled east from their homeland in order to find a potential solution to the floods, storms, and crop failure that plagued their empire back home. Alva in particular is an integral part of this expedition, as she has attained the rank of Diviner, meaning she's in charge of analysing, collecting, and retrieving useful data that could help the Quen Empire using her focus. This means she must recover data concerning anything to do with the Old Ones to help them piece the story of the Old World together. As as well as anything relating to their own issues and how to stop the many problems plaguing their land. Little does she know, these problems go far deeper than anything she can currently comprehend. Now, it's hard to speculate where exactly the Quen's homeland is. The only information we're given is that they came from beyond the Great Ocean, nothing more. Additionally, we only know the locations of three of the nine Eleuthia cradles dotted around the world, with the one most likely to be linked to the Quen being Eleuthia 1, located in Jingjiang, China. If we're to believe this theory, then the ancestors of the Quen spread off into all different directions throughout Asia, with the people that would eventually become the Quen heading east and finding the Yellow Sea that leads to the Pacific Ocean, most likely becoming a large coastal civilization specialised in exploiting the nearby ocean for food. But of course,
us, there are nine cradle facilities across the world, and we only know the exact locations of three of them. So right now, as of writing this video, we can only theorize as to where the Quen are actually from until we get more information. The Quen as a civilization are also particularly advanced thanks to their study of the old world and the data they find in ruins, which they refer to as the legacy. This search for old world knowledge is what originally led them to discover focuses, which are an integral part of Quen culture. Much of their society and culture is shaped by the knowledge recovered from the ancient past, and they view themselves as having been chosen, having been entrusted by the old ones with the power of the focus, and with it, the ability to access the legacy. Quen society is authoritarian, with publicly available information being extensively monitored, controlled, and doctored by the government especially regarding the legacy. The Quen are also known to practice kin punishment, an act of collective punishment for the families of individuals found guilty of certain crimes, in addition to the culprit themselves. Most importantly though, Quen society is tied firmly to the legacy, the collective body of recovered ancient knowledge. The legacy is considered the ultimate truth, and the most important old ones are deified by the Quen as ancestors, meaning that prominent figures such as Elizabeth Sobek and Ted Farrow are important members of Quen religion. As you can tell, the Quen Empire is strict, harsh, intelligent, authoritarian, and powerful, which is what makes them such a fascinating civilization within the world of Horizon. The way they seek technology and guidance from the old ones to fix their problems actually makes them one of the most intelligent civilizations we've come across, but their lack of willingness to share the knowledge amongst their people is their downfall. Whoever is at the head of the Quen Empire chooses to keep the people shrouded in ignorance. Only the diviners know the extent of the legacy, and even they often misinterpret the data they find. Despite their social and humanitarian shortcomings, the fact that within less than a thousand years they have successfully figured out sailing ships, using strong ocean winds, and actually crossed the Pacific Ocean is impressive to say the least. And I'd love to see what the Quen Empire actually looks like, and whether or not they would be capable of possibly even overthrowing the Kajia if they wanted to. We'll learn more about the Quen in due time, but for now, we've made an ally in Alva the Diviner, who curiously owns a prototype design for the Focus, which was developed before Aloy's more streamlined design was released to the public. I really like Alva. She starts off naive and very set in the ways of the Quen, but you'll come to see she breaks from the mold of her people, which is a common theme for Aloy's companions. Zoe, Catalo, and now Alva are all people who are different from other members of their tribes. We'll talk more about Alva's arc later. For now, we've found a map to the greenhouse, which means it's going to be much easier to find Testation Ivy and hopefully find a way to dissolve the vines. Within Testation Oak are two consoles on either side of the room, and a large hatch stands between them in the center. The two consoles serve as a way to open the hatch, but they must be operated simultaneously to work. Aloy and Alva both take a console each and open the hatch down to the tunnels below the facility. I I really like this section. The game basically drops you into this small maze of tunnels and lets you find your own way through, instead of giving you a waypoint at every intersection. It's fascinating exploring the partially flooded tunnels, marvelling at what was once one of the world's leading biotech research labs, now in a state of ruin with nature slowly swallowing it up. My favourite part of these games is exploring these old world sites, so I'm always having a great time when Aloy makes her way into another ruin to look around. These tunnels are also home to lots of valuables. If you take a wrong turn, you'll most likely be rewarded with some sort of valuable cash to make up for it. And it's a good idea to look for these because they contain legendary rarity valuables that can be sold for hundreds of shards apiece. After a bit of wandering around and pulling debris out of the way using the trusty pull caster, Aloy finds a ladder leading back to the surface and the two women make their way up. That can't be good. They fly to and from the complex several times a day. Only the ancestors know why. Well, the ancestors are dead, Elva. Of course. How else could they be ancestors? <sighs> Looks like we have more pressing concerns. Follow my lead. Of course, no mission is complete without the looming threat of a huge machine to fight. In the Kulruk quest we fought a Slitherfang, and in the Sea of Sands quest we fought a Tide Ripper. So it's safe to assume we will have to fight a Dreadwing, bat-like machines that fly on their colossal wings and use an arsenal of weapons and abilities to kill humans. Aloy's gotta stay alert so as to not get caught out by this predator. The next closest test station is Test Station Elm. If it's anything like Test Station Oak, there'll be an entrance to another set of tunnels that can be used to reach Test Station Ivy, so Aloy and Alva plan to head there next. A large group of machines block the way, which means they need to be taken out before we can move forward. I'm not going to go into detail with this fight because they're all machines we've fought before, but I will say I'm pretty sure you can just sneak around them, 
You don't even need to fight them, but for some reason I decided to during my playthrough. Although I guess it made it easy to explore the area with them gone. Anyway, after taking out the machines or sneaking around them, Aloy and Alva climb their way up through a vent into Test Station Elm. We now have a puzzle, which now that I think of it, is the first puzzle we've come across in a while. Thankfully, this puzzle is a simple one. Similarly to Test Station Oak, there are two consoles in this room, but this time, they're inaccessible. On the ground floor of the room, there are a few battery storage racks that can be pulled out of the wall. Behind one of them is a valuables cache, which is always nice. Behind another is a maintenance bypass key, and behind the third is a battery. The maintenance key can be used to unlock a nearby mechanism, which detaches a storage unit from the wall. Upon freeing the storage unit from its clamps, you can drag it along the rails on the floor in order to use it as a platform for Alva to stand on. This way, when it's in position in the center of the room, Alva can jump from the platform into the first control room, bypassing the need for a key to the door. The battery is used to power the door leading into the first control room, meaning Aloy can enter Alva's control room and use the storage unit platform to jump into the control room adjacent to the first one. To access the battery node, you need to climb through a vent, blow a hole in the wall using some fire gleam, carry the battery through the breach, and deposit it into the slot. This means all that's left to do is to go through the newly opened door, walk past Alva, jump onto the storage unit platform from before, and then jump into the control room adjacent to the first one. And that's it! It's a pretty simple puzzle, but one that engages your brain enough so that it's satisfying to complete. I enjoyed it. With both women standing at their respective consoles, all that's left is to activate them, and hopefully gain access to Test Station Ivy. Okay, you ready? On two. One. Two. Commencing adamantine reef vulnerability test scenario, 12C15. Okay, that's where we need to go. Magnetic field engaged. Initiating biomass conversion process. What? No, 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 no. How do I shut this thing off? Failsafe exceeded. Test cannot be aborted. What is this? That's how the world ended. Test complete. Adamantine reads structural integrity. Uncompromised. What did we just see? Alva, let's meet below. I'm gonna share a file with you, okay? Test log, um, uh, I think it's Tuesday, the second. Oh, who cares? I'll say this for the end of the world. It's jam-packed with irony. We developed biomass conversion here. Infinite food for infinite machines. And now we're racing against time to find something to give them indigestion. Well, it works. War machines won't be able to eat the reeds. But can we deploy them in time? God, I hope so. I don't understand. Your ancestors? They were wiped out. Your legacy didn't tell you that? The time of ashes. But most of the data about that is lost or forbidden. Well, they created machines that consumed all life. You just saw how. It's a miracle anything survived. I don't want to know this. This is not why I'm here. I need the wisdom of my ancestors to help save my people, not forbidden knowledge of their sins. I need to find something that helps, something to bring back. The overseers will punish me, or even worse, people will die. Do you understand? My family, my sister. I left her when she was 14. Already you could see her bones. 
They will starve. Alva. Alva. I get it. I do. It's hard to explain, but you and I are working toward the same goal. And if I succeed, your people won't need any data. Things will just... They will get better. But even if I believe you, my people won't. I need to bring something back. Okay. Then we'll go to Test Station Ivy. And if I can find a way to kill those vines, then I will have access to the data core. What I need is in there. I'm pretty sure that if I take it, it will unblock access to all the data that this place has. And that will give you something to bring home. I'm not sure I understand. But... Every secret makes its own maze. A diviner must persevere. Go on. I'll follow. I really like this cutscene. You can see Alva's desperation to find something anything that she can bring back to the Quen Empire to satisfy the Overseers. As I said before, the Quen practice kin punishment, meaning if Alva doesn't return home with some tangible data that could be used to potentially save the Quen's crops, her and her family will most likely suffer greatly for it. She also sheds some light on what her motivations are, her sister. She was born into a poor family, but eventually reached the rank of diviner in the hopes that she could help her family out of poverty by going on this expedition and being useful to the overseers. I really feel for her in this cutscene. You can tell that Quen life is hard as it is, with the collapsing biosphere making it even harder for people like Alva, who are just trying to look after their family and get by. Aloy, understanding her desperation, is much more compassionate in this cutscene, as she realises that Alva is a sensitive person who needs reassurance to be calmed down. After all, Alva's not only worried about life back home and the prospect of her sister dying, but the knowledge that the Old One's greed and arrogance led to their own demise is something that Overseers did not allow in the general public. It's forbidden knowledge to even diviners who are meant to be the sole keepers of the legacy. Learning this information is almost like a slap in the face, as the Quen see the legacy as the ultimate truth. Yet how can it be the ultimate truth if what actually happened is being censored by the Quen's authoritarian government? Again, it's such an interesting concept. We've not come across a civilization with a proper government in power, let alone a government that lies to its people and covers up undesirable parts of human history in order to control the people and feed them handpicked information. Even though most diviners have a vague knowledge of the time of Ash, as she puts it, Alva must be the first of the diviners to find out what actually happened to the old ones, and I don't think she takes it well during this cutscene. I mean, who can blame her? It must be quite horrific watching a swarm of nanites strip the biomatter from every living thing in its path, even if it's only in a small area. It's a glimpse of what humanity faced in those final 15 months during Operation Enduring Victory. Even with all their infinite wisdom and knowledge and power, the Old Ones still succumbed to the Pharaoh Swarm. There was no other option. That sort of existential crisis is probably quite a lot to take in for someone like Alva who has been sheltered from the harsh truth for her entire life, so it's understandable that her resolve would falter. Anyway, Aloy successfully calmed her down, and the two agreed that they're both working towards the same goal. Getting into the data center is the most important thing here, so Aloy can recover Demeter, and so Alva can look through the greenhouse's files on agriculture to hopefully find something that will satisfy the overseers. The two once again descend into the tunnels underneath the facility, to get into the courtyard in the center of the facility. After a little more walking around the dingy tunnels, and some looting of course, Aloy and Alva come out into the center courtyard, with Test Station Ivy right across from them. However, as they run through the area to get to the adjacent test station, a cloaked Dreadwing attacks, launching us into yet another boss fight. Dreadwings are flying combat machines that use a variety of impairing status effects to disorient targets. For example, the Dreadwing could use its ears to reflect light into Aloy's eyes to blind her, or it could use the metal bite sack in its throat to shoot acidic clouds and projectiles. Additionally, it has bomb launchers on its chest that can be used as a weapon, as well as a cloaking device that allows the Dreadwing to go nearly fully invisible. It also has a pair of antennae on its ears used to call reinforcements, as well as a radar on its tail to spot nearby threats. A lot of the Dreadwing's abilities are centred around impairment, evasion and range, so be aware that this machine will throw everything it can at you from a distance to stop you from closing that gap. But be aware, when you do close that gap, 
You're then going to have to avoid its powerful melee attacks as it swipes with its tail and wings in a large area to keep Aloy under pressure. The key, of course as usual, is to figure out what its weaknesses are. In this case, the Dreadwing is weak to fire, so it's a good idea to hit it with fire until it's grounded. Then go in and start detaching and destroying components to do extra damage. The best bet is to hit the sparker canisters on its shoulders one by one. This way the Dreadwing will be rendered paralysed for a while, allowing you to more easily target those weak areas that aren't covered by armour plating, or even just go straight in for a few critical strikes with your spear. Keeping the weaknesses of machines in mind is paramount to the combat in this game. It's like working out a jigsaw puzzle. You've got to work out which pieces fit in the right places. You can't just brute force your way through. Keeping this in mind, this fight is easy. Upon looting its carcass, the Dreadwing is carrying a metal flower, insinuating that these colossal bat-like machines were responsible for deploying the metal flowers that can be found all over the open world. It seems as if, in its state of paranoia that the Pharaoh Plague would return, Demeter tried to launch the Adamantine Wreath Project by creating the metal flowers containing the vines and having the Dreadwings come and deploy them across the world. Of course, Demeter has no idea that the war ended centuries ago because it has no contact with the outside world. I also want to mention that the metal flowers in Horizon Zero Dawn and the metal flowers in Horizon Forbidden West are different. The ones in Horizon Zero Dawn were created by Gaia during the terraforming process to plant seeds that would promote the repopulation of extinct species of plants, whereas the ones in Horizon Forbidden West were created by Demeter about 20 years ago, after the derangement, in order to launch the Edamantine Wreath Project, not knowing that the Pharaoh Plague is gone. Just thought I'd clear that little bit of lore up, because it kind of confused me. Finally, after many trials and tribulations, Test Station IV is within reach, and Aloy and Alva make their way inside. Within Test Station IV is a console that when interacted with shows us a hologram log from a scientist called Tala Aquino during the time of the Pharaoh Plague. She confirms that they did in fact discover a way to dissolve the vines from the metal flowers. They installed a piece of code to the metal flowers that, when activated, triggers the release of an enzyme that causes the vines to eat themselves from within. The only issue is, the swarm was reproducing at such a rapid rate that they couldn't deploy the vines quick enough to have an effect. Aquino is clearly devastated by this, as she blames herself for having a hand in the Pharaoh Plague. Being a lead scientist in developing the biomass conversion technology in the first place, Aloy has discovered a way to reliably get into the data center as she acquires the software module that contains the code to dismantle the vines, and attaches it to her spear alongside the igniter and the master override. The vine cutter is the final piece of special gear that we will acquire in the game, and with that, Aloy's arsenal is complete. We've come a long way since crafting the pool caster right at the beginning, haven't we? So. Aloy now has the means to recover Demeter, but before we go any further, I think it's time I tell the story of the greenhouse, the scientists that worked there on the biomatter conversion, and the tragedy of Project Adamantine Wreath. It all starts with Ted Farrow as many things in the Horizon universe do. As we know, Ted Farrow launched his company Farrow Automated Solutions in 2033. In its early years, the company became popular for the invention of the Focus, a personal augmented reality device that served as a multi-purpose sensory interface which could be used for many domestic or work-related purposes. It basically became the new smartphone, completely overshadowing the need for a phone at all. Farrow Automated Solutions was also successful with its popular lines of personal servitors and bodyguard bots for domestic use use, as well as industrial robots such as multi-servitors or construction bots. Despite its success in these areas, Faro Automated Solutions was still overshadowed by other robotic companies such as General Synthetics and Recorp. However, during what is known as the clawback era of the 2040s, Faro Automated Solutions made its greatest success with the introduction of green robots. Its environmental cleanup and detoxification efforts were led by none other than Dr. Elizabeth Sobek. Faro Automated Solutions had seen great success in the area of biotechnology, with machines capable of gene manipulation in the field. These robots were able to analyze soil composition, light intensity, temperature, wind speed, and a hundred other factors. Then utilizing gene sequences developed in the greenhouse, they could select or construct a plant to produce the best yields for that location. By 2049, Farrow Automated Solutions was widely credited for the solving of the climate crisis and became the world's wealthiest corporation, with a record market capitalization of over 23 trillion US dollars. 
During the mid to late 2040s, the scientists at the greenhouse were urged to shift from their research into the already successful green robots to focus more on biomass conversion, which was a controversial request to say the least, as at least one member of the team resigned as a result. To be fair, when used in moderation, biomass conversion is a useful tool to turn any form of biomass into fuel. It means that fuel can be sustainable so long as you have enough biomass to be consumed and replaced for it to be consumed again later. The issue is, when used for the wrong reasons and when used without care, the dangers of biomass conversion are unfathomable. The scientists working within the greenhouse then spent the turn of the decade working on biomass conversion and successfully created a method that worked. A swarm of nanites, small nanomachines, could be deployed and used to strip the biomatter from a given area, and then convert that biomatter into a fuel source that could be used to power vehicles, facilities, or other machines. Around the beginning of the 2050s is where the problems began to become prevalent. Ted Farrow was never in it for the benefit of the people. That was merely a byproduct of success. He only cared about lining his own pockets. Even if he had unprecedented talent for sales and marketing, he never truly cared about or understood the science behind the projects his company was developing. This is why he didn't understand the severity of his decision to change from developing green robots in favor of militarized machines of war. Now, I don't need to go into detail about what happened as a result of this shift in business tactics, not only did Farrow Automated Solutions' profits increase dramatically when compared to the sale of green robots, but the company also started pitting governments against each other, and sometimes outright inciting conflict between nations in order to sell military machines to both sides to maximise profits. This change also led to the resignation of one of the company's greatest assets, Dr. Elizabeth Sobeck. She detested Farrow enough as it was, but his choice to almost abandon the development of green robots in favour of machines of war breached one of her personal codes. Seeing no future working at Farrow Automated Solutions, Sobek resigned and founded her own company, Miriam Technologies, where she continued the research and development of environmentally friendly robots as well as quality of life technologies. Miriam eventually became the world's largest supplier of green robots and went on to win numerous awards and accolades, including the 2053 Nobel Prize for Physics and the 2056 Rachel Carson Award for Environmental Progress. But even with all of this progress towards great things, the world would ultimately reach a standstill in late 2064, in which one particular chariot swarm, owned by the corporation called the Hartz Timor Energy Combine, began exhibiting what Ted Farrow called a severe glitch. It had stopped responding to commands and began attacking its owner's personnel. In response, Farrow instructed his programmers to use remote access to upload a service pack that would bring the swarm back under control, only to be reminded of his strict insistence to his team not to include any such access in the OS. Thus, regaining control of this rogue swarm, was impossible. The swarm had become a completely independent entity, answering only to itself. This, coupled with the robot's abilities to exponentially replicate and consume biomatter as fuel, meant that the swarm would quickly grow to numbers beyond any hope of containment. Unfettered and uncontainable, the swarm would overrun the planet, consuming all organic matter until it had consumed the entire biosphere, and thus began the Pharaoh Plague. Of course, we know the story of Elizabeth Sobeck, and how she responded to the desolation of the biosphere with Project Zero Dawn. The creation of a complex and sentient AI in control of nine unique subordinate functions that would one day shut down the swarm, terraform the planet, detoxify the oceans, regrow the flora, and even usher in a new generation of humans, all nurtured by the technology and knowledge of their distant ancestors. But even with Project Zero Dawn in full swing, that doesn't mean humanity didn't try to find ways to avoid the destruction of life on Earth. Whilst Elizabeth Sobeck and her nine alphas worked in conjunction with the US Robot Command and Ted Farrow in order to make sure Zero Dawn was ready before the swarm reached the Gaia Prime facility, to the west, scientists at the greenhouse worked tirelessly to figure out a way to reverse or halt the biomass conversion that they once worked so hard to create in the first place. The end of the world is drenched in irony, but despite this, they came up with Project Adamantine Wreath. As we discovered, Adamantine Wreath was a project in which scientists at the greenhouse developed a way to grow vines that were immune to the swarm's biomass conversion systems. It's never explicitly explained how the vines would be used, but I believe that they would either be consumed by the machines which would in turn disrupt their biomass conversion systems, or they would have used the vines to physically trap the swarm so that it couldn't move or reproduce, giving them time to develop an AI that could hack the swarm to shut it down. Unfortunately though, Project Adamantine Wreath was too little too late. According to projections from US Robot Command during the war, the swarm's rate of reproduction outpaced their ability to drop the wreath deployment shells by 375%. This means that even if it did work, there was no way they could contain the swarm anyway. 
The very thing these scientists strove to create to be the new triumph of human engineering was destined to be humanity's undoing, which I think is pretty poetic in a morbid sense. Tala Aquino, a lead scientist that worked for Faro Automated Solutions for decades, the woman we see in the various hologram logs throughout the greenhouse, worked directly in conjunction with Ted Faro for a number of years at the greenhouse facility and watched on as his interest in green robots dwindled and his obsession with biomass conversion and self-replicating military robots emerged. She trusted in his judgement and respected him because of their great success during the clawback era, even shutting down entire projects at his whim. I guess the true tragedy in all of this is that the scientists working within the greenhouse were originally all passionate about creating robots that would be used to nourish the world and to preserve nature, but instead ended up creating something that would do the exact opposite, all while allowing it to happen because they trusted in the man that led the company through hard times before during the climate crisis. I think Farrow's attitude towards those who worked for him is summed up in this quote from a text data point entry, a transcript from a conversation Ted Farrow and Tala Aquino had in which he abruptly instructs her to terminate a project that her team have been working on for six months. The transcript goes as follows. It's a dead end. There are 12 competitors ahead of us on found protein. Our team is pushing to improve the yield and once they've- No. Kill the program today. The plant gene sequence and stuff is where we've got an edge, but I want every program to link up to the harvester our robotics team's developing. You're talking about flushing six months worth of research. Our AI tells us the plants you're creating aren't robust enough for auto-harvesting. You wanted me to feed starving people, Ted. This research will help. We will feed them. From a farrow harvester. This is all too sudden. We can't reconfigure everything that quickly. You have to think bigger, Tala. What was it you wrote to the team this morning? One of those quotes you're always throwing around? If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Isaac Newton. Well... Newton didn't have the resources we've got, Tala. He couldn't dream of the horizons we can already see. We're the giants now. Tala Aquino was an instrumental member of Faro Automated Solutions during the clawback era. Working in the greenhouse, Aquino oversaw insect protein research programs in an attempt to solve the growing crisis of world hunger. Ted Faro disregarded six months of hard work towards a project that could have been instrumental in feeding people across the world who were homeless or living in poverty, in favour of what he vaguely frames as horizons we can already see. Faro's arrogance is what led to the end of humanity, and in the end, Tala and her fellow scientists were left in an impossible situation, with the technology to theoretically put a stop to their demise, but with no means to deploy it fast enough. Of course, eventually the world did succumb to the Faro Plague, and after a few hundred years, life re-emerged anew thanks to Zero Dawn. But even now, the Dreadwings carry the memory of the greenhouse, the scientists, and the tragedy of Project Adamantine Reef in the form of these metal flowers, created and deployed by Demeter in a desperate and futile attempt to stave off an apocalypse that ended centuries ago. In using the vine cutter to dissolve the vines, finally recovering Demeter, and unlocking the data core for Alva to find data that will help save her people, Aloy has honoured the efforts of the scientists that worked in the greenhouse. Their research was of some use in the end. What did you do? I've never seen my focus glitch like that. Uh, I found a special type of data. It's something you can't read. But it kept a tight grip on the data core. But now you should have access to the central server. All of it. Should give you something to bring home. You were right. Hundreds of archives. Almost all of it relating to agriculture. It would take us years to get through all of this, but we don't have that kind of time. Uh, what you said before about... <laughs> Alba! Hold your fire! By the word of the ancestors, you must stop. Come, look at who you fired on. That barbarian killed our soldiers! Uh, only those who fired blindly. She is no barbarian. She gave me the data we need. Come, look at her. Can't you see? Elizabeth Sobek stands before you, an ancestor reborn.
Diviner. We should bring the Ancestor back. It is we who follow their word, Commander, not the other way around. Uh, my apologies, Dr. Sobek. Our people's faith is strong, but there are those who are not as familiar with the legacy as they should be. You heard the Diviner. The data has been found. You two, with me. The rest of you, meet us back at the beach for return to landfall. I can't talk long. They will have many questions. So do I. Your people know a lot about the past. And about Sobek, I guess, but they're... Please, I must know. What you said before about working towards the same goal, how long will it take? I don't know. A few months? Then you are my family's best hope. Let nothing get in your way. You have opened my eyes to many things, and for that, I thank you. But now you must go. Will I see you again? Soon we return to Legacy's landfall. It might be dangerous for you to go there. Well, tell me how to reach it, just in case. We made landfall on the northeast edge of the sunken city. The currents around the archipelago are vicious, and the only approach is from the south. And it is guarded. Only attempt to go there if you must. Diviner! What's the delay? Please, go. If you attempt to stay here any longer, they may want to take you with us, and that won't go well for anyone. Well, that was quite the adventure, wasn't it? I really enjoyed the search for Demeter. The greenhouse is a really cool environment with some really interesting lore that's actually pretty integral to the legacy of the old ones. Anyways, Alva goes back to Legacy's landfall with her people, and Aloy leaves before the Quen change their mind about letting her go. Finally, Aloy returns to the base after a long journey eastward and merges Demeter back into Gaia's heuristic matrix. We did it! After a lot of hard work, Gaia now has control over Minerva, Aether, Poseidon, and Demeter, and can now begin to heal the biosphere gradually, although she will still need Hephaestus to permanently repair the damage that has been done on a global scale. And with that, the third chapter of this story is done giving us a little bit of time to take a detour from the main story and explore the expanses of the Forbidden West. So with the first two acts of the story done and dusted, and with Minerva, Aether, Poseidon and Demeter recovered and merged with Gaia once more, I think it's time we take a break from the main story and discuss the Forbidden West's wealth of side content. There is plenty of side content in Forbidden West, scattered all across the Tanakh clan lands and beyond. If you were a fan of the side activities in Horizon Zero Dawn, then you're sure to love the side activities in Forbidden West. You'll notice many returning activities, such as cauldrons, faction camps, tall necks and hunting grounds, but Gorilla went that extra mile to include some more really fun and engaging side content such as melee pits, relic ruins, sunken caverns and my personal favourite, the arena. After recovering Minerva and making your way past the mountains west of Plainsong, you can pretty much tackle any of the content at any time, so long as you find their starting locations. And I'll say as someone that refused to put the game down until I finished all the side content, I must admit, it was a ton of fun. If you prefer to watch this chapter after my summary of the main story, then feel free to skip to the time shown on screen now to get back to the main story. If not, without further ado, let's delve into the wealth of side content in Horizon Forbidden West. Salvage contracts are a chain of side missions given to you by various Osiram salvages across the map. There are five salvages in total, and you'll meet the first of them, Karuf, in Barren Light as you pass through the entrance to the settlement. Karuf will inform you about his salvage business and request that you meet him at his camp in No Man's Land to discuss further. He informs you that he's trying to create the best set of armor that Osiram Ingenuity can come up with, but he needs the salvage to do it. Each of his subordinate salvages are going to make a set of armor, and when the armor is built, he will judge which one of them is the best. He instructs 
requests you to speak to each of the salvagers and complete their contracts and then return to him when the work is done. The actual contracts themselves turned out to be really fun, even if they are very simple fetch quests. I think it's because Forbidden West machine hunting is so fun that I was just happy to travel to a location, take down a bunch of machines and then head back to the camp to receive the next contract. In a game that has a lot of narrative based content, it's really nice to just kick back, kill some machines and not have to think too deeply into what you're doing. There are 17 contracts in total that range from easy to pretty challenging, depending on your difficulty setting and how familiar you are with the machines you'll be hunting. You'll be required to fight some easy machines like lance horns, bellowbacks, scrappers and snapmores. However, sometimes the contracts will throw some pretty tough machines at you. A couple of ravagers, a shell snapper and even a behemoth. Although nothing's too tough for our redhead huntress, it's quite easy to acquire all the materials you need for the various contractors. Once you've completed all 17 contracts, you can turn to Karuf's camp where he and the contractors are waiting for you, along with their armour. Then there's this comedic scene where Karuf says none of the armor's good enough but he'll take them anyway on the condition that he will try to sell them to turn a profit, even though he put no work into collecting the materials or making the armors at all. It's just peak capitalism really, isn't it? Aloy suggests they take the best aspects from each piece of armor and combine them, so they end up with an overall set of armor with the best features from each. The salvages then suggest that Aloy gets to keep the armor because it only makes sense as she put in most of the work hunting the machines and she stands to benefit the most from wearing it. Finally, the thing that makes this quest worthwhile is that we are rewarded with the Osaram Artificer Legendary Armor Set, which is considered by many to be the best armor in the game. This armor increases melee effectiveness and also greatly increases is how fast your Valor Surge meter fills up, complete with nice resistances to melee, ranged, fire, acid, shock, and purge water damage. This personally isn't my favourite legendary set in the game, but it is a good one that's certainly worth taking the time to get. Plus, it looks really nice, so if you're not too bothered about stats that much, then this is a great piece of armour for fashion purposes. Overall, salvage contracts are pretty fun. Nothing more, nothing less. Just simple fun to get on with whilst you appreciate the game's world and enjoy the fun combat. One of the returning pieces of side content from Zero Dawn is the hunting grounds. I don't quite remember what the wider audience reception of the hunting grounds were in the original game, but I for one really enjoyed them. They were an actual challenge that really put Aloy's abilities to the test. They actually weren't as hard this time around. I got full stripes in all the hunting grounds without much difficulty in Forbidden West, whereas in Zero Dawn there definitely were plenty of tough time constraints requiring you to be perfect that had me just about scrambling to get those full stripe rewards. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. The hunting grounds consist of four separate sites scattered across the map, each with a different set of machines to hunt and challenges available for you to partake in. I'm not going to go on about these for too long, but I do appreciate Gorilla bringing them back and I do hope to see them return in some form in the next game. You're tested on your ability to take down and dismantle machines in a variety of ways whether that be using stealth or just going in and hunting a group of machines in a certain time limit. I think the hunting grounds do actually test your abilities pretty well and if you play them enough to get the perfect score you do end up picking up some of the techniques that the hunting grounds require you to employ. The hunting grounds definitely take a backseat compared to a lot of the other great side content in this game but they still serve as an engaging way to break up Aloy's travels through the Forbidden West and the medals you earn from completing challenges can be used to purchase weapons from a vendor, which is always nice. I just hope that in the future, they bring back the difficulty from Horizon Zero Dawn because they definitely were a lot easier this time around and I'm a bigger fan of hard challenges when it comes to side content. Melee pits are a really fun side activity. I really enjoyed them because they highlight just how improved the new melee combat system is. In Horizon Zero Dawn, the spear combat was very limited to only a few attack types, light, heavy and context specific attacks such as critical strikes and stealth takedowns. In Horizon Forbidden West, not only are there longer combos for light and heavy attacks, but you can also string together a variety of different ground and aerial combos to form long combo chains. It really, really spruces up the melee combat. Pair the new movesets with the new Resonator Blast ability and you've got yourself an incredibly robust melee system that feels great to use. Not to mention the superior animations that really add weight to this new combat system. Don't get me wrong, it's by no means 
means the most engaging melee combat system in the world. Considering Horizon's combat is mainly range based, I can definitely appreciate the effort that went into revamping this part of the game. So the melee pits are most likely a way to get players to engage with the new combat system, especially because the pit challenges actually serve more as combat tutorials. The melee pits have you face off against a single enemy, and to complete each challenge you must perform the combos required perfectly. This means you fail if you do the wrong move and you've got to start again. I must say, forcing players to perfectly learn the timings of combos actually really worked for me because you would keep doing the combo over and over again until you've gotten it perfect, meaning it sticks in your brain easier due to the repetition. At least, that's how it worked for me. Additionally, upon completing the combat challenges of any given pit, you can choose to have a free fight in which you can fight a singular opponent however you want. You're not required to complete combos in a specific way. This was a really fun way to practice the moves you learn during the challenges, which further helps you remember them. I actually noticed a distinct difference in the way I approached melee combat after completing all of the melee pit challenges. I was much better at performing fluid combos that would seamlessly lead into the next set of attacks. It's overall a really fun combat system. After completing the three Tanakh melee pits and collecting their marks, you're able to fight the Enduring, the Tanakh melee champion. Aloy heads to the mountains north of Scalding Spear and finds an older woman asleep by a campfire. Surprised at finding a seemingly frail old woman instead of a young Tanakh warrior, she seems reluctant to fight. The Enduring, known as Azureka, invites Aloy to sit after finding out she has all three marks from each of the clans. She reveals that she trained Chief Akara when he was young, as well as most of his marshals, all except Regala. She single-handedly trained multiple generations of Tanakh in close combat, so it's safe to say she isn't the frail old woman she seems to be on the surface. The enduring boss fight itself is actually great, a real extravagant finale to this questline. Even with all the knowledge you've learned during the melee pit fights, the enduring will push you to your limits as she uses a variety of fast combos, ranged volleys and smoke bombs to overwhelm you and whittle down your health. Honestly, this boss took me a lot of tries to complete due to how relentless she is in pursuing you and attacking you. There are four smoke drums around the arena which you can use every now and then to break her flow of movement, but you must use them wisely as there are only four. Overall, the enduring fight is a welcome challenge. She doesn't go easy on you at all, and once you finally beat her, it's a really rewarding feeling. After defeating her, Azureka actually modifies your spear, giving it plus one attack damage, which is a nice overall boost. A great reward for a great finale to a really fun set of side activities. Do you enjoy racing? Do you enjoy robot horses? Do you enjoy racing robot horses? Then the Gauntlet Run side activity is right up your alley. This isn't something I expected to be added at all, but it certainly came as a nice surprise and served as a small detour from the serious narrative based side content that is very prevalent in Horizon Forbidden West, which I might add is not a bad thing, it's just nice to have a break every now and then from the story based content. Gauntlet Runs have you racing machines around a set track, and to spice things up, you can use your spear and arrows to knock people off their machines to slow them down. You can also pick up different types of ammo during the race that are more effective at slowing your opponents down. There are three types of arrows you can use. Regular hunter arrows, shock arrows, and tear blast arrows. Hunter arrows are your standard arrows that take two shots to stun an opponent, shock arrows take one shot to stun, and tear blast arrows knock the rider off the machine entirely. And you can even time your tear blast arrows perfectly so you can knock multiple riders down at the same time. It's so satisfying. Additionally, you can pick up a blaze boost which will cause your charger to get a sudden boost of speed, propelling you past the other riders. Kind of like the bullet from Mario Kart, I guess. Yeah, this is essentially Horizon Kart. Genuinely, I really enjoyed these races. They take place across different parts of the map and it really shows you just how beautiful these open world areas are. Especially the race that takes place in the ruins of Las Vegas. After doing the quest where you turn the lights back on, this is easily my favourite area of the game aesthetically and being able to race through it at breakneck speed whilst competing with other riders was such a fun little detour from the regular gameplay loop. There's also a surprise returning character from Horizon Zero Dawn. Nil, the insane murderer who reveled in killing bandits. He's taken a more wholesome turn in his life, he no longer kills for fun, instead he races machines. I gotta say it was a big surprise seeing Nil in this game, he's the character I least expected to see again, but it's nice to see he's trying to live a semi-normal life. You can have a brief conversation with him where you can find out what he's been up to for the last year, and it seems he's decided that racing is more exhilarated than killing. Good for him. So with the four gauntlet runs completed, it's time for us to head on to the next side activity.
Ah, the arena. This is definitely the greatest new addition to the side content in Horizon Forbidden West, and I must say I really hope this feature returns in some form for the next game. There's something about arenas in video games that I really love, just you against a group of enemies with the crowd cheering when you come out on top. The Tanakh Arena in Forbidden West really does encapsulate what I love about arena modes, however I do kind of wish there was a wave based mode that gets progressively harder as you play through the rounds to really test your skills and endurance. The arena can be found in the Memorial Grove, where you first meet Chief for Kara when looking for Aether. After you've successfully completed the Kulrut, you can speak to Kala at the entrance of the arena, who asks if you can bring her back some materials to fix the ballista that was destroyed during the Kulrut. You are required to gather two bristleback tusks and a rollerback sinew, which can easily be acquired by hunting the corresponding machines. Take the materials back to Kala, and there you have it, you've unlocked the arena. I really like that they have a small side quest to reopen the arena, as it not only adds a nice bit of character to Kala, the NPC you must talk to to participate in the arena, but it also shows the impact of Aloy's presence in the Forbidden West. The arena is an important part of Tanakh culture, and so being the one to bring it back is one of the many reasons why the Tanakh end up admiring Aloy towards the end of the game. There are 20 arena challenges to sink your teeth into, with each of them being progressively harder the more you complete. Challenge sets are split up into tiers, amateur, intermediate, skilled, expert, and legendary. The early challenges, as expected, are pretty easy, but as you complete more, the combinations of machines get tougher and tougher. Not only do the enemies get harder, but you're timed on how quickly you can dispatch the machines. If you fail to complete it in the preset time limit, you are not awarded with any arena medals, but you do unlock the next challenge. The various challenges have you fighting combinations of machines, such as a rollerback and three spike snouts, a tide ripper and two snap moors, a shell snapper and two elemental bellowbacks, one fire and one acid, an apex storm bird and even an apex scorcher and an apex thunderjaw. I must admit, some of these fights are brutal, to the extent that for some of them I had to leave to do some leveling so I could come back and actually stand the chance, but finally beating all of them was a very satisfying feeling. I will admit, as much as I love these fights, I just wish the arena was bigger, because having a thunderjaw and a fireclaw throwing themselves at you in the space you're given, it kinda ends up with you being thrown around, getting back up, trying to create distance, and then being thrown around again. This is my only complaint about the arena though, other than that, it's a really really enjoyable piece of side content. It's also worth it too. After successfully completing the arena challenge time constraints, you're rewarded with arena medals that you can spend at the arena shop. Just speak to the prize master Duka, she accepts arena medals and hunting medals from hunting grounds. You can purchase all sorts of great arms and armaments from Duka, including some of the best weapons in the game. The Deathseeker's Shadow Hunter Bow, the Forge Force Sharpshot Bow, the Blast Forge Bolt Blaster, and three legendary outfits. The Karja Stalker Elite, the Tanakh Vanquisher, and my personal favourite armour in the game, the Nora Thunder Warrior. All of these weapons, outfits, coils and weaves are so worth getting, which makes the arena even more fun to play. Not only are you guaranteed a fun challenge, but you're also guaranteed some of the best armour and weapons in the game. If you find yourself in Memorial Grove and you haven't already, I really recommend checking out the arena. Rebel camps are basically what they say on the tin. They are large camps that contain a lot of rebel soldiers. Of course, you can approach them in any way you want. You can use stealth, ranged, melee, traps, whichever playstyle you prefer. So long as by the end, all the rebel soldiers are dead. I'm not going to talk about these for very long, because literally every open world game has some sort of bandit camp side activity these days, and I'm sure you're all as sick of these types of side activities as I am. Although in Forbidden West, they're pretty fun, I will admit. But that's mainly because Forbidden West is a fun game, not because bandit camps make for good content. You don't get an awful lot of opportunities outside of the main story to fight human enemies, you're mainly fighting machines in this game, so it's nice to just be able to switch off for a bit and fight some fellow humans. I usually took these rebel camps as an opportunity to practice the melee combos I learned from the melee pits, which made them really fun overall, especially given the fact that lots of enemies come at you at once. So you've got to get creative with your combos to manage the situation. Stealth is also quite a fun option for rebel camps. Taking out an entire camp without anyone even suspecting you're there is certainly really fun, and again, stealth isn't exactly exactly something that's massively encouraged in Forbidden West because most machines can't be taken down using stealth, only smaller machines can be killed with the silent strike. Although the main allure of these rebel camps is the underlying narrative that goes along with them, involving Regala's rebels and the Osirum sub-faction, the Sons of Prometheus. Do you guys remember Duval from Horizon Zero Dawn? He attempted to murder Sun King Avad by blowing up Meridian and sent a bunch of Glinthawks in to fight you. Well, after Aloy and Erend foiled Duval's plans, a few of his rebels were able to escape, including one resourceful woman named Asir. 
Lucera, who went on to form the Sons of Prometheus. Shortly after the Battle of the Alight in Meridian, which Aloy defeated Hades, Silence approaches Acera and offers her a deal which she can't refuse. He promises to provide her and her Osirum subordinates with machine overrides and focuses, so long as they promise to help Regala in her rebellion using the machines they override. This way, when the Civil War is over, the Sons of Prometheus and Regala's army can march on Meridian and wipe out the Kaja. Of course she accepts, and Acera and Regala easily see eye to eye thanks to their shared hatred of the Kaja, and the loss of their loved ones due to the Red Raids. The Sons of Prometheus teach Regala's rebels how to use overrides, and both factions help bolster each other's power through their shared goals. After stumbling across a few of these rebel camps and discovering the Osirum helping the rebels, Aloy looks into it and finds out more about Acera, the sons of Prometheus, and their involvement with Regala's rebellion. As a result, Aloy instructs Eren to find out more about the sons of Prometheus, specifically where their main camp is located. Eren later subdues a sons of Prometheus operative and discovers from his focus they're based in a place called First Forge, hidden away in the snowy mountains. There's a bit of overlap here between the rebel camps and the companion quests. The final rebel camp in this game is actually Eren's companion quest, so I'll save that for the section of the video where I talk about the companion quests. As for the rebel camps, I've told you all you need to know for now. Much like the Rebel Camps, I'm not going to talk about the Rebel Outposts for too long, as from a gameplay standpoint, they're pretty much exactly the same as the Rebel Camps. Kill enemies in whichever way you want, stealth, range, traps, over in the machines, etc. In each outpost, there's always an outpost leader. Killing them and looting their body will complete the outpost and award you with soldier tags. Soldier tags can be given to Duca in exchange for... yeah, in exchange for pretty much nothing. Duca gives you materials in exchange for soldier tags, but honestly, you get enough crafting materials just by playing the game and hunting machines, so the whole soldier tags thing is kind of pointless. If Duca gave you a unique weapon or armor, then yeah, I'd be on board for these rebel outposts, but it just doesn't seem all that worthwhile to complete all 17 rebel outposts just to get miscellaneous materials. I feel as if they should have left the rebel outposts out this time, considering the six rebel camps in this game are great. It seems like the rebel outposts were very much an afterthought that was made made as filler content created to pad out the open world. I suppose if anything, the presence of the outposts helped to convey the size of Regala's army. Her influence stretches across the Forbidden West, with camps and outposts occupying various strategic points, but other than that, I really think the rebel outposts are kind of pointless overall. There are a variety of collectibles scattered across the Forbidden West, and in this next section I'll be talking about each of them, how fun they are to collect, and what you get from them. Collectibles are a point of contention for lots of people in modern games, because a lot of games opt to include collectibles to pad out the world to avoid having to spend time and resources on creating substantial content. Instead of making the collectibles fun additions to the world that add a little bit of extra incentive to explore places that you wouldn't normally think of exploring before. The best collectibles also have a significant reward, for example, some dialogue with or exposition about the character that asks you to collect them in the first place, a reward in the form of a powerful weapon or piece of gear that will greatly help you on your journey, an item that can be read or inspected to learn more about the game's world and the previous owners of the item, or even a set of items that will trigger an alternate ending. The reward for a collectible has to be significant and it has to feel worthwhile when you've gotten them all. If not, then they shouldn't be there in the first place and were simply added to the game to make it longer. Some of my favourite collectibles from games include the bobbleheads from Fallout 3, the Templar keys from Assassin's Creed 4, the Gwent cards from The Witcher 3, red bricks from the Lego Star Wars games, the Jotnar shrines from God of War, literally every kind of collectible in Doom Eternal, and of course the power cells from Horizon Zero Dawn. All of these collectibles have some sort of tangible experience or reward for collecting all of them that make them worthwhile. The bobbleheads offer permanent skill boosts, the Templar keys offer a special endgame armor, Witcher 3's Gwent cards can be used in games of Gwent, which is really fun if you don't enjoy Gwent, you have no soul. Red bricks give you game changing extras that make free play so much more fun. The Yotnar Shrines offer exposition from Kratos, Atreus, and Mimir about the Norse world. Doom Eternal's collectibles are displayed in the Fortress of Doom and can be viewed at any time. You can even listen to the records. And finally, in Horizon Zero Dawn, you get the completely overpowered Shield Weaver armor for collecting all of the power cells and entering the bunker that contains the armor. In short, collectibles have to be worth their while, and if they aren't, then they shouldn't be included. In this segment of the video, we're going to be discussing the collectibles present in Horizon Forbidden West, and whether or not they're actually worth it, because I'm pretty sick of games that have useless collectibles that do nothing and are there solely to collect for the sake of collecting them. As a completionist that's 100% in his fair share of games, it becomes really apparent how collectibles have changed over the years. They used to serve a purpose, but are now relegated to being content fillers.
Relic Ruins are a piece of side content in Horizon Forbidden West that contain the collectibles called Ornaments. The Relic Ruins themselves are really fun, I'll say that right out the gate. These side missions have you exploring various ruined structures scattered around the map, each of them containing environmental puzzles and parkour for Aloy to overcome. At first, I really didn't understand what I was meant to do for these, but eventually once you start exploring more of the ruins, you become very aware of your surroundings and it becomes quite easy to figure out how to get through them. You just have to look out for debris to clear, vents to crawl through, grapple points to latch onto, crates to climb and fire gleam to blow up. And the puzzles normally open themselves up to you if you've got an eye for problem solving. It's always a good idea when entering a new relic ruin to use your focus to scan the area so you can start piecing together the different aspects of the route you have to take through the ruin to get the ornament. Once you work out what you have to do, the fun is in traversing the room or building so that you can reach the ornament. There are also various optional valuables to collect in the ruins so be sure to keep your eyes peeled for valuable caches and green shine. Relic ruins are overall really fun pieces of content that are genuinely genuinely satisfying to complete, which actually in of itself makes the ornaments worth collecting, because you get to play this really fun content. However, are the ornaments themselves actually worth it? The ornaments themselves are small holographic spears that were once used in hologram light shows during certain holidays in Vegas. Each ornament represents a different holiday or celebration including St. Patrick's Day, Halloween, Chinese New Year, Easter, Valentine's Day, New Year's Eve and Christmas. I must say I really appreciate this nice little addition. It's ultimately useless but was very fun checking out the different kinds of lights. And I also like how they included non-western holidays in there too because it gives Aloy an idea of the various celebrations celebrations that used to be held by the old ones. It's just this really nice wholesome little thing that you can do and I appreciate it. After collecting all the ornaments you can head to Stemmer at Hidden Ember to activate them. They even go that extra mile and have Aloy and Stemmer comment on each of the light shows they tried to work out what the different symbols mean and what was being celebrated. You're also awarded with the Ancestors Return Legendary Shredder Gauntlet for collecting them all which is a great reward all in all. I didn't use Shredder Gauntlets very much during my time playing the game but they are very fun to use and with this being a legendary weapon it's most likely very powerful. All in all, I think the ornaments are a great collectible, not only because you're required to do the relic ruins to get them, which are really fun in their own right, but also because the reward is tangible and offers a nice little wholesome moment between Stemmer and Aloy as they discuss the holidays of the old ones, as well as a powerful weapon. Black boxes are a type of collectible that can be found within the wreckage of old planes left over from Operation Enduring Victory. Each one contains an audio log of the moments just before the plane crashes. A curious Tanakhthin Memorial Grove, Antala, requests for you to search for these black boxes in exchange for machine parts and resources. Due to their belief in the Ten, as we have established earlier, the Tanakh are drawn to old world recordings and holograms, and Antala is clearly interested in finding out what happened to the old ones. Aloy is also naturally curious, so she agrees to help and sets off to find each of the black boxes to recover the last moments of whoever was aboard the planes as they went down. I must say, I really like the black boxes too. Hearing the last moments of the pilots and passengers of the planes as they realise they're going to die, it's pretty raw. Some of them panic, some of them cry, some of them try to reconcile, and some of them simply accept the state of affairs and sit back and let it happen. The voice acting really carries these recordings and sheds a tiny bit more light on the extinction level event that was the rampage of the Pharaoh Plague. The actual gameplay aspects of the black boxes are varied. Some planes are sustained more damage than others. The ones that crashed are in pieces scattered across the landscape and you must find the cockpit to find the black box. One crashed in the middle of a lake and is surrounded by snap moles requiring you to swim past them undetected. One plane was even successfully landed, meaning all you have to do is walk up to it and pry the door open to reach it. Most of them are partially attacked and hanging precariously on the edge of cliffs or amongst trees, meaning you have to climb up to them and find a way inside. For such a small piece of side content, I actually really enjoyed travelling around the map to each black box and trying to find my way inside each plane, then finally getting to hear the next haunting audio log from the people aboard. As far as rewards go, I'd say this one is very worthwhile. For collecting all of the black boxes, you're rewarded with the Wings of the Ten Blast Sling, which I used extensively during my time playing the game. Definitely the most powerful blast sling in the game, with the capacity for 12 advanced bombs, 12 normal bombs, and 12 sticky bombs. This sling came in clutch for me on many occasions where I needed one last burst of damage to finish off a tough enemy, and it completely obliterates smaller machines. I expected the black boxes to be pretty boring, I'm not gonna lie, but I was pleasantly surprised by the fun exploration of the planes and their surrounding areas, the interesting and raw dialogue of the audio logs, and the worthwhile reward. 
The signal lenses are a collectible linked to the side quest Signals of the Sun, and there are six of them in total. Just south of Chainscrape is where the quest begins. You meet a woman called Raina after saving her from a group of machines, and she tells you about her fascination with the signal lenses found in the old Kaja signal towers. The signal towers were used by the Kaja during the Red Raids to notify nearby soldiers that Tanakh were advancing towards the Sundom. The lenses would create a signal light by reflecting the sun, which would in turn attract the attention of other Kaja soldiers in the area. As we know, the Tanakh were able to push the Kaja all the way back to Barren Light, and so the signal towers are no longer in use and began to crumble. As a result, the Kaja planned on demolishing the towers, not only due to their disrupt pair, but also as a way to erase the history and bad memories left behind by the 13th Sun King and his Red Raids. Reyna's father, an Osiram engineer, created the signal lenses that were installed into the towers, and she wants to reclaim them before the Kaja come back and demolish the towers entirely. Her father passed away, and the signal lenses would be the only mementos she could keep to remember him. Understanding her desire to feel closer to her father, much like her own desire to be close with Elizabeth, Aloy agrees to collect the rest of the signal lenses for Reyna, and sets off on her way around the Daunt to the remaining towers. From a gameplay standpoint, I had a lot of fun with these. Each tower has a different parkour route that Aloy must climb to reach the top. They kind of feel like the way old viewpoints from Assassin's Creed were designed, a specific vertical route that the player had to figure out as they climb, opposed to just being able to climb everything to get to the top as soon as possible. There are certain handholds that Aloy is able to climb, and the player has to work out the correct route that leads to the top. I will admit, you can bypass the climbing pretty easily. If you're like me and you save side content until after you finish the main story, you're going to have access to the Sunwing Mount, which means you can basically just fly to the top of each tower, bypassing the climbing altogether. But I guess considering this quest takes place in the Daunt, Aloy wouldn't normally have the Sunwing by that point if you naturally found the quest by exploring early in the game. After collecting all six signal lenses, you can return them to Raina who will reward you with mostly junk basically. Metal shards, bronze ziggots, green shine slivers. However, she does give you the Dune Shadow die, which is actually one of the nicest looking Kaja dies in the game. So I guess the signal lenses are good for something. Overall, I'd say the signal lenses are a pretty average type of collectible. They could be taken out entirely, and the game wouldn't lose any substantial content or anything. But I like Reyna's backstory, as well as the towers themselves. The towers add to the history of the area as a stark reminder to the people of the Dawn that the Red Raids happened, and thousands of people died to appease the Mad Sun King. However, something positive came from the remnants of these towers. A girl clinging onto the memory of her father reclaims his work and returns the lenses to their homeland. The towers may be demolished, but her father's memory lives on. For my entire time playing Horizon Forbidden West main story, I had no idea what survey drones were or what they did. All I knew is that there was a console in the base in which you could use the survey drones in some capacity, but beyond that I had no idea what they were or what they were for. From a collectible standpoint, the survey drones are simple. Get to a spot you can jump from and wait for the drone to fly alongside your vantage point, then jump and grab onto it to bring it to the ground so you can recover its data. There are 10 survey drones in the game, each in a different biome across the Forbidden West map. They can be found surveying a particular area scanning the environment and following a specific route. Some can be found in relatively peaceful areas where there are little to no machines, whereas some can be found near powerful machines. One is even found scanning an area that has a prowling thunder jaw. Some are located in areas that require parkour to reach, whereas others can be found in easy to reach places next to ledges, cliff edges, or old world ruins. What I'm trying to say is, there is a certain diversity as to where the survey drones can be found, which makes it a lot more fun to find them and collect them. Not to mention that you get to travel to each of the game's many biomes to find them, which itself adds to the value of experience as you get to appreciate the game's world on your journey. As for the actual use of the survey drones, honestly it kind of blew my mind when I collected them all and headed back to the base and interacted with the survey module console. The survey drones serve as a contextual way to change the background of the room that you speak to Gaia in. The reason why the drones were scanning the environment is so that the data they collected can be sent back to the base and used to create a perfect digital recreation of the areas that they surveyed. This makes sense within the context of the game too, as the base was originally called the Regional Control Center 9 and would be used to monitor terraforming operations done by Gaia. So having a platform within the control center in which you can directly see the landscape of each biome in the area would be very useful. After finding out what the survey drones did, I was disappointed I didn't go ahead and collect them as I was playing the main story. Again, I had no idea what the survey drones did until after I finished the main story and had no reason to return to the base. So in my experience, they were really redundant. However, I massively appreciate this feature. It just adds so much more character to the base and adds an entirely new layer of atmosphere to the conversations between Gaia and Aloy. Overall, survey drones are great simply for that cool reward. It does nothing practical, but I still love the idea. Lastly, out of all of the collectibles in the game, 
we have the Vista points making a return, being the spiritual successors to the Vantage points in Horizon Zero Dawn. I'm so glad they decided to bring a variant of the Vantage points back in this game. I really enjoyed the concept in Zero Dawn. However, they're a lot more involved in this game, requiring you to complete an environmental puzzle to complete them. In Zero Dawn, completing the Vantage points was merely a task of buying the map showing the locations of the Vantage points, climbing to a high spot in the area the map tells you to go to, and using your focus to see the image left behind in the time capsule. In Forbidden West, however, once you reach the area of the Vista point, a holographic image shows up on your focus display. Then it's a matter of lining up the image with the ruins in front of you. You'll know you've successfully lined it up when the image changes from a purple fragment into the full colorized image, showing what the place looked like in its prime. Well, I love this concept in Zero Dawn, and I absolutely love it in Forbidden West too. It's such a cool way of having players interact with the world in order to learn more about what the old world used to look like when the old ones were at the height of their technological power. As far as rewards go for this collectible, completing all nine Vista points unlocks a cash containing valuables, as well as a message from Elizabeth Sobek herself. The message is a thank you message from Elizabeth and her corporation Miriam Technologies to anyone who took part in the Vista Point tour, as originally these Vista Points were set up for people interested in seeing the sights in and around San Francisco. The message is clearly very meaningful to Aloy, as she looks towards Elizabeth as a figure of hope, and she models herself after Elizabeth's outlook on the world and her sheer drive to do whatever is required to make the world a better place. Hello, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Sobek. Thank you for completing the VistaPoint tour. I hope it's given you a better idea of the work we do at Miriam Technologies, but more importantly, why it is so critical. As you've seen, life is fragile. And as my mother once told me, it needs our support, our care, and our love to survive. I hope this message, which is the core of Miriam's mission, means as much to you as it does to me. Life is indeed fragile, which is a constant theme of the Horizon games. In its vastness and incomprehensible complexity, life is fragile and needs to be nurtured and cared for, not destroyed and abused. This is what Aloy fights for, to ensure that life on Earth continues, nurtured by the care of Gaia. If Aloy inherited anything from Sobek, it's the fire in her heart for the human race, even with all of its shortcomings, and the belief that one day, things will be better. This is something we can all learn from Aloy. Even though the world and the way things seem to be headed are bleak, we must keep hope that things can and will be better with time and a little bit of care. Maybe eventually, there will be a day where we all truly bridge the gap of the unknown to understand one another, and only then will there be true peace. This message from Sobek leads to a great character moment for Aloy. Every time she discovers a new message or memento from Sobek, it reminds her of what she's fighting for, and spurs her to continue her work. After all, every last ounce of hope Sobek had for a better future for humanity was instilled into Aloy when she was created by Gaia. This is a brilliant reward for completing all the Vista points. As I said earlier, meaningful character exhibition is, in my opinion, such a worthwhile reward for completing a side activity. And I must say, a message from Elizabeth Sobek herself is the definition of meaningful when it comes to Horizon. Overall, I actually think the collectibles in Horizon Forbidden West are worth their time. Not only is there a wide variety of content to get involved in when searching for these collectibles, but most of them actually have a tangible or meaningful reward that makes the time you spend worthwhile. It's pretty common these days for games to have meaningless collectibles that are merely something to tick off your completionist list that have no real value at all. But it's safe to say that most of the collectibles in Forbidden West are worth your time, or at least they are from my perspective. I might add that this is a huge step up from the collectibles in Zero Dawn, in which there wasn't really any worthwhile reward for most of the collectible stuff in the game. Right, with the huge collectible based tangent out of the way, let's go back to discussing the rest of the side content available in Horizon Forbidden West. There's plenty more to discuss before we get back to the story. Machine Strike is a popular Tanakh board game, inspired by the machines present within the game's world. The game itself is simple enough. Each player has a set of pieces that each represent different machines. Each piece has a number that equates to its victory points, the number of points gained when the machine is defeated. You need 7 victory points to win a game. These victory points also correspond with setup points, and a set of machines can only contain machines whose setup points add up to a total of 10. A set of machines in this instance is the machines you choose to play with. The limit of 10 setup points points means you can't just throw the strongest machines into your set and expect to win, because the strongest pieces usually have a much higher amount of setup points. This forces you to balance your sets and to think about the best combinations of machines that would work well together. 
Let me explain the rules of the board itself. Each machine strike board is different, but they all adhere to the same rules. The main difference between machine strike boards is the terrain that is featured on each one. Each board is made up of an 8x8 grid of up to 6 different terrains. Pieces can move anywhere on the board within their movement range and in any direction, but the terrain they're standing on affects their stats. Depending on which tile your piece is standing on, a power buff or debuff is applied. Chasm terrain adds a minus 2 power debuff but can only be accessed by flying machines. Marsh terrain adds a minus 1 debuff and stops most machines from moving for one turn. Grassland terrain is neutral and makes no changes to the power status of your machine. Forest terrain adds a plus 1 power buff, hill terrain adds plus 2, and finally mounted terrain adds plus 3. Choosing the right terrain for the right pieces can provide a huge strategic advantage and I must encourage that you learn this system instead of ignoring it like I did when I first started playing Machine Strike. It's really fun stacking a bunch of buffs onto one of your pieces and absolutely decimating an opponent's in one shot. Now that we've got the rules of the board out the way, let's talk about the machines. As for the pieces themselves, let's talk a little bit about the types of machines you can play in Machine Strike. Much like any game, certain pieces are generally better than others, whereas some are more situationally useful. There are six archetypes of machine in total. Melee, Gunner, Dash, Ram, Pull, and Swoop. Some of these are objectively better than others, but I can appreciate the attempt to incorporate machine classes into a minigame. Melee machines always attack the first machine in their attack range. Gunner machines will always attack the machine at the maximum of their attack range. Ram machines always attack the first machine in its attack range to knock it backwards a tile and will then move onto the terrain left behind by the opposing machine. Dash machines always move to the end of their attack range, damaging everything in their path, including friendly pieces. These types of machines must have an empty tile to land on at the end of an attack. Swoop machines always attack the first machine within their attack range and move next to it. They also gain plus one power on all terrains and can ignore all terrain penalties. And finally, pull machines always attack the first machine in their attack range and then pull the enemy one terrain closer to it. They also gain plus one combat power while on marsh terrain and can traverse through it without the marshland hindering its movement. Of the six different machine archetypes in Machine Strike, I'd say that swoop, pull, melee, and dash are the best types of machine pieces. Although I'd say the best of the best a swoop and melee machines, thanks to the insane range and versatility of swoop attacks and the large health pools that melee machines typically have. As for gunner and ram types, they're not exactly bad, they just aren't as good as the others. As for the individual machine pieces themselves, every piece has unique stats on top of its intrinsic stats that correspond with its archetype. If you hover over a machine whilst creating a set, you can view its stat card. At the bottom, you can see four stats, attack power, range, movement and HP, as well as its strength points and weak points. Attack power determines how much damage a machine will do, range determines how many tiles in any given direction the machine can attack, movement determines how many tiles the machine can move in a single turn, and HP determines how much health the machine has. Each piece also has predetermined defense points as well, which shows the machine's defensive capabilities quantified by a number. As for strength and weak points, much like the actual machines in the world of Horizon, the machine strike pieces have places where they're more armored, and places where they're left unprotected. Most machines are strong at the front, weak at the back, and neutral on the sides. But there are some that have weaknesses or strengths on the sides, strengths on the back, or weaknesses on the front. It really depends on the piece. Additionally, Pieces have secondary abilities on top of their archetype's intrinsic abilities, called skills, that will further change the way you use that piece in conjunction with others. These skills are as follows. Sweep, Shield, Retaliate, Blind, Empower, Whiplash, Spray, Burn, Freeze, Alter Terrain, Growth, Gallop, High Ground, Climb, and Stalk. Wow, that's a lot of skills. Way more than I remember there being when playing but that's likely because most of the skills in Machine Strike are either annoying to use or directly work against you in some cases. The best skills of the lot are Sweep, Shield, Retaliate, Blind, Empower, and Whiplash. The rest are basically terrible or just too situational to even use. The reason why these select skills are the most useful is because they directly affect other pieces on the board and are much easier to make use of regularly. Skills like Gallop, High Ground, Climb, and Stalk are situational as they only trigger when your piece is standing on a specific terrain tile, making them pretty redundant when other skills are so much better. Skills such as Alter Terrain, Growth, Freeze, Burn, and Spray are all pretty pretty terrible because they can and will put you at a disadvantage in most circumstances. Alter Terrain is particularly awful when it procs as it basically buffs your opponent and weakens you by raising their terrain and lowering yours, meaning they will do extra damage to your piece when it's their turn. I get the attempt to make interesting skills for the strike pieces that aren't too overpowered, but honestly, I think there are some possibilities for some really cool revisions to some of these skills if we see Machine Strike again in a Horizon game. 
So how does combat actually work in Machine Strike? Well, an attacking piece's combat power is the combination of its base attack power and the value of the terrain it's standing on. For example, if a piece has an attack power of 2, and it's currently standing on forest terrain, which provides a plus one buff, its combat power will be three. Likewise, if the same piece is standing on marsh terrain, which provides a minus one debuff, its combat power will become one. A defending piece's combat power is only decided by the terrain value, so it's good to make sure your pieces are on forest, hill, or mountain terrain when it's time for you to defend. It's equally as important to do damage as it is to avoid it. If you want to do some decent damage to your opponent's piece, you need to keep in mind that the attacking piece's combat power is pitted against the defending piece's combat power, and the damage dealt is the difference between the two. So if your piece has a combat power of 2 and the defending piece has a combat power of 1, you will deal 1 point of damage to that piece's health. So it's a good idea to decide which of your pieces will be best used to attack certain pieces on the opponent's side, to make use of their combat power most effectively. Taking into consideration an enemy piece's combat power, the terrain it's standing on, its skills, which archetype it is, where its weak points are, as well as where your piece will be positioned after attacking, can all be quite a lot to think about, which is why I think Machine Strike is so fun as a simple strategy game. Machine Strike is as much as a game about combat as it is about positioning, so there's still much more to consider while playing. For example, when moving a piece, you'll be able to see its whole range of movement. The outer limits of this shown range, the tiles with a dotted circle, are where you can sprint to. Sprinting is when you move a piece one space beyond its normal limit. If you sprint, you can't follow up with an attack, unless you overcharge. But what's overcharging? Overcharging your piece is an option when you want to move the same piece multiple times in one turn, meaning you can in fact sprint and follow up with an attack. However, it comes at the cost of 2 HP, which sometimes isn't worth it. I found myself using this as a strategy many times, and just brute forcing my way through a tough opponent by regularly overcharging a piece with lots of expendable HP. Now there's tons of pieces in Machine Strike, and we'd be here for way too long talking about this if we went through all of them. So I thought I'd just go over my favourites. The ones that I used over the course of the game that I found worked out time and time again. The Scrapper is a really reliable piece, even if it's nothing special. Considering you only have 10 set points, you sometimes need a piece that still has a decent amount of combat power and health, but has a small amount of set points. With 2 set points in total, 5 health, and with a decent amount of attack power, the Scrapper is always a good choice for when you need to use up the rest of your set points, but don't want to settle for a machine that isn't really going to do anything for you. If anything, the Scrapper can be used as a throwaway machine that you can use offensively because it ultimately doesn't matter too much if it gets destroyed. The Leap Lasher is a particularly useful piece because of its Empower ability, which buffs nearby pieces with plus one attack power at the start of each turn. The Empower skill can actually stack as well, which means you can really buff your pieces up just by keeping the Leap Lasher nearby. Not only is the Empower ability great, but the Leap Lasher only costs one SP, meaning you can pair it with some of the most powerful machines in the game. I often went for the Slither Fang and Leap Lasher combination, which proved to be really powerful. Overall, the Leap Lasher is very reliable as a support piece. The Claw Strider is a particularly powerful piece due to its offensive capabilities as well as its large pool of health. Throw a couple of these into your set and you've got some really formidable machines on your side. Their attack range is very high and their damage output is great considering they only cost 3 SP to put in your set. Whenever I needed a set with more machines and couldn't afford something like a Thunderjaw or Behemoth, I'd always find myself falling back on Claw Striders. Similarly to the Leap Lasher, the Long Leg has the same Empower skill which means it can be used to buff your other piece's attack power. However, what sets the Long Leg apart from its younger brother is that it can actually handle itself in a fight. Whereas the Leap Lasher has very little combat power and can actually be taken out in one hit, the Long Leg has much more health, more defense, and more attack power, making it not only good for buffing machines, but it's capable of fighting off your opponents too. The radius of Empower is also doubled in all directions, so it's much easier to spread your machines out when using the long leg to buff them. The Sky Drifter is an absolute beast. It's my go-to piece when I have a random 2 SP left and I have no idea what to spend it on. Being a swoop archetype of machine, it has a great attack range, being able to reach enemies up to 3 tiles away. The Sky Drifter also has 6 health, which is a really generous amount given its already high attack range. This means you can swoop in, do some damage, and take some damage all without much of a sweat. The Sky Drifter is great, definitely one of the most reliable pieces in the game. The Behemoth was another go-to piece when I needed a mid-level piece that didn't take up too much SP. The reason the Behemoth is so useful to me is because it has 10 health and has the shield ability, making it a great tank to send in alongside some weaker pieces. A lot of the time I'd find myself pairing the Behemoth up with a Leap Lasher or Long Leg in order to buff its attack power too. 
This means the Behemoth becomes an absolute tank, with the ability to shield itself from damage and deal more damage thanks to the machine buffing it. It really is a great combo. The only downside to this piece is that it has weak sides, which is a hindrance because now there's two weak points that machines can attack from, but overall, its abilities make it hard to ignore. The rollerback was a piece that actually surprised me. You wouldn't expect this piece to be particularly powerful, considering the rollerback isn't a particularly dangerous machine. But man, I constantly found myself coming back to the rollerback. It's got a decent health pool of 5, a great movement distance of 3, a decent attack power of 3 which can be buffed if needed, and its ability is retaliate which is a good one. It makes your opponent think twice about attacking your piece, as whenever the rollerback is attacked it will return with its own attack every time. But most of all, the most standout feature of the rollerback is its weak and strong points. The rollerback has a strong front, strong size and a weak back. This means that the rollerback is protected from most angles and it's quite rare to suffer an attack from behind if you're paying attention. What makes the rollerback so useful is its versatility. It's always a decent piece to have alongside some other strong pieces. Ah, the Shell Snapper. This is another piece that can be turned into a walking tank. It's a really good one. I normally pair this one with a long leg to buff it, which turns the Shell Snapper into a very formidable piece. Not only does it start with 3 attack points and 10 health, but it also boasts a movement range of 3, strong sides and back, and it's a pull archetype of machine, meaning you can easily use this machine aggressively against pieces that are on higher terrain than you. I'd argue that the Shell Snapper is one of the greatest pieces in the game. It hits hard, is heavily armoured, and has a great attack range. Definitely worth getting this one. The Slither Fang is a great piece, but it's also a challenge to use correctly. In terms of base stats, the Slither Fang is a really strong piece with 12 health, an attack power of 4, and a decent range of 3. The only thing I'd say is bad about this piece is that it has the Alter Terrain ability, meaning when you successfully attack an enemy piece, their terrain raises and yours lowers. But you can compensate for this by being aggressive and constantly keeping your opponent under pressure. Even if they do have the advantage of height, the Slither Fang has the advantage of combat power over most pieces, so it's more than likely your opponent will try to move their piece away from the Slither Fang instead of launching a frontal assault. I usually paired the Slither Fang with, of course, the Leap Lasher. Given the fact that it takes up 9 SP, you only have the option for one low level machine, so the Leap Lasher is perfect to buff the Slither Fang just that little bit more. Much like its robotic counterpart, the Thunderjaw Machine Strike piece is a formidable beast. I use this piece a lot because it's just a classic, and how can you not love the robotic T-Rex itself? Being a dash machine with 10 HP, 3 attack and the sweep ability, the Thunderjaw is really powerful, especially when you use our good friend the Leap Lasher or Long Leg to buff it. You'll notice a pattern here. Most of the big machines I pair with a machine that can buff it in some way. It's just a nice combo. The sweep ability on the Thunderjaw is what really sets it apart from the other machines. You can catch Catch an opponent off guard and get free damage on multiple pieces at once, which makes short work of those low to mid tier machines. Finally we have the most powerful piece of them all, and probably the most fun piece in the entire game, the Slaughter Spine. With an SP of 10, a HP of 15, and an attack power of 4, this piece is so fun to play with. Of course if you pick the Slaughter Spine, it is the only piece you'll be able to choose, but man is it worth it. In exchange for the lack of backup, the Slaughter Spine can move twice in one turn, which means you can absolutely torment your opponent's pieces by chasing them down. And smashing them. Once the Slaughter Spine is in range, it only takes a couple of attacks to take down most machines and you can always do a bit more damage by overcharging, so once you reach the piece you want to destroy, it's basically impossible for it to get away. The Slaughter Spine is so fun to use. I always find myself picking this one when I'm having a difficult time beating an opponent because it's almost downright cheating. Overall, I think Machine Strike is a great first attempt at a minigame in the Horizon franchise. I always love it when these RPGs have in-depth minigames, it really adds another layer to the world. It's a really simple game that's easy to follow with few rules, and I think that's what makes it the most fun. It doesn't overwhelm you with complexity. Of course, it's not quite up there with the likes of the greatest of all video game minigames, Gwent from The Witcher 3, but I think Machine Strike really has some legs, and I'd love to see it return in the future with more machines, more terrain, more skills, and maybe even a whole quest line dedicated to playing Machine Strike. Maybe a Machine Strike tournament or something along those lines, with a large sum of metal shards or rare Machine Strike pieces of the prize. Either way, whatever they decide to do with Machine Strike in the future, I surprisingly really enjoyed it here in Forbidden West.
Sunken caverns are optional explorable areas that are marked on your map. Most of them are not tied to any quest in particular, although some of them are entered during side quests. I didn't know what to expect from sunken caverns going in, but I must say, I actually thought they really worked. Horizon Forbidden West new underwater exploration is probably the best underwater physics I've seen in any game. The weightiness of Aloy's movements really sell to you that you're underwater, fighting against the pressure as you delve deeper down. Sunken caverns are exactly that, cave systems that have been completely filled with water. The reason for entering these caves is because large deposits of green shine lay in the deepest parts. Even huge deposits of green shine as rare as green shine slabs. The aim of the sunken caverns is to find all the deposits of green shine as well as the optional valuables caches you can find scattered around the cave systems in all sorts of nooks and crannies. But honestly the aspect of exploring these caves is what's most appealing to me. I mean there's not many games where you can do underwater exploration. In fact it kind of reminds me of the diving bell stuff from Assassin's Creed 4 only in caves instead of in the sea. Swimming and looting are not the only things you can do in these caves though. There are a variety of blocked passages that need to be cleared, fire gleam to be blown up, and strong currents to push through. You're also not alone in these caves either. Burrowers swim through some of the caves, so you must take care and slip by them undetected. And with no way to fight back, you have no option but to swim away if you're spotted. The caves contain lots of treasures, but they're also home to a variety of obstacles and dangers, which keeps them interesting. The cave systems themselves are beautiful too, with many tight passageways, open areas and cavern sections where you can walk around and explore parts of the cave that are untouched by water. There are some really impressive moments in these caves where you come up from the water, stick your head out and see a huge open cave around you. My favourite moment was when I was exploring a cave, poked my head out of the water and all around me were bioluminescent glowworms lighting up the cave in this beautiful blue light. It was one of those moments playing a game where you're taken aback by the technology that makes this game so beautiful. I just remember being awestruck and looking around the cave in disbelief, slowly walking around to each greenshine deposit so I could spend longer marvelling at the beauty of this game. The sunken caverns are great, and they really add a new layer of depth into Horizon. I really enjoyed them. I hope in the future games we get fully explorable underwater areas in the ocean, or even in larger, more elaborate cave systems. I think Forbidden West's underwater exploration is so fun, which is pretty rare considering most underwater sections in games end up being slow, boring, and disorienting. Of course, the fan favourite cauldrons make a return in Horizon Forbidden West, and this time, they're better than ever. Of course, we've already discussed Repair Bay Tau, as it was a cauldron linked directly to the main quest line, and there will be one more cauldron that's mandatory for the main quest too, but there are four optional cauldrons for you to tackle and they're such a step up from the first game. All of the cauldrons feel unique in this game. Of course, they keep the sci-fi uniform art style from the first game, but the way they're structured makes them all feel unique. Some will have you find a different way to enter, some will be heavily puzzle-oriented, others will contain more parkour, or some will contain lots of enemies for you to fight. There's even a cauldron that's partially flooded, requiring you to swim through certain sections. There really is a diverse range of things to do in these cauldrons that keeps them fresh and interesting, and they really make the cauldrons in Horizon Zero Dawn look outdated in comparison. Cauldrons in this game also make more use of Aloy's new equipment, like using the glider to cross large gaps, using the pull caster to grapple to ledges, move crates or mechanical arms to create parkour routes, using the rebreather to swim through large sections of water, or using the igniter to create new pathways by blowing up fire gleam. Every aspect of the cauldrons has been updated to include Aloy's new abilities, as well as improving on what the original cauldrons did exponentially. Of course, finding each of the cauldrons, finding a way inside, and exploring them is one thing, but there's still always a boss of some kind when you finally reach the core. The four optional cauldrons have their own respective bosses. In Cauldron Mew, you have to fight a large group of wide moors. In Cauldron Iota, you have to fight a rollerback. In Cauldron Chi, you have to fight a slitherfang. And in Cauldron Kappa, you have to fight a tide ripper. I like the idea of fighting a boss-like enemy at the end of a cauldron, although I wish they were more unique. Instead of just fighting a tide ripper or a slitherfang, I would love it if the ones in the cauldrons were unique enemies with their own unique designs, colour schemes and attacks that other machines from their class don't have. Making them more unique would really go a long way to convey to the player that these are bosses. Kind of like Redmore from the Hunter's Lodge questline in Horizon Zero Dawn. Redmore was battered and damaged with arrows and spears sticking out of its chassis. This visual storytelling lets us as the players know that this was a Thunderjaw that had killed countless hunters and was significantly more powerful than your average Thunderjaw. Having the enemy at the end of the cauldron feel more like a boss through its design and moveset would also further solidify the dungeon feeling of the cauldrons because that's what they're meant to be. Be. 
dungeon-like activities with high risk and high reward. Lots of enemies, exploration, puzzles, and finally a distinct boss at the end. Plus, it would contextually make sense. Hephaestus is in the Cauldron Network, building hunter-killer machines designed specifically to kill humans. It will be interesting to see the designs that Hephaestus has been playing around with as it learns to create more elaborate and powerful versions of previous machines. Kind of like how the Plowhorns from Plainsong were upgraded by Hephaestus into Grimhorns, which are much more dangerous. But at this point, that's just something I would like. It's not an actual criticism of the Cauldrons themselves. I love the Cauldrons in this game. They felt so much more cinematic, immersive, and diverse this time around, and I can't wait to see how they evolve this staple feature of the series in the future. But that's not where it ends. Of course, upon successfully defeating the boss and overriding the core of the Cauldron, you unlock a variety of overrides for machines that you can use out in the wilds. I will admit I'm not much of an overrider in the Horizon games. I certainly would be if they made more machines rideable, but for the most part, I've found overriding machines to be more of a nuisance than just killing them. Although it depends on the machine. If you've got something powerful like a Slitherfang, Thunderjaw, or Slaughter Spine on your side, it's pretty damn cool. But you'll never catch me overriding a Shellwalker, Longleg, or Glinthawk, for example. The overrides work slightly differently in this game. Lesser machines are fully unlocked when you override the core of their respective cauldron. However, the stronger machines will only be partially unlocked and will require you to use the fabrication terminal in the base to unlock fully. Meaning you will have to collect machine parts from that type of machine, bring it to the fabrication terminal, and craft the full override manually. There are also additional types of mount in this game. You've got the standard charger which works like a horse and the sunwing which allows you to fly which we discussed earlier. But there are two more mounts, the bristleback and the claw strider. The bristleback controls like a heavier version of the charger. I don't know why the bristleback was chosen as a mount when there's so many other types of machine I'd rather ride, but it's cool too I guess. The claw strider also had the potential to be so cool, but it just moves painfully slow. Honestly, when I got the override, I was expecting the claw strider to be as fast, if not faster than the charger, but I was sorely disappointed as its max speed is basically a fast walk. Still, being able to override pretty much all the machines in the game is such a cool feature, and I'm really happy with the additions of all the new machines in Forbidden West. And of course, I'm looking forward to seeing the potential new machines they add in DLC. Of course, the fan favourite Tornex make a return. It's good to see these guys again. It's crazy to think that some of the earliest images of Horizon Zero Dawn have Tornex. They're like a staple of the game. And here we are over five years after the announcement of the first game, and Tornex are better than ever. I almost wish there were more in this game because of how creatively the devs came up with more ways to override them. In Horizon Zero Dawn, each tall neck was pretty straightforward. Find the ledge that lines up with the path that the tall neck takes, wait for it to get close, and then jump onto it. Pretty straightforward, right? The Frozen Wilds DLC is where they got a bit creative with how you could interact with tall necks. It established that interacting with the tall neck shouldn't be the same every time. It should be a sort of mini quest or errand. In the Frozen Wilds, the one tall neck in that DLC can be found frozen in ice completely unable to move, with a few components missing. Aloy finds a way to reattach the components keeping the tall neck from escaping the ice, in turn saving the tall neck from further damage. Then you find a way to climb onto it. It's absolutely brilliant, and I remember really enjoying this interesting mini quest to override the tall neck instead of just finding a ledge and jumping onto it. The devs of Gorilla must have had a positive reaction to this because every tall neck in Forbidden West is entirely unique, with different environments to consider and different challenges to overcome. There are so many cool solutions to the tall necks in this game. One of them requires Aloy to find a way to power an old world satellite to change its position so she can jump onto the tall neck. One requires you to have the sunwing override so you can reach the top as there are no ledges high enough in the area to jump from. One tall neck is damaged and is in need of repairs, so Aloy uses Ballista to tie it down so she can make the necessary repairs to override it. Another requires parkour to reach, having Aloy make her way high into the trees using suspended platforms. And one tall neck is nearly completely submerged in water and is in need of repairs. So Aloy heads to a nearby Glinthawk nest to find the parts she needs and ultimately replaces the missing parts to override the tall neck by jumping onto it from some nearby ruins. Each and every one of these tall necks has a unique solution Solution, and I was always excited when I found a new tall neck because I knew each one was different. However, there's one that stands out from the rest, and it can be found in Cauldron Iota. 
this final tall neck made for one of the coolest moments in the game for me. Once you get to the core of the cauldron, you'll notice a tall neck hanging in the center of the room, although it's missing its head. Upon successfully claiming the overrides from the cauldron, Aloy realizes that the tall neck's body is blocking the elevator from leading up. Aloy must attach the tall neck's head to its body and use it as a platform to stand on to get out of the cauldron. After going deeper into the cauldron and doing some parkour to reach a normally inaccessible area, a place that we've never seen in any other cauldron before, Aloy finds the tall neck's head, which is obstructed by debris. Clearing the debris causes the tall neck's head to start slowly moving towards the core room where its body is, and you must follow it, fighting a variety of scroungers, burrowers, and shell walkers along the way. Once the head is reattached, Aloy must then climb onto the tall neck, up its back, and onto its head to override it. Then you've got this beautiful view as the elevator moves upwards, and you seamlessly go from inside the cauldron to outside on top of the tall neck. And you can see the landscape stretching as far as the eye can see. It really is a beautiful moment, and when I played this for the first time, I was completely awestruck that they had come up with the idea to mix the tall neck side activity with the cauldron side activity, to create this amazing finale after you just spent so long exploring underground in the cauldron. This is definitely my favorite open world moment in this game. It's crazy how much effort they put into making this section feel cinematic, considering it isn't even a main story mission. This was one of the things in this game that made me realise just how much Guerrilla have stepped their game up, and will continue to step their game up as they make more instalments in the Horizon franchise. Overall, I absolutely love the tall necks in Horizon Forbidden West. They're unique, diverse, and fun, and as you're playing through the game, they serve as a nice little activity to get involved in as you enter new biomes as you travel further west. As I've mentioned a few times before in this video, once you have a few companions in the base, they'll start to give you side quests relating to their own personal issues and needs. Earlier in this section, we briefly mentioned Eren's companion quest as it's part of the Rebel Camp's questline. As for Aloy's other companions, Zoe, Catalo, and Alva, each of them have their own quest which I think develops their character and relationships with Aloy greatly, and it really adds a nice bit of downtime in between main quests. I would say it's paramount to the overall story to do these quests. They add so much context to the relationships between the characters in the base. We get to know parts of their backstory, memories from childhood, their opinions on current events, and their wishes for the future. It's great stuff. These four side quests are going to be the only side quests we talk about in this side content section of the video, as I think these are the most important side quests in the game. I just want to say, you can actually choose to do these quests after the main story, and I will admit they do fit nicely in that context as a final goodbye to the characters that shape this story. But for me, I prefer to do them in between big main quests, as they really add to the overall journey that Aloy's companions go on. In my opinion, these quests prepare them for the end of the game, showing that they're able to be proactive in fixing their own problems and demonstrating that they know they can rely on Aloy for help. For now though, I'll stop waffling. Let's dive into our companion side quests. This quest is given to you by Zoe in the base. She tells Aloy she has a matter to discuss regarding an issue with the Utaru's land gods. You said you wanted to talk about the land gods? I think there's a way to heal them so that they'll once again provide plain song with grain. Gaia gave me a set of instructions. She called it a uh, reboot code. If we deliver it to the land gods, their derangement will end. Well, that's great. It may be. There are thorns on the path. Unless the code is given by Hephaestus, the land gods will reject it. Gaia showed me a way around this. We need components called control cores from machines made by Hephaestus. Machines similar to the land gods. You mean Grimhorns? Like the one we fought in the repair bay? Yes. Gaia helped me locate two of them out west. So, kill the machines, get the control cores, then... Use them to adapt the reboot code into something the land gods will obey? If all goes well, but taking down two Grimhorns won't be easy. We'll do it together. Bless you, Aloy. I'll send you the location of the machines.
To be able to reboot the Land Gods, we need to collect control cores from Grimhorns, which will in turn bypass the need for Hephaestus to undo their derangement. Aloy meets Zoe at the campfire near the Grimhorn site, and the two make their way towards the machines. After climbing over the nearby hill, two Grimhorns can be seen fertilising the ground next to the river. This is the perfect place to scan the machines in order to determine their weaknesses, same as usual. Of course, we already fought a Grimhorn back in Repair Bay Tau, so we know easily how to deal with these guys. Acid arrows to deal lasting acid damage, explosives to exploit the already corroded metal, and sharpshooter arrows to blow up the blaze sacks. Of course, you can also detach the cluster bomb launchers if you really want to do some damage. After the fight, Aloy loots the control cores and gives them to Zoe, which prompts a conversation. Two control cores, as requested. Thank you. Gaia showed me a way to scan them and take what we need to update the reboot code. I'll head back to base and get started. When I was a child, there was always enough to eat. The land gods provided for us, and... Every season, we celebrated them. My happiest memories come from those times. Do you really think we can bring them back? We'll make it happen. Thank you, Aloy. In this cutscene, you can really see how much Zoe cares about the Land Gods, as well as how ingrained into Utaru culture these machines actually are. For generations, the Grimhorns looked after the Utaru people, gently fertilising their lands, with festivals and celebrations being held to thank the machines for their tireless work. This continued all the way until the derangement, and for the last 19 years, the Utaru have experienced famine unlike anything they've seen before. Zoe clearly just wants to thank the Land Gods for their service, to do something for them for once, which I think is a very noble goal, especially for someone who's been all but banished from the tribe for disobeying the chorus. If Gaia and Zoe can work out how to use the control cores to apply the reboot codes to the Land Gods, it will ease the struggles of the Utaru people and bring them back in harmony with the machines. Zoe takes the control cores and makes her way back to the base, and Aloy meets back up with her later to see if she's made any progress. Any progress with your plan for the Land Gods? Is the reboot code ready? It is, but there is difficult work ahead. Gaia warned me that because the land gods are linked together in a network, the code must be delivered to all of them. Most are in plain song, but in recent years, three of them wandered off. So, T, and Do. We have to find them? No, we know where they are, but they're hard to reach. So, wandered into a lake and sank. Do ventured into a dangerous canyon, and T broke down amidst a herd of machines. Okay, tell you what. You go to Plainsong, handle all the land gods there. I'll take care of So, T, and Do. I'll need their locations, plus the reboot code. I'm sending the data to you now. My people made shrines near where each land god faltered. When you see them, you'll know you're close. And once again, thanks for your help. We're not gonna let your people starve, So. I promise. So we've got quite the task ahead of us it seems. In order to reverse the derangement on the land gods, the reboot codes must be applied to all of the machines, including the ones that got lost or wandered off after the derangement. Three land gods, three trials to overcome in order to save the Utaru's land from the Red Blight. The first one can be found in a nearby canyon. The entrance is blocked by vines from a metal flower. Of course, we now have the means to dissolve the vines, so using the vine cutter, Aloy clears the entrance and makes her way inside. Within the canyon, the land god is on the ground covered in indestructible adamantine wreath vines, with the metal flower just out of reach. To reach the flower, Aloy must remove another set of vines covering a nearby cave, which leads round to a cliff face. After scaling the cliff and reaching the top, the metal flower is accessible. Aloy uses the vine cutter one last time to free the land god, and then makes her way back down to install the reboot codes. The second land god can be found in a lake southwest of Plainsong. The machine wandered off in the direction of the lake, and kept walking into the water, ultimately settling at the bottom of the lake to shut down. Eventually, the land god was covered in debris, and rock, making the machine impossible to reach for the tribespeople. Not only this, but the lake is patrolled by snapmores, making it dangerous to even attempt to recover the land god. Of course, this is easy work for Aloy, as she swims down to the centre of the lake, evades the patrolling snapmores, and prides the debris away, and installs the reboot code with ease. 
Lastly, the third land god can be located south of Plainsong at Cinnabar Sands, nearby a herd of machines. Upon arriving at the shrine near to where the land god was lost, Aloy finds two corpses of Utaru people. These must have been the people who tend to the shrine and place offerings for the land gods. The machines that did this are just over the ridge, and if Aloy wants to install the reboot codes, she's going to have to take them out first. This is an easy task for the experienced Huntress. After all, it's only about four scroungers and a ravager. The most sensible way to go about this is to sneak around and take out each of the scroungers individually without alerting the rest of the herd. It can be really annoying fighting machines with a ravager blasting its cannon off, so it's best to take down the small fry first. After that, I leaped onto the ravager with a stealth attack from a Above, which did a decent bit of damage, then proceeded to use the classic combination of acid and explosives to take it down. And of course, for a bit of fun at the end, I decided to shoot off its cannon to finish it off. Aloy approaches the land god to install the codes, but before she can do it, a stormbird swoops in and attacks. Stormbirds are very fun enemies to fight, as they fire a variety of projectiles, as well as using a lot of swooping attacks to try and catch you off guard. They also land on the ground and use land-based melee attacks to overwhelm you. Of course, as per usual, it's a good idea to scan the machine. Honestly, I'm sounding a bit like a broken record at this point, aren't I? The stormbird is weak to acid and plasma, so that's a great place to start. In this particular fight, I actually opted to use my plasma bolt blaster, which did the trick nicely to ground the huge Bird. Then whilst it was impaired, I used my ice arrows to pierce a chill water canister on the machine's shoulder, causing a chain reaction that covered the stormbird in ice. This in turn made the machine's armour brittle, allowing me to go all out with attacks whilst in its weakened state. Then it's basically a matter of rinse and repeat until the end of the fight. I think the key to effectively taking out a stormbird is to just overwhelm it with elemental effects so it doesn't have a chance to leave the ground. Another option to do a nice amount of damage is to shoot its chest where its storm cannon is. This will not only render the weapon defunct, but will also do a lot of damage. You can also shoot the jet engines on its wings, which will ground the bird and stop it from effectively carpet bombing you. Finally, after defeating the Stormbird, Aloy uploads the reboot goes to the Land God and notifies Zoe that she's done with all three. Zoe asks Aloy to meet her at Plainsong to send out the reboot signal so that all the Land Gods can come home. Aloy makes her way to Plainsong and speaks with Zoe to see if their plan has worked. All of the Land Gods have been updated. Now to send out the reboot signal. beginning. Gaia told me this would happen. To all of them. Do, T, So, and the rest. She called it a reboot sequence. But I didn't think it would be so beautiful. Soon the land gods will return to tilling the soil as they once did. So, the chorus wants a word. Of course they do. Do you want me to come? No need. I'll just tell them that our lands will soon bloom again. Who are they to argue? Find me later, and I'll tell you how it went. Good luck. And there you have it, Zoe has officially returned to Plainsong to speak with the chorus and the land gods have been rebooted. You can actually speak with Zoe later on, who tells Aloy that everything went well and she is no longer shunned by the elders of the Utaru. Although all that matters to her is that her people are once again protected by the fertilization of the land gods, and her people will starve no longer. As far as quests go, this one's pretty fun. It's got a nice mixture of dialogue, exploration and combat, and I gotta say the Stormbird boss battle was a nice touch at the end. Overall this is a great quest for Zoe as a character, it shows that she's resourceful enough to speak with Gaia herself to come up with plans to help people, which is a lot considering only at the beginning of the game she was confused by the focus that Aloy gave her. I really like Zoe, she's one of my favourite characters in this game, and we'll be seeing more of her later. On to the next companion quest. You may remember earlier in the video I talked about the Rebel Camp side content as the underlying story involving the Sons of Prometheus and Regala's Rebels. Well, after some investigation into these two factions, and with a little help from Erend, Aloy decides to head back to the base to see what Erend has learned. I found out more about the Sons of Prometheus. They definitely have a base. It's a place called First Forge. We just have to find it. First Forge? Why, that's it then. I know where that is. You found one of them? 
A Sons of Prometheus operative? Hey, he was posing as a Delver, but my focus locked onto his. When he saw me coming, he ran. I caught up with him. He tried to crush his focus, but there was still data on it. A bunch of locations and coordinates. One of them was called First Forge. I didn't know what it meant till now. Nice job. Ah, you know me. Ancient tech expert. Send me those coordinates, okay? Now hold on, Aloy. I'm coming with you. Asera is the last of a line of killers that murdered Ursa. And I need to be there when she goes down. Of course. Send me the location and I'll call you when I'm close. All right, then. You can see that Erend is eager to avenge his sister, and Aloy understands that there's no arguing with him on this. When it comes to the memory of Ursa, Erend is serious. This is a very important moment for his character. Aloy agrees to let him come with her, and tells him to meet her at the coordinates to First Forge. Upon arriving at a campfire in the mountain near First Forge, Aloy contacts Erend to let him know she's arrived. So, you ready to take down some very nasty Asaram? First, we have to figure out a way in. We'll never get in unnoticed. Your armor. It's almost the same as theirs. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh, hey, guys. Keep up the good work. Who are you? I'm the guy who caught the Nora as Sarah's been looking for. That's who. Yeah, we don't know you. Huh. <clears throat> well, that went well. We should do it more often. After that downright comical attempt at sneaking in, Erend and Aloy fight their way inside, taking out the Sons of Prometheus and Regala's rebels alike. I gotta say, I love that they gave us this mission with Erend. It feels like old times in Horizon Zero Dawn where he and Aloy first met, investigating Durval and foiling his plans to blow up Meridian. Plus, their chemistry as characters is almost unparalleled in this franchise. The Sons of Prometheus base is located in this cool cave area too, and infiltrating it and seeing how fortified it is really helps convey that this is the centre of all Sons of Prometheus traffic in the Forbidden West. There's a variety of strong enemies in First Forge, like the Armoured Hunters, Heavy Weapon Specialists and Shield-Bearing Warriors, that all throw everything they've got at you as soon as your presence is known. Not gonna lie, it was an actual challenge to take all of these enemies on, even with the help of Erend. After the enemies have been defeated and you've collected your loot from the main area, it's time to take on Asera herself. Aloy and Erend chase her through the cave, but she manages to destroy the bridge leading outside. Luckily for Aloy and Erend, there's a tree that can be pushed down, allowing them to across the gap where the bridge was. Upon exiting the cave and confronting Asera, she calls in two overridden claw striders, which you should focus your attention on immediately to avoid being overwhelmed. At this point in the game though, you should be able to easily take down claw striders. They seem intimidating at first, but go down really easily. And now it's time to fight Asera. The Asera boss fight itself is quite simple. Dodge her ranged and melee attacks and bombard her with a variety of high impact attacks when she's open. This fight is different to the enduring fight from the melee pits questline in the sense that you can use all of your weapons. When fighting the Enduring, your arrows were training arrows designed to trigger the resonator blast and you were only allowed to use your spear to do damage. In this fight, you can quite literally throw a barrage of explosive tip spears directly at her face, as well as using your Valor Surges to deal more damage. It's safe to say this fight is pretty easy, even though Asera does have a ridiculous amount of health. Soon enough, after a long and brutal fight, Aloy and Erend are the victors. You okay? The Red Raids, and my sister's death, and Sarah's little army. Yeah, it feels like the bloodshed never ends. And the pain it causes. I hope it's really over this time. Me too. But you did good. I'm serious. We couldn't have stopped this without you. Well, I'm glad I could help. For once, I guess. Should we head back? You go on ahead. I'd like to take a look around first. Make sure Sarah didn't leave any more surprises behind. Okay. i see you later, then. By the forge, I could use a drink. 
After defeating her, make sure to loot her corpse. Don't even let it sit for a while to appreciate your victory, just immediately pluck the items directly from her body. And you'll be happy you did, because she drops the legendary Sun Scourge Hunter Bow, which is used for fire, acid and frost elemental buildup. I never once took this bow off my character since I got it, it's just far too useful of a utility to replace with something else, especially considering elemental buildup is a huge part of this game's combat system. Anyway, overall I like the underlying storyline that goes along with the rebel camps, and I like that Aloy goes to Eren for help, leading to this great moment where Eren and Aloy are hunting the people responsible for arming Regal's rebellion and the killers of Eren's sister. I'm sure bringing Mercer's killers to justice was a sort of bittersweet closure for Eren, finally nipping their plans in the bud and ensuring the future safety of Meridian for the seeable future. I'm sure Ursa will be thankful that he has a friend like Aloy, and she will be proud of the man Eren has become. The next side quest, as you can imagine, is given to Aloy by Catalo in the base. He mentioned that he has an important matter to discuss. You said there was something you wanted to talk about? I've been speaking with Gaia. She mentioned that the Zeniths bind metal with flesh to make themselves stronger. I was wondering if you'd help me do the same. You want to make yourself a new arm? Yes. Gaia insists she can help me build such a thing if I can get the necessary data and materials. She believes these things lie in the place where Beta hid from the Zeniths. Their ancient research lab. I am not as familiar with old world machinery as you are. I could use your assistance. It might be dangerous. The Zeniths probably still keep an eye on that place. We were lucky to get out of there alive the first time. I see. That sounds like this is worth the risk. By the ten, we shall see it through. Catalo humbly asks Aloy if she can help him acquire the components that would allow Gaia to help him synthesize a new arm. You gotta love Catalo. He is so earnest in his desire to be of use to Aloy and the team that it's easy to forget the trauma he must be continually going through after the loss of his arm. Once a respected Tanakh Marshal, after losing his arm, I'm sure many Tanakh looked down on him or regarded him as weak. Of course, as we know, Catalo is not weak at all, even after the loss of his limb. But I'm sure learning that he could somewhat reclaim his loss by using the technology of the old ones filled him with a sense of hope. Without hesitation, Aloy agrees to help Catalo, and the two agree to meet outside of the Far Zenith Research Lab, the one that Aloy, Val, and Eren found Beta in. The two climb the nearby cliff face to reach the facility, but are promptly stopped in their tracks by a group of scrappers, a watcher, and a shell walker. The machines were attracted to the area by the carcasses of the spectres that we fought last time we were here. They're working a way to dismantle them for spare parts that can be taken back to a cauldron in order to build more machines. You can either take these out stealthily, or you can just go all in. They're low tier machines, either way they're gonna go down easily. The two warriors make their way down into the facility, but are stopped once again by another couple of machines that have made their way down here. Honestly, these two machines may as well not be here at all because they can both be dealt with really easily. After clearing out the rest of the scrappers, Aloy and Catalo make their way back into the large storage room we entered earlier in the story. In the corner of the room near the console we used to free Beta is an operations console that Aloy can interact with. Upon interacting with it, Aloy chooses to download the database onto Catalo focus. Somewhere within that data is the schematics for a working prosthetic arm. However, during the download, two spectres find their way into the facility and attack Aloy and Catalo. These spectres must have been left here by the Zeniths to watch over the facility whilst they're gone, which means Aloy and Catalo need to destroy them to purge any evidence that they were ever here. Of course, we've fought spectres before, so we know how to deal with them. Acid arrows to weaken them, explosives to take advantage of their weakened state, and sharpshooter arrows to exploit their weak spots indicated by gold plating. It's funny, the first time you come across spectres, they're really imposing and hard to fight, but at this point they're honestly pretty easy and juggling two of them at once is no issue. After scrapping the spectres and successfully downloading the blueprints for the metal arm, Aloy and Catalo split up, with Aloy making their way to another part of the facility to find the components necessary for Gaia to actually create it, and Catalo waiting and watching for any more spectres to show up. Aloy quickly gathers the components, and the two agree to meet back up at the base later. Upon returning to the base after some time has passed, Aloy asks Catalo how he's doing with the new arm, and he confirms that is done, but he needs to test it in the field and once again requires Aloy's help. He asks her to meet him where we took down Regala's overridden tremor tusk earlier. After arriving at the meeting point, Catalo mysteriously leads Aloy into the nearby valley, not telling her precisely how he actually intends to test the arm in order to not ruin the surprise. Alright, talk to me, Catalo. I wish to test the arm on that. 
It has menaced the valley for some time. Killed more than a few of the Sky Clan. But no longer. I'm honored to help. After you. Well, it's time to put the new arm to the test, against one of the strongest machines in the Forbidden West, the Scorcher. Scorchers are particularly dangerous because not only are they strong, but they're pretty agile for their size. The Scorcher is equipped with large sharp teeth and fangs for close range fighting, as well as a mine launcher mounted on its back for that extra added range. Of course, the Scorcher is a fire based machine and is therefore strengthened by fire, so it's a good idea to put those fire arrows away. This means it's best to use ice arrows, which are definitely some of my favourites to use in this game if you haven't figured that out yet. Inflicting enough ice damage on a Scorcher will temporarily subdue its flames and cause it to be frozen in place for a short time. This gives you the opportunity to go ahead and start using sharpshot arrows to do some serious damage to those components. One component of the Scorcher in particular is really useful to take out is its power generator, which is located on the back of the machine. Not only does shooting this deal a lot of damage when the machine's frozen, but it also immediately inflicts the machine with shock damage, which is another elemental weakness of the Scorcher. My method to take out the Scorcher consists of freezing them, taking off as many components as I can to maximise damage, destroying the power generator to stun it, and then going back to freeze arrows to finish it off. Again, much like any machine in the game, the Scorcher is easy to deal with once you know what components to focus on. And just like that, the Scorcher's down. Well, I think it's safe to say the new arm works fine. Agreed. Then why are you taking it off? This is what I am now. What I overcame. Anything else feels... wrong. Like a disguise. I'll use the new arm when I need it. But the rest of the time, I will simply be myself. I wouldn't have it any other way. You have my thanks for doing this with me. Here. Something to mark our victory. Thank you. I'll see you later then. The ten be with you, Aloy. I love this scene so much. Catalo has access to a fully working prosthetic arm that would help him in all aspects of his life, but he chooses to embrace his loss and instead learn to live with the lack of his arm, whilst also acknowledging that it will be there for him when he needs it. It just shows the type of person Catalo is, honourable. In his eyes, using the arm all the time would feel like a crutch. He would rather learn to live with the burden and embrace it than try to change what happened to him. Obviously, I can't speak for people who have gone through such a loss, but I like to imagine that this dialogue may have resonated with some gamers out there and maybe now feel more able to embrace themselves as they are. I also just want to highlight Katalo's character journey over the course of the game. During the Broken Sky quest when we first met him, he was cold, bitter, arrogant and wouldn't give Aloy the time of day. But after witnessing what Aloy is capable of and befriending her, it's clear his outlook on life has changed drastically. Katalo has learned a lot over the course of this journey and it's such a beautiful natural character development. He's definitely one of my favourites in this game. Don't worry though, there's still plenty more Catalo for us in the main story, so we'll go check up on him and the others at the base soon. Last but not least, we have the fourth and final companion side quest given to us by Alva. Now I know at the point we're at in the main story, Alva actually hasn't made her way to the base and officially joined the team yet, but it's so obvious that at this point she will, and it makes it easier for me to summarize all the companion quests during this chapter. So all you need to know is that Alva will join Aloy and her other companions soon, which of course leads to her getting her own companion quest. Aloy approaches Alva in the base, who makes mention of something called Leviathan, a flood control system linked to the great delta of 
her homeland. It was initially built by the Old Ones as a way to avoid flooding during monsoon season, and Alva hopes to find some data on how to repair it so that the people don't have to worry about the floods sweeping their homes away on top of the famine that's already plaguing their lands. Alva asks for Aloy's help to search a research lab in San Francisco for answers, and Aloy agrees to meet her at Legacy's landfall. Upon arriving, Alva and Aloy speak to a nearby diviner, who's recently gone on an expedition to the research lab to see if they can find out what he knows. Diviner Alva, what are you doing back in Landfall? And with the living ancestor? We're looking for the At Bay Research Center, where Leviathan was developed. The legacy tells us it's somewhere in the city. Alva mentioned you've been collecting data in the area. Do you know where it is? Uh, yes, I stumbled across it, but there was no data there, only crumbling ruins. Tell us anyway. We might be able to find something you missed. Please, don't trouble yourself. I, I, I sh assure you, our search was very thorough. Mm, you're hiding something. What? That... that is absurd. A diviner must only speak truth, as you're well aware. Oh, you're worried you found something dangerous. Something compromising on Eileen Sasaki? Keep your voice down. Look, I get it, Nerik. You want to make it back to your family, so it's safer to turn a blind eye. But think of Leviathan. How it could help everyone. Isn't that why we're here? Don't let fear deny us that. Very well. The facility's just south of here, along the shore. But even if you find a way to fix Leviathan, it's sure to be shrouded in that which is forbidden. Too often the truth is forbidden. As you can see, this diviner in particular was paranoid about the implication of him finding forbidden knowledge. Of course, forbidden knowledge just means anything that the overseers deem unsavory. This could be anything ranging from things that greatly contradict the current teachings of the legacy, or anything that depicts the ancestors as anything less than deities to be worshipped. What this diviner must have found may have painted the old ones in a bad light. Regardless of what he found, we'll see for ourselves anyway. And with that, Aloy and Alva set off to find the research lab containing more information about Leviathan. Arriving at the facility, it's apparent that the Diviner wasn't wrong when he said it was a pile of crumbling ruins. Nevertheless, there must be something inside that Alva can use. As you move closer to the ruins, a Slitherfang bursts out of the ground to defend its territory. But obviously, at this point we know how to take down a Slitherfang easily as we've fought so many across the course of the game, so I won't go into detail with this fight. It's funny, the Slitherfang we fought with Val at the beginning seemed like such a tough enemy, but at this at this point, we can take down a Slitherfang in a matter of seconds with the right combination of weapons. After taking down the Slitherfang, Aloy and Alva can continue their search for Leviathan. A vent on the exterior of the ruins can be removed, allowing the two women to get deeper inside. It's quite evident that this facility has gone through a lot with the ceiling having caved in possibly hundreds of years ago, leaving the interior completely open to the elements. It's hard to recognise this as a building at all, with twisted metal and crumbling stone protruding from every available surface. After a little bit of climbing, at the top of the facility lies a console hooked up to a hollow projector. Oh, the data on Leviathan isn't here. Well, there's some kind of log. Delete the database. But Miss Sasaki, when you look at the reports, 3,000 exhibiting symptoms, over 400 dead. The data's clear. Omaroma is contaminating the water supply, promoting bacterial growth. And with Leviathan based on the same architecture, you're a smart kid. Top of your class, right? My father built this company thanks to world-class talent like you. And you know what else is world-class? Our legal team. So unless you want to spend the rest of your career in some dead-end, underfunded public research institute, you'll delete that database and forward all data on Leviathan to my office. Yes, ma'am. That was her. The ancestor, Eileen Sasaki. Hundreds dead. And she knew their system was to blame, but she had the truth erased. Were all the ancestors like this? Selfish, ruthless, immoral? And yet we hold them up as paragons of enlightenment and virtue. Given what we've learned, I don't even know if Leviathan will work. Hold on. Let's not give up just yet. 
You said before that the Old Ones use Leviathan to control flooding. Which means... it probably worked. We'll know more when we find the data on it. The recording mentioned a copy was sent to Eileen's office. And to their corporate headquarters. Uh, there. Once again, Alva's devotion to the Quen Empire is being tested. As I mentioned earlier, Quen culture revolves around the legacy and the ancestors, holding the old ones to a very high esteem. As Alva puts it, we, the Quen, hold them up as paragons of enlightenment and virtue, when in actuality the old ones were arrogant to the point of extinction. The more Alva discovers about the forbidden parts of the legacy, the more she realises that the overseers in charge of the Quen Empire merely pick and choose the desirable parts of human history in order to control the general population of the Quen Empire. This is what sets Alva apart from the other diviners. She isn't afraid of uncovering forbidden parts of the legacy, even if that means tarnishing her opinion of her own people. Anyway, Aloy and Alva need to make one last climb right up to the tallest skyscraper in the area, as that's where Eileen's office is which will hopefully contain more data on Leviathan. After making the trek from the previous ruins to the office building, there's a really nice climbing section at the building that shows off Forbidden West's array of different climbing animations. It looks great, as Aloy smoothly jumps from handhold to handhold. After reaching the top of the shaft, you use the pull caster to pull a beam down across the gap, and then shoot down a ladder in order to climb up. As soon as you climb up the ladder, there are two glint hawks. I genuinely have no idea why these are even here in the first place because you can stealth kill both of them without any danger of either of them seeing you. After passing the glint hawks there's another decent climb up even higher. There's a particular section of this climb that I thought was cool. After clearing some debris from the adjacent building, you've got to make the jump across the gap into the entrance to Eileen's office building. The gap between the two buildings is just enough that Aloy can make it across, and she grabs the ledge to pull herself up. It's also made clear throughout this portion of the quest that Alva has a fear of heights, and that this climb has been difficult for her. Given the fact that even Aloy barely made that jump, Alva is pretty scared, and she actually asks Aloy if she'll watch her jump to make sure she makes it across safely. As she makes the jump, there's a moment where it looks like she doesn't make it, and honestly, it got me the the first time. I even went over to the edge in an attempt to help her. Additionally, I don't see anything stopping the player from just choosing to run off and continue on their way without even engaging with this interaction. I'm sure Alva's AI would just catch up, but the fact they put this in is such a nice touch. It serves as a moment of bonding between these two characters and the trust they now have for each other compared to when they first met in the greenhouse. The two make their way into the next room which has a code locked door inside, with two data points alluding to what the password may be. One of the data points reveals that the code is the exact date that Atbay Global Infrastructure was founded. The company was founded on the 20th of October 2023. So naturally, the disgusting Americanized date system means that the passcode is 102023 even though it should be 201023. Anyway, after getting into the office, one of the audio logs inside reveals that Eileen wasn't as callous and uncaring as the previous audio log has led us to believe. Eileen wasn't actually the one who greenlit the Leviathan project despite the company's last venture poisoning the water supply. It was actually her father, Kenzo Sasaki, who had the final say. Even though she did cover up for him, she was trying to convince him to halt the project, but it seems he had other plans for the business. It seems we're getting close to the information we want, but we still need to climb higher if we want to find out more. Using her pull caster, Aloy pulls a crumbling section of wall down, which reveals a pathway outside the building, which leads further upwards. At this point, we can really appreciate how high we actually are, as you get a nice view of the coast from this high up. This is basically the last stretch up the skyscraper, as Aloy makes her way around the outside of the building and further up until she reaches another entrance to the corridor. At the end of the corridor is a deposit of fire gleam. Blowing up the fire gleam reveals an elevator shaft with handholds that lead right up to the top floor. Alva meets Aloy up at the top, and there's one last small puzzle that needs to be solved in order to unlock the final door. The clue to the door's code are actually in the form of four artifacts that remain in this room. They belong to Eileen Sasaki, and each of them has a significant year or number related to each of them. Due to Alva's knowledge of the legacy and old world artifacts, she's able to name each artifact, the year some of them were made, as well as how old Eileen was when she acquired each one. Each of these numbers add up to make the code, so all you need to do really is listen to Alva's dialogue, write down each number she mentions, put them in a sequence, and change the order of the numbers to accommodate for the two artifacts that fell off their podiums. The final code is 402625, which took me a while because I'm absolutely shit at maths. Finally, after this long journey, we've made it to the room at the very top of the building, Eileen Sasaki's office. Well, it's official. Eileen Sasaki, CEO, Chair, 
And the worst daughter in the world. Security had to escort Dad to his vert. Guess we'll be speaking through lawyers from now on. Looking down at the world from here. It's hard to see the details. People become risk factors. Statistics. <laughs> Far too easily. Omuramba was supposed to provide clean water. Improve lives. It was easier to pretend there wasn't a problem. Easier to believe... The lie was truth. But I don't want to pretend anymore. I will build Leviathan right. No more shortcuts. No more lying just to save face. It won't undo our sins. My sins. But maybe we can still do some good. She overthrew her father, uh, took over the company, so that Leviathan wouldn't end up killing people. It sounded like she regretted covering up Omuramba's failure. She wasn't perfect. Not a paragon, as the Quan believe. But not a monster, either. She tried to make up for her mistakes. And now you know the truth. Uh, as for the data... Uh, Leviathan... Uh, yes, uh, it's here. Downloading a copy now. Is something wrong? I think I'll stay here a while longer. There's a lot more data that I want to look through. Are you sure you'll be okay on your own? Down is always easier than up. Let's speak again when we're back at base. Okay. I'll see you there. This was a nice cutscene. Even though Alva learned the truth of Eileen's deception, and how she helped cover up at base dangerous Omaramba project, which led to the deaths of at least 400 people, at least she also found out that Eileen had a change of heart, and turned her own father into the police in order to save lives. Then she became CEO of at Bay and made it her goal to see Project Leviathan through, using ethical means. Of course, Alva also got what she came here for after all, as Eileen's database has lots of information on Leviathan that she'll be able to use to help her people back home. Later on, you can actually meet Alva back at the base and she talks about everything she's learned about the old ones since meeting Aloy. Their hubris and their propensity for selfishness. She began to question the entire legacy of the Quen and realised that the path of human history and the morality of the humans that have existed throughout history is not black and white, but merely shades of grey. She actually declares that as a diviner she will not settle for the half-truth that the Quen accept as history. All human history, no matter how ugly, must be available for all to see. And there we have it, that's all of the companion side quests in Horizon Forbidden West, and I must say I really enjoyed all of them. Whether that be restoring the land gods with Zoe, taking down Asera and the Sons of Prometheus with Erend, helping Catalo construct his prosthetic arm, or discovering the secrets of Project Leviathan with Alva. These quests really add so much to the relationships between Aloy and her companions, and helps flesh them out way more as characters. We get to see Zoe's outlook on Utaru culture, and how even though she is currently an outcast, she still cares about her fellow Utaru people. Eren's quest nicely finishes his current character arc, as we get to see him finally make peace with Ursa's death, as he is now able to move on after taking down Asera and her men. During Katalo's quest, we're shown a much more vulnerable side of him, and he's not afraid to explain his personal philosophies to Aloy. And of course, in Alva's quest, we get to see a much more open and honest side of her, as well as the full extent of her curiosity for human history, and how seriously she takes the legacy. Each of these quests shows us an important part of each of these characters, and they do a great deal to expand on smaller ideas that were brought up in other quests. I would definitely say that the companion quests are paramount to a first time playthrough of Horizon Forbidden West. In terms of characterization, they're as important as the main story in my opinion. Congratulations, you made it to the other side of the side content section of this video. I know this was such a huge tangent to make which took us well away from the main story, but I really wanted to discuss this game's breadth of side content, and I didn't want to split the video into two halves with one for the main story and one for side content. For me, collecting each subordinate function was a very urgent task, so it wouldn't make much sense to do side content during that whole act, whereas after the subordinate functions have been returned to Gaia, Aloy and her companions have some more breathing room 
which means it makes more sense contextually to start doing side content after the initial bulk of the game is out of the way. It's always super jarring to me when a character has this urgent task and yet decides to spend a good few days doing side quests that have no overall bearing to the state of the main story. Anyway, I have no more to say regarding this game's side content other than that most of it was great. They really populated the Forbidden West with an array of fun activities. And I must say this sandbox kept me entertained for hundreds of hours. Definitely high quality stuff as far as AAA open world games are at the moment. Now, I think it's time we get back to the main quest line, don't you? After that long tangent, I thought now would be a good time to do a brief story recap to summarise the events of Chapter 3. Where we left off, Aloy had just completed her long journey across the Forbidden West to find three of Gaia's most important subordinate functions, Aether, Poseidon and Demeter. Aether was found in the Memorial Grove, the Tanakh's capital settlement where Chief Ikaro lives, along with his most trusted marshals. The Memorial Grove is an old world museum, dedicated to the memory of the Joint Military Task Force JTF-10 and the related travesty that occurred during the Battle of the Mojave in 2037, in which the members of JTF-10 and hundreds of refugees were killed as a result of the conflict. Aether sought asylum within a large processor in a server room underneath the Memorial Grove, and in order to receive access to it, Aloy had to work with his Hikaro's most trusted marshal, Katalo, to make sure that the trial by combat known as the Cool Roots would go ahead without delay, and without intervention from Regala and her forces. Aloy successfully fulfilled her end of the deal, and Hikaro subsequently allowed her to reclaim Aether and return it to Gaia. Poseidon was found within the old world ruins of Las Vegas in the Nevada desert. Aloy met a small group of wandering Osram showmen known as Morland, Abaddon, and Stemmer, who were attempting to enter the ruins below the dunes in order to access a large deposit of hollow projectors, when the ruins suddenly flooded with water. With the help of Morland, Aloy crafted a diving mask and swam down to investigate. After some trials and tribulation, the Huntress managed to drain the underground dome, allowing her to fight the Tide Ripper that had taken residents down there. After successfully destroying the Tide Ripper, Aloy made her way to the processor where Poseidon was stored and recovered the rogue AI to return to Gaia. Demeter was found in the old Faro research lab known as the Greenhouse. Aloy had to fight her way inside, against Quen soldiers that mistook her for a Tanakh. After making her way into the facility, Aloy met a Quen diviner known as Alva, who was studying the Greenhouse's database to find something that could help her people save their dying crops. Due to their mutual interest to explore the facility, the two women help each other reach their respective goals, with Alva finding information that will help her people, and Aloy finding Demeter in the data core, allowing her to take it back to the base and merge it with Gaia once more. With our little recap out of the way, let's get back into the main story. Where we left off in the main story, Aloy had just returned to the base in order to merge Demeter with Gaia, which takes us into our next chapter. With the acquisition of Aether, Poseidon and Demeter, my heuristic processing density has expanded greatly. I should now be able to absorb Hephaestus, and fortunately, we have made progress on a plan to capture it. With Varl's encouragement, Beta analyzed all available information on Hephaestus. Its expansion has been rampant. It is too large to be beamcast, and the kernel you have been using could never hold it. Therefore, it must be contained in a location with a direct physical connection to me. A place with two data cores. Two cores? Where would we find a place like that? Gemini. An abandoned cauldron in the desert west of here. Seismic activity disrupted the original construction. Two data cores were built as a result. I've been there. The Tanakh marked the entrance as some kind of ritual ground. We'll have to bring you there by hand. I have devised a blueprint for a suitable, albeit unwieldy, transport rig. It will require two people to carry it to Gemini. I can help. Once I am installed on the first core, I will call down Hephaestus on the other, trapping it. I will then initiate the merge. 
However, in order to construct the rig, I will need considerable help. Can you build it? I suppose I could, but it's not gonna work. The Zeniths will find you. Minerva won't be able to conceal your location. That is correct. Absorbing Hephaestus will create a significant power surge, easily detected by anyone capable of noticing. But what if there were multiple power surges? To fake out the Zeniths? If Erend, Zoe, and Catalo spread out to the other cauldrons and create their own surges, would those conceal the one at Gemini? Analyzing. Such a tactic might be effective. With Beta's help, we should be able to build a set of handheld pulse generators. I told you it's not gonna work! I did a test. Hephaestus has written Alpha Clearance out of its access module. You'll never be able to capture it! Then we need a higher level of clearance. There is no higher- Ted Pharaoh's Mega Clearance. The one he used to purge the Apollo database and kill the Alphas. But to get it, you would have to find Thebes. The private bunker he retreated to when the world ended, and nobody knows where that is, not even the Zeniths. Their only intel was that it was somewhere in San Francisco. That might be all I need. Alva, the Quen Diviner I met, said her people had set up a base at Landfall. They were searching for data in San Francisco from there. She might be able to help. So I guess I'm headed all the way west. While I'm gone. Will you be able to build the rig and the pulse generators? I'll try. I'll make sure she has what she needs. So we finally have a plan to merge Hephaestus with Gaia. With now four subordinate functions at her disposal, Gaia is strong enough to trap and absorb Hephaestus back into her heuristic matrix. The key to doing this is Cauldron Gemini, a cauldron that has two data cores. Gaia will be deposited onto one of the data cores, thus trapping Hephaestus in the other, allowing Gaia to begin the merge. Of course, this whole process will cause a massive energy surge, which will likely alert the Zeniths, which makes this a risky move. Aloy devises the plan to send Zoe, Erend, and Catalo to each of the other cauldrons in order to set off a series of decoy power surges, which will hopefully distract the Zeniths long enough for Gaia to take Hephaestus. However, before they can even think about setting this plan into motion, Beta brings up the fact that Hephaestus has written Alpha Clearance out of its access module, meaning currently even Aloy doesn't have the means to override Hephaestus in the first place. She needs higher clearance, and the only clearance higher than Alpha is Omega, strictly reserved for Ted Farrow himself. This is where things get really interesting. After the world ended, Ted Farrow retreated to a private bunker somewhere in San Francisco known as Thebes, named after the capital city of ancient Egypt during the Middle Kingdom, known in our time as Luxor. In order to find the Omega clearance required to subdue Hephaestus, Festus, Aloy needs to find Thebes and uncover what happened to Ted Farrow and the other occupants of his private apocalypse bunker. No one knows more about the old world than the Quen, and so Aloy plans to set off to find Alva at the Quen settlement known as Legacy's Landfall, on the Isle of Spires, to see if they can tell her where Thebes is. Before you leave the base though, as always you can speak to Gaia, Val, Zoe, Erend, Catalo, and Beta to get some insight into how each of them are feeling about future plans, companion quests, and current happenings around the base. Gaia's conversations are usually particularly interesting, as you can actually get to learn about how she has put each subordinate function to use, using Minerva to master location of the base from the Zeniths, using Aether to calm weather conditions and purify the air, using Poseidon to detoxify the oceans, and using Demeter to store the blight and promote healthier plant growth. After speaking to her companions, stocking up on ammo and supplies, and tying up any loose ends that need to be tied, Aloy sets out from the base and heads westwards in search of Alva. After a long ride across the lands of the Forbidden West, Aloy reaches the western coast where the land meets the sea. On the beach is a small Quen outpost, as well as a boat. It's impossible to swim across the bay, and the boat seems abandoned, so Aloy uses it to cross over to the Isle of Spires.
It's pushing me south. There's no choice but to head for that beach. Due to the strong currents in the bay, Aloy was actually taken to the south side of the island instead of the eastern side where Legacy's landfall is. This didn't bother me when playing though, because it gives us the chance to actually explore the island a little bit before moving on with the main story. Bear in mind that this is the first time in the game you actually go to the ruins of San Francisco, so you bet I made the most of this downtime and just wandered around admiring the environments. I even took the time to go and override the nearby tall neck to get a lay of the land. Anyway, after doing whatever catches your attention after arriving on the Isle of Spires, Aloy Aloy makes her way to Legacy's landfall at the eastern side of the island. To enter the settlement, Aloy crosses a wooden bridge which is guarded by two Quen soldiers. Unlike last time she encountered them, the soldiers are not hostile and actually invite Aloy into the settlement on the orders of Diviner Bohai, another diviner stationed at Legacy's landfall alongside Alva. Escorted by the guards, Aloy enters the settlement in the hopes that Alva is somewhere nearby. This is landfall, right? I'm looking for Alva. Overseer Bohai ordered us to invite you before him should you approach. Please, come with me. Go, let him know we're coming. It's her! The Diviner was right. Overseer Bohai, a stranger, just walked through the gate. I knew Alva would not dare lie. You do look like Sobek. Is Alva here? I need to talk to her. I will consider your request once it is determined what you are. A living ancestor as Alva believes, or a threat. Lurking in such a guise. I am no threat, okay? Back on the mainland, your soldiers fired on me without warning. So you say, infidel. None of those you engaged survived to bear witness. I held off on your squad when... May I present our honored CO. So, here she is, our great mystery. Well, Bohai, what have you divined? What is she? A mystery indeed, my CO. How can she appear as Sobek, and yet know nothing of our ways? Are we to believe that a living ancestor was born to this wretched land, an ocean apart from the realm of the Chosen? And if so, to what end? I cannot answer. Only she can. But I warn you, no falsehood will satisfy us. Now speak. Why are you here? What is your purpose? I'm looking for a place called Thebes. And what do you seek there? Alva told me a little bit about what you're after. I guess you could say I want what you want. A way to heal the world. As I suspected. Tell her. We found Thebes. The final resting place of Ted Pharaoh's secrets. It isn't far, but the way is closed to us. Machine attacks have cut us off from the site. Diviner Alva is there, along with a complement of diggers and soldiers. Is she all right? Our scouts tell us that a machine has our people pinned. 
behind their defenses, but they are holding out. Machines, huh? I can help with that. Alva told us that you are indeed formidable. But I have a few questions first. We will answer what we can. So you found Thebes. How? The ancestors revealed it to us not long after we made landfall. Almost a year ago. Through a scrap of ancient data discovered by Alva and verified by myself. It contained details about the construction of a great underground palace. Where, exactly? Close. Beneath the Great Pyramid in the ruins beyond. Figures. Ted loves his pyramids. Have you been inside? Uh, no. <laughs> that has been a problem, one of many. And we will solve them all in time. Getting back to the site is the one at hand. I hope you're as effective against machines as Diviner Alva suggested. So, Alva reports to you. I was chosen by my colleagues on the Board of Overseers to supervise data retrieval on this expedition, yes. And you're in charge of the expedition? He is far more than that. You are addressing the cousin of the Emperor of the Quinn. Heir to the vast holdings of the Great Delta, the first CO in five generations. All she needs to understand is that I am the authority here. And my will is to attain the secrets of Thebes. Mine too. We're in luck. You crossed the ocean on these ships? Couldn't have been easy. Greatness is never easy. Indeed. It took seven years just to build the flotilla. This expedition is the most important undertaking of our generation. A quest for knowledge across the gaping sea with nothing less than the fate of our tribe at stake. And none of it would have been possible without the will of the CO. The voyage was difficult. The wilds here even more so. Our sailors and soldiers have suffered much. I know that. But all for the glory of the Quen. Good to know. What kind of machine has your people pinned down near Thebes? A Thunderjaw. We've dealt with them before, but this one is... Tougher, stronger, and it has black armor? Yes. How did you know? Doesn't matter. Won't be easy, but I can take it down. Then destiny shines upon us, as I knew it would. A living ancestor now walks among us. And she will help me attain the secrets of Thebes. Resupply here, if you must. Then on to Thebes, at the base of the pyramid in the ruins. We will follow when our scouts confirm you've cleared the way. Ah, the classic RPG exchange of kill this strong enemy for me and I'll let you progress through the story. It's a transaction as old as the genre itself. Although these types of quests are plentiful in the RPG genre, I gotta say when they're well placed like this one, I actually don't mind. Contextually, this part of the quest gives Aloy the chance to build a good relationship with the Quen, which is certainly needed after their rocky introduction back at the greenhouse. From a narrative standpoint, it gives us as the audience a sense of increasing tension as we theorise what Thebes actually is and what lies down there. Not a lot is known about what happened to Ted Farrow after the Farrow Plague wiped out life on Earth, so setting up the prospect of finding out more about what happened to him being dangled on a string over the player's head, then having that prospect immediately snatched away is a good way to get the players hungry for what's to come. At least that's how it worked for me. I was happy playing the first part of this quest because I was happy in the knowledge that there was going to be a significant sequence of story beats soon. Plus, who doesn't like fighting Thunderjaws? 
They're probably the most fun machine to fight in the game, because they're just so iconic. After speaking with the CEO and Bohai, Aloy makes her way towards the campsite that the Quen have set up right outside of Thebes in order to attract the attention of the Thunderjaw. As she approaches the gates, the Quen call out to Aloy to warn her of the approaching machine, without realising she's the one that's been sent there to take it down. From a gameplay standpoint, this fight serves as a way to demonstrate how far we've come from the beginning of the game. In the first quest, we were barely able to even defeat a damaged Slitherfang, whereas here we are now fighting a fully operational AP. Apex Thunderjaw, and man is this fight fun. I think Thunderjaw fights really shine in areas where you're given a lot of space to dodge and move around in. Because they're such large machines, they really need the space, otherwise the fight doesn't flow properly and ends up just looking goofy. This fight in particular is actually pretty hard. Of all the large machines you have to fight during the main story, this is definitely the one that caused me the most issues. Apex Thunderjaw is a weak to acid, so my elemental weapon of choice during this fight was an acid bow, of course paired with the explosive spears, which we've established by now is a ridiculous powerful combination. I think this fight in particular highlights just how powerful the acid and explosive spears combo actually is. It genuinely tears through this Apex Thunderjaw as if it were any other machine. Of course, just like any other machine, the Apex Thunderjaw has weaknesses. The two main weaknesses on a Thunderjaw that I found were pretty easy to reliably hit are the cannons mounted on its back which can be detached and used against it and the heart in its core which can be revealed by destroying the armor plate and covering it. Your best bet to taking down this absolute beast quickly will be to cover it in acid and shoot as many many explosive spears at it as you can whilst the acid debuff is applied. This will remove the majority of the armour plating on the machine's chassis, and then follow up by shooting the Thunderjaw's exposed heart with precision arrows or by throwing spears at it. You'll see how much damage this does, especially when you hit its heart in the perfect spot with the right weapon. If you're lucky, you'll even be able to get in some free damage if you knock it down, allowing you to get some free pot shots on its heart. Of course, if you want to go that extra step, you can shoot the Thunderjaw's disc launcher cannons off its back in order to use them against it, and they really pack a punch. Honestly, just rotate between all of these different methods of dealing damage, and the Thunderjaw will be scrapped in no time. With the Thunderjaw down, and the way to Thebes cleared for Sio and the other Quen, it's time for us to speak with Alva, who was stranded at the camp. Alva, I'm glad you're okay. Oh, you got rid of that machine! But... What are you doing here? There's something inside Thebes that I need. I went to Landfall. I met your CEO. We came to an agreement. Kind of. And you're going to help us get in? I guess so. The whole thing was a little... tense. There was something off about that guy. And I don't understand what he wants from Thebes. I thought we found the data that your people needed back on the mainland. That data will take us years to sift through. The CEO wants faster results. Aloy, you have to be careful. He's- There they are. The legacy tells us that Elizabeth Sobek helped the ancestors cast aside all obstacles. And so it has been today. You have been true to your word. I'm pleased. Thebes awaits us below, shall we? Quite an excavation. Much of this was flooded. We had to pump a great deal of water out. Behold, the door to Thebes. A door like no other. Well, you're right about that. It's designed to open for only one man. Ted Farrow. But the legacy tells us that he worked closely with Sobek. He trusted her. Surely she could open the door, and so surely can you. Not gonna happen. At least not from this side. You said she was a living ancestor with Sobek's eternal essence. Uh, if I may... Pharaoh, great as he was, did not build his palace alone. We know this from scraps of data we found, the ones that pointed to this location. And we found evidence of passages below. Maybe they were built to aid construction. Or 
for servants. We can't reach them. The way is flooded, and they're too far underwater, but... I... Yeah. I can reach them. There might be another way in down there. You see? With Sobek, there is always a way. Then do what you must to get us inside. So, of course it wasn't going to be as easy as walking up to the door to Thebes and opening it. There's always a complication. Although, it's to be expected that Ted Farrow Jean locked the door to Thebes. It is his fortress after all, and he wouldn't dare risk anyone getting inside, even if the world is dying outside. This means we're going to have to find another way to get inside, and it just so happens that there's a system of maintenance tunnels underneath Thebes that would have been used by engineers to access the bunker without having to go through the main door. Swimming down into the parts of the structure completely submerged in water, it's evident that this bunker is huge. Farrow Automated Solutions spared no expense in its construction. In fact, the whole facility is powered by a geothermal power generator. As Aloy swims through the cave, you can actually see magma at the bottom of the ravine with machinery coming out of it, using the thermal energy to power the base itself. Thebes was clearly built to last. Swimming a little bit further up, Aloy finds a rupture in a nearby structure that allows her to enter one of the maintenance shafts. Within this shaft are many large fans that are still in operation, serving as mini puzzles to keep players engaged whilst finding a way to enter Thebes. I will admit I use the term puzzle very lightly, as they really don't take a lot of brain power to get past. The first one just requires you to wait for the fan to stop spinning to get past them, and the last one just requires you to activate a nearby console to stop it from spinning. But I suppose even minimal interaction with the environment is better than none at all. After passing the fans, Aloy swims up through the last stretch of the tunnel and up to the surface of the water, finding herself within Thebes itself, meaning hopefully she can open the main door from the inside. We're lucky that time has eroded the defences of Thebes over the centuries, otherwise we may not have been able to get inside at all. It's clear upon walking around the living quarters that the years have not been kind to Thebes. With water dripping through holes in the ceiling causing puddles to form on the floor, mould and dirt covering all surfaces, and malfunctioning electronics bathing each room in a diaphanous purple and blue light. But nevertheless, Thebes still stands relatively strong after centuries. There are also many data logs and audio logs scattered around the living quarters, which gives us a bit of insight into the people who were lucky enough to be locked in here with Ted Farrow, and what it was like living with him in such close proximity during and after the events of the Farrow Plague. After reading and listening to some of the logs, we come to learn that the inhabitants of Thebes consisted of Ted Farrow himself, his spiritual guru Grigori Fasbach, his psychiatrist Dr. Narong Somtao, Somtao's daughter Kanya, and a collection of girlfriends supposedly for him to repopulate the world with whilst waiting for Zero Dawn to do its thing. It just sounds so awful. Everything about Thebes from the way it was built to the people that were selected to live there was all geared towards pleasing Ted Farrow, which is the least he deserved after being responsible for wiping out all life on Earth. I'll talk more about Farrow and his various subjects later. For now, it's time for us to open the door to Thebes for Alva, the CEO, and Bohai. The door is open. Destiny is upon us. I knew you could do it. What's going on? The CO is preparing to enter Thebes. Oh, why are you dressed like Ted Farrow? I am Farrow, renewed. My essence is the same as his. Across the years, across the generations, his soul is my soul. His will is my will. We are sundered in only one way. I need his final testament, his deepest secrets. And now that the door is open, those secrets are within my grasp. When I have them, I will be complete as he was. I will have everything I need to save our homeland, and, as Pharaoh did, the world. Okay. I think there's some confusion here about who Pharaoh really was. No one knows better than I who he was, who he is. Me. The Renewer, greatest of the ancestors, the man who saved the world, and you. You understand, Sobek. You are her, Pharaoh's harbinger, his assistant. Come, 
we will descend into Thebes together, as it should be. Bring her the raiment. Raiment? As he is Pharaoh, you are Sobek. For an occasion, this momentous, shouldn't you wear proper business attire? Whoa. No, 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 no. No, I am not wearing that. No way. You will wear the proper attire to mark this moment. Or what? It is said Sobek valued life above all else. Is this true? Fine. I'll wear your raiment. Excellent. Shall we proceed? As you can see, the CEO is completely delusional. He seems to believe that he's some sort of reincarnation of Ted Faro. Well, given his arrogance, he might as well be. It's like he's based his entire personality on the information about Ted Faro that the Overseers allowed the Diviners to include in the legacy. Because don't forget, most Quen don't know that Ted Faro caused the end of the world. They actually believed he helped save the world. The CEO really admires this deified version of Faro without knowing the whole truth. I also like the fact that he's tied to this CEO, which is clearly derived from the abbreviation of the business title title, Chief Executive Officer, CEO. This further paints him as this strange caricature of Ted Farrow. Although we never actually find out what his real name is, he's only ever referred to as the CEO. Clearly the Quen discovered through analysing old world data that CEO was a title reserved for important people, and subsequently adopted it into their own culture as a rank or role in Quen society. The CEO is actually a really interesting concept for a character, and gives us an insight into what the Quen Empire must be like across the ocean. Given the fact that the CEO is this arrogant it allows us to imagine what the other members of Quen royalty are like because he's blood related to the Emperor. He even goes as far as forcing Aloy to cosplay as Elizabeth Sobek, which was probably really demeaning for Aloy as even though she is a genetic clone of Sobek, she's still her own person. And to have your identity disregarded just because you look like someone else must be a pretty frustrating experience. Especially with how the Quen refuse to acknowledge her as Aloy, they only refer to her as Sobek. I don't think any of them apart from Alva refers to her as Aloy for the entirety of this quest. Upon stepping into the main entrance to Thebes, you'll also notice the abundance of Egyptian themed decorations and statues, laced with gold and lining the grand entranceway, giving Thebes the appearance of a palace. This continues the theme of ancient Egyptian influence related to Ted Farah himself, his company, and his interests. You guys may have noticed that the names of the chariot line of combat machines share names with other things associated with Egyptian culture and religion, such as the FAS ACA3 Scarab, the FAS FSP5 Kopesh, and the FAS BOR7 Horus machines. The Scarab is a species of beetle native to Egypt, the Kopesh is a curved Egyptian sickle sword once used by warriors in ancient Egypt, and Horus is the son of the two Egyptian gods Osiris and Isis, who is often depicted as the king of the Egyptian pantheon of gods. And of course, the very name Pharaoh is a homonym for Pharaoh, which was the title reserved for ancient Egyptian monarchs. To go even further with this Egyptian theme, the Pharaoh plague itself could be a metaphor or reference to the biblical story, the Ten Plagues of Egypt, in which God punishes the Pharaoh because he refused to set the Israelites free from slavery. Thebes itself is also in the shape of a pyramid, imagery that denotes the Great Pyramids of Giza, and obviously we already discussed the relation to ancient Egypt that the name Thebes has. If you want to take it even further and start really reaching, Elizabeth Sobek's last name could be derived from the name of the ancient Egyptian god Sobek, a deity associated with fertility and the Nile River, which could be a reference to how Sobek brings fertility back to the earth. So yeah, there's a lot of references to Egypt and Egyptian symbolism in these games, and Thebes is where all these isolated references come together to form the bigger picture of Ted Farrow's rampant ego. His obsession with the legacy of Egypt's empire shows what he values, power, affluence, grandeur, and exploitation. Walking through the entrance to Thebes, 
we can see Ted Farrow's arrogance firsthand. Opening the door at the bottom of the stairs reveals a huge room with a giant statue of Farrow himself standing in the center, watching the entrance to the room as if he's silently judging those that enter. Making their way down the stairs and into the room, Aloy notices two corruptors standing on podiums next to the entrance to the next room. At first, the group thinks they're just statues, but upon scanning them, Aloy realizes that they're actually functioning corruptors. This section's actually really cool. If you haven't done the arena challenges already, then this will be the first of two times in the game you can actually fight corruptors. Seeing as all of the corruptors out in the wild were shut down when Hades was defeated at the end of Horizon Zero Dawn, the only places you can fight them are during this quest in Thebes and during the arena challenges in one of the later fights in that questline. It's just really cool seeing the Corruptors back, as they were really common in the first game. Luckily for us, they also had the same weaknesses to fire that they had in Zero Dawn, as well as the two large weapons mounted on their chassis, which serve as weak points. This fight is actually really easy. All you need to do is set them on fire to do damage over time, then throw everything you've got at those weak spots, and they should be dead in no time. This fight is made even easier because the Quen soldiers are shooting volleys of arrows down from the walkway above, so you really should have no issue with this fight whatsoever. After defeating the pair of Corruptors, the CO and his men come back down into the statue room, with Diviner Bohai deciding to go back to the surface because it's too dangerous to risk the lives of two diviners at once. With that said, Aloy, Alvin, and the CEO make their way into the next part of Thebes. The group passes through various rooms and corridors, all filled with ancient Egyptian iconography and statues, with old stone floors and columns reaching up to the ceilings. If it weren't for the sci-fi sliding doors and overhead artificial lighting, it would feel like we were walking through an ancient Egyptian ruin. Heading into the next room reveals a haunting piece of information. The reason why Ted brought Dr. Somtau into Thebes in the first place was to employ gene therapy procedures that would essentially render Ted Farrow immortal. He did this in exchange for a life for himself and his daughter, Kanya. After around two years and hundreds of hours worth of procedures, Somtau was able to dramatically improve Pharaoh's cell's ability to regenerate. Somtau estimated that Pharaoh's life would extend far beyond the natural humans, but his uncertainty in just how long it would last left Pharaoh increasingly impatient and bitter. Additionally, the treatments resulted in escalating mutations for Pharaoh's cells, which were only suppressed via a regimen of drugs and additional procedures that Somtau likened to pharmaceutical whack-a-mole. This raised raises a whole new question. If Somtau was successful in this endeavor, is Ted Farrow still alive? Well, the only thing we can do is to continue to press on through to find out more. You saw something. I could tell. Did the data explain what Farrow used this device for? I think he was undergoing treatments to live longer. A lot longer. Really? Could he still be alive? Don't be foolish. If he were alive, he would have kept his essence. It would not have been passed down to me. Remember, he was the renewer. Of course he would have stopped at nothing to grasp the secrets of life and death. But not for himself. Everything he did was for a new beginning. For us, for the Quen. And for his true heir, me. You know, I'm starting to think you're right. You do have a lot in common with Ted Farrow. I knew you would see, in time. Let us continue. His secrets await. Well, it doesn't seem like the CO believes that Farrow is still alive, but mainly because it conflicts with his belief that Farrow's essence was transported into him when Ted died. At this point, it's obvious that he's just straight up delusional, and I think even the Quen soldiers can see that too. After heading deeper into the facility still, we have finally met with a locked door, meaning Aloy has to find a way around whilst everyone else sits there helplessly. To the right of the door is a vent grate that can be pulled down using the pull caster. Aloy uses this vent to climb through into the next room. Upon dropping down, she discovers a functioning computer setup. Finally, a possible way to download the Omega clearance that she needs. And with the door locked behind her, there's no better time than now to try it. There. Omega clearance. Got it. What do you have to say for yourself, Ted? Somtau's dead. Along with his kid. Found him on the floor of his office this morning, holding hands. Must have poisoned themselves. I never would have put them to sleep. She was just a girl, for Christ's sake. I offered him life. 
And this is how they repaid me. By leaving me all alone. But I guess I've been alone since this whole thing began. Alone in bearing the burden. For the past. For the future. Same old Ted. No matter who dies, he's the one feeling sorry for himself. Less his future. Less his children. Someday they'll come. And I'll be here to greet them. Sometimes that my aging has stopped altogether. If anything, my cells are replenishing faster than normal. I just need some time for the mutations to calm down. Time. And energy. Sometimes if the reactor can give me what I need. To grow strong again. To get my shit back together. So I can greet the kids. They're gonna need me. My advice. My guidance. And then I won't be alone anymore. Pharaoh's secrets. Are they here? Uh, not the ones you're looking for. Then they must be in there. Trust me. You don't want to go in there. Are you mad? I haven't come all this way to stop now. At last, Pharaoh's legacy is mine. Is that? It's him. Burn it to ash. Wait, no. Pharaoh has it rigged to melt down if... Kill them too. No witnesses. So, Ted Farrow survived this long. However, his mutations have reached such an extent that he no longer resembles a human form, a fate befitting the man who robbed humanity of life and then tried to cheat death himself. You'll notice that the cutscene obviously doesn't actually show what Farrow looks like directly. The only indication we get is the diagram that's shown to Aloy whilst she accesses his files, with tendrils of mutated tissue extending out from the large fleshy mass in the middle. I actually really like how instead of showing what he looks like, we're left to imagine the disgusting form sitting in that room. After all, our imaginations are always far more terrifying than anything the devs could have cooked up. It adds a certain element of personal horror to the cutscene. Well, Ted Farrow was a monster in all but appearance during the time of the old ones, but now in the new world, his appearance matches his personality. Disgusted by what he sees, not only upset that his ideology that he was Ted Farrow reborn had been debunked in front of everyone, but also realising that this monstrosity would directly contradict the legacy itself, the CO orders that Farrow is killed. What he doesn't know, however, is that Farrow had a final failsafe installed into Thebes, that in the event of his death, the facility will go into a complete meltdown as the geothermal power generator will cause the structure to self-destruct. However, before Aloy can warn him, Pharaoh is put down by a Quen soldier and the CO orders the deaths of Aloy and Alva in order to preserve the sanctity of the legacy. Even in death, Pharaoh manages to take the lives of others. Aloy and Alva quickly dispatch the two heavy Quen soldiers in the room with them and begin running back the way they came through the facility back up to the surface. We now have this really intense set piece where we need to run back through Thebes, avoiding the lava pouring in and taking out Quen soldiers on our way. Although to be fair, it's best just to run past the enemies. They're too focused on you to actually do anything and running past them leaves them trapped where they are as the whole facility crumbles around them. After a lot of running and dodging the lava that's slowly flooding the facility, Aloy and Alva make it back to the statue room to find the CO trying to escape the facility. Hurry, sire! Come on! Out of my way! Ah! 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 
Ah, this moment was super satisfying when I first played it. The CO meets his demise by being crushed by the statue of the man he idolised. It's dripping in delicious irony, and we can be safe in the knowledge that a second Ted Farrow will not be unleashed on the world. Both incarnations of him will be safely buried in the ruins of Thebes forever. It's quite poetic, actually. Now we're on the home stretch. Only a few more rooms stand between us and escape. Aloy and Alva use the statue as a bridge to cross the lava to the other side of the room so they can reach the stairs leading to the catwalk above. Again, there are more Quen soldiers on the catwalk, but there's no time to fight them. Huge boulders fall from the ceiling and destroy parts of the platform, so you need to be careful and watch your step. Finally, in one last epic sprint to the end, Aloy and Alva hurry up the final set of stairs in the main entranceway, tearing out of the exit with mere seconds before it collapses. We found something that will help. Not just your homeland, but everywhere. But where's the CO? Oh, he's... gone. I guess you could say he gave his life to help us attain the secrets of Thebes. I see. You must think I'm eminently stupid. What? No. No. The CEO was an entitled egotist who twisted our beliefs into a sickening, self-serving fantasy. And you expect me to believe he sacrificed himself for scraps of data? It's time for the truth, and it better be convincing. Otherwise, I'll simply order these soldiers to open fire. Hold on. You're right. To be honest, the CO screwed everything up. He brought Thebes down around our ears and died like a gutless coward. But we really did find something down there that will help your homeland. If I can take it and use it. Now, if I have to, I will fight my way out of here, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can just let me go, and then take credit when things start to improve. Success certainly does sound better than failure. It seems then that our destinies are intertwined. Landfall is open to you. If it will help your cause, you may come and go as you please, but Alva must join you and report back on your efforts. Fair enough. Thebes is of no further value to us. Obviously, we're going back to the flotilla. Alva, I expect your reports to be thorough. Oh, I thought he was going to have us killed. Oh, and instead, I get to join you. Glad to have you. But you're going to need a little help to reach our base. Varl, I made a new friend. I need you to meet her at the Quen Ferry and escort her back. On it. Can't wait to meet her. Trust me, you'll love it there. Varl will give you a better focus and all the data you could ever want. Head to the ferry. I'll join you back east as soon as I can. A diviner must follow the truth, wherever it leads. I'll see you there. What a great quest that was. Definitely one of my favorites in the game. As much as we all hate him, 
It's hard to deny that Ted Farrow is a fascinating character. His arrogance and propensity to betray others knows no bounds, and this was no different during his time as ruler in Thebes. Thebes was designed to serve all of Ted Farrow's needs and desires. The entrance to the facility was genetically locked to open exclusively to him, the power supply was designed to be simple enough for him to operate alone, and of course the whole facility was rigged to blow up upon his death. But these aren't the only oppressive design choices that gave him dominion over his subjects. Most insidiously of all, Thebes occupants were secretly implanted with a device that would trigger death at Pharaoh's command. In short, Ted Farrow had complete control of everything and everyone in Thebes, making it a living nightmare for those taking refuge there. They may have escaped the Pharaoh plague, but they merely traded one hell for another. Starting with his spiritual guru, Grigori Fassback, Farrow began to progressively kill the occupants of Thebes out of paranoia, until the last two remaining residents, Dr. Somtau and his daughter Kanya, committed suicide as a final act of spite against him, leaving him all alone as the sole living organism left on Earth. With no one to treat his ever-increasing series of mutations caused by his life extension treatments, Farrow entered the reactor chamber, hoping its energy would stabilize his mutations while he awaited the new humans created by Eleuthia to find Thebes so that he might greet them as a god. However, his hopes of guiding the new generation of humanity were dashed as his mutations accumulated to the point where he became the hideous abomination that we got a glimpse of from the hologram, becoming immortal as he desired but completely bereft of any humanity or cognition, ultimately being rejected and killed by the new humans that found him. It's the fitting end for the man that caused so much pain. Not only did he have to live with what he did to humanity for nearly a thousand years, not only did he have to endure the pain of mutating into a disgusting monster, but as soon as the new generation of humans find him, they see him as nothing more than a creature to be put down. I'm sure if he had any cognitive function left in him, all that would be left is disappointment and regret. Who knows? Maybe he even heard Aloy speak, recognising her as a clone of Elizabeth Sobek, knowing that he lost everything due to his boundless greed, whereas Elizabeth's legacy will live on forever. We will never truly know what Ted was thinking or feeling in those last moments, or even if he could, which is what makes it all the more fascinating. Anyway, I really loved this quest. It's definitely a highlight of the game for me. After escaping Thebes and being assigned to Aloy's mission by Diviner Bohai, Alva is now a part of the team and will be sent to the base to meet the other companions. I really like how Alva and Aloy become friends. Her development as a character all the way from that first moment to now is brilliant. How she learns that the Quen's devotion to the legacy may be misplaced, and how the Overseers choose to cut undesirable information out of the legacy in order to support their religious beliefs about the old ones. Alva really became one of my favourite characters in this game, and she makes a great addition to the team. So the whole reason we went to Thebes in the first place was to acquire the Omega Clearance in order to override Hephaestus so that Gaia could force it to remerge into her heuristic matrix. With the Omega Clearance downloaded, all that's left to do is to head back to the base to tell everyone the good news, and to actually get this plan underway. If all goes well, Gaia will have the functionality of Minerva, Aether, Poseidon, Demeter, and Hephaestus, and will be strong enough to completely reverse the damage that has been done to the biosphere. A lot is riding on this next quest, and with that, Aloy heads eastward and makes the long journey home, back to the base. Aloy, I know your experience in Thebes was unsettling, but we have a new problem. Did something go wrong with Beta and the rig? Will we be able to transport you to Gemini? The rig is complete. The problem is Hephaestus itself. It has accelerated its proliferation throughout the Cauldron Network, increasing its power. But with your subfunctions restored, we can still succeed, right? Correct. But the net effect is that absorbing Hephaestus will take longer than previously calculated. How long? Even with Omega Clearance, my current estimate is that the merge will take 35 hours. And each hour increases the risk of detection by the Zeniths. Two cores. Two overrides. What if the merge were carried out by two clones of Elizabeth Sobek, both armed with Omega Clearance? How long then? Half the time? Hephaestus would be unprepared for the simultaneous labor of two operators, in addition to obvious synergetic efficiencies. Calculating. It would reduce the merge time to approximately 4.5 hours. Okay. Varl, it looks like we're gonna need Beta at Gemini. Do you think you can convince her? Uh, I don't know, but I'll try. What about our diversion? Are the pulse generators ready? Only a final test remains. 
I am confident that if fired in proximity to other cauldrons, the pulses will mask our activities at Gemini from the zeniths. Good. As long as Aaron can operate one without shooting himself in the face. Aloy, you'd better get down here. Beta's in bad shape. Okay. So we may have overcome the hurdle of getting Omega clearance, but there's an additional problem. Beta is going to be needed at Cauldron Gemini, which she's most likely not going to be happy about, mainly because cauldrons are notoriously dangerous places, especially when Hephaestus is infecting the cauldron network, spreading faster than before and creating more and more deadly machines. Cauldron Gemini is likely to be filled with them. On top of this, the large energy surge caused by the merge will paint Gemini on the map to anyone that can read energy signatures, most notably the Zeniths making this an extremely dangerous mission. But on the other hand, with the help of Beta at Gemini, the merge will only take a total of four and a half hours, opposed to the 35 hours that it would take without her. So she's a crucial part of this plan now. Val has tried to convince her, but it seems she's not responding well to the suggestion. So Aloy makes her way down to the basement to talk to Beta herself. I tried, but it's impossible. I don't think anything will convince her to go. We don't have a choice. Good luck. Beta, you have to come with us. It's the only way. It's one mission. The most important one. We need you. Tell me why you won't go. What if they... What if they take me back? Alone. In a cell again. A slave. Forever. Laurel and I will be at Gemini too. I'll protect you. As soon as we get Hephaestus, we'll come straight back here. The Zeniths aren't going to find us. You don't have to be afraid. No! You can't protect me! Nothing can protect me from them! I told you from the beginning, we'll never beat them! It's hopeless! Beta. Leave me alone! You don't understand! You're right. I don't understand. We have the same genes, the same mind, the same heart. So why can't you find the strength to do what has to be done? Like Elizabeth would. Don't you think I thought about that? I don't know what piece of Elizabeth I'm missing. I don't know what you have that I don't. I look through all the data from your focus. You were raised as an outcast, shunned, and isolated just like me, so what's the difference? What's my defect? You don't have a defect. Beta. Look, it's not a piece of Elizabeth. The difference is... I had him. Frost. He raised you, trained you, but he was never warm or loving. The day he died, the day he gave you that charm, he was going to abandon you. He wanted me to embrace the tribe. But then he gave his life for mine. He loved me in his own way. And that was enough. What did it feel like? It was like... Having a strength. That was always there. It's still there. Even now I hear him in my head when things get bad. When it looks impossible, look deeper. And then fight like you can win.
You don't have to go on the mission. We'll find another way. I'll go. You said you'd try to protect me. I believe you. But you have to promise me one thing. Yes, of course. If it goes bad, if the Zeniths find us, I don't want to be their slave again. Do you understand? Okay. Promise? I promise. I could use as much time as you can give me to study up on the merch, to make it as efficient as possible. I'll be ready when you are. I swear. This scene has a lot of heart in my opinion. First of all, it's understandable that Beta would be afraid of leaving the base and being exposed to the Zeniths again. After all, it's literally impossible for the Zeniths to take control of Gaia without Beta's alpha clearance. She's a clone of Elizabeth Sobek, which makes her a very valuable asset. The Zeniths would certainly jump at the chance to get her back. She has every right to be afraid of them because she was subject to years of mental toil as a result of being born essentially in captivity and raised to fulfill one purpose to help the Zeniths take control of Gaia. An interesting concept is raised by Aloy in this scene, where she mentions that they are identical clones of each other, sharing the same genes, mind and heart, and yet Beta still lacks the resolve to do what must be done to save the world. Even identical clones, identical in every way, still differ because of their life experiences. The way we are perceived and treated by others determines our personalities. Whereas Beta was raised as a means to an end so that the Zeniths could acquire Gaia, Aloy was raised by Rost, raised to be fierce, curious and resolute, traits that Beta never learned or inherited. It truly is a beautiful moment when Aloy realises that even though she inherited certain traits from Elizabeth, a lot of her personality was shaped by Rost and his teachings, and that without his guidance, she would feel as scared and as lost as Beta is right now. In his own way, Rost loved Aloy as his own and spent 18 long years passing his knowledge on to her so that she may survive. After the loss of his own biological daughter, he saw Aloy as a way to make amends, and did so by nurturing her growth from a scared girl to a capable woman. Rost wouldn't have understood Aloy's current responsibility to save the world, but he gave her the lessons she needed to become who she was meant to be, and now it's time for Aloy to pass those lessons on to Beta, and to show her the humanity that the Zeniths kept from her. This scene is probably the first time in the game that Aloy and Beta feel almost like sisters sisters, as they now understand one another better, and there's a level of trust beginning to form between them. Of course, ultimately Beta agrees to come to Gemini, which means the plan can now finally be set in motion. All that's left for us to do now before setting off is talking to Gaia one last time so she can brief the team and make final preparations. Gaia remarks that she admires the complexity of human relationships and how even though Aloy and Beta disagreed at first, they came to an agreement by talking through the subject and empathising with one another. Which is true, even though human relationships can be unhealthy and volatile, they can also be full of love and understanding. The complexity of human relations knows no bounds, but here we are as individuals trying our best to navigate them every day. Anyway, at this point you can choose to speak with Gaia further to ask her about things such as the missing subordinate functions, Zero Dawn, Elizabeth Sobek, Far Zenith, and all sorts of other topics which I won't cover in this video. But I do recommend exhausting Gaia's dialogue because as I've said before, the conversations between Aloy and Gaia are some of the best in the game. Of course, you can also take this opportunity to talk to your companions before leaving, and you're going to want to exhaust all of their dialogue too because Gemini is quite a long quest and you won't be able to return to the base during it, or during the quest that takes place directly after it. After speaking with Gaia, tying up any loose ends you have at the base, and having one last conversation with all of your companions, it's time to set this plan in motion and head to Cauldron Gemini to finally subdue Hephaestus. Okay people, it's time to head out. I'll get everyone together.
right. Connections in place. Booting up. Beta, Aloy. I am fully installed on this core and ready to connect to the Cauldron Network. It's good to hear your voice. Errand, everyone. Fire your pulses and sound off. I'm at my cauldron. This thingy, it's blinking. Did I do it right? In position at my cauldron. My pulse generator is blinking also. That means they're working. I'm in position and mine is too. Mine as well. Okay, radio silence until I give the all clear. Signing off. Gaia, let's cage the beast. Connecting to the Cauldron Network now. Elizabeth Sobek, Alpha Prime, activating Omega Clearance. Elizabeth Sobek, Alpha Prime, activating Omega Clearance. Clearance confirmed. Initiating containment sequence. Attempting to compensate. It's cracked. Look! That means machines are on their way. Here we are, finally at Cauldron Gemini, with all the components we need set in place. I particularly like the preceding scene that shows Aloy and her companions riding to their respective cauldrons, with Zoe, Eren, Catalo, and Alva splitting off at the crossroads in order to play their role in this plan. This leaves Aloy, Beta, and Val heading to Gemini itself in order to upload Gaia into the Cauldron network. This scene in particular is just beautiful. Not only does it mark the first time that Aloy and all of her companions are working together, but it also marks the first time that Beta has been free to enjoy nature without the looming threat of the zeniths over her. You can see Beta in awe at the world around her, particularly interested in the sun ring that flies overhead. Finally, she shares a smile with Aloy, almost to say, thank you for freeing me. It's a beautiful moment, but it also feels bittersweet, like the calm before some great storm. I also really like the next scene in the cauldron with Aloy, Beta, and Val setting up and installing Gaia into the cauldron network. As Zoe and Eren, Catalo, and Alva set off their respective pulse devices within their cauldrons, each of them appear as a hologram in Aloy's focus display to confirm that they're in position. Throughout this whole quest, the other members of Aloy's party will be communicating across their shared focus network to update you on what's happening on their end. It really makes this section feel like a big thought out plan with lots of moving parts. After uploading Gaia to one of the cauldron's cores, Aloy and Beta activate Omega clearance in order to trap Hephaestus. In retaliation, it deploys malware to escape the core and retreats further into the cauldron, sending machines to attack Aloy, Val, and Beta. There is a lot of fighting throughout the course of this quest, which is to be expected. It's not like Hephaestus is going to go down without a fight. I mean, it's been infecting the cauldron network for nearly 20 years and has clearly had the time to develop failsafes in the event of capture. For now, Aloy and Val need to protect Beta if they want to stand any chance of successfully capturing Hephaestus. Two machines enter the data core room, a behemoth and a ravager, both quite powerful machines. It's a good idea to use fire and acid arrows against these machines, as both of them are weak to fire and acid. Then it's basically a matter of dodging their attacks and keeping on top of their weaknesses until they're destroyed, which honestly is quite easily done. Although there's definitely tougher fights ahead of us. After scrapping the two machines, Aloy tells Val to wait with Beta in the main room while she heads deeper into the cauldron to pursue Hephaestus. There's no way of the rogue AI escaping the cauldron. All it can do is create machines in the hopes of killing Aloy and her friends. All Aloy needs to do is survive long enough to locate the next network uplink nodes, override them, and then trap Hephaestus back in the data core. Simple enough, right? Well, it's easier said than done as we'll come to find out. 
Aloy climbs up the doorway that Hephaestus used to escape deeper into the cauldron and makes chase through the facility, using the shield wing to cross large gaps and using the pull caster to pull on parts of the wall to reveal handholds. She finally reaches a large assembly chamber where Hephaestus is clearly trying to build some kind of large hunter killer machine. It will be best to continue with caution. After all, Hephaestus feels threatened and will most likely use all of the tools at its disposal to kill Aloy. But we don't have time to worry about that now. We'll deal with it later. Moving deeper into the cauldron, we have a really fun parkour section coming up that has us using our pull caster to grapple to various perches and handholds in order to gradually scale our way to the next area. Of course, it wouldn't be a cauldron if we didn't have to hitch a ride on one of the worker drones, so upon finding a perch, Aloy leaps onto one and lets it take her to the next area. Waiting for us in the next area is a pair of Apex Leap Lashes and an Apex Long Leg, and although these machines are great in Machine Strike, they're not so powerful in the real world. In fact, they go down really easily, especially if you use Shock Ammo. A great way to incapacitate all the machines at once in this area is to use Shock Arrows to shoot the sparkers on the Long Leg's back, causing a large shock explosion which will stun the Long Leg and the surrounding Leap Lashes if they're close enough to the blast. This then gives you enough time to go in with your spear and take them out into individually with a critical strike. It's as easy as that. Climbing up to the next area, we can see that the network uplink is right there. But before Aloy can override it, Hephaestus interrupts her and sends more machines in. Yeah, I did mention earlier, there's lots of fighting in this quest. In comes another two Apex Leap Lashes and a Grimhorn, and we know how to easily take these down. I actually used Ice Arrows against the Leap Lashes this time, which worked really well because they're only lightly armoured, meaning that when they're frozen, a couple sharp spears can take them down quickly. Of course, we know the tried and true method of taking down a Grimhorn is by afflicting it with acid damage then launching explosive spears at it. And of course, this works like a charm here too. Also, you'll notice just how fluid the combat is at this point in the game. We've mastered all the elements, memorized all the weaknesses of our enemies, and acquired some powerful weapons over the course of our journey. So it's much easier to take out groups of machines, and the combat now feels like it flows much better. After taking down the machines, Beta successfully disrupts Hephaestus' control on the nearby uplink node, allowing Aloy to override ride it, forcing Hephaestus to flee into the Materials Bay. Aloy heads back the way she came to reach the Materials Bay, climbing up onto the higher ledges using the pull caster, and finally using an overhead beam to slide down into the Materials Bay, where more machines wait for us. This chamber works the same as the last one. You take out the machines already in there, attempt to override the network uplink, and Hephaestus interrupts to send in more machines for us to destroy, which of course are scrapped pretty easily by exploiting each of their weaknesses. Having defeated the waves of machines quicker than Hephaestus can build them and send them out, Aloy overrides the second network uplink, which forces Hephaestus back to the assembly chamber where we saw that machine being built. Heading back through the large corridors once more, we finally make it back to the assembly chamber, just in time to greet Hephaestus' new creation, the Slaughter Spine. So we've already discussed how powerful the Slaughter Spine is in Machine Strike, but this machine is an entirely different beast in action. I gotta say, the first time I fought a Slaughter Spine in this game, I was actually kind of intimidated because they're so imposing and powerful. As you can see, the overall design of the Slaughter Spine is inspired by interpretations of the Spinosaurus dinosaur, with a long slender face, large hind legs, and the very distinct spines protruding from its back. This machine is covered from head to toe in heavy armor plating, and is equipped with a variety of weapons, such as a massive saw-bladed sail across its back, with two smaller similarly sized spines around the mainsail that serve as missile launchers. On its chest it has a plasma core, and above that is a plasma energizer which it uses to charge up its attacks. After its plasma energizers charge up, its attacks are enhanced with plasma and can unleash devastating special abilities. Lastly, the slaughter spine's tail ends in a three-pronged fan, with each prong being capable of opening up to fire out lasers. So yeah, this thing's a walking dreadnought and they're very tough to take down. Luckily for us though, Slaughter Spines do have weaknesses, one of which is ice, which means we can spam ice arrows at it to freeze it, then go in with our sharp spears and sharp shot arrows, which now receive a significant critical damage boost thanks to the ice. This makes the fight a hell of a lot more manageable, all we need to worry about now is dodging the Slaughter Spine's attack so we can deal enough damage to take it down, which is easier said than done with how aggressive these machines can be. Slaughter Spines basically have two phases, one where they mainly use their long range plasma cannons to put pressure on you from a distance, and a second where they close the distance and start using melee attacks to overwhelm you. I must say, the first phase of a Slaughter Spine fight is easy, I almost thought it was too easy. It was almost like the machine was barely even fighting back. This was until it started coming at me in full force, swiping its tail, charging at me and stomping me into the cold metal of the cauldron floor. Additionally, if you let the Slaughter Spine charge itself up, 
then even its melee attacks will do plasma splash damage, which in turn leads to you getting knocked down by the plasma status effect, leaving you open to another attack. And the cycle starts again. This is why it's very important to either destroy the plasma energizers or to keep up the pressure so that it doesn't have a chance to power itself up. After a long and gruelling battle in which lots of potions were used and lots of ammo was expended, Aloy finally brings the slaughter spine down, leaving the final network uplink module undefended and open to being overridden. Finally, that does it. Hephaestus is now back in the original data core and trapped with Gaia. We can finally begin the merge and stop Hephaestus once and for all. Aloy heads back to the data core to check on Val and Beta. They've probably had their fair share of close calls too, but Val clearly fought bravely to defend Beta as both of them remain unharmed. The core is stable. Hephaestus is 100% contained. And we better get started with the merge. It's all set up. Gaia? Establish the link, please. Done. Okay. To complete the merge, we need to excise Hephaestus' malicious code. Carefully. Redundant copy. You've cost us quite a lot of time. <laughs> Eric, get beta. And squash that bug while you're at it. <laughs> Screwing around. Now we're having fun, right? Tilda, get Gaia and Hephaestus ready for transport. Tilda! I failed. Hush. All is not lost. Tilda! What the hell are you doing? Stop her! No, I can't even see her!
Where am I? Ah, you're awake. You took quite a hit when Gerard attacked you. I imagine you must still be in a great deal of pain. I can assure you that we are safe. The others can't detect us here. You mean the other Zeniths? You must be Tilda. I wasn't sure if... Beta would have told you about me. Where is she? Alive. And while she isn't where she wants to be, not in urgent danger. We must discuss how to get her back, of course, after you've shaken off the cobwebs. When you're ready, take the stairs down the hall and, and come see me. In the meantime, I'll make breakfast. Breakfast? Okay. Aloy wakes in a strange place, with nothing but the sharp sting of failure lingering from Gemini. Even though the team successfully contained and trapped Hephaestus, Gaia and Beta have been taken by the Zeniths, and Val was killed whilst trying to defend Beta. Which hit really hard when I first played the quest. Val was one of the first people from the Nora tribe who acknowledged Aloy and befriended her after her outcast status was cleared by the Matriarchs. He risked his life to fight alongside Aloy at the Battle of the Elite at Meridian, and he was even there at the beginning of this game, following Aloy's tracks for months to make sure that she was okay. Seeing Val of all characters die was certainly a punch in the gut. Not only because he's such a great and wholesome character, but because he's been with us since this all started. Since before Aloy even knew she was a clone of Elizabeth Sobek. What made this death hit even harder for me is that I actually neglected to exhaust the dialogue options with Val in the base. I was about to leave before Gemini, and I saw that Val had extra dialogue options, and I remember saying to myself, Ah, it's alright, I want to continue with the main story. I can catch up on optional dialogue when we get back. Not knowing that Val wouldn't be coming back from Gemini. It made the death feel a whole lot more real, if that makes sense. As with love ones in real life, you don't always get to have that last conversation with them before they go. Val's sacrifice serves as a narrative way to get the player to hate the Zeniths even more, and it shows just how raised the stakes have become at this point. I just never thought they'd kill off such a long-running character. Val fought more bravely than most would in his final moments, looking an impossible situation in the face with resolve and choosing to defend his friends instead of laying down his arms and giving up. He was truly an honourable friend. Val's death will continue to cause ripples throughout the rest of the game, and the companions will react in their own ways to the news. In particular, both Erend and Zoe will be very saddened by the news of Val's death. Erend became good friends with Val after the events of the first game, as they had time to bond during and after the battle at Meridian. Val and Zoe also had a bond that grew over the course of this game. It's not something I particularly covered in this video, but Val and Zoe became very close very quickly, with a romance flourishing between them. There is a subplot about it, but it's never explored in a great amount of detail. It's more so some Something we just know is happening. It's still a believable relationship though, and I like the thought of Val and Zoe together. You'll notice during the early game that Val and Zoe begin to share a bed, after which it becomes pretty obvious that they aren't just friends. I'm sure the news will be very distressing for Zoe. Catalo and Alva on the other hand most likely haven't had a lot of time to get to know him too well, but I'm sure they will at least be saddened by the loss regardless. After waking up following the events at Colge and Gemini, Aloy is contacted by the woman that saved her life, Tilda Van Der Meer. Tilda is a particularly interesting character, who's mentioned briefly by Beta in her optional dialogue. Tilda is a member of Far Zenith, but her aspirations seem to differ greatly when compared to that of her peers. She actively went against the other members of her organisation to save Aloy, but why? We can gain some insight into the type of person she is by looking back on some of Beta's optional dialogue. During their time on the Odyssey, Far Zenith came up with a plan to retrieve a copy of Gaia from Earth in order to reset the biosphere for themselves. To do this, they needed a clone of Elizabeth Sobek. So their answer was to create Beta using technology similar to the ectogenic chambers that were used by Eleuthia to create the new humans in the cradle facilities. The same chambers that Gaia used to create Aloy. En route back to Earth, Beta was placed in a learning module and educated by Apollo. As we know, the Zeniths managed to secure a copy of Apollo before it was purged by Ted Farrow in the final days of Zero Dawn. Beta worked away for months, even years of her life, in this virtual training module in order to learn everything she can about Earth, the Farrow Plague, and Zero Dawn in order to be up to speed by the time the Odyssey reached Earth. Feeling that Beta needed to experience a small part of Earth's culture, 
Tilda created a data channel that allowed Beta to exit the training module into a virtual replica of her mansion back on Earth. Within this data channel, Tilda would share some of her favourite art with Beta, mostly the works of Dutch masters, as well as talking with her to keep her company. This virtual space slowly became a haven for Beta, whose life consisted of being shunned and obeying the cold demands of the Zeniths. After a few months of regularly meeting with Beta in this virtual space, Tilda considered that the other Zeniths would punish Beta if the channel was discovered, so she spontaneously cut off all contacts and would later pretend the Data channel never existed when Beta finally met the Zeniths in person. This is the only obvious information we get about Tilda up until this point. It does paint her as empathetic because she cared enough about Beta not only to create the virtual space and keep her company, but even thought about the effect that it may have on Beta if it were to be discovered. Of course, there's also the question of why she cut it off without any explanation. Maybe she just wanted to be extra discreet. So, we know that Tilda is capable of empathy, which is more than can be said for other Zeniths. But what are her motivations for saving Aloy? And what does she hope to gain by making an enemy of the Zeniths? I suppose only time will tell. For now, Tilda speaks with Aloy over the intercom and invites her to breakfast. With no other choice, Aloy leaves the room and begins walking through the adjoining corridor. Upon reaching the end of the corridor, Aloy comes across a larger chamber, with none other than a curated collection of classical art hanging on the walls and displayed on podiums. Tilda explains that this is her own personal collection, which were all secured and sorted down here before she left Earth on the Odyssey. During this section, you can actually inspect each piece of art with your focus, with some even triggering dialogue between Aloy and Tilda as they briefly discuss what it means. I actually really I really liked this part. It was some much needed downtime after Gemini. It actually gives you some time to process what happened. Anyway, after looking at as much art and listening to as much optional dialogue as you want, Aloy exits the gallery and uses the large vault door at the far end to speak with Tilda in person. There you are. Feeling better? How did you find us at the cauldron? And what did you do to everyone right before I passed out? All business, I see. Well, suffice it to say we were keeping a very close eye on Hephaestus, knowing we would need it at some point. Your ruse didn't fool us, and as for my little trick, it was an overload of the senses accompanied by an energy discharge. Gerard and Eric were only momentarily disoriented due to their shields, but it, it rendered you unconscious while I got you out. Perhaps some breakfast might steady you a bit? This was your house. The one you recreated for Beta, in the data channel you shared. How perceptive of you. Please, this way. After everything your people have done? You think I'm just gonna sit down and have a chat with you? They're not my people. They never were, and especially not now. You shot off into space with them and live with them for a thousand years before coming back. So what made you suddenly turn on them? Quite simply, this. My old focus. You repaired it? But that means you've seen incredible things. What you've accomplished in two decades of life thousand years at my back and I haven't even come close. I'm sorry if I invaded your privacy, but I had to. In order to understand. To be enlightened. You truly are Elizabeth's blood. With her drive, her sense of mission, her integrity. Watching all this shamed me for the company that I've kept. Having seen it, all I want is to help you. Even if it means stopping your friends? Especially so. Please, sit down.
there. That's better. Now, we must recover Beta and Gaia at all costs. By now, you must know that Gerard intends to use Gaia to reboot the Earth's biosphere. Remaking this world to specifications that would only suit us immortals. This process will kill every living thing on the planet. He calls it a clean install. Not if I stop him first. Not if we do. And once he and the others are gone, we can work together to fulfill Elizabeth's dream. I'm sure Beta told you that there's a build of the Apollo database on board our ship. A complete collection of human knowledge. With that and Gaia, we could do everything Elizabeth wanted. Heal the biosphere, educate the people of this world, uplift them. Create the world she imagined. <clears throat> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. From what I've seen, your friends are invincible. I do wish you would stop calling them my friends. And they're not invincible. In fact, a friend of yours has found a way to defeat them. Silence. Oh, he's been a busy bee, building an army powerful enough to crash through Gerard's precious base. Yeah, Regala and her rebels. Even now she's preparing a final march on the Tanakh capital. When she wins, she'll have the entire tribe under her control. Hundreds of warriors and machines to throw at the base. She's been duped. They'll all perish, of course. But it should be enough to break Gerard's defenses and allow Silence to kill him. Along with all the others. Using the new weapon he's developed. Yes, he's found a way to circumvent our shields. Truly an exceptional man, he's planned for everything. Except you and me. You see, while his army is battering down Gerard's doors, you and I will sneak in through a back way, one that only I know about, while Silence and my friends are busy battling each other. We'll take back Beta and Gaia. I told you I want to help you. I mean it. You said Beta is not in urgent danger, so what are the Zeniths doing to her? Putting her to work. Merging Hephaestus with Gaia. A difficult, time-consuming task, as I'm sure you know. They will compel her if need be. But her life is not in danger. She's the only one who can do it. Because you people made her to be nothing but a tool. Gerard's idea, not mine. They always viewed me with suspicion when I attempted any form of kindness towards her. That's why I created the Data Channel. A virtual place where we could speak in peace. What exactly is your plan to sneak into the Zenith base? We will make use of a lesson I learned from an early age. Always know your exits. In this case, a place where Gerard's new construction meets the ancient foundation, a passage that only I can access. When Silence flings his army at the base, we will enter through this back door, bypassing most of the fighting. The distraction will provide us with a window in which to rescue Beta and Gaia. How do you know about Silence's plan? He isn't the only one adept at spyware. You hacked his focus? No, he's too careful for that. But his subordinates? <laughs> Not so much. He gave additional focuses to the tribals he branded the Sons of Prometheus. The ones working with Regala. By tapping their focuses, I learned about most of his dealings. The distribution of override technology, the arming of Tanakh rebels, and the secret pact with Regala to attack Gerard's base. But how did he come up with a weapon that can take down your shields? That's the one thing I haven't been able to figure out, but however he did it, I'm quite certain it will work. With it and the Tanakh army, victory seems to be within his grasp. Such a shame he'll be disappointed. Regala's only interested in killing Hakaro and waging war on the Karja. What does she have to gain by attacking Zeniths? 
It's the price she must pay for her war. Without the ability to override machines, her little rebellion would have languished in the desert. So she trades with the sons of Prometheus. Machines to help her overthrow Hikaru. In exchange for an assault on the base. Pride has deluded her into thinking she can actually survive such a battle. And all without ever knowing who the sons of Prometheus really answer to. Yet for all of Silence's brilliance, still he underestimates you. That blind spot is what will allow us to take Beta and Gaia right out from under him. While hundreds of Tanakh are cut down outside. Tilda's plan is quite a well thought out one, and would go off without a hitch if Aloy weren't so moral. The one flaw in Tilda's plan is relying on someone like Aloy to just happily let a whole nation of innocent Tanakh charge to their deaths, without even thinking of another way of defeating the Zeniths. Throughout this entire game, we've spent a lot of time interacting with the Tanakh, and much like the player, I'm sure Aloy has come to greatly respect them as a people, and wouldn't want to use them as a means to an end. Not to mention that Aloy's companions would not accept this plan either, especially Kotalo. Tilda's plan needs a bit of work, that's for sure, but there's lots that Aloy needs to discuss with her. This is another one of those long dialogue sections, and I won't play all of it as a cutscene, because then we'd be here for half an hour just watching optional dialogue. And believe it or not, I want to keep the uncut cutscene footage to a minimum in this video. You can ask Tilda all sorts of questions about her life on Earth at a young age, how she built her fortune, joining Far Zenith, living on the Odyssey, her brief friendship with Beta and the data channel she created for her, the Zenith's plan, the Zenith base, Silence plan, and finally, what Elizabeth was like. Of all the information we can learn from Tilda, the most valuable thing Tilda can give Aloy is some more insight into what Elizabeth was like. After all, Tilda met and befriended Elizabeth Sobeck in Paris, approaching her the morning after Elizabeth gave a keynote speech on AI ethics. The two became romantically involved for a while some time later, but eventually broke things off. A choice Tilda regretted, a choice that she's clearly trying to make up for now. We learn a great deal about Tilda during this dialogue, and I must say I was absolutely fascinated by her insight into the old world of Horizon. I mean, we're speaking with someone who was alive before the Pharaoh Plague, and has lived for the last thousand years in space. Quite the unique character compared to who we're used to. But with all the information we learned about her life and her career in the old world, the Zeniths and their plan to wipe the world clean using Gaia, or even her brief relationship with Elizabeth, Still one concern remains, there must be another way to recover Gaia, Apollo and Beta without sacrificing the Tanakh. First Faro, now Hikaru and the Tanakh. Your plan would wipe out an entire tribe. There has to be another way. We are in an admittedly desperate situation, but I assure you there isn't. Remember Zero Dawn. Elizabeth's sacrifice. Sometimes many have to die for a new world to grow. If it looks impossible, look deeper. Wait. The data channel. It still exists, doesn't it? I need you to open it. Let me talk to Beta. Impossible. We might be detected. It's worth the risk. There is another way, one where the Tanakh survive. But we won't. If the others... If you want to help, open it. What are they doing to her? Virtual reality dissociation. The manual merge of Hephaestus will take hours upon hours of tedious micromanagement. If she resists the work, they run simulations to induce feelings of isolation and despair. Beta, can you hear me? You're alive. 
They're watching me. I, I, I can't hold up this extra projection for long. You should have killed me. No. No, look at me. I'm coming for you. I promise. Okay? I just need you to hold out a little while longer and work on the merch. Contact again when it's time. Can you hold on? As long as I know you're coming for me, I can endure anything. All right. I did as you asked. Now I think you need to tell me what you're planning. I'm going to take Silent's army away. I don't need it. Only the weapon he made to penetrate your shields. And how do you propose to get it? Ask him nicely? Without Regala and her rebels, he won't have a choice. We'll be his only option. Only option for what? What did you tell her? That is between me and my sister. Will be Silent's only option for crashing that base. I'll tell you the rest later. But first, there are a couple of things I have to do. Oh. And what are those? Lay my friend to rest. And then I'm going to use the override that Beta gave me at Gemini to put an end to Regala's rebellion. From the air. Wait. Since you insist on doing things your way, I know of something that will truly help you make a grand entrance with the Tanakh. The ancient Horus Titans still possess electromagnetic energy cells as part of their arsenal. Drop one of those on Regala's army and they'll receive quite a surprise. So go, do what you must. I'll come to your base if you manage to bring silence to the table. Not if, when. Aloy's character arc throughout this game has been learning to separate herself from Elizabeth Sobek. She's constantly comparing herself to Sobek, and I think at this point where she takes charge of the plan and decides to save the Tanakh instead of just letting them all die, is the moment she surpasses Sobek. As Tilda said, Sobek had to lie to the people of the world with Operation Enduring Victory, sacrificing countless lives to buy time for the development of Zero Dawn. Aloy is faced with a similar situation where she can either sacrifice the lives of the Tanakh for an easy victory, or choose the harder route and figure out another way. Instead of choosing the easy way, Aloy chooses the path of most resistance because she knows that there's a chance that the Tanakh can still live. Even though Elizabeth's situation was complex and difficult, she still chose to send millions of people to their deaths without even telling them what they were fighting for. Aloy has the luxury to choose this time, and she chooses life. The Tanakh have a right to live just as much as anyone else, so why should they shoulder the burden of taking down the Zeniths when they have no idea what they're up against? Aloy's plan is to use Silent's weapon to defeat the Zeniths. In order to do this, she plans to thwart Regala's rebellion to dismantle her army. If Regala is defeated in battle, most of her forces will scatter. Aloy also plans to use the Sunwing override so that she can fly, allowing her to collect a Horus energy cell which can be dropped on Regala's army as a sort of bomb, incapacitating machines and stunning any soldiers within the blast radius. Of course, there's also the matter of regrouping with the team and laying Val to rest. So there's lots to be done. It's time to head back to the base to assess the situation and to lay Val to rest. When you're wounded, you have to strike back. Draw blood. Hey! Can't I get one damn minute to mourn my friend? Regala is going to slaughter my tribe to overthrow Hikaru. The Zeniths have Beta and Gaia. We can't sit around wallowing in our losses. Katalo's right. We must fight. Oh, all right. So what are we going to do, huh? Take on all of Regala's rebels? 
Not to mention the Zeniths. What can we even do? Throw ourselves at their base? Something like that. So... After we lost contact with you, we regrouped and went to Gemini. What happened? The recording we found on Varl's focus cut off when that Zenith Eric... The Zeniths were tracking Hephaestus. When Gaia trapped it in Gemini, they... They knew where we were. After... Varl tried to stop them. They took Beta and Gaia. I only survived because one of the Zeniths turned against the others to save me. One of them? Well... At least we didn't lose you, too. So what do we do now? We're going to defeat the Zeniths. And get Beta and Gaia back. But first... We're going to stop Regala. How? Back in Gemini, Beta gave me... A gift. There's something I need to do first to make it work, but it could put an end to the bloodshed. Word is, Regala's readying her army for an all-out assault on the Grove. I... Need to be there. I know. Go. Stand with Akaro. And keep an eye on the sky. Strike true as the ten. The rest of you, whatever preparations you need to make, upgrades, resupplies, get on it. It won't be long before we take the fight to the Zenus. We'll be ready, Aloy. And when you're ready, Meet me outside the east exit. I'd like to have a word in private. Even when things are darkest, you're the flame that lights the way forward. Just tell me one thing. Am I gonna get to smash up a bunch of Zenith bastards? We all are. Good. With everyone finally back at the base following the loss at Gemini, Aloy explains the new plan to all of her companions, giving the group direction again. Even though they're feeling the loss of Val, everyone needs to focus on defeating the Zeniths and recovering Beta and Gaia. First though, Aloy needs to deal with Regala and her war against the Tanakh in order to force Silence to cooperate with her. Defeating Regala will give Silence no choice but to team up with Aloy, giving her access to the weapon he created to take down Zenith's shields, and in turn saving the Tanakh from eradication at the hands of the Zeniths. I like how Katala requests permission to go back to the Memorial Grove to stand against Regala with Hikaru and the other marshals. It's a reminder that even though he's been dedicating a lot of time to Aloy's struggle to save the Biosphere, he is still loyal to Hikaru and the Tanakh above all. Honor and loyalty is a big part of Katalo's character, so it's good to see he hasn't just forgotten about his duty as a marshal. So, the team is all back together and morale is a bit higher now that Aloy has returned, but before she can acquire the Sunwing override that she needs, Zoe requested to speak to Aloy in private, so she heads outside to meet her. We would come out here, to tend to the garden. Sometimes I needed fresh air. Other times we would simply sit and watch the sunrise. So when we returned from Gemini, it seemed fitting that he be laid to rest here. Now he can always look out at plain song and... Further east, to the Nora sacred lands. He would have liked that. He often spoke of his sister, Bala. He said she used to gather her favorite golden blooms and tie them to her spear. Their mother called it useless, but... Bala was stubborn. Yeah, she seemed like that. It wasn't easy. But I tracked down the flower. Gathered its seeds. Her 
as verdant limbs wither, roots rot in snow, still the sea rises as certain as stone from death follows new life. So it is with the land. And so it is with us. I'm with child, Aloy. I was going to tell him when he got back from Gemini. Instead, one day, I'll bring our child here. We'll sit among the blooms. And watch the sunrise. I never got to tell him. To thank him. For saving my life, sure, but also... For not giving up on me. He always knew. Goodbye, Farl. I promise to look after them. This cutscene is a beautiful send off for Val. How Zoe made sure his place of rest was facing east towards Plainsong and the Nora Sacred Lands. I also like the mention of Val's sister, Vala, who was killed by Eclipse soldiers during the Proving in Horizon Zero Dawn, and how Zoe found the flower that she used to tie around her spear and planted the seeds at Val's resting site. Although the mention of Vala reminds me that Sona, Val and Vala's mother, has now lost both of her children. She doesn't even know Val is dead because she's so far east and probably won't find out for a long time. In light of the terrible circumstances, Aloy and Zoe comfort each other, and Zoe even reveals that she is pregnant with Val's child. Even though she never got to tell Val they were having a baby, she will tell the child all about their father when they're born. So even though Val is gone, a small piece of him lives on in this child, which I think is particularly beautiful. After speaking with Zoe, Aloy heads back into the base in order to craft the Sunwing override she needs to defeat Regala and her soldiers. If you remember, the plan is to use the Sunwing to collect an energy cell from one of the dormant Horus machines with the intent of dropping it on Regala's forces, in turn disabling all of her machines and halting her assault on Memorial Grove. This would then allow Aloy to head in and challenge Regala directly. Defeating her would basically end the civil war right there because the Tanakh respect displays of strength. If Regala loses, her warriors will lose faith in her cause. But also, Regala follows Tanakh law very strictly, meaning if she is bested in a fight, she will accept defeat. But first we need that override. All you need to do to get it is to head inside the base and go to the fabrication room, interact with the fabrication terminal, and select craft on the Sunwing override. It's easy as that. Now comes the fun part overriding and mounting a sunwing. Conveniently for us, further up the mountains above the base is a sunwing site, so Aloy begins scaling the rock face to get to the top. It's moments like this where the new freeform climbing system really shines. Being able to climb any rock face freely adds a lot of more depth to the climbing system, and makes a lot more sense than only being able to climb specifically placed handholds. Upon climbing up, we can see three sunwings perched at the top of the mountain. All that's left to do now is to sneak up on one of them and override it. Hello. Oh, this is it. I'm in the air. I will forever remember the moment you first get to fly a Sunwing. I always really wanted to be able to ride one of the flying machines in Zero Dawn. But sadly at the time, the technology of the PS4 just didn't allow seamless flight across the map. At least that's what I'm guessing held it back. But this time around with a good 5 years of development and PS5 technology, flight is possible in Horizon, and it's just as great as I imagined it being. The world of Horizon Forbidden West is absolutely beautiful, and it's even more breathtaking when you're up in the sky, 
looking down at all the different biomes that make up the world. In order to acquire one of the many Horus Titan energy cells in the area, Aloy first needs to head to the nearby Tallneck, which is only accessible via the Sunwing, to deploy some software that will send out a pulse to activate the power cells. This is actually the last Tallneck in the game, because it's the only one that requires the Sunwing to get to. All you need to do to activate is to fly up to it, slow the Sunwing down to a hover, and then jump off onto the platform to override it. Easy stuff. Now all that's left to do is to fly up to a nearby Horus Titan, grab the energy cell, and then fly over to the Memorial Grove to stop Regala in her tracks. The Memorial Grove is a decent fly away, so it's a good opportunity to take in the sights of the Forbidden West. We're coming close to the end of our journey now, so enjoy the scenery while you can. After a while of flying, Aloy finally makes it to the Memorial Grove just in time to stop Regala and her forces. Regala's inside. Ah. Hikara will soon ah. be dead. It's all over, Chaplain. I gotta drop it now. Here it goes. She flies on the wings of the Ten. The tide has turned. Push through. <laughs> End of the line, Hakara. Now on your knees, and I'll give you the death you didn't have the spine to give me. They're down! The machines! All of them! They're down! What? How's that possible? Regala! <laughs> Enough bloodshed! Let's settle this. You and me. Easy to say when you're on top of a machine. Well, that was just to get your attention. I don't need any help to take you down. Fine. I accept your challenge. And once I'm done with you, I'll get to finish the slaughter. We'll see about that. The duel is set. Let none interfere. <laughs> Aloy flies in on her Sunwing, destroys all of Regala's machines, and then challenges her to a duel in single combat. Quite the entrance as far as entrances go. I also like the symbolism of this part. Aloy has unintentionally become the embodiment of Tanakh's belief. After all, the entire belief system of the Tanakh revolves around Joint Task Force 10 and their proficiency at all types of combat, most notably their use of F-38 Razor Wings for aerial combat. Not only this, but the battle is taking place at Memorial Grove, the very place where JTF-10 fought the government drones during the Hot Zone Crisis of 2037. So Aloy flying the Sunwing in to defeat Regala's Rebellion and free the Tanakh in the exact same place where JTF-10 had their battle is in a way honouring the memory of their sacrifice. You'll notice that Eureka says she flies on the wings of the Ten as she looks up at Aloy, and in that moment, all of the Tanakh realise that Aloy is a hero, and much more than just an outlander. I also love how Aloy is so done with the whole civil war situation at this point, there's much more important things to be worried about. The Civil War is merely something that's currently in the way of getting Beta and Gaia back, whilst avoiding the genocide of the Tanakh. It just shows how far she's come as a character since the beginning of Zero Dawn. She's already had to deal with the Rebellion before whilst fighting the Eclipse, so she knows exactly how to handle Regala quickly. She's barely even had to try, and already, Regala's forces are on the back foot. Aloy challenges Regala to a duel, and with that, the Regala boss battle starts. The very moment that the Tanakh side of the story has been leading to for all these hours. This fight is actually really fun. 
If you remember the boss fights of both the Enduring and Acera, Regala is like a mixture of those two. You can use any weapon you want during this fight, and Regala uses a variety of melee and ranged attacks too. But I recommend that you close the distance in this first phase of the fight. Unleash some combos onto Regala to stun lock her, but don't spam her with too many attacks because she'll parry you mid-combo and counter. So be careful of that. The first phase of the fight takes place on this lower platform, forcing Aloy and Regala into a close quarters fight. During this first phase, it's a good idea to use your spear combos to build up enough energy to perform a resonator blast. This will do insane damage, and the first phase of the fight will be over quickly. Of course, you can also spam Regala with explosive spears too, and they'll detonate on impact because you're fighting a human enemy, meaning you can just continually throw them at her. Whichever method you choose to do damage, this part of the fight is particularly easy because Regala can't exactly take cover or create distance between you. After getting knocked down to the second layer, the fight shifts into its second phase. This phase of the fight takes on a more ranged playstyle, meaning you've got to dodge Regala's volleys of arrows and spears whilst keeping up your own offensive. I also had quite a bit of trouble during this part for some reason. Regala has the advantage of being on the high ground, so it makes it difficult to hit your shots sometimes. I also didn't stock up on crafting materials before the fight, which didn't help either. I ran out of ammo pretty quickly. One thing that I actually found useful during this fight was the shield tripcaster ammo. Just throw it down and sit behind it, and Regala's shots will be deflected. Although it's pretty useless against explosives, so I had to watch out for Regala's spears. Honestly, if I stocked up on crafting materials before this fight, I don't think I would have had as much of a hard time with it. I was just so limited as to what type of ammo I could use, so I couldn't maximize my damage effectively. The third phase of the fight is definitely the best of all three. Being in the arena allows you to use so many different options in the fight. You can of course run up close and use your spear, or you can create distance and use your ranged weapons, or a mixture of both. There's also a variety of explosive barrels scattered around the arena, most notably smoke barrels that will create a cloud of smoke if shot. These are really useful if you want to briefly stun Regala. I actually nearly died quite a few times during this fight. Fair enough I was running low on ammo by this point, but Regala's attacks are brutal when she manages to hit you. Her melee combo is especially deadly. She does this one move where she kicks up dust before attacking meaning you can't read the telegraph of her attack. This one in particular always caught me out, to the point I had to drop back and use a potion. Halfway through this phase, she also imbues her weapon with plasma, meaning if she hits you with it, you immediately get hit with the plasma debuff. I eventually got the hang of the fight and just started loosing arrow after arrow into Regala's face and doing some resonator blast combos just for good measure. She may have a large pool of health, but I eventually managed to take Regala down, meaning Aloy and the Tanakh are victorious, and the plan to assault the Zenith base can begin. <laughs> Here I am again, on my knees before bootlicks and cowards. Go ahead, run me through. Shut your mouth, traitor. It was you who flew in on the wings of the Ten. You who challenged her by our rights, you must decide her fate. I spared her once. It only made things worse. She was the best of my marshals. What a waste. She's dangerous, all right. But maybe that's exactly what I need. Cowards! What more do you have to conspire about? Whether you live or die. This is actually one of the only decisions you get to make that actually affects the story of the game in a significant way. I sat and thought long and hard about this decision and I came to the conclusion that I would keep Regala alive. My reason being that I don't think Aloy would choose to kill Regala in cold blood, especially when she's already been beaten. Plus, if Regala wants a warrior's death, what better way to get it than by dying in a blaze of glory fighting the Zeniths? I'm not here to forgive you for your crimes. But there's another battle ahead. Against an enemy more powerful than anything you can imagine. And I need people. A squad. That's willing to do whatever it takes. I don't want your mercy. It's not mercy. The battle I'm talking about will be charging into a nightmare. A better death than this? Yes. My blood is yours. Your enemies are mine. Meet us at our stronghold. 
and the mountains near Plainsong. You mean to send her alone? Without even an armed guard? She does not need it. I will be there. You have my word. I'll hold you to it. Chief, there is something you both need to see. In the throne room. He surrendered to our guards outside the grove. Claims he has an urgent message for the outlander who defeated Regala. So, state it. It's for her alone. From an interested party. I'm gonna need some privacy. Clear the room. Put him with the rest of Regala's soldiers. I'll see you back at base. You saved the tribe. Let me help you with your mission. No. With Regala gone, you have a chance to build the future you dreamed of. So get to your task. Then at least allow me to give you this. Armor for the battle ahead. May it keep you safe. Thank you. Do you have any idea what you've just done? Oh, it's a pleasure to see you too, Silence. Congratulations on your victory. You saved the Tanakh for a few weeks. Unfortunately, you doomed the entire planet as well. Wrong. I don't need a Tanakh army to defeat the Zenus. Oh, Eloy. Have you learned nothing about the enemy we're up against? More than you, hiding whatever hole you found. My idea is just better than anything you ever came up with. Go on. No, not here. We're doing this my way. Face to face, and with the weapon you've developed. And why would I agree to that? Because I'm your only way of beating the Zeniths, and getting the copy of Apollo that's on their ship. So meet me at my base. Mountains west of Plainsong. Time to submit to the inevitable silence and follow the person who actually knows what she's doing. Don't be late. Regala has been spared and will serve as a valuable asset during the final battle at the Zenith base. Aloy has sent her to the base, so when we get back there, she'll be waiting there. On top of this, Aloy's plan to force Silence to cooperate was a success, and he's also going to show up at the base in due time, along with his weapon capable of taking down Zenith shields. With no army to fight the Zeniths with, Aloy and her team is Silence's last hope of getting a copy of the Apollo database. I love this confrontation between Silence and Aloy, how Silence assumes she knows nothing about the Zeniths and patronizes her about how she's doomed the world, until she reveals that not only does she know his exact plan, but she has a better one, one that doesn't require the genocide of an entire people. In Zero Dawn, Silence was always seemingly an omnipotent figure compared to Aloy, but now she's one step ahead of him. I just love the dumbfounded look on Silence's face when Aloy mentions that she already knows about the copy of Apollo. He realises in that moment that he has underestimated her. I think Silence is a fantastic character, but he really is an arrogant bastard, so seeing Aloy put him in his place from time to time is great. Anyway, with Regala's rebellion thwarted and Silence's weapon within her grasp, Aloy can finally head back to the base, to gather all of her allies in preparation for the assault on the Zenith base. Hey, uh, Mr. Know-It-All is here. You know, you're focused, buddy, who never smiles. I didn't know what to do with him, so I had him wait in your room. Got it. 
Thanks. Well, Silence, looks like you finally found a door you could open without me. I'm glad it's there, actually. It kept me from having to mingle with the company you keep. But enough prattle. I believe you owe me an explanation. Your plans for the Zenith base? You're right. I do owe you. My spear in your throat for deceiving me again. At the Hades Proofing Lab. I doubt you asked me here for that kind of reckoning. No. Right now, I need your help. So I'm giving you one final chance. But if you ever betray me again, I will kill you no matter what the circumstance. Understood? Very well. Though we'll both face a decidedly short future if you can't get us inside that base. Aloy, your other guest is here. She's, um, coming to you. Thanks. Good timing. The truth is, I can't actually get us into the base. But, she can. The company you keep is even worse than I thought. Not a fan of surprises, are you? Oh, well, look. That must be your little invention. Does the weapon work? Without self-destructing? Of course it does. I've eliminated the imperfections and greatly improved its design and output. How can we be sure? Care for a demonstration. Enough, both of you. We're in this together, at least for now. Go talk to Erend. Tell him I said to give you rooms of your own. I'll come see you when I get a chance. Oh, no. You first. I love this interaction so much. It's been a while since Aloy and Silence have spoken face to face. It always fills me with the nostalgia when the two of them interact, because it reminds me of playing Horizon Zero Dawn back in 2017. Although Silence has taken a bit of a smaller role in this game, He's come through right at the end to help the gang fight the Zeniths. Plus, it's amusing seeing him in the base, being forced to interact and team up with people he most likely loathes. His interaction with Tilda is also even more of a treat, as both of them are very untrusting people, and both of them realise the danger they pose to each other. However, the direst of circumstances turn even the fiercest of enemies into temporary allies. If we want to stand any chance of defeating the Zeniths, everyone needs to set their differences aside and work together. It's good to see Silence again, He's one of my favourite characters in the Horizon franchise, so having him as an ally during the final battle is exactly what I wanted. I'm just glad to see that Silence remains an anti-hero, because when I first watched the post credit scene of Horizon Zero Dawn, it made it seem like he would be somewhat more of a villain in this game. I'm glad they didn't go down that route. So here we are, after hours of me rambling about everything and nothing, we finally made it to the last main quest of the entire game. This is the moment that the entire story has been leading to. The moment where Aloy assembles all of her allies and takes back Gaia and Beta, most importantly allowing her to save the biosphere in the process. Alright people, I need you up in the control room right away. Okay everyone, we all know what's at stake. Beta, Gaia, not to mention life on Earth. Now it might seem like the Zeniths are invincible, but they're not. We've got what it takes to break into their base and defeat them. We even have one of them on our side. Tilda, show us the base. It is constructed atop the ruins of an ancient military facility on an island to the southwest. I can get us inside. To this location. Undetected. How exactly? You'll know when you need to. Once inside, our goal will be this structure. The launch tower. 
Gaia and Beta are being held at the top. But along the way, we will face overwhelming resistance. Most importantly, from Gerard, Eric, and the others. But also... Once I take away their shields, we should be able to deal with them. But it will be easier to deploy the device if someone else is carrying it. I'll need a strong back. Carry stuff? Yeah, I can do that. Even if your device works, there will still be Spectre drones, scores of them. If only we had an army to fight them. I've got that under control. You'll know when you need to. All right. We'll meet up again just before we go in. Where's the best place to rendezvous? On the coast, just across from the island. Once there, I'll show you the way. Okay. I'll let you know when I arrive at the rendezvous point. And then you can join me. In the meantime, do whatever you need to prepare. Understood? You too? A minute? Tilda helped me get in touch with Beta, and she told me something important. There's an installation inside the base. It's called a regulator. Here. Once we're inside, I need you two to split off from everyone else and destroy it. So you'll have to bring explosives. This will help stop the drones. Everything depends on it. You with me? After that, I want you to find a way to infiltrate the Zenith network. How? Go over all the data that Beta left behind. She knew how to do it, I'm sure of that. All right, but... Why? Uh, what am I trying to do? Find information about Zenus. Anything Tilda's not telling us. Silence is right about one thing. There's no way we can take her on her word. I'll do my best. Keep her safe, okay? On my life. I really loved this cutscene when I first watched it. All of the hours of gameplay preceding this scene has been leading up to the moment where Aloy assembles her team and Tilda briefs them on the plan to take the fight to the Zeniths. Seeing all the characters you've met along the journey all gathered in the same room, it's just such an impactful moment and really goes to show the leader that Aloy has become. I also found it really funny how Regala's just there. She has no reaction whatsoever to Tilda, or the hologram of the Zenith base, or the mention of Gaia and all life on Earth being threatened. She just stands there accepting the fact that she's gotten herself involved in some crazy shit. Truth be told, all she cares about is dying in a blaze of glory anyways, so I guess for her, the more mental the situation is, the better. In the end, I'm glad Regala's here. Not only is she a powerful ally, but this is the redemption she deserves, after being misled and exploited by Silence. After all, her rebellion against Hikaru only happened because she believed that the Kaja should have been punished for the Red Raids. And Hikaru refused to push past Baron Light when the Sanakt forced the Kaja to retreat back to the Sundom at the end of the war. I think that Hikaru was right to choose peace over war, but Regala was justified in her anger and grief. The Red Raids were horrific and brutal, being subject to that would definitely change a person. So. Tilda briefs the team and explains exactly how the plan is going to be executed. Everyone is to rendezvous near the island just off the southwestern coast, where the Zenith base is located. Tilda can get everyone inside without being detected, but she doesn't disclose exactly how at this point, only saying, you'll know when you need to. Once inside, the goal is to head straight for the launch tower where Gaia and Beta are being held. Eren is to carry Silence Weapon into the field where it can be deployed which will keep the Zeniths on the back foot. It's likely that they haven't fought without their shields for a long time, if ever, so this would be a reality check for them, a reminder that they can still be killed. But there's still the issue of the spectres that will be crawling all over the facility. Of course, the original plan was to use Hephaestus to manufacture an army of hunter-killer machines to fight them, but without Hephaestus, this will be much harder to achieve. However, Aloy says she has a plan that will work, 
but she doesn't disclose this to the rest of the group, or even to us, the player. You'll notice a theme here of Aloy concealing information from people she doesn't trust. In this instance, it's silence. But the first example of this was when she spoke to Beta through the data stream in the quest All That Remains. If you remember, she whispers something to Beta, and when Tilda asks what she said to her, she simply replies with, that's between me and my sister. It's clear that Aloy and Beta have some sort of plan to deal with the Spectres, but right now, Aloy's companions and the audience are intentionally kept in the dark as to what was discussed between them. So I won't tell you right now. Just know that you'll know when you need to. At the end of the briefing, Aloy asks Katalo and Alva to stay. She explains to them that there's some sort of regulator inside the base. Alva and Katalo's goal is to split off from the rest of the group to destroy it. This will help stop the production of Spectre drones. In addition to this, Alva is to find a way, using the data that Beta left at the base, to infiltrate the Zenith network in order to find more information about the Zeniths and any secrets that Tilda's keeping to herself. Yeah, if you hadn't noticed already, Tilda is a strange character. She's definitely got an ulterior motive for wanting to help Aloy, and she's playing her cards close to her chest. She may be our ally for now, but who knows how quickly that could change. Exactly why is she so adamant on helping Aloy defeat the Zeniths? You may notice that I've finally changed out of the Nora Anointed armor set into the Nora Thunder Warrior set. If you know me, you know that I love the Shield Weaver armor set from Zero Dawn, so I was really happy to see that they had Aloy wearing this armor at the start of Forbidden West, even if the energy cell powering the armor had died. I just love it when games acknowledge the achievements you made during the last game, and have you start the sequel with the gear that you acquired during the first game. It does something for me, okay? I also have this thing with games for some reason where I like to wear the character's canon outfit for the main story. Then once I start doing side content, I play around with the other gear to see what works best in the end game. But I decided the original Nora anointed armor didn't seem grand enough for the final quest of the game, and it makes sense that Aloy would wear stronger armor for her fight with the Zeniths. So I decided that the Nora Thunder Warrior armor was a good fit for the final fight. Not only does it feature more armor plating, but it's also one of the best armors in the game stats wise, so this was a no brainer for me. I decided to pair this with the Nora Deathseeker face paint in honor of Rost. Without him, Aloy wouldn't be where she is now. Also, the color scheme of the Deathseeker face paint perfectly matched is the blue in the Thunder Warrior outfit, so I kind of had to pair them up for fashion's sake. At this point, it's a good idea to take this one last chance to speak with all of your companions before heading up to Gaia's chamber. You can have final conversations with Zoe, Eren, Katalo, Alva, Tilda, Silence, and even Regala, which feels like we're taking a nice victory lap before the end of the game, allowing you to get some context on how everyone is feeling about the mission to come. I won't cover what's said in these one-on-one -on -one conversations, but I recommend doing them if you haven't before. It really adds a nice sense of finality to this quest. You can also, of course, head to Val's resting place to pay your respects one last time before heading off. After all, it's a dangerous mission, and you never know if we'll make it back in one piece. After stocking up on ammo, crafting materials, and speaking with all the companions, all that's left to do is make the flight from the base to the rendezvous point to the southwest. You can fast travel to the campfire to immediately start this quest, but I actually took this time to physically fly across the map, just so I can appreciate the open world one last time before the end of the game. It really is a bittersweet flight, because even though the finale of this game is exciting, it's also a game that I was sad was ending because I enjoyed it so much. Take one last look at the Forbidden West, guys. We're nearly done. Following a long flight to the coast, Aloy dismounts her Sunwing and calls upon her allies to prepare to infiltrate the Zenith base. Here we go. We finally made it to the point of no return. Aloy. Where are the others? Not far behind. Egghead here couldn't stand traveling with the pack. Are we all here? Then let's begin. A tunnel. An ancient escape route from the ruins on the island. When I realized it ran all the way across the water, I, I thought it might prove useful to come and go undetected. So I concealed it from the others. Shall we? I wish there was a less pungent way to get way inside the base. Agreed. Oh. 
There's the launch tower. That plane offers a little cover, so the only viable path is through there. There will be specters guarding it, and many more can be deployed from those hangars. All right. Alva, Catalo, get to it. Where are they going? Somewhere important. Erend, you're with me. You guys, take the high ground in case we need covering fire. Tactically sound, I suppose. What will she do? There's a sensor node nearby. If I hack into it, I should be able to scramble the network and keep you undetected. But not for long. Then we should proceed. One more thing. Open up the channel to beta. Audio only. Aloy, we're here. And we're coming for you. You know what to do, right? As long as you hold up your end. We will. See you soon. Be careful. Let's go. <clears throat> the team splits off into groups of two. Aloy and Erend, Zoe and Regala, Alva and Catalo, and Silence and Tilda. I like that Aloy has teamed up with Erend for this final mission. Erend was the first person Aloy got to know outside of the Nora tribe. He was her first friend in a large and confusing world. Now they're fighting side by side against a force that threatens the entire world. Erend wasn't wrong when he told Aloy that he would follow her anywhere. The time has come for the team to push forward to the facility itself. Whilst Tilda and Silence scramble the Zenith systems, Catalo and Alva destroy the Regulator, and Zoe and Regala provide covering fire, Aloy and Erend make their way through the nearby ridgeline to stay somewhat hidden. The longer the element of surprise is maintained, the better. Heading down into the ridges, the two are immediately met by two spectres which are easy enough to take out. We know that acid and explosives are just incredibly effective against spectres, so why change the formula that works perfectly? Just apply the acid status effect to the spectres, use whatever explosives you can, and there'll be nothing but scrap in no time. Come to think of it, it's actually quite surprising how quickly we can defeat spectres now, considering the first time we fought them it took us a decent while to even kill one. Again, this just shows how powerful we've become by the end of the game. Aloy and Erend leave this first area and head towards the facility and into a nearby cave with a ravine in the center. Aloy uses her shield wing to cross the large gap, and Eren finds another way across. Coming out of the cave leads to another large area with spectres. This place looks like some sort of machine graveyard, with lots of machine carcasses. This is actually a really creative way of making sure we have crafting materials to craft more ammo. In the last area, there was a couple dead bellowbacks, which can be looted for volatile sludge, which is required to craft advanced arrows of any type. Similarly, in this area, there are many machine carcasses to choose from, so if you're low on ammo, you can loot them for some vital crafting materials. Something I didn't even realise when I first played this quest was that you don't actually have to kill the spectres, you can just sneak past them. In retrospect, this would have saved me a lot of time, and it actually makes more sense from a story perspective if the goal is to get as close to the facility as possible without alerting anyone. Kinda hard to believe the Zeniths don't know we're here when we're spamming explosive spears over and over again, anyone would be able to hear that from a mile away. The gameplay loop for the next few sections remains the same. Reach a New area, fight some more spectres, move on to the next area, rinse and repeat. It's not bad, but I certainly wish there were more zenith type machines to fight instead of just spectres. They get incredibly boring to fight after a while, and this quest throws a lot of them at you. Honestly could have done without the onslaught of spectres. It just feels like they were placed here because video game, and not because they add anything fun to this part of the mission. I would have actually preferred it if the start of this quest was suspiciously quiet with no fighting. You could even have the members of your team talk through the focus network, talking about how they thought there'd be more resistance. With with each duo of their team coming across their own large ambush of spectres at once. It'd build a lot more tension and would be a whole lot more engaging than kill spectres, move to the next area and kill more spectres. After a little bit more fighting and climbing, Catalo contacts Aloy through the focus network to let her know that they've destroyed the regulator, which will help stop the production of spectre drones. Aloy and Eren climb to the top of a nearby ridge to get a lay of the land surrounding the base, only to be met with an army of spectres spreading across the area. <laughs> Alpha and Catalo did their job. Now it's Beta's turn. Uh, Aloy? I think we're in trouble. Whatever you plan to do to stop those spectres, you better do it now. I'm not doing anything. Beta will. She just needs a little time. Time that we don't have. Come on, Beta, come on, come on, come on.
What is that? Our army. I think you got their attention. Very clever. You had Beta inject Hephaestus into the base's printer matrix. Which is faster and more powerful than any cauldron. And now it can crank out machines to its heart's content. Get to the launch tower before this whole place becomes a war zone. <clears throat> the scene is where things really start ramping up. The Zeniths have detected that their network is being scrambled, so a whole legion of spectres cross the field in the direction of Silence and Tilda. However, moments before they reach them, the Zenith printing matrix starts creating slaughter spines and thunder jaws. The plan that Aloy kept under wraps has finally been set in motion. When she whispered to Beta, she told her to inject Hephaestus into the printing matrix of the Zenith base, creating the army of machines that they needed. Although even though Hephaestus has come in handy this time, this stunt means it's escaped containment and will most likely flee back into the cauldron network before long. But for now, it's on our side. This scene blew my mind when I first watched it. It's completely sci-fi with two armies of machines firing beams of energy lasers at each other. It's definitely a far cry from some of the fantasy elements of this game, which is something I've always loved, how they strike a great balance between fantasy and sci-fi within the space of a few hours. If you compare the unadulterated sci-fi tone of this quest to the more fantasy style tone of the quest To The Brink when we first arrived in Chainscrape, it really is night and day, almost hard to believe it's the same game. With Hephaestus keeping the army of spectres occupied, Aloy and Erend can push up towards the spire. Anyway, after clearing out the spectres from another couple of areas, Zoe, Regala and Silence meet up with Aloy and Erend to help them out with the final push to the launch tower. Come on, let's go! <sighs> this way, demon! Ah! This is the death I was promised! Go! Finally, Regala has been granted the warrior's death she wanted for so long. All in all, I do think Regala was underutilized as an antagonist or anti-hero, but I do like her nonetheless. She's like the embodiment of extreme Tanakh beliefs, and a representation of what can happen to someone when they let vengeance consume them. Who was once Akaro's favored marshal, slowly became a war-obsessed fanatic who would gladly sacrifice the lives of her fellow people in order to get revenge against Akaja. Something that wouldn't ever come to fruition anyway, because attacking the Zenith base would wipe out most of the Tanakh. She certainly was a troubled person. Hopefully she can find peace and rest now. Regala's sacrifice also gives the rest of the team time to get out of the collapsing tower, and she manages to take five spectres down with her. It's the glorious death she always wanted, and the redemption her character deserved after enduring so much. With Regala distracting the pursuing spectres, we've made it to the final stretch, heading towards the Zenith base. Alba contacts Aloy to let her know that Catalo has successfully escorted her to the network node, and she's currently trying to infiltrate the Zenith system, in order to find anything that Tilda has neglected to tell the group. In the meantime, Aloy, Eren, Zoe, and Silence make their way further towards the launch platform as the war between the two robot armies rages on around them. <laughs> <laughs> Now we know who's been causing all the fuss. Tilda's little pet. Uh, uh, 
silence. Zenith inbound. Can we drop their shields, please? I'm powering it up. <sighs> Stay still. This is pointless. You can't hurt us. Face it. Your worms that ooze to the cracks into our basement. Silence. One moment more. But I might just spare you if you give up Tilda. I think it's safe to say she's forfeited her share of our operation. Permanently. Ah, uh, there. No. Nothing. Fine. All right, people. Light them up! <laughs> Are we supposed to be scared? can't let Gerard escape. It won't take long before he preps the shuttle for launch. Then he'll be able to take Beta and Gaia into orbit and onto the Odyssey beyond our reach. We gotta go through there? I fail to see another option. Then we'll carve a path. Ready? Top and secure Gaia. I'll stop Gerard. This part is so satisfying. For the entire game, the Zeniths have always been one step ahead, and they knew it. Those shields made them immortal, so whenever we came into contact with them, they were incredibly self-sure and condescending, knowing that no direct harm could come to them. But this time, with Silence Contraption, Aloy has the upper hand. It's clear that the Zeniths haven't had to worry about the threat of death for a long time, because once their shields are depleted and the machines are charging at them, most of them become disoriented and confused, as if they're having to come to terms with their sudden mortality. This brief moment of confusion and fear allows the Slaughter Spines and Thunder Jaws to come in and rip most of them to shreds, with Eric and Gerard fleeing back to the launch pad in order to get their ship ready for departure. Now that they have Gaia, Beta, and all of the subordinate functions except for Hades and Hephaestus, all they need to do is launch the ship, return to the Odyssey, and they'll be out of reach, with Aloy and her team having no means of getting into orbit. The goal now is finding both of them immediately. Aloy runs through the onslaught of spectres while her teammates defend her, and finally makes it to the main launch tower. Eric and Gerard will be waiting somewhere beyond the large gate in front of of us, and without their shields, they're defenseless. At the foot of the tower is an ornate Far Zenith cargo elevator. All Aloy needs to do is activate the console, and she'll have access to the upper level of the tower. We got some unfinished business, little girl. I don't need a shield to take you out. Trust me, you're gonna wish you had one. This moment is so satisfying. If you guys have been following along closely, you'd remember me saying that the shield is my favourite power surge in the game. Well, this is the perfect moment to use it in order to flip the tables on Eric. When we first fought him in Atopolis, he was the one with the shield. Well, this time, 
Aloy has the shield and he's left defenseless. I just love the irony of this fight if you use the shield power surge. I was saving it for this moment. Of course, Aloy isn't totally impervious like Eric was at the beginning of the game, but having the shield does give you an advantage for sure. The Eric boss fight itself is actually one of my favourites in the game. It's decently challenging and Eric has a nice range of attacks to throw at you. Fighting him at close range with your spear prompts him to fabricate a large blade on his arm, unleashing a flurry of combos that can only be dodged effectively with well-timed rolls. He's open to attack at the end of this combo. If you run away and create distance, he then switches from the blade to his arm cannon, shooting high-powered projectiles at Aloy. If you deal a large amount of damage at a close range, Eric will release an energy blast that does area of effect damage. Think of this as his way of breaking a stun lock. This ability will always proc if you do too much damage in a short space of time at a close range, without allowing Eric to recover. He's also able to do ground slams which cause large energy crystals to blast out of the floor, meaning even if the initial slam misses you, the following spikes will probably hit. This makes you mindful of the timing of your dodges. So what's the best way of dealing with Eric? Honestly, at this point in the game we've got so many powerful options in our arsenal that you can pretty much use a conjunction of whatever weapons you want. I mainly use my melee spear during this fight because I'm a big fan of the new spear combo combat system, and it's fun stringing combos together against an enemy that's significantly larger than you. I loved fighting the shield bearing champions, and Eric is basically a stronger version of those, so I had an absolute field day with my combos on him. Something else that I found particularly strong against Eric was fire arrows. He's a human enemy, so he's really weak to fire, making fire arrows another good option. And of course, how could I forget good old explosive spears? They explode on impact when you're fighting Eric too, because he's a human enemy, but given the emotional weight of this fight, I tried not to use that tactic, because it ends up looking silly. I stuck mainly to my spear combos, and Eric was down in no time. I almost forgot what it was like to hurt. Now we're having fun, right? As someone who was very close with Val, it's fitting that Zoe gets to deliver the final blow to the man who took the father of her child away from her. Eric didn't even need to kill Val. All he would have had to do to get Beta is incapacitate him, but he wanted to kill Val and that desire to kill ended up being his undoing. I like the subtle look that Aloy and Zoe share after killing Eric, as if they both look at each other to say, we did it. Val has been avenged, and we can properly start to move on from that grief. I think at this moment Aloy and Zoe become much closer. They both shared love for Val, so it's only natural that his absence would bring them closer. I look forward to seeing how their friendship progresses in the future. Zoe certainly is one of the strongest new additions to the main lineup of characters. Well, with Eric dead, all that's left to do now is to head to the top of the tower to deal with Gerard. He's the leader of Far Zenith after all, and with him dead, the current members will either surrender or scatter. Either way, Far Zenith will be over with him gone. Zoe regroups with the other members of the team, and Aloy heads to the nearby elevator to reach the top of the tower. As the elevator ascends, we get a view over the battlefield, with the army of spectres fighting the slaughter spines and thunder jaws in the distance, which is such a cool spectacle to be able to see from such a high vantage point. At this stage, most of the machines down there have destroyed each other, only a few remain on each side. Halfway up the tower, the elevator seems to jam, so Aloy's forced to climb the rest of the way up. Luckily for us, there's plenty of handholds which form a path leading directly to the top. Here we have the final parkour section of the game, so enjoy it while it lasts. I actually really like this part, with far above the chaos of the battlefield below, and the climb almost serves as a moment of solace to process everything that's happened in this quest so far. After making it to the top of the old rusted tower left over from the old world ruin the Zeniths built their base on, an ornate staircase can be seen bridging the two structures together. Upon climbing these stairs, Aloy has reached the highest point. Are you okay? Look, I, I know you've been through a lot, but you have to help me access the Zenith network. I need to see their files, anything referring to the word Nemesis. Okay. O over there. The systems are down all over the base. I should be able to take advantage of... 
Yes, Nemesis. Here. There's something in deep space. It's following the Zenith to Earth. Look. Escape vectors. Alva tried to warn me about this. The Zeniths aren't planning to stay here. It's a machine of some kind. O or a swarm of them. The energy readings are... astronomical. Aloy, I don't think a natural disaster destroyed the Zenith colony on Sirius. This thing did. Earth isn't a new home for them. It's a way station. They're on the run. I see you've been busy. And you've been lying. Nemesis, what is it? It is us. The minds of Far Zenith. Or failed copies of them, anyway. Back on Sirius, some of my peers weren't satisfied with physical immortality. They wanted digital transcendence. A way to upload their minds into any form, organic or mechanical. Nemesis was a failed experiment to that effect. Abandoned, but never erased. An immense database of our memories, emotions, and prejudices left to fester. And it destroyed your colony? We didn't realize it had gained sentience until it broke containment. It had everything it needed from our memories. Security protocols, system specs, override codes. It hacked everything before we knew what hit us. Then it took over our printing facilities, allowing it to gain any machine form it needed to wipe us out. But why? Imagine being trapped alone for decades with only the twisted echoes of megalomaniacs for company. It hates us for abandoning it to that prison. And now that it's free, it will do anything to destroy us, including denying us a safe harbor on Earth. The extinction signal that woke Hades. You didn't send it. Nemesis did. Finally, you understand. And when that failed, it launched from Sirius to finish the job itself. Which is why we must flee to a random planet circling a random star somewhere it can never find us. With Gaia, so you can build yourself a new world. That's the plan. Even now. Earth is finished, Aloy. Nemesis will scour it of life to deny its creators a viable home. But Elizabeth's dream won't die. You'll come with me to the stars. And with Gaia, we'll create a new world. Together. Where that monstrosity could never find us. What? No. I loved Elizabeth. More than you could ever know. And I let her stay behind to die with the rest of humanity. A mistake I have regretted for a thousand years. Now she stands before me again. Not some inferior copy. But her best possible self. So I'm not asking. You're coming with me. It may seem harsh now, but you'll forgive me in a few centuries. You can't force me, Tilda. Your shield is gone. I have something better. Spectre Prime, to me. Take cover! Get to the door! Submit, Aloy. You can't win. No! Uh, I've heard that before. 
So there was a large dump of exposition in this cutscene. Aloy makes it to the top of the tower and frees Beta. The two of them look through the Zenith database, specifically for something called Nemesis. Thanks to Alva snooping around in the Zenith network, Aloy discovered that Nemesis was something important to the Zenith because there were lots of files dedicated to it, as well as files insinuating that they were afraid of it. It's revealed by Tilda that this Nemesis is actually what destroyed the Zenith colony in the Sirius star system, with the Zeniths running from it ever since. But what exactly is Nemesis? Well, Tilda explains to us that Nemesis is a failed attempt at achieving digital immortality. After becoming bored with physical immortality, the Zeniths wanted a method of uploading their mind into a digital space, meaning they could transfer their consciousness into any form, organic or technological. Their attempt failed, and what was left was an unused digital database of far Zenith minds. It was contained and left intact, but ultimately abandoned as a failed project. Unbeknownst to the colonists, after years of containment, the entity eventually grew sentient and vengeful, blaming its creators for its constant torment and imprisonment. Being the minds of Far Zenith, Nemesis had access to all Far Zenith knowledge. Security protocols, system specs, access codes, everything it needed to topple the utopian Far Zenith colony. Before they even knew what was happening, Nemesis had hacked everything and had begun to destroy the colony. Only 11 members of the colony survived and escaped on the Odyssey, with the intention of going back to Earth to retrieve Gaia, only to leave again to find a new barrier planet to terraform. The Zeniths never wanted to settle back on Earth. They were merely using it as a way station so they could gather what they needed before finding somewhere else to build a new colony. So what is Nemesis's goal exactly? Nemesis wants not only to destroy the Zeniths, but also any habitable planet that they could potentially settle on, including Earth. Currently, Nemesis is on its way to Earth in the form of a huge machine swarm, with the intention of destroying the planet in order to prevent any Zeniths from seeking asylum there. In an attempt to destroy Earth before the Zeniths even got there, Nemesis sent the extinction signal to Gaia that would awaken Hades. Hades would then theoretically execute its extinction protocol to destroy Earth's biosphere and render it uninhabitable. The signal worked as intended, but also inadvertently turned all of Gaia's subordinate functions into self-aware entities, which then resulted in Gaia self-destructing and creating a genetic clone of Elizabeth Sobek in the hopes that she would be able to stop Hades and save the biosphere. Of course, we know this clone came to be Aloy, who did exactly as Gaia had hoped. However, in the event of its defeat, Hades sent the signal back to Nemesis, notifying the superintelligent AI that it had failed to execute the extinction protocol. Upon learning of Hades' failure, it launched itself towards Earth to finish the job itself. All of the events of the entire Horizon franchise up to this point were already predetermined to happen the moment Far Zenith created Nemesis, abandoned it, and left it to fester. I think in a way, this is quite par for the course when it comes to the timeline of Horizon. It was the arrogance of humans who thought they had dominion over life, again. If Far Zenith had never left Earth on the Odyssey and had died during the Pharaoh Plague like everyone else, they would never have had the hubris to create Nemesis in the first place, meaning that Zero Dawn would have run its course, life would have been brought back to Earth, and everything would be fine, with no looming threat of a second swarm of machines destroying Earth once again. The old ones, in this case the members of Far Zenith, somehow managed to doom the planet a second time, and it's all thanks to their own arrogance. Much like how Ted Farrow's arrogance led us to the Faro Plague, the Zenith's arrogance has led us to Nemesis. However, due to the 8.6 light year distance between Sirius and Earth, it will most likely be years before Nemesis reaches the planet, giving Aloy and her companions time to prepare. Anyway, enough about Nemesis, we'll talk more about it later. Our current focus is on Tilda. Her intention this whole time was to manipulate Aloy into leaving Earth entirely, so that they could travel the stars together and create a new world far from the reach of Nemesis. She claimed to love Elizabeth Sobek, and she regretted leaving her to die all those years ago, during the conception of Project Zero Dawn. But if she truly knew anything about Elizabeth, then she would know that trying to convince Aloy to come with her is a fool's errand, as she shares Elizabeth's love for Earth, and would give her life defending it. Of course, Aloy refuses Tilda's request, after which she reveals she wasn't asking. She plans to take her by force which is where a small inconsistency with her character appears. She's seen Aloy take down countless huge machines entirely on her own, so what makes her think that summoning another huge machine is going to be enough to defeat her? Tilda is notoriously a genius, so why did she overlook this? I know Spectre Prime is definitely a result of video game logic. The only reason it was put here in the first place was so that the final boss of the game was a machine instead of another human enemy. But it just feels super out of character for Tilda to fight Aloy in a large mech suit after watching Aloy take down many large machines without issue. I hate to have a gripe with the game right at the end because this video has been largely positive so far, but I really think Tilda is uncharacteristically stupid in this ending part of the game. It just doesn't make sense. She also could 
have just used the energy surge she used to incapacitate Aloy during the Gemini quest. That seemed to knock her out for hours, which would give Tilda enough time to take Aloy onto the ship and away from Earth. Past that point, Aloy really couldn't do much to get away. So yeah, she's actually kinda dumb. But let's give Tilda the benefit of the doubt and say that she had assumed that Spectre Prime would be enough to at least subdue Aloy. After all, it's a large machine, and thanks to its nanotech composition, it doesn't sacrifice any agility for its size, meaning it's powerful and fast. It's canonically the strongest machine that Aloy has ever faced, even stronger than Thunderjaws or Slaughter Spines. Here we go guys, the final boss battle of the game. We've come a long way since fighting that damaged Slitherfang at the beginning, right? The beginning of this game feels so far away now. So, as a final boss, how good is Spectre Prime? I actually think it's really fun. Yes, my main issues with this boss are how it's introduced, but the actual fight itself is great. It's a boss fight that's unprecedented in the Horizon games, with coherent and manageable attack patterns, telegraphed moves, and a great boss arena. First of all, something that's key to this fight is the elemental weaknesses of Spectre Prime. The machine is equipped with nano armor, which initially protects the machine from any serious damage. In order to weaken the machine's chassis, we must damage and destroy some of the armor fragments. Similar to regular Spectres, Spectre Prime is weak to acid and plasma damage. So take your pick. I'm personally a bigger fan of acid, it's something we've used a lot throughout the course of the game, and plasma is far less reliable because it takes time for the plasma status effect to build up. Whereas acid can be instantly applied, does damage over time, and also weakens the machine itself. Its weakness to acid makes acid and explosives a great way to deal with the Spectre Prime, and I see no better combo than acid arrows and explosive spears to take it down. This pairing of weapons has basically carried us through the game at this point, so at least we get to use the legendary combo one last time against the final boss. Spectre Prime is also equipped with a regeneration module in its lower chest that can repair its armor. A well-placed shot to its chest with a powerful weapon like a sharpshot bow is enough to render this module inoperable, meaning it can no longer regenerate armor pieces at will. In terms of weapons, the Spectre Prime has a veritable arsenal of nanotech weapons that can be reattached when blown off. First off is the Siege Mortars. Spectre Prime uses these to launch explosives around the area which cause large area of effect damage, so it's best to keep your distance when it uses this attack. Secondly, the Spectre Prime can use a pulse cannon on its chest to shoot electrical beams, so it's a good idea to get behind some cover or dodge carefully during this attack. Thirdly, it's got a Lancer Prime on its back that can fire a series of lance-like projectiles. Again, either stay out of the line of fire or dodge to avoid taking damage from this attack. And last but not least, the vector thruster near its legs allows the Spectre Prime to generate waves of fire as it jumps. To deal with this, you need to constantly be on the move, creating distance between yourself and the boss in order to avoid damage. Additionally, Spectre Prime can also strike you with its upper limbs by extending its arms and charging towards you. This melee attack can come in the form of a strike with one arm or a swipe using both arms. These can both easily catch you out, so be sure to time your dodges carefully in order to fully clear the arm. The last thing to keep in mind is that you must keep up the pressure with the elemental damage by hitting Spectre Prime with elements that it's weak to. You can actually stun the boss, which gives you a small window of time to freely deal damage, which makes this the perfect time to shoot its weak points directly without having to worry about dodging. If you keep all of these things in mind, then you'll have no problem taking down Spectre Prime. This boss wasn't too challenging, but it wasn't too easy either, making it a decently balanced final boss that is accessible to anyone playing. Although, I imagine it's much harder if you're playing on ultra hard difficulty, which I plan on playing when I go back through the game on New Game Plus. After an intense fight with the most powerful machine she's come across in her travels so far, Aloy finally deals the last blow to Spectre Prime destroying the machine and killing Tilda in the process. The cockpit inside of the machine explodes from the machine's chest and lays on the ground burning, insinuating that Tilda died inside. Aloy makes her way to the stairs on the other end of the boss arena to return to the control center. She tried to take you. And she told you about Nemesis. So you've known all along? From Hades, yes. Along with data on how to circumvent the Zenith shields. Everything I did to create the rebel army was based on that knowledge. To reach this place, this moment. And you couldn't just tell me? Come now, Eloy. You're the last person to act sensibly in the face of impossible odds. When I learned of Nemesis from Hades, I saw the pieces on the board and how to play them. And in that same moment, I knew it was a game you would never play. That you would interfere and attempt to save the Tanakht. I was correct, to a point. 
you ruined my plans, but brought your own to fruition. The end result is the same. We're here. And now it's time for me to leave this doomed planet behind. To seize the Odyssey and the Apollo database and begin a new chapter in my pursuit of knowledge, one with infinite possibilities. You can join me if you so desire. You've more than earned your place. Unlike Tilda, I'm extending a polite invitation. You're going to just take off? And abandon everything? Stay. Help me fight that thing. Perhaps Tilda didn't adequately define the threat. Nemesis can't be stopped. It destroyed a highly advanced Zenith colony in a matter of hours. What hope does this primitive tribal Earth have? If you brought Gaia, you wouldn't be abandoning life. You'd be saving a seed for a new world. Just as Elizabeth did. It's the choice she made. The sacrifice of all that is for the hope of what might be. If she were here in your place, she would board that shuttle, Aloy. Found her. Is she hurt? Still on her feet. Thank the turn. Goodbye, Silence. She looks okay. She looks victorious. As always. Eloy. You did it. Where's he going? As far away as anyone can go. Oh. Are you sure? You're staying. For a time. You people are going to need all the help you can get. Does anyone else need a drink? Not if it's that ale of yours. Uh, I'd be fine with a nap. Excellent idea. Uh, I hope it's really over this time. There's another battle ahead, Elizabeth. Very different than the one you fought. It's not about the distant hope of creating a new world. It's about preserving the one we have. My friends have a new mission. To spread the word and ask for help. They've taken it in stride. I think it's because they've always known what I've only just started to understand. That the people of this world have the strength to fight any battle. The ingenuity to solve any problem. The courage to overcome any obstacle.
and the resilience to rise after any setback. As for me, I can't say I'm not afraid. What lies ahead will be harder than anything we've faced before. But I know I can put the fear aside. Because for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm not alone. And so the curtain closes on this journey. With the Xenus defeated, Gaia restored, and Hephaestus back in the Cauldron Network, even Silence decided to stick around, demonstrating that he's more than just an emotionless machine. He doesn't admit it, but he can't help but want to stand with Aloy. That's just the type of person she is. Even though they were victorious in this chapter, our heroes still have yet to face the toughest challenge yet, the looming threat of Nemesis. Although now is the time to celebrate their victory. Aloy finally realises what she has always failed to see, that she cannot hope to save the world alone. Aloy's character arc over the course of this game has been to learn that the burden of the world is not one she can carry on her own. She needs allies now more than ever. The team now splits off to each corner of the Forbidden West and beyond, asking for help in the coming fight. As I said earlier, Nemesis' arrival is years away at this point, giving Aloy and her team ample time to gather more allies and prepare for what's to come. And I'm so excited to see where the story goes next, whether that be in a Forbidden West DLC, or the next installment in the franchise. Overall, Horizon Forbidden West is a brilliant open world experience that improves upon everything that was in the first game. It's such a shame that, much like how Horizon Zero Dawn was overshadowed by Breath of the Wild, Forbidden West was overshadowed by Elden Ring. Don't get me wrong, I loved Elden Ring with every fibre of my being, and actually plan on doing a big video for it eventually, but I do wish more people gave the Horizon franchise a chance. It really is one of the best narrative-based single-player open world games out there at the minute, with a really really unique and ambitious story that we've never seen the likes of before. I also had an absolute blast playing through this game's side content. It's got minimal open world fluff and I really appreciate that, with incredibly fun and high quality optional content such as the melee pits, arena, relic ruins, machine strikes, sunken caverns, cauldrons, tall necks, and of course the companion quests. I'm finding it hard to summarise just how much I enjoy playing this game, but I guess the 100,000 words in this script speak for themselves. But I will reiterate, I love this game. It was everything I wanted it to be and more. So, with Eren, Zoe, Catalo and Alva out in the world spreading the word of the coming fight, and with Silence in the base studying Nemesis' trajectory, Aloy and Beta finally reinstall Gaia's heuristic matrix into the base with seven of the nine subordinate functions. Aether, Apollo, Artemis, Demeter, Eleuthia, Minerva, and Poseidon. Only now missing Hephaestus, with Hades entirely unobtainable. With everything set in motion, and a new adventure on the horizon. For the first time in her life, Aloy feels like she's exactly where she belongs. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you've made it to this point, I don't know if any of you watching have made it to this point. The video is 11 hours long. It's, it's ridiculous. I never intended for it to be this long, but it sort of happened. I was writing the script and it eventually just got longer and longer and longer. Um, I actually even cut parts out. There's entire sections of the video that were hours long that I've cut out for the sake of trying to keep it as minimal as possible. Um, but yeah, this video has been the work of about the last year, ever since Horizon Forbidden West came out. Uh, and then I finished it back in sort of around April time last year. I've been working on this video, so it's been yeah, pretty much pretty much a year's worth of work. Uh, that's why I haven't uploaded in, in a year, basically, since the Assassin's Creed Revelations retrospective. And uh, it's safe to say I'm never going to do a project this big again. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll want to in the future at some point. Maybe a game will come out that I think is, is worth this, this much. But um, yeah, I think in the future I'm going to definitely try and uh, keep the videos below the 10 hour mark. <laughs> Because this has just been too much work, but I've really enjoyed working on it over the last year It's been a great time. I've learned so much about editing and video creation and it's just been mental to be honest So if you've taken the time to watch this video and you've watched the whole thing up until this point then uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, even if you didn't finish the video, obviously, if you didn't finish the video, you're probably not watching this right now. But uh, just thanks to everyone that has watched this and has uh, given an 11-hour video the time of day. 
Uh, it, it means a hell of a lot to me. I'm going to stop waffling. You guys probably want to stop hearing my voice at this point, to be honest, after 11 hours of, of just me waffling and rambling. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much. I'm working on more videos. I've got more scripts in the work. Nowhere near as long as this one, but I've definitely got more videos in the works. And I'll continue to bring you this sort of long form content if that's something that you're interested in. Because going forward, I think I really just want to put my effort into these long videos that are just huge in scope. And uh, yeah, maybe not, again, not this long, but definitely long videos that are hours long. Uh, it's the type of content that I've sort of always wanted to make for a long time, so why the hell not just dedicate the channel to this type of content. But yeah, um, thanks for watching. I appreciate it a lot. The last year of work has been absolutely insane, but it's finally all done now, and I can rest. So yeah, thanks guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, everybody.